hair tonic and Cremel shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Once again, it's Monday evening and time for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. From the hints you gave us last week about tonight's story, it sounded like quite a yarn. It took place in Paris, you said. Yes, my boy. It was in that colorful city of bright lights, lilting music, and beautiful women that Sherlock Holmes and I had one of the oddest adventures that ever happened to us in our long association. I call the case The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm. Sounds mighty intriguing, Dr. Watson. But first, men, if you want a successful, prosperous appearance, don't give your hair that cheap, greasy, plastered-down look. I've heard many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed. That's why I urge you to try Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed all day long. Every hair in place. Cremel gives hair a rich, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Cremel, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. And how the ladies admire that natural, well-groomed look which Cremel always gives. Yes, Cremel gives your hair a handsome, clean-cut appearance as if you had just combed it, and it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about your new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm? Well, Mr. Bell, though that singular affair took place in Paris, I suppose the story really began on an October evening in, in Baker Street, a long, long time ago. I'd been more than usually busy with my practice that day, and I returned to our lodging shortly after nine, I remember. As I entered the living room, Sherlock Holmes was seated at his side table, clad in his dressing gown and working hard over a chemical investigation. A large curved retort was boiling furiously in the bluish flame of a Bunsen burner. Finally, he brought a test tube containing a solution over to the table. In his right hand, he held a slip of litmus paper. You come at a crisis, Watson. If this litmus paper remains blue, all is well. If it turns red, it means a man's life. Good Lord Holmes, really? Aha. As I thought, it turns red. And now to send a telegram to Scotland Yard, and I need have no further connection with the case. Well, you didn't tell me that you were working on a new case, Holmes? It was a shoddy little affair, my dear Watson. An orthopedic shoemaker in Wapping became somewhat fretful with his wife. He added poison to her morning pot of tea and was stupid enough to leave a sample of the deadly brew. It was purely a routine matter. Let's forget it. You look tired, old chap. Yes, I'm home. Uh, busy day. Uh... I hope you won't be too tired to accompany me to Paris tomorrow. To Paris? Why? This afternoon I received a very rare visitor in these rooms. My brother Mycroft. All is not well at the foreign office. They need our help. Well, what's wrong, Holmes? An international spy ring is at work. In the past few months, important secrets have leaked out. Vital secrets that might bring this country to the verge of war. Good gracious me. Two of the foreign office's brightest young men have committed suicide rather than divulge how they betrayed their trust. Mycroft tells me he has reason to suspect a beautiful and dangerous young lady in Paris who inspired these men, uh, in these men, a loyalty even above patriotism. And they want you to try and trap her, is that it? No, Watson. They want us. Oh, oh us. Yes. Mycroft and I agreed that you would be perfect bait to use in such a trap. Bait? Makes me sound like a piece of cheese. Only metaphorically, Watson. You must agree that your imposing appearance, your open countenance and hearty manner would attract the attention of any female spy. Yes, I see what you mean. Perhaps you're right. In any case, we shall make you doubly desirable by entrusting you with uh, uh, certain invaluable naval secrets. Masterly, Holmes. Masterly. You will entrust me with utterly worthless documents, spread the story that they're valuable, and uh, wait for the woman to approach me. Precisely. I shall accompany you as a bodyguard, but uh, leave you largely to your own devices. Yes, Watson? I have high hopes of this trip to Paris. With you as the worm and me as the hook, I think we may snare this evil loveliness. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, you have shown me your credentials and explained your mission. We are aware of this firing. We are on constant watch. 
But I think you would have done better to have stayed in your own country. We of the Paris police are perfectly capable of handling such an affair ourselves, I assure you. Inspector Rigaud, the fact remains that two foreign office men died here under sinister circumstances. Yeah, nasty business, you know. British officials. Monsieur, I myself investigated the deaths. They were both self-inflicted. We of the Dersian Bureau cannot fathom the mind of a suicide. Quite. But I doubt if the deaths were coincidental. Surely there must be some connecting link between them, Inspector? The only facts I can give you, Monsieur, are these. Both men frequented an American-owned gambling casino in Montmartre. The name of it, please? Slater's en Room Fontaine. The only other fact I can give you is that both the dead men were seen there in the company of a certain Mademoiselle Elvira. Ah, that must be the woman that Mycroft spoke of. Can you describe her, Inspector? Oh, what a woman. Though she is very young, princes have dueled for her favors. Oh, really? At the moment, a high official of the Bank de France lies in a prison cell because he appropriated funds that he lavished on her. She is a femme fatale, messieurs. But she is as elusive as the wind. Well, Watson, our first move is obvious. Tonight, we shall visit Slater's gambling casino on the Rue Fontaine and try our luck. <laughs> I say, Holmes, this is all rather exciting, isn't it? Paris at night, and we're on our way to an American gambling casino in the hopes of meeting a beautiful young spy named Elvira. <laughs> Just like a novel. Quite. Incidentally, since the young lady apparently moves in high society, I think it would be wiser if we give you a more impressive name. A uh, fictitious title, perhaps. Well, how about the title I used once before? Sir William Norton. Splendid. Sir William Norton it shall be. And I trust that Sir William remembers the role he is to play. Yes, indeed, Holmes. If I do meet the young lady, I'm to appear very susceptible to her beauty. Uh, not too hard for you, I imagine. And... Uh... And I'm to drop dark hints about the valuable secrets that I'm carrying. Precisely, Watson. And uh, if the lady proves as intrigued as I hope she will, you will follow the matter through to its uh, logical conclusion. Oh, logical conclusion, Holmes. Yes, I don't quite know how to take that. Ah, here's the casino. Courage, Watson. And good luck. Good evening. I'm Sam Slater. You gentlemen haven't been here before. No, Mr. Slater. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and uh, this is Sir William Norton. How, How do you do, do, Sam? Holmes? Sherlock Holmes, the detective? Not here drumming up business, I hope. Oh, no. Just showing Sir William some of the sights of Paris. Fine. Then relax and enjoy yourself, gentlemen. Forget your profession, Mr. Holmes. In Paris at night, there's no crime. <laughs> or if there is, the police are conveniently blind to it. Glad to have you. Oh, nice place, Holmes. I think perhaps I'll take a little flutter at the tables. Uh, pardon, monsieur. You wish to speak to me, sir? Uh, yes. I could not help but overhear Slater mention your name. It is a great honor to meet Sherlock Holmes. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. I am André Flandon. How do you do? And this is Sir William Norton. Do, I flatter myself do? that uh, perhaps you have heard of me. My poetry has been published in England. Oh, poetry, oh, Lord. Uh, no, Monsieur Flandon, I'm afraid it's escaped me. You have not heard my verses? Etant, etant selon, où seront je mon cœur? <laughs> Charming, do you not think? Quite. Though the metaphor seems a little involved, if you don't mind my saying so. What do you think, Sir William? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one language. That's English. <laughs> bon. Then I shall recite a poem of mine in English translation. Oh, must you? I say, Holmes, look at that stunning creature sitting by herself at the Chemin de Fur table. <laughs> She's smiling at me. Oh, you are fortunate, Sir William. That is Mademoiselle Elvira. Elvira? Oh, never heard of her. And now, gentlemen, in translation, my poem begins... A grave as the grave, August as August heat... Yes, I think I'll try my luck at the tables over there. I'll see you later, Holmes. Much later, I hope, Sir William. William Norton, is it not? Yes, it is. Oh, I can't think how you recognize me, Miss, uh, uh, Madam... Uh... You may call me Elvira. Oh, really? Uh, Elvira? Uh, Elvira? <laughs> how do you know me? Sam Slater told me who you were. He knows that I have a certain penchant for distinguished Englishmen. That's extremely flattering. Perhaps you'd care to join me in a glass of champagne. Oh, yes, I would like that. Let's sit at this table. Monsieur, uh, garçon, garçon. Oui, monsieur. Uh, de champagne. Uh, uh, bon champagne, too. Oui, monsieur. You are here in Paris on business? Uh, uh -huh. Yes, yes, I am. Important business. You see, I'm, uh, well, I'm handling an extremely delicate and confidential matter for the British government. Oh, how very impressive. 
Then I suppose you would be too busy to let me show you some of the sights of Paris. Oh, no, I don't think so. All work, no play, you know. I, I'd be very flattered to escort you with her. Oh, good. Oh. Then if we are to be friends, hmm? I can't go on calling you Sir William. I think I shall call you Willie. Do you mind? Willie? No, no, no. I don't like it. Willie. Go for a champagne. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Mercy, mercy, mercy. I'll open up, will you? Oui, mercy. Well, we must uh, drink a toast, do we? May I propose one uh, to Willie? The man of mystery. Oh, thank you, my dear. And I shall drink to Elvira and to our better acquaintance. Mm. Good night, Willie. I shall see you tomorrow. Yes, rather. Uh, how, about, how about breakfast? Oh, it's nearly breakfast time now. Oh, really? really? How about lunch? <laughs> Yes, of course, my dear. But your important mission for the British government, uh, when will you attend to that? Well, in a day or two, Elvira. Uh, good night, my dear. Come here, Willie. Closer. Good night. What? You, you kiss me, you little darling. Thanks awfully. <laughs> You're doing splendidly, Watson. Splendidly. Keep it up. Oh, she's a sweet little thing, Holmes. It's hard to believe that she's a spy. I told her that I was here on a secret and confidential mission. I even told her that I was carrying important naval plans. She didn't seem particularly interested. Of course not. She's much too clever to use the clumsy approach. She'll work slowly. She'll wait until she thinks she's got you completely captivated before she goes after that secret. Oh, then I'm just to carry on the way I did last night. Yes, old chap. Oh, good. Wine her, dine her, send her flowers, buy her jewellery. Make her think you're head over heels in love with her. I suspect that you won't find the job too unpleasant. Oh, I'm sure I shall. <laughs> Now, Vera, you've been showing me past, but this is the first time I've actually been in your flat. You like it, Willie? Yes, very much. I thought it would be much quieter here. At dinner, you said you were going to explain some of your important business to me. You were going to show me what a secret treaty looks like. Yes, I know I said that, but... Uh... Well, Vera, a pretty girl like you wouldn't be interested in, in such matters. Oh, but I would. You have the treaty with you? Yes, I have. Then please let me see it. Oh, please, Willie. Oh, I can't go through this masquerade any longer. Masquerade? What do you mean? Well, I've, I've grown really fond of you in these last few days, Elvira. I can't let you walk into a trap. Trap? What are you talking about, Willie? I'm not Willie. I'm, I'm not Sir William Norton. My name's Watson. Dr. John H. Watson. My closest friend is the detective Sherlock Holmes. We came to Paris to try and trap you. Trap me? Oh, my dear girl, you're suspected of being mixed up in a spy ring. What? Well, that's why I pose as a, an important embassy from, from England. Trap! Are you doddering old fool? Oh, no, don't say that, don't say that. I'll teach you about trap. Elvira, put down that revolver. No, I'm going to. I'm Oh, to... you're going to drop it, my dear. I can't do it. I'm just a stupid, weak female, after all. I've grown fond of you, too. You bumbling old walrus. Oh, there, 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 there. You remind me of my father. He was such a sentimental old fool. Like you. Just as sweet. Oh, there, you're young. I know you don't really want to stay mixed up with a bunch of criminals. No, no, no. Now, now, look, look here. You tell Sherlock Holmes and me what you know about this firing, and we'll see that no harm comes to you, my dear. I've wanted to get out of it for months. It was rather glamorous and exciting at first, and they paid me well. But I hate them now. And yet when I told them I wanted to get away, they threatened me. Oh, well, we'll take care of you. Just tell us who's at the head of the organization. That I don't know. But I can tell you a lot about some of the members. That's splendid. And slip on your coat and a funny little bonnet and, and we'll go over and talk to Sherlock Holmes. Oh, and have him see me looking like this. Oh, very eyes and red. Oh, no. 
You go and bring him here. By the time you get back, I'll be more presentable. All right, Rover. Uh, I'll go and get him at once. <laughs> Watson, I'm occasionally astonished at the many facets to your character. Oh, thank you very much, Holmes. It's nice of you to say so. Your personal charm has apparently convinced a dangerous woman that crime does not pay. It's remarkable, if it's true. What do you mean, if it's true? Surely it must have occurred, even to a man burning with the zeal of one who has snatched a convert from the fiery flames, that this could be a trap for us to walk into. The delay, while the young lady makes herself presentable, would provide an excellent opportunity for her to summon her associates. Oh, upon my soul, Holmes, you're utterly cynical. I don't believe you have a heart. Possibly not, but I do have a head. Well, here's her place now. Stop, cabby, stop. Arete. Oh. I'll bet you a hundred pounds to a shilling that she's still waiting for us and alone. Long odds, Watson. Very long odds. Look, look, look. The concierge is sweeping up the steps. He'll be able to tell us if anyone's been here since I left. True. Uh, bonsoir. Bonsoir, monsieur. Vous parlez anglais? Yes, monsieur. Splendid fellow, Paul is anglais. Uh, look here, we were, we were calling on Mademoiselle Elvira. Has anyone been to see her in the last half an hour? Oui, monsieur. A man. She left with him only five minutes ago. Though I do not think she wished to go. You mean that she was taken away by force? Not exactly, monsieur. But I could swear on the sacre coeur. That the man who accompanied her was holding a pistol to her back. You don't mean it. I, uh... I think she has been, uh, how you say, kidnapped. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. That's why when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Don't settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients, which is found in no other hair tonic. Cremel keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day and always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Cremel leaves your scalp feeling alive and tingling. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. It's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Cremel help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking handsome, always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, once again you left me on the edge of my chair. So when you went back to the girl's flat, she'd been kidnapped, hmm? What did you do next? Well, fortunately the concierge was able to give us a good description of the cab driver. And with the aid of Inspector Rigo, we were able to find the man and question him. He'd driven the couple, he told us, to a vile apache den in the alleys of Montmartre. A, a club known as the Scarlet Worm. Holmes and I, accompanied by the French inspector, lost no time in taking a cab to the place. Monsieur, I should not permit you to visit Le Verre Eterlat, the scarlet worm, as you would say, without my protection. It is a cesspool of the underworld. Men have been known to enter there and make their exit by back door, at first into the sewer. Good Lord, they've taken that poor little girl there. Uh... Inspector Rigo. As I said, Mademoiselle Elvira told my friend that she does not know who is at the head of this organization. Have you any suspicions? Yes, but little else, my friend. One thing we are sure of, this man of mystery, the brain behind these criminals, is not French. Probably he is English. An Englishman, or is it sure enough? There. Le Ver et Carlat is waiting for us. Be on the alert, my friends, and keep close to me. Oh, no, there's Sam Slater, the man who, who owns the casino we went to the other night. Yes, and he seems to be involved in a violent argument. Yeah, a rat hole like this, you don't know what you're doing, sir, but... What's up? You know what you're doing here? Stay in your own golden peace guy. Who's the man that Slater's arguing with, Inspector? That is Chabert, the owner of this establishment. Oh, Slater's leaving. 
I wonder what he was doing in a place like this. Uh, come, we'll speak to Chavert and find out. Hey, bonsoir, Chavert. Uh, bonsoir. Ah, I am honored with a visit from the inspector, the detector. Que voulez-vous? Since when does a visitor from the Deuxième Bureau have to explain his business, Chavert? Tell me, why was Slater here? And why did you argue? Ah, sure. He comes here to try and hire some of my apache. He has trouble collecting his gambling debts. I spit on him and his high class victims. Let the kind stick to themselves. I'm not bothered if I Pleasant fellow. Let's sit at the table, shall we? You might as well be as unobtrusive as possible. I shall rejoin you in a moment, monsieur. I wish to make some investigation. Watson, you seem to be a positive magnet towards the fair sex. Look at this uh, young lady heading for you. Oh, red hair, belly, and a painted face. Not my type, I'm afraid. Bonsoir, monsieur. Voulez-vous m'offrir un impératif? Uh, run along, young lady, and don't sit there. Oh, no, no, Watson. Where's your chivalry? Please sit down, won't you? Merci, monsieur. Then you don't recognize me. Of course I don't. Me. Never saw you before in my life. Whereas I've been keeping silence, Mademoiselle Elvira. Elvira? The wig is excellent, and the use of makeup superb, Mademoiselle. But I recognized you at once by the confirmation of your earlobes. Elvira, why are you disguised? Why'd they bring you here? Shh. I cannot speak now. You must get me away at once. Be careful. I'm being watched. We can't leave by the front way. But I know a back staircase that leads from the cellar. But there may be trouble. You take her, Watson. I'll guard the retreat. When the music starts again, dance with her. When you get to the back of the hall, slip out. I'll join you at the hotel. Look, 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 Holmes. Look who's coming to our table. It's that ghastly poet fellow we met at the casino. Andre Flandon. Pay no attention. I'll take care of him. Ah, once again, I meet my friend Sherlock Holmes. I have a new poem that I've composed in your especial honor. Dance, Watson, and good luck. All right, you are, Holmes. Come along, my dear. Come along. Your friends leave. Au revoir. Now, I shall tell you my poem. It begins... Elvira, my dear, I can't tell you how relieved I am to find you all right. Don't look so serious. Pretend that I'm some girl that you don't know. Laugh. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's better. Now, dance me toward that door in the corner. There we are. <laughs> now, let's slip through it. I can't see a thing. Follow me. There are stone stairs here. Careful. Where do these lead? To an alley. Oh, careful. The stairs turn here. There's a light coming up the steps towards us. Shut up! You did not think you could live so easily, did you, Elvira? Uh, I've been waiting for you. Look out, he's got an eye! But he can't see without his lantern. Where's that path? Uh, run, Elvira, I'll follow you. Run, run, run. You won't follow her! Oh, won't I? How'd you like that, you filthy swine? Watson, are you all right? Yes, Holmes, I'm quite all right. Then run, old chap. I'll take care of this end. See that the girl is safe. <laughs> Now that we're all safely back at the hotel, I can tell you, Holmes, that I hated leaving you in that filthy den. Inspector Rigaud had a revolver. It's more efficient than a knife, eh, Inspector? It was a near thing, Monsieur Holmes. You fought bravely, and so did your recumbent friend on the sofa there. Andre Flandon, the poet. I wondered why you brought him back here. For a poet, he uses his fists with surprising skill. He must be hurt. He seems to be unconscious. I think he's suffering from the effects of a trifle too much absinthe. I hadn't the heart to leave him. Ah, there you are, Mademoiselle Elvira. You're feeling no ill effects, I hope? No, Mr. Holmes. Splendid. Then, now that we're all assembled, supposing you tell us your story. Who kidnapped you tonight? It was one of Chavez's men. They made me disguise myself and swear never to see either of you again, on pain of death. Instead of which, we came to see you. We knew that Travers was connected with the spies. Now he is safely under lock and key. But we still don't know who is at the head of this organization. Can you give us any clues, Mademoiselle? I... I think that the man you want was waiting in the cab that took me to the Scarlet Worm. But he was masked and he never spoke. Can't you recall anything that might give us a clue? Oh, one incident, if it means anything. Chavez's man said to him, We go to the Scarlet Worm, eh? That is good. You also, you make worms, no? And then he laughed. He said this in French, of course? Yes, yes, he did. Then the case is solved. I'm an idiot. 
I should have spotted it sooner. The man you want, Inspector, is lying asleep on the... Look out! He's not asleep. Watson, he's got a revolver. Oh, no, you don't. Oh! He's gone to sleep again. Really, Watson, you're in splendid form tonight. But, Monsieur Holmes, why do you say that man is the culprit? You yourself gave me the clue, Inspector, when you told me that the criminal was an Englishman posing as a Frenchman. But you only met the fellow on two occasions, and then not for more than a few minutes. It was long enough to realize that Flandau was really an Englishman. The first time we met him, he quoted a poem that he said was translated from the French. The translation was, Grave as the grave, August as August heat. The poem could not have been translated from the French because both of those puns are possible only in the English language. But how did my repeating the conversation in the cab give you a clue, Mr. Holmes? Because it was another pun. In French, the word for worms and for verses is the same. There, spelt V-R-S. I see it now. When the man in the cab said, you make worms, he also meant, you make verses. Precisely, Watson. And thereby pointed directly at the poet there. With André Flandin, or whatever his real name is, in prison, I'm sure Mycroft will have no more trouble with his spiring. Ladies, of course you use a shampoo to wash your hair, but just a word of caution... There are many popular shampoos today which leave the hair lustrous but have a tendency to dry the hair. And that's why I advise you to always use Cremel shampoo. How right you are, Joe. Lovely Powers models were among the very first to discover the amazing, beautifying qualities of Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves hair with more brilliant, glossy, natural highlights. Yet under no circumstances does Cremel shampoo ever dry your hair. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Yes, after a Cremel shampoo, your hair actually radiates natural, brilliant luster. But Cremel shampoo is one shampoo you can buy today that has a beneficial built-in oil base, which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. So, ladies, be smart. Always wash your hair with Cremel shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining beauty, yet in no way hurts the texture. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Next week, what shall I tell you? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of how Sherlock Holmes, by solving an ancient musical cipher, managed to save the estates and restore the fortunes of the Earl of Moultrie. I call it the adventure of... Of Moultrie Abbey. Tonight's newest Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Naval Treaty. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of Maltry Abbey. <laughs> is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time to keep that pleasantest of all doctor's appointments, our weekly visit with our excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bell. Just in time to join me in a glass of port. The decanter's there on the sideboard. 
Help yourself and then settle down. Fine, Dr. Watson. I suppose you're already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey, isn't it? Yes, my boy, and in many ways I'm inclined to think it was one of the most singular adventures that Sherlock Holmes and I ever had. But before I begin the weird adventure of Moultrie Abbey, haven't you, haven't you got a word for our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men, neat-looking, well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer, keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kreml never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kreml keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men, if you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Kreml. If you're using some other hairdressing, change to Kreml. Then see if your hair doesn't look better than it ever did before. Better groomed, better looking when you use Kreml. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the venerable bead and the adventure of Moultrie Abbey? Well, Mr. Bell, that story began in Baker Street on the December afternoon many, many years ago. It was shortly after tea, I remember, when Sherlock Holmes, who'd been pacing up and down our room, suddenly stopped at the window and looked intently out at the street below him. After a few moments, my curiosity overcame me and I joined my old friend. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that on the pavement opposite there stood a young woman dressed in the height of Edwardian fashion. She wore a fur boa and a broad-brimmed hat, from under which she peeped up in a nervous, hesitating fashion at our windows, while her body oscillated backward and forward. Suddenly, with a plunge like the swimmer who leaves the bank, she hurried across the road and we heard the clang of our front door bell. Oh. Took her a long enough time to, to make up her mind in Holmes. Yes, Watson. I've seen those symptoms before in women. Oscillation on the pavement generally means an affair du coeur. She would like advice, but is not sure whether the matter is not too delicate for communication. Oh, she looked a pretty little thing. Perhaps some scoundrels jilted her. Oh, no, Watson. In such a case, the usual symptom is a broken bell wire. Here, I think we may deduce the young lady is not so much uh, angry as uh, grieved or perplexed. Why not meet her at the head of the stairs, old chap? Mm -hmm. I know Mrs. Hudson's rheumatism is bothering her. Yes, yes, of course I will. This way, young lady. It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I'm, I'm Dr. Watson. Won't you come along in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, this is my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? I'm Sybil Carter, and I need your help, Mr. Holmes. Then please be seated, Miss Carter. I presume it is Miss, since I see no ring on your wedding finger. Yes, it's Miss. Though that awful man, Jonathan Davis, would like to make it Mrs. Oh, I can quite understand any man. Won't oh, quiet, you? Watson. Oh, sorry. Oh, please tell me your problem, Miss Carter. Well, I can tell you in two words, gentlemen. Jonathan Davis wanted to marry me, and that was bad enough. But even to save the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't marry him. Now he wants Harold to leave the country and disappear. And when we think of the Abbey and the tenants, what can we do? I know that my brother's dead set against outside interference, but tonight is when we play the music. And if only you could be there. Well, that's, uh, that's considerably more than two words, Miss Carter. I'm afraid I can't make head or tail of any of them. Nor can I. Supposing you begin again and talk more slowly. Oh, very well, Mr. Holmes. Uh, perhaps it'll be better if I ask questions. You mentioned your brother's title. May I ask what that title is? My brother's Harold Carter, the 14th Earl of Maltry, and the poorest. Confidentially, we're in a dreadful way financially. Harold invested in Canadian copper last year. The market dropped recently and we were nearly wiped out. That's when this awful Jonathan Devers came on the scene. And who is uh, Jonathan Devers? Oh, he's a cousin of ours from South Africa. He's a dreadful bore, but extremely wealthy. And he, he wants to marry you, you sir? Yes, but even for the sake of the Abbey and the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't do that. Now he's offered Harold 50,000 pounds in cash if he'll go abroad and pretend to disappear. You see, Jonathan Devers is next of nail kin in line for the inheritance. So Mr. Devers is trying to bribe your brother to disappear so that uh, he may inherit the title and estates? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. 
In this particular matter, I fail to see how I can help you. Oh, but you can, Mr. Holmes. You see, the first Earl of Maltree, he was created by Henry VIII, you know, left a family motto. It's inscribed in our private chapel at the Abbey. It says, if the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable Bede. Bede or some fellow who works in the parish, isn't he? Bede, Watson, not Beadle. Oh, oh Bede. Bede. Yes, spelt B-E-D-E. Oh, Bede. Oh. The venerable Bede, if I'm not mistaken, was an 8th century monk who is revered not only as a saint, but as the first great English historian. Yes, Mr. Holmes. We have a statue of him in the chapel. And then we have a family custom that... <laughs> I know this may sound silly to you. Oh, don't worry, Miss Carter. I'm aware that some of these old, crusted superstitions often conceal surprising truths. Pray continue. Well, it's been passed down in the family that if ever the Maltrees were in trouble, they should play a very peculiar piece of music which he composed. Piece of music? What, a, what an odd idea. Extremely interesting. And uh, you're planning to play the music tonight, you say? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Heaven alone knows the Maltrees couldn't be in worse trouble than they are now. And I want you to be there. Only Harold doesn't. So I thought, if you'd be your violin, I could pretend that you would just come to hear the music. An excellent idea, Miss Carter. As I remember, Maltry Abbey is in Gloucestershire. Yes, Mr. Holmes, at Chipping Martin. An express leaves Paddington at 5.30. Perhaps we could travel together? Certainly. Mm, so it seems like a wild goose chase, Holmes. An eighth-century monk and strange music. Sounds like a lot of mumbo-jumbo to me. Where's your chivalry, Watson? In any case, surely you recall the singular affair of the Musgrave ritual? There's no telling what these old family customs may portend. So be a good fellow and pack your bag. There's no time to be lost. I'll just have time to show you the chapel before dinner, gentlemen. Thank you, Lord Carter. And uh, after dinner, I shall be happy to gratify your musical curiosity, Mr. Holmes. But you mustn't regard my sister's visit today too seriously. Sybil's an overly emotional girl. And quite frankly, I wish that she hadn't approached you. I feel that Maltry Abbey is my duty. I'll find some way to save it and my tenants. I uh, trust that the music will live up to its magical reputation. Well, this is the chapel. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful building. Must be very old. Oh, 16th century. The Abbey House was built nearly 100 years later. 16th century? Uh, hold your lantern a little higher, Dr. Watson. Uh, that's it. Now, I, I want to show you a prize possession. There you are. Magnificent. Quite magnificent. This, I presume, is the statue of the Venerable Bede that uh, your sister spoke of. Yes. It's an excellent specimen of 16th century wood carving. No particularly the delicate work on the beads of the rosary. Odd. Very odd indeed. What's odd, Holmes? The fact that the... How many times do I have to tell you to keep away from me, you filthy scum? Don't you take your whip to me, sir. I, I'm, I'm not doing nothing. Oh, what the devil's going on out there? Come on. Come on, you dear victims. See this. Oh, don't you lay your whip on me. Jonathan, what's the matter? Harold, I demand that you discharge this groom of yours. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Well, what's he done, Jonathan? He's been following me. Twice today I bumped into him in the grounds. Not half an hour ago I was taking a walk by the bottom of the tarn, and I found him skulking behind me. Now I bump into him sneaking after me here. I say you must discharge him, Harold. But he was only hired today. Ah, I suppose you're right. Wilson, you may collect a week's wages and leave in the morning. I wasn't doing no harm. Just trying to deliver a telegram. That's why I came here. Is one of you gents, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am he. Then this telegram come for you. I was only trying to find you when this son of a South African well, slave driver comes in. Oh, I'll have your blood. Just see if I don't. That's enough, Wilson. I clear off. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Oh, by the way, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Mr. Jonathan Devers. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Devers? Ah, yes. Sybil told me that you were having distinguished company at your musical soiree tonight. How are you, gentlemen? If excuse me. We'll see you at dinner, no doubt. Oh, bully. That poor devil of a groom was half his size. Mr. Devers mentioned that he was walking by the bottomless tarn half an hour ago. What, may I ask, is the bottomless tarn? Oh, it's a lake on the estate, just behind the gamekeeper's cottage. Well, there's a legend that it's fathomless. All I know is that some years ago, a prize heifer of mine was seen to fall in and drown. 
We dragged the lake, but no grappling hooks we could obtain touched the bottom. Interesting. Holmes, uh, the telegram that fellow brought you. Oh, yes, the telegram. Uh, give me the lantern, Watson. Uh, uh, Thanks. An extremely illuminating message. Read it for yourself, Lord Carter. Oh, it says nothing but my cousin's name, Jonathan Devers. And yet the message is quite eloquent. It is in answer to a query I made before leaving London. Who forced that market drop in Canadian copper which wiped out the Maltree fortunes? You mean that Jonathan deliberately smashed me, Holmes? It would seem obvious. Yes, it's perfectly clear the Devers covets the title and stop at nothing to get it. <sighs> Holmes, what am I going to do? What the devil am I going to do? We must wait until after dinner and hope that the musical composition may give us a solution to your unhappy problem. <laughs> that Sybil's played that rather dull piece of discordancy. I hope you're all satisfied. Naturally, the Maltree fortunes will be restored. Very funny, Jonathan. What do you make of it, Mr. Holmes? It's uh, curious. Very curious. Will you repeat that principal theme again, please, Miss Carter? Yes, of course. Thank you, Miss Carter. I think I begin to get a glimmering of the mysterious message. Yeah, blessed if I do. Sounds like a jumble of meaningless notes to Never me. Never mind, Dr. Watson. Your brilliant friend thinks that he saved the Maltry fortunes. In that case, Harold, I suppose you won't need to see Mr. Alexander in London tomorrow. Why, how did you know that? That your solicitor planned to start bankruptcy proceedings at the latest tomorrow? <laughs> I, too, have my investigators, Harold. They seem a bit more efficient than your great Sherlock Holmes. Good night, Sybil. Good night, gentlemen. Mm. Uh, there you are again. What are you doing, listening at the door, you filthy swine? I was just going to the kitchen. Oh! Uh, get to the tables where you belong. If I see that groom again, Harold, I'll break his neck. See that he goes tonight. How dare he speak to you like that, Harold? He's not master here. Not yet, Sue. But I can't hold on to the place much longer, and he knows it. You're a thoroughly unpleasant scoundrel, if you ask me. Mr. Holmes, you said the music gave you some clue to the message? It did, Miss Carter. But uh, it requires thought and a certain amount of uh, musical experimentation. I doubt if this music room would welcome the consumption of an ounce or two of shag tobacco. I think, therefore, that Watson and I will retire to our own room. With the aid of a pipe and my violin, I shall give the matter undivided attention. And tomorrow... Tomorrow, we... Moultrie Abbey will go into receivership. Not while Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Oh, thank you, Watson. A man of my... Uh, peculiar modesty and needs your constant reassurance. Uh, I can finally sleep at home. Then why not go to sleep, my dear well, chap? How can I when you keep scraping away that wretched fiddle? Da, 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 lot of rubbish. Sit up half the night. We'll get you. Oh, yeah, I'm going to sleep. When the mole trees are in need, seek the venerable bee. This music will solve the Maltree's problems. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Too bad that your solicitor is starting bankruptcy proceedings tomorrow. You must help us. You must. When the Maltree's in need, seek the venerable bees. I've got it. Watson, wake up, wake up. Uh, oh, uh, what's, uh, uh, what's up, Holmes? I've got the answer, Watson. I've solved the musical message. Before the night is through, I think we shall find the secret of Maltree Abbey. <laughs> Mr. 
just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and discover just what that secret is. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic? Cremel is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Cremel massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Cremel removes dandruff flakes, and it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Cremel daily for better groomed hair for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I, I'm just as confused as I'm sure you must have been when Sherlock Holmes awakened you. What was the musical message? Supposing I tell you the story in its actual sequence, Mr. Bell. I quickly dressed, and in the moonlight, Holmes and I stealthily crept down the corridor to Lord Carter's room. A few moments later, the three of us, carrying lanterns, started down the staircase leading to the main hall. Holmes, as we went into Lord Carter's room, I'm sure... That absolutely certain that I saw another door down the corridor, half open, and, and then close. Which door was it? The last one on the right. Well, that's Jonathan Zever's room. Well, I suppose he knows what we're up to, which I must confess is more than I do. Well, if I'm right, not even Devers can stop us now. You're being confined in mysterious homes. Will you tell me why we're heading for the chapel at two in the morning? In a few moments, I shall make the reason extremely clear to you, I hope. Well, yeah. here's the door. the stained glass windows over there. I swear there's someone with a lantern in the grounds outside. Our immediate problem is here, inside. Focus your lantern on the statue of the Venerable Bede, Watson. That's where the answer to the mortuary legend lies, I think. For heaven's sake, Holmes, I wish you'd be more explicit. Very well. Let me see if I can whistle those notes written in the musical theme. The notes are B, E, D, E, E, B-E-A-D. These notes were followed by a rhythmically repeated series of the note D four times. Surely now the pattern becomes clear. Well, the notes B-E-D-E -E obviously stand for Bede, the venerable Bede, and we're standing in front of a statue here now. But the second four notes are B-E-A-D. You yourself pointed out the rosary on the venerable Bede statue, Lord Carter. The notes B-E-A-D must refer to the beads of the rosary. That's why I became suspicious on first seeing the statue. The rosary did not come into use till almost five centuries after the Venerable Bede. Yet, his statue had one. Then, what does the repetition of the note D four times mean after the melody? I think it gives us the vital clue. D is the fourth letter in the alphabet, and it's repeated four times. Let's see what happens when we press the fourth bead on the Venerable Bede's rosary. So, by George, I think you're on the right track, Holmes. You are. Look at that section of wall behind the front. It's slid back. Come on. Let's see what it takes us to. There's a narrow stone staircase leading below. Well, I'll go first. Holmes, perhaps you have saved the Maltry fortunes after all. I hope so, Lord Carter. I hope so. Watch your head, Watson. Oh, must have built these steps for pigments. Holmes, do you suppose we'll find any hidden treasure down here? I shall suppose nothing, Watson. In a few moments, there will be no need for conjecture. Holmes, I'm afraid we've drawn a blank. What's wrong, Lord Carter? Now look for yourself. Hmm. A deserted crypt? Nothing but a few cobwebby old relics. Yes. A crucifix, a Bible, a gutted candlestick on the table here. Oh, they may have some small intrinsic value, but nothing else. Oh, I was a fool to have any hopes. I was expecting to find buried treasure. Wait a moment. Something, possibly the treasurer has recently been removed from here. Well, what makes you say that, Holmes? The room is thick with dust. 
And yet there's a large rectangular space free from dust on the table, as though a heavy folio volume had recently been lying there. By George, you're right, Holmes. And look here on the floor. Fresh footprints. Yes, someone has recently anticipated our discovery. Well, it's not very hard to guess who that someone was. Jonathan Devers. Aha. Observe these curious marks on the floor by the table. Four round dots rectangularly spaced. I should say that a Gladstone bag has been placed here. A bag that was undoubtedly used to remove the treasure. But why, Holmes? Why carry off a heavy book in a bag? Supposing that book were of priceless value, Watson. Suppose it were the heirloom of the Mortar family and its discovery by the rightful owner might save the estate. Yes. And I'm sure that Devers is quite capable of stealing it. The question is, though, what would he do with it? Precisely. And to answer that question, I shall try and imagine myself in the shoes of Mr. Devers. I'm a millionaire, and therefore I don't need the treasure. Too risk it to sell it anyway. All I want to do is to keep it from the more trees, so I'll destroy it. But how? I have the time or the opportunity to burn it. Difficult with a heavy book in any case. So I'm looking for some place to dispose of it where it may never be recovered. A fathomless lake on this estate. That'd be the place. The bottomless tar. Of course. Remember the devils told us earlier that he'd been walking by it this evening? Then let's go there as fast as we can. I can only pray that we're not too late. Look, look, look. There, in the moonlight. It's Jonathan Devers. He's running towards the edge of the lake. Yes, and he's carrying a Gladstone bag. Which means that we can run faster than he can. You have your revolver, Watson? Yes, yes, I have. Don't hesitate to use it. This devil's work must be stopped. Come on, faster, faster. Oh, we'll, we'll never catch him. He's at the edge of the tower. Drop that bag, Mr. Devers. You're too late, my friend. Drop it or I'll shoot. I'll drop it in the bottomless town. There. <laughs> uh, goodbye to the treasure of the Maltese. You devil. You've ruined me. I'll have the law on you for this. You're a common thief. I don't know how you'll prove it, Harold. There was my own Gladstone bag and I dropped it in the tarn. You don't even know what was inside it. But here comes the man who can tell us. Good Lord, it's Wilson, the groom fellow you discharged, Lord Carter. Well, what are you doing here, Wilson? What's that book you're carrying? I've just done what Mr. Sherlock Holmes told me to, sir. I was following Mr. Devers. When he put down the bag and went off to get his coat before coming out here, I thought there might be something valuable in it. I took out this book... And I'll fill the bag with a few rocks. Wilson, I'll No, you skin. won't, Devers. Or you'll end up in the town where you belong. Let me see the book, Wilson. Here you are, Governor. Thank you. Hold the lantern a little higher, Watson. That's it. Aha. These faded pages are written in monkish Latin of the 8th century, and the hand is of the same period. Unless all my researches on the datings of documents are valueless, these may be, they must be, the original manuscripts of the Venerable Bede himself. Good Lord, then they're absolutely priceless. And that means that the mall trees are saved. And you, Mr. Devers, will have the privilege of inspecting the interior of an English prison. Rubbish. What charge could you make? Common theft. Burglary. The proof would depend on the word of that filthy groom there. And who's going to believe the oath of a servant with a grudge over the word of a South African millionaire? I think it's high time that this uh, filthy groom disclosed his true identity. All right, Mr. Holmes. The gentleman, I'm Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. And a great credit to the force you've been, my dear Jones. Yes, indeed, you certainly have. Your impersonation of a country groom was masterly, quite masterly. And now, uh, let's return to the house, shall we? It's nearly three in the morning, and I think we've had enough excitement for one night. <laughs> satisfactory case, Watson, don't you think? As we head back to London, I must confess to a certain glow of satisfaction. The fortunes of the mall trees are restored, the villain foiled and in custody. And, uh, And Scotland Yard get the credit. You know that, of course, Holmes. Well, they deserve it. Anthony Jones is a very enterprising fellow. Yes, Watson, an immensely interesting case. You see, Maltry Abbey was, uh, from its name, one of the properties expropriated from the monks by Henry VIII, who created the earldom. Undoubtedly, the abbot had hidden the monastery's most valuable possession, the bead manuscript. Then I suppose the first earl discovered the hiding place and left the book there as a future security for the Maltry family. Exactly. Leaving the cryptic verse as a clue. If the Maltrys be in need, seek the venerable bead. Yes, I, I see it all now. You know, Holmes, to me, the whole case was worth it when I saw that girl's face light up 
as we told her the good news. I fear that I'm less impressionable, old chap. For me, my retrospective pleasure in this case lies in the fact that an irreplaceable treasure has been saved. And uh, that a monk who died 12 centuries ago will have been responsible for restoring the fortunes of a fine old family. Yes, Watson, I think that in many ways you might refer to this as uh, our most successful case. Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Ladies, you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory. And how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair. Never under any circumstances. And it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel Shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel Shampoo whips up a luxurious active foam even in the hardest water. You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that Divinely Beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I shall tell you how Holmes managed to trap a fiendish murderer who had terrorized a pretty little English country village. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the tolling bell. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now for our weekly visit to the famous chronicler of Sherlock Holmes, our good friend, Dr. Watson. Well, Dr. Watson, how are you this evening? Oh, in the best of spirits, Mr. Bell. Thank you. And you? Never better, thank you. And am I correct in deducing that that faded old newspaper lying upon your desk has something to do with the story you're going to you tell us tonight? You are indeed, Mr. Bell. Here you are. The London Times of September the 4th, 1903. Take a look at this. Hmm. Judges summing up to jury interrupted. Sensational solution by Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, I think that you will find it equally sensational, Mr. Bell. It was one of Holmes's most dramatic cases. But uh, first, you want a word with our listeners. Go ahead, well... Well, I light up the pipe. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Men, in summer when you go without your hat, does your hair get dry, wild, and unruly looking? After a swim, does it feel sticky and stringy? 
Then remember, Kreml hair tonic keeps dry, wild, sun-baked hair looking perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. As if your barber had just combed it. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair neatly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Kreml always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. It leaves the scalp feeling so cool, so refreshed and alive. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. And now that I see you've got your pipe drawing to your satisfaction, Dr. Watson, how about the story you promised? Well, well, Holmes and I had just returned from a long-anticipated holiday in Scotland. Mrs. Hudson greeted us with the news that a lady was at that moment awaiting us in our rooms. And as we opened the door... Oh, Mr. Holmes, at last, thank heaven. I beg your pardon. You must save him. He didn't do it. I know he didn't. And they'll hang him. They'll hang him. No one in the world but you can help him now. Now, my dear madam, you must control yourself. I can't possibly help you until I know your problem. Oh, you... You must excuse me. Uh, Here, 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 my dear. You you drink this. It'll, It'll make you feel better. Oh... Thank you. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Holmes, praying for your return for days. You left no forwarding address. I know. Dr. Watson and I had promised ourselves a real holiday. I'm Edith Fairmont. Evidently, that name means nothing to you. You haven't seen the newspapers? No, not for four weeks, thank him. Compose yourself, madam, and tell us what has brought you here. And remember that we know nothing beyond the obvious facts that you are in great distress and uh, from your apparel recently widowed. Well, I, I shall try to give you a clear account, Mr. Holmes. You're my one remaining hope. Some ten years ago, I married Augustus Fairmont, a marriage which, I frankly admit, was forwarded more by my parents than by any wishes of mine. I was then only 18. Augustus was more than 20 years older than I. He was a diamond importer, and a very successful one. Our marriage was perhaps not an ideally happy one. But for ten years, I... I did my best to be a good wife to Augustus. No, 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 my dear. Just, just uh, please continue, easy, Mrs. Fairmont. About a year ago, my husband took into partnership with him a young man of 32, Charles Rossiter. During the ensuing months, Charles and I fell in love, Mr. Holmes. But I assure you that both my self-respect and Charles's high sense of honor kept us from anything more than a declaration of that love. Oh, I beg you to believe that I'm telling you the entire truth. I'm sure you realize, Mrs. Fairmont, that that is the only thing to do. Yes, of course, of course. Charles wanted to discuss our problem with my husband, but I persuaded him to let me approach Augustus. But the result was as I had anticipated. Afterward, I met Charles for tea, as we'd agreed, to tell him what had happened. Edith, my dear... I thought you'd never get here. Oh, it was difficult, Charles. Even more difficult than we expected. I... I hate to tell you this, my dearest. You don't have to tell me. I knew as soon as I saw you. Augustus refused even to discuss the possibility of giving me a divorce. You know how violent his temper is. He... he really frightened me. I wish you'd let me speak to him. Oh, I'm glad I didn't. His hatred for you is great enough as it is. But how can he want to hold you tight to him in marriage knowing that you love me... I should think that any decent Evidently, you don't know Augustus very well. He has an almost abnormal sense of possession. But whatever belongs to him, he'll keep, no matter what the cost. Very well, then. We've tried to do the right thing. Since he won't give you a divorce, there's only one thing left. Leave him. You and I will go to America or the continent and, and make a new life there for ourselves. I can't, Charles. You know that I love you, but we could never find happiness in that sort of life. I want to be your wife, Charles, to have children. And since that's denied us, we must stop seeing each other. I shall always love you, dear. Edith, you can't go out of my life like that. There's no other way. Goodbye, my darling. That was the last meeting I had with Charles, Mr. Holmes. I see. Go on, Mrs. Fairmont. Well, my husband and Charles were, under the circumstances, equally anxious to dissolve their partnership. They agreed to make a final trip to Amsterdam to complete a transaction which they'd previously arranged, after which the business was to be dissolved. 
Uh, how long ago was this? A little more than a month ago. The day before they left, my husband, uh, telling me that he was unable to find the revolver which he always carried when transporting valuable shipments of diamonds, asked me to buy him a new one. I did so, and he took it with him when he sailed. Two days later, having completed their business in Amsterdam, Charles and my husband started back to England aboard the night boat from Flushing. My husband had with him over 10,000 pounds worth of unset diamonds which they'd purchased. I assume, Mrs. Fairmont, that this part of your narrative is all uh, hearsay. What I'm telling you now, I've learned from the police. Charles and my husband had adjoining cabins on the boat. It was a foggy night in the North Sea. And about midnight, a German gentleman in the cabin adjoining my husband's on the other side from Charles's heard the sounds of a violent quarrel between Charles and Augustus. <laughs> Stuart! Yes, Mr. Smith? What can I do for you? Listen to that bellowing in there. Is this a cattle boat? How can I sleep with such a theft? Look, the noise going on. Oh, I'm very sorry, sir. The, the gentleman do seem a bit agitated, like. I'll knock on the door. I'm sorry, sir, but there's been a complaint from some of the passengers regarding the noise. Oh, all right. There you are, Mr. Smith. If there's any more disturbance, just ring for me. If there is any more disturbance, I go to the captain. For an hour now, I have been trying to get to sleep. What was that? That was a shot, you dumb cop. Come. It's locked. Well, break it down. Oh, good evening. That man is dead. Dead as a doornail. It's Augustus. What's happened? You ask what has happened? With that man dead on the floor and you in the doorway between your cabins? Here, Stuart, get the captain. I'll watch this murderer until you come back. There, 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 Mrs. Fairmont. I can understand what a strain it must be for you to tell all this. Uh, let me get you some aromatic... Oh, I, I'm all right, Dr. Uh, Watson. Thank you. Your husband had died instantly, Mrs. Fairmont? So the police said, Mr. Holmes. Apparently the revolver had been fired at very close range, directly into his head. They said he must have fallen dead on the instant. And the revolver? Well, it was gone, Mr. Holmes. The porthole which gave onto the sea was wide open. The police, of course, say that Charles threw the revolver out of the porthole after shooting Augustus. The bullet was a thirty-two caliber, the same as the one I had purchased at my husband's request. And uh, what has Mr. Charles Rossiter to say? Well, what is there for him to say? Oh, quiet, Watson. Oh, I don't blame you for thinking that Charles is guilty, Dr. Watson. Everyone in the world thinks so. But I know that he isn't. He has sworn to me that it's a complete mystery to him, and I believe him. If I didn't believe him, there'd be nothing left to live for. The police arrested him, of course. Oh, naturally. He, he goes to trial at the Old Bailey tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must save him. You must. You're my only hope. No one else can do it. Say that you will. I cannot promise that, Mrs. Fairmont. I'll uh, undertake the case, but you must understand that anything I discover, even though it may be evidence damning to Mr. Rossiter, will be turned over to the police. That's all I ask. I know he's innocent, and I have faith that you'll prove it. I beg you not to indulge in any false hopes, Mrs. Fairmont. I shall do my best to uncover the truth, but we have little time at our disposal. You omitted to mention what had happened to the diamonds... Were they found on your husband's person? Oh, I... I almost forgot. They seemed so unimportant. The diamonds were missing, Mr. Holmes. Huh? Missing? Oh. How do you come for that? The police think that Charles was going to steal them. And that suddenly realizing the impossibility of the idea, he threw both them and the revolver out of the porthole. Odd. Well, with the trial starting tomorrow, Mrs. Fairmont, Watson and I have much to do... Our first task must be a complete examination of the police records of the case. I know you'll excuse us if we hurry off, Mrs. Fairmont. Our first call must be on Mr. Charles Rossiter in prison. And as heaven's my witness, Mr. Holmes, I've told you and Dr. Watson everything I know. You say that you and your late partner had taken out business insurance on each other's lives? Yes, Mr. Holmes. To the extent of uh, 25,000 pounds apiece. 25,000 pounds apiece? I say that makes it look even worse, Holmes, huh? Unfortunately, yes. 
Uh, one more question, Mr. Rossiter. After the quarrel on the boat, when the steward had knocked and requested silence, you went back into your own cabin. Is that correct? It is, Mr. Holmes. And according to you, you heard the sound of a shot from Fairmont's cabin a moment later. How much time would you say had elapsed? Oh, a very short interval, not, not more than 15 seconds at the outside. Thank you. Well, Mr. Rossiter, I'll do what I can, but... Uh... Oh, I know it's hopeless. I wouldn't believe the story myself if I heard it from someone else. Tell me, Dr. Watson, you're a medical man. Could I conceivably have had a lapse of memory? Could I have shot Fairmont without knowing anything about it? Well, it seems to me almost inconceivable. I never heard of a case of amnesia or loss of memory that began and ended all in the space of a couple of minutes. Well, come on, Watson. We must be going. Mr. Holmes, do, do you think there's any chance? Keep up your courage, Mr. Rossiter. There's always a chance. Uh, water. I say, Holmes, I grant you that Mrs. Fairman's a lovely woman and that young Rossiter had a lot of provocation. But why did you tell him that there was a chance... It hardly seems cricket to me. I told him that there was a chance, Watson, for the excellent reason that there is. Chance of what? Of acquitting Rossiter of a crime which he very obviously did not commit. What do you mean to say that... Come along, Watson. We have no time to stand about arguing. Rossiter's trial opens tomorrow morning. And if we're to secure the evidence we need, you and I have our work cut out for us. Evidence? Evidence of what? Evidence to convince a jury. The sequence of events is obvious, but it'll require a continuous chain of proof to convince a jury of Rossiter's innocence. Innocence? <laughs> On oh, my soul, Holmes, I think you must be mad. Prosecution has an absolutely clear-cut case. And you go on practicing about Ruster's innocence. If Ruster didn't shoot Augustus Fairmont, somebody must have. Somebody did, Watson. And a devilishly clever plot he invented, too. But if we're to save Rossiter from hanging, it's up to us to prove it. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll find out if Sherlock Holmes is able to prove it. Men, on hot, sticky summer days, your hair needs extra special care. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than keep your hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and keep and buy Kremel hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. Kremel gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. It keeps the hair perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. It never looks or feels greasy or sticky. In addition, Kremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the hair, the scalp, feeling so clean, refreshed, and alive. No wonder Kremel is preferred among America's most prosperous men. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily for better groomed hair and more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what steps did you and Sherlock Holmes take next to prove Rossiter's innocence? Well, Holmes and I hurried to the offices of Fairmont and Rossiter in Hatton Gardens. Assisted by Fairmont's chief clerk, a little dried-up wisp of a man, we spent the next hour in an intensive study of Fairmont's old checkbook stuff. There's no question of it, Watson. These regular payments, month after month, to Mademoiselle Elaine Dufour can only mean one thing. Oh, I don't see why. She might have been an old nurse of his or something. Really, Watson. Huh? One does not pay one's old nurse 50 pounds a month over a period of years. Oh, oh perhaps you're right. Thank heaven we found Mademoiselle Dufour's address. Why? Because you're leaving for Paris tonight. Huh? And I want you to bring back Mademoiselle Dufour no matter what means you use to persuade her. Oh, really, Holmes? What are you going to do? I won't be doing well while I'm off on this, on this wild goose chase. I have a few things to look uh, into, Watson. Quite a few things. And you performed the post-mortem yourself, Dr. McPherson? I did, Mr. Holmes. And I'm prepared to state my professional reputation that Augustus Fairmont would have been dead within a year, no matter what had been done. That disease had progressed too far for surgery to have been any use whatsoever. You uh, told the police this, of course. Oh, naturally. They weren't interested. All they cared about was the bullet which finished the fellow off. <laughs> Uh, 
Of course, you understand, Mr. Holmes, that after the police had finished, this cabin was all straightened up. New carpet on the floor, everything ship-shaped. Quite. And uh, Mr. Fairmont's body was lying right here. Is that right, Stuart? It was indeed, sir. And a fair turn he'd give me, with half his head blown off. And uh, this cabin and the adjoining one, occupied by Mr. Rossiter, are identical in every way? Yes, sir. Ah, I'd hoped to find something like this. What was it, sir? Take a good look at this, Stuart. I may need your evidence in court. This uh, rather deep nick here in the lower part of the brass rim of the porthole. Oh, I see the nick all right, sir, but I'm blasted if I can make Just it. tell me one thing. After the tragedy, was any heavy object missing from Mr. Fairmont's cabin? Uh, something heavy, but uh, fairly small? That's a queer thing, sir, now that you come to mention it. I reported to the chief steward that the heavy glass water bottle was gone when the police let me straighten up the cabin. But I didn't think nothing of it at the time, sir, except that maybe it got smashed in all the confusion. Thank you, steward. Thank you very much indeed. come back to England with you, Dr. Watson? Yeah, I do indeed, Mademoiselle Dufour. To go into court and tell everything? I know nothing about your English law. Perhaps I render myself liable to prosecution. All this for the sake of a man who I have never seen. Not only for his sake, Mademoiselle, but also for the sake of the woman who loves him. And, most important of all, for the sake of right and justice. To save a man from hanging for a crime that he did not commit. There's no way in which I can force you to come with me. I can only most earnestly beg you to do what we both know is the right thing. And in the final analysis, members of the jury, I must remind you that the decision as to Charles Rossiter's guilt or innocence rests solely with you. Under the law, my province as judge is merely to assist you in reaching a just verdict. And this I have endeavored to do by summing up for you the evidence to which we have been listening during these last three days. The prosecution has endeavored to prove to you that this man, who has not denied his love for Mrs. Fairmont, knew that they could never be together so long as her husband should live. You have heard the evidence of their quarrel on the boat, of the shooting and of the scene found by Mr. Schmidt, the steward, and the other witnesses when the door to the cabin was broken down. You have heard the suggestion of premeditation in the purchase of the weapon by Mrs. Fairmont, a weapon which, though missing, was of identical caliber with the bullet which killed her husband. You have heard the prisoner's protestations of innocence and his own inability to offer any logical explanation of the tragedy. Under these circumstances, is it... My lad, I beg leave to interrupt. Well, Sir Aubrey? What is it you want to say? During the entire trial, my lad, my client and I have put our hopes in an investigation being conducted by the eminent criminologist, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Mr. Holmes has just arrived in court, together with his colleague, Dr. Watson, who has brought with him from Paris a witness whose evidence is vital to the defense. I respectfully beg your lordship's permission and that of the prosecution to allow Mr. Holmes to tell us what he has discovered. Uh, <coughs> it is most irregular, Sir Aubrey, but the primary concern of this court is that justice be done. In view of Mr. Sherlock Holmes' distinguished record and many services to the law, I see no objection to granting your request. Thank you, my lord. I assure you that we would not have waited till so late in this trial to present our evidence had it not been for the fact that Dr. Watson has only at this moment arrived from Paris, escorting a lady who is the final link in that chain of evidence. Proceed, Mr. Holmes. The late Augustus Fairmont, married to a woman more than 20 years his junior, was a man with a very great sense of possession. Whether or not he loved his wife, he was determined that no one else should have her. And when his wife freely and honestly confronted him with her admission that she loved another man, Fairmont could think of nothing but revenge. Hmm. I'm willing to allow you a fair amount of latitude, Mr. Holmes, but this seems to have no bearing on the case. With your lordship's permission, I hope to establish its bearing in just a moment. 
I have here in court Dr. McPherson, who conducted the post-mortem upon the late Mr. Fairmont. Dr. McPherson will testify that Augustus Fairmont was suffering from an incurable disease which would unquestionably have killed him within another year. Violet! Violet's in the court! Also in court and ready to testify is Sir Edward Penrose of Harley Street, to whom Augustus Fairmont went for an opinion just a little more than six weeks ago. Sir Edward informed Fairmont, who had never before suspected the presence of this disease, that he would be lucky if he lived for six months and that there was nothing to be done. Now, Fairmont faced with the knowledge that he would die, probably painfully and lingeringly, within a few months at most. And the bitterness of this knowledge must have been increased a hundredfold by the realization that his death would remove the last barrier to the wedding of these two people who loved each other. Bravo, Holmes. Quiet in the court. Oh, sir. Then Augustus Fairmont evolved in his twisted mind a perfect plot. He would die, not lingeringly and painfully, but instantly. And in dying, he would make sure that Charles Rossiter, the man he hated, would be hanged for his murder. With his partner, Rossiter... With his partner, Rossiter, Fairmont sailed to Amsterdam. But when he had purchased some 10,000 pounds worth of diamonds, the thought crossed his mind of making a final provision for the woman whom, for many years, he'd been seeing in France. She's here now, due to Dr. Watson. And I will ask her to rise. <coughs> Mademoiselle Dufour, is it not true that Mr. Fairmont provided for you during the last six or seven years and that he visited you frequently during his trips to the continent? That is correct, Mr. Holmes. Now, will you please tell the court what you received in the mail from Mr. Fairmont the day after you read of his death? I received a package containing a small fortune in unset diamonds together with a letter from August saying that I would not hear from him again, that I should make no inquiries concerning him, and that these diamonds would provide me with sufficient funds for the rest of my life. Thank you very much, Mademoiselle Dufour. Quiet. Quiet in the courtroom. I think that will be all. Oh, magnificent, my dear. I so am very, very proud of you. Well Augustus done. Augustus Fairmont well done. provided for the woman with whom he had so long a friendship. He did this with a knowledge that he was to die that very night. On board the boat he purposely entered into a noisy argument with young Rossiter, an argument which ended with a steward knocking on the door. A moment later, Rossiter returned to his own cabin and shut the communicating door. <coughs> the instant he had done so, Fairmont took from its place of concealment the revolver which, with studied malice, he had caused his wife to buy. This revolver Fairmont had previously prepared for what he was about to do by tying a stout string from its trigger guard to the heavy glass water bottle he had taken from his cabin wall. It was the work of but a moment, after Rossiter had closed the door, to suspend the heavy bottle outside the porthole which gave directly upon the sea. Then, Fairmont raised the revolver to his head and pulled the trigger. As he fell dead, the revolver released from his hand was pulled sharply up and out of the porthole by the heavy weight of the bottle. It hit the edge of the porthole, nicking the brass rim, and then disappeared forever into the depths of the North Sea. Order! Order! This demonstration is stopped instantly. I shall have the courtroom cleared. My lad, in view of the evidence offered by Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the Crown withdraws its charge against Charles Rossiter. Oh, great work, Holmes. Great work. You brought it off, old man. I never could have, Watson, if you hadn't been persuasive enough to get Mademoiselle Dufour here oh, in time. Oh, you to say so, boy. Ah, look, look. Here comes Mrs. Fairmont. Oh, God bless you, Mr. Holmes. And you too, Dr. Watson. Oh, I, I've got to kiss you both. Oh, very nice. Upon my word, that's the nicest fee we've ever had. <laughs> Now, friends, our guest star, one of the greatest authorities on feminine beauty, that king of glamour, John Robert Powers. And you know, Mr. Powers is famous for his million-dollar Powers models. Gorgeous girls you often see on magazine covers, in the movies, in exclusive fashion shows. Ladies and gentlemen, by special transcription, Mr. John Robert Powers. Good evening, friends. I have a little surprise for you this evening. 
as I brought along one of my most attractive powers girls of all times, Ellen Allardyce. And perhaps we can get Ellen to tell us how she keeps her hair so bright and shining. Will you, Ellen? I owe all that to you, Mr. Powers. Do you remember how you told me to always wash my hair with cremel shampoo? I certainly do, Ellen. I tell all my Powers girls to use cremel shampoo. I'm thoroughly convinced that no other shampoo leaves the hair more radiant with such natural, brilliant luster. And cremel shampoo keeps it that way for days. What I like about cremel shampoo is that it never dries the hair. That's right, Ellen, because cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base. This oil base actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry and brittle. I know it. Cremel shampoo always leaves the hair so much silkier with a lovely natural satin sheen. And I love the way cremel shampoo whips up just lots and lots of luxuriant active foam, even in the hardest water. Ellen, I think every girl owes it to herself to try cremel shampoo. I feel certain she'll be in for one of the greatest beauty thrills of her life. Because without a doubt, in all my years spent in helping women become more attractive, I've never come across a more beautifying shampoo than cremel shampoo. Many, many thanks to you, Mr. Powers, and to your very lovely Powers model, Miss Ellen Allardyce. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, yes, next week, in answer to many requests, I think I shall tell you about the most gruesome and most horrifying experience that Holmes and I ever had. It concerns the frightening happenings at Stoke Moran, the home of Dr. Grimesby Roylet, and tells how Holmes solved the mystery of the death of one of Dr. Roylet's two daughters and prevented the murder of the other. I call it The Adventure of the Speckled Band. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Problem of Thor Bridge. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at the same time. And Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Speckled Band. BC, the American Broadcasting Company. Portions of the following program are transcribed. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Is uh, this the Diamond Detective Agency? Well, what does the sign on the door say? Yeah, the Diamond Detective Agency. And take a guess. Uh, are you Mr. Richard Diamond? It depends. How much does he owe you? Uh, uh, nothing. You just want to speak to him? I do. You come as a client? Yes, I do. You have a hundred a day in expenses? Yeah, I do. Then I now pronounce this man and client. Your name, please? Uh, my, my name is Thomas Jason. The stockbroker? <laughs> you better pay cash. Oh, I, I'm retired now, Mr. Diamond. And to end this uh, nonsense, here's your hundred dollars. Oh, thank you. Now, what's your trouble? Uh, it's Carol, uh, my adopted daughter. We adopted her when she was 12, but my wife died shortly after. Frankly... Carol has been trouble ever since. And now? Uh, now, I I'm afraid it is no longer a matter of delinquency. I, uh, yeah. Well, there have been several incidents that make me suspect that she's trying to do away with me. Oh, sweet girl. What's her reason? Uh, my money. 
In my will, she is my only heir. Why not change the will? Uh, I said I suspected her, but I'm not certain, Mr. Diamond. And you understand, it would be terrible to disinherit her if I am wrong about my suspicions. I, I, I simply must be sure before I change my will. Do you have any idea of your suspicion? Uh, yes, yes, yes. This morning I did speak to her. They mentioned the possibility of cutting her from my will. She flew into a rage, made several terrible threats. Oh, what do you want me to do? Uh, well, sir, I want you to... Uh... Oh, excuse me. Diamond Detective Agency, we have the only corpse with the lie-down design. Oh, Rick, why don't you answer the phone right? Okay, Helen, baby. Diamond Detective Agency, Mr. Richard Diamond speaking. What? See, it throws you. Uh, uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, honey, I'll see you tonight. i got a client. She? He. Good. Bye. Uh, you were saying, Mr. Jason, before I was so nicely interrupted... Yes, I, I want you to either prove my fears to be true or groundless. If I am right... I will change my will, of course. Where do I start? Uh, come to my house at three this afternoon. Here's the address. I'll introduce you to my stepdaughter, Carol, as a business acquaintance. After you've met and talked with her, I'll give you what details I have about her threats and actions. Okay, Mr. Jason, I'll be at your place at three this afternoon. Uh, good day, Mr. Diamond. I checked the time and found it would be nearly twelve, so I beat it out to grab a bite of food before the noon rush began. Cafes in downtown Manhattan at lunchtime can only be compared to a can of sardines after all their relatives move in. When I had downed my daily bread, I went back to the office, did a little washing, and found myself with still time to kill. So being interested in my new client's problems and always liking a clear view of a new case, I dropped in at the 5th Precinct to see what Lieutenant Levison had on the Jason family. When I walked into the squad room, I found Sergeant Otis tilted back in his chair with his number 14s crossed on the desk in front of him. From the sounds he was making, he was either sleeping or gargling with molasses. Sergeant Otis. Oh, boy. Sergeant Otis. Some down. Otis, wake up. Oh, what? Oh. Oh. Oh, it's you, Salmons. Patrol leader Diamond with his stout hearted brownies, who are shocked by your dreams. Shame on you. Hey, how'd you know I was dreaming about a dame? I peeked. You know, I think I'll tell the lieutenant that you were sleeping on the job. Well, oh, oh, no, please don't do that, Shamus. You'll start me pounding the beat again. Please don't tell him. Well, maybe I'll let you off the hook, but only if you tell Walt we're pals. That might stop him from giving me the devil about ribbing you. Pals? You mean friends? Buddies. Oh, no, I couldn't stand it. Hello, Walt. Okay, so where's the body? Nobody. You lost one? Now you stop that. Well, get you. All bad because I can't find a body for you. Oh, please, Rick. What do you want? I just wanted any dope you might have on the Thomas Jason family. Jason? Yeah, the broker. Oh, oh nothing on him, but plenty on his stepdaughter, Carol. Like what? Oh, she's a regular. Usually D&D, &D, drunk driving, disturbing the peace. You want to see the file? Yeah, I might be worth a look. Uh, have my pal, Otis, bring it in. Sure, up. You what? My pal. What did you know? It is not your friends. <laughs> is that why he tries to hide under the desk every time he sees you coming? Call him in. See for yourself. You think I won't? Otis, get the file on Carol Jason. Bring it in here. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. <laughs> now we'll see. Friend, <laughs> that's a laugh. <laughs> that's a laugh yourself. You better be feeling good. Yeah, what do you mean by that? You'll see. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Here's the file. I'll take uh... it, Otis. Thank you very much. Sergeant Otis, you have an opportunity to do me a great favor. Please, and without profanity, tell me what you think of Rick. Oh, he's nice. What? You're turning blue, Walt. I'll turn blue if I want to. What did you do to Otis? Dope him? You heard him. He thinks I'm nice. We're pals, buddies. I heard him all right, but I wouldn't believe it on a stack of police manuals. Otis, I'll give you one chance. What's this all about? The shamus told you, Lieutenant... I think he's a swell, like a great guy. Thank you, Otis, my uh, friend. Always kidding, but a good pal. Otis, do your feet ache? My feet? Why, no, Lieutenant. Well, they will. I'm sending you to a beat. A beat? Yes, in Yonkers. Oh, no! I went through the file on Carol Jason and found out Walt hadn't been kidding. She'd been picked up for everything from kicking dogs to slugging her boyfriend with a champagne bottle. Real nice girl. 
I left Walt trying to third degree the truth out of Otis and headed for what I hoped would be a nice, easy case. In a few minutes, I was in front of my client, Jason's house on East 66th Street. It turned out to be a modest little shack of some 30 rooms with a brownstone cover. I was ushered in to wait in the library for Thomas Jason. But I got a surprise. Mr. Diamond? Well, now I'll bet you're Carol. Your stepfather's told me so much about you. You're a friend of my stepfather's? Well, uh, you might say we have things in common. Where is he? I'm afraid you can't see him, Mr. Diamond. You see, he's become quite ill. Oh, ill so quickly? I talked to him a few hours ago. He's about as sickly as Paul Bunyan. Mr. Diamond, will you please leave? Not until you tell me what happened to Jason, where he is, and why I can't see him. Get out. Do you hear me? Get out. Oh, put a cork in it, honey. Your father suspected trouble. Apparently, it came quicker than he thought. Me, I want to know all your little secrets. Just who are you? Policeman? Private policeman, dear. Your father hired me this morning. Well, I'm firing you this afternoon. Father's ill and I will not allow him to be disturbed. He paid me for a day's work. Tomorrow you can fire me. Is he here? No. Now, will you get out or do I call the real police? Oh, maybe you'd better, dear. There's a smell around here that isn't a room full of roses. All right. If it's going to save trouble, I will tell you this much. Father had a serious mental condition. This afternoon, a couple of hours ago, he had an attack. And I was forced to have him taken to a place where he could be treated properly. With what? Embalming fluid? Why, you insulting... Where was he taken? Who's the doctor? I think I've answered all the questions I need to, Mr. Diamond. My actions are entirely legal. If you persist in your insinuations, I shall see that your license is revoked and that you are charged with defamation of character. Oh, get you. You've been reading up on the law, and I bet I know why. All right, dear. I'll leave now. Go on, and don't come back. Temper, temper, temper. I'm going, but we'll see each other again. Uh, hello, Pop. Got a minute? Yeah. You reckon so, Misty? What's on your mind? Oh, questions. Like how long you've been out here mowing the lawn? Uh, most of the day. Why? Did you, uh, see Mr. Jason leave? Oh, sure. Left in an ambulance, he did. He was wearing a funny white coat with the arms tied in back. Oh, my fashion certainly changed. You didn't notice any name on the ambulance, did you? Well, as a matter of fact, I did, Mister. Oh, my, it was a silly name. About the silliest I've ever heard of. Oh, the name, Pop. What was it? Oh, don't be in such a dang rush. It was uh, Home Sweet Home Rest Home. Oh, no. Ain't that silly? I don't think my client agrees with you. If he was taken there for a rest, it may be a permanent one. Next stop, a drugstore with a phone book. Said book gave me the address, and I was soon in Baychester, looking at something pretty swank in the way of nuthouses. Home Sweet Home was two acres of lawn, trees, and a square white blockhouse, and all surrounded by 15 feet of spiked steel fencing. By this time, the setup was really beginning to smell, and I decided that maybe a shamus might not be welcome. So for a moment, I stood by the big gate debating how I could get in. The answer was fairly simple. I rang the bell. It caused a huge character wearing a white jacket with arms like hairy telephone poles to appear. Yeah. What can I do for you, mister? Now, let me in. Why? This is a rest home, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I want to rest. Oh, funny. Beat it. I want to speak to the doctor, King Kong. Is he in? Maybe, maybe not. Who wants him? I do. Who are you? Uh, let's just say I'm a patient. You going to keep me out here dying of schizophrenia? Dr. Thorne is busy now. Come back later. Look, in one minute I start throwing fits. Think how that'll ruin your trade. Yeah, the doc wouldn't like that. Maybe you had better come in. Now, that's right neighborly of your friend. Wow. Nice place. For nuts? Please. I'm a patient, remember? So, if you're a nut, I should care. If you ain't, why should you? Now, that's a homely bit of philosophy. Tell me, what do you do here, break skulls? I don't think I like you. And I'm a nurse. What a shock this will be to Dr. Kildare. I don't know him. Now, you wouldn't. His nurses are pretty. If he had to have you as a nurse, he'd quit medicine and take up playing the glockenspiel. Well, you're nuts. Wait here. I'll get the doctor. Yes, nurse. Dr. Thorne, you got a patient, I think. All right, Brazo. 
I am Dr. Thorne, sir. What can I do for you? He's not stuck. Be quiet, Brazo. Oh, he's right, Doc. I, I'm nuttier than a squirrel's hideout. Well, I'm afraid I can be of no assistance, uh, Mr. Promise you won't tell? Is I promise? I am Sherlock Holmes. What? H O L. I can spell. I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place, Mr. Holmes. This is a private sanitarium, and certain procedures must be followed. I have money, I can pay, and I want to stay here. But, Mr. Holmes, you must be examined by a doctor and committed by a relative. You're a doctor? Examine me. But your relative, you you can't commit yourself. Why not? I demand my rights. Oh, this is preposterous. This is not a hotel. You can't just come in and register. Tell me, uh, who's your doctor? Where is your home? Well, look, look. Tell you what, you let me stay here for the day and I'll tell you who my doctor is. And if you don't let me stay, I'll tell everyone what a bad place you have. Uh, you, uh, you said something about having um, money. Just how much money? I've got a mattress full. Can I stay? Well, perhaps it can be arranged. Though, of course, I must examine you. Of course. And there will be a certain um, fee, you understand? Mm, I'm beginning to. Tell me, Mr... Um, H-O-L- uh, stop! You certainly are most annoying. Tell me, why do you want to stay here anyway? Well, I, I've got to stop the plot. The, the plot? You know about that? Sure. You plan to rub out fearless Fosdick, but I'm not going to let you. Oh, I see. Tell me, do you, uh, do you have any dreams? Well, of course. I have dreams about eating ice cream cones, and oh, what a mess they are. What's so messy about eating an ice cream cone? My mouth is always filled with BBs. BBs? For my air rifle, stupid. How else could I stand off the Indians? Well, what Indians? Well, the Indians who want to steal my ice cream cones. Now, why would Indians want your ice cream cones? Oh, they're mad about pistachio. You are crazy, aren't you? Brazo, take Mr... Um... H-O-L. Oh, never mind. Take him to observation room B, Brazo. I don't have time for the examination now. Uh, wait, uh, can't I be with the other patients? I get lonely. Later, later. Come on, Sherlock. This way. Well, I was in, thanks to the good doctor not being able to pass up a possible easy buck. The big ape Brazo led me to a small room with bars on the window and a spring lock on the door. When he left, I made like a smart gumshoe and went after the lock with my penknife. Due to my early training in picking locks at the automat, I was out like Alabama. I found myself in a long hall with seven rooms, three on each side and one at the end. I knocked on every door. Nothing. Not even Bogart. The last one had to be Jason. Are you in there, Mr. Jason? Diamond. Oh, oh, I am glad to hear your voice. Please, get get me out of here. Now, just take it easy. I don't have a key and this door has a padlock on it. But you must get me out. Sure, sure, but give me time. First, tell me what's the score. Why did they lock you up? Carol had it planned. She has paid Dr. Thorne to keep me here until I go crazy. She wants to have me judged legally insane so she can take the estate. Yeah, well, maybe I can put a few kinks in her plan. Wait, wait Diamond, where are you going? Uh, there's a phone in the doctor's office. If no one's there, I'll use it to get help. But what if you can't get to the fault? And I go out and get the Marines. If I can get by that ape man, that locked gate. Don't go away. Oh, there you are, Sherlock. Oh, don't pick on me. I was only three and a half years old. Yeah, I'm upset with you, Sherlock. You oughtn't to be running around the halls like this. Well, huh? That guy's got to have his constitutional, Brazo. Yeah, well, you're true with yours. The doc wants to examine you now. I've, I've, I've changed my mind. I, I don't think I no, like it I said the doc wants you what the doc wants he gets. Well, bully for him, but this is one time you won't. I'm leaving. I don't want to break your arm, Sherlock. No? So you don't leave until the doc says so. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint him, but certain things are necessary, like this. Oh. Now, you shouldn't act like oh. that. I might get mad. Oh, my knuckles. What is your jaw made of, concrete? Uh, come on, Sherlock. Or do you want to try again? Uh, no, thanks. One busted hand is enough. And don't try to run. The gate's locked. And if I have to catch you, <laughs> I'll fix your legs so you can't run again. A oh, friendly little butcher, aren't you? Uh, right in here, Sherlock. The doc is waiting. <laughs> here he is, Doc. Good. <clears throat> you can go back to the office, Brazo. I won't need you. Well... You seem to be well-trained as a detective, Mr. Holmes. Do you always pick locks so easily? I do better with my erector set. Uh, But you needn't examine me further. I've changed my mind. You've changed your... 
This is on. First you demand in, now you want out. I just remembered I forgot to pick up my station wagon. But the Indians, you want me to help you keep them from stealing your ice cream cones, don't you? Uh, they already got them, and all my money, too. They're both gone. Your money? Then you don't have any money? Not a bolivar. Now, may I go, Doctor? You're going to stay right here, Mr. Holmes. There's something peculiar about the way you've recovered from your illusions. Uh, Doc, uh, Miss Jason to see you. She's in your office. Very well, Brazo. Stay here and guard this man, whoever he is. Uh, Holmes, age old. Will you shut up? And make sure he stays put this time, Brazo. I have some questions I want to ask him. He won't go in the place, Doc. You go ahead to the office. Well, Carol... This is a pleasant surprise. Come to visit Jason. So, and our plans will have to be changed. Changed? Something has come up that may cause an investigation of stepfather's illness. We can't afford to take a chance of that. But we can't let Jason go now. I had no such intentions. He must be taken care of tonight. Taken care of? But that's impossible. How could I... He must be gotten rid of. What? Oh, no. No, I didn't bargain for murder. Look, Thorne, you're in and you stay in. I paid you $10,000. Don't forget it. But why all this sudden rush to change our plan? Why can't we A private it? detective came to see me this morning. He was hired by stepfather. I knew he had suspicions, but I didn't know they'd gone so far. A detective? Oh, he can't act legally, but he's a sort to cause trouble. Detective. Private detective. Sherlock Holmes. He's rambling about. I'm afraid we're in serious trouble. Come with me. What? Your private detective. I think he's already found Jason. Come on. Now you wouldn't like to earn a hundred bucks, would you, Brazo? No. It is you, Diamond. Uh oh, fun's over. Thorne, you fool. How'd he get in here? He said he was a patient, Carol, and I swear he seemed crazy enough. He probably said he had money. Uh, you seem to understand each other, honey, but do you mind? I'd like to take Mr. Jason home For now. For a couple of extra dollars, you let him walk right in. Oh, Thorne, you're an idiot. I suppose he found Jason and talked to him. Well, he did get out of his room and wander about. Oh, that's great. So now he knows the whole works. Uh, too bad, baby. Your plan is kaput. No, it's White Diamond. You've just talked yourself into real trouble. This gun says for you not to get any bright ideas. My IQ just dropped 30 points. Shut him up, Rizzo. Sure. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh! Now, stay with him while Thorne and I make arrangements. We won't be long. <laughs> Do I get the... Yes, Rizzo, when we're ready. Yeah. Come on, Thorne, I want to talk to Stepfather. <laughs> Brazo's fist was made of the same stuff as his jaw. By the time I came around, darkness had painted the window, and the room was full of shadow and Brazo. The big hulk was squatting a few feet away, paying no attention to me. So I waited till my mind was clear while I eased off my right shoe. The heel was leather with a steel plate in it. I could only hope it was harder than Brazo's skull. With the shoe in my hand behind me, I was ready. Only to have him catch me stirring. <laughs> Coming to, eh, Shamus? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, hand me my cigarettes, will you, Brazo? You need a smoke, eh? Oh. <laughs> sure. Uh, where, where are they? Uh, fell out of my pocket, uh, over there behind you. Oh, where, where? I don't see you. <laughs> I say, that's not... Need another? Oh. Stop that. Oh, come on, Buster, fall. <laughs> well, is little old Brazo finally getting sleepy? Happy New Year, Buster. Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick, if you don't want me to be a customer of yours, get out to the home sweet home rest home fast. What? Hey, what kind of a gag is this now? It's no gag, believe me. My client and I are the blue plate specials and dinner is about to be served. The home sweet... Oh, it still sounds like a gag. Who'd call anything that? Now, don't argue, Walt. It's no joke. Okay, Rick. What's the address? 1820 Allerton Avenue, Baychester. And bring a blowtorch to cut an iron gauge. You may have to. All right. I'll be there in 30 minutes. Uh, quicker, if you can. Stand right there, Diamond. Or I'll use this gun. Uh, good afternoon. I represent the sleep Looks like I more... came just in time. Only now that you've fixed Brazo, you have to dig your own grave. Dig my own grave? Oh, honey, is this trip really necessary? Keep moving or I'll kill you right here. I, I move. Keep going. Over there behind those trees where Thorne and Jason are. Oh, well, is Jason... He's alive, but not for long. Where's Brazo? I thought he was going to... Diamond knocked him out. I can dig their own graves. There, the shovels. Get busy. Carol, please, you may have the money. I swear... Shut up and dig. Carol, this is... Just abs- work the shovel. Can you 
Can you imagine Richard Diamond, private detective, letting a sawed-off female make him dig his own grave? You can't? Well, she did. And for a good half hour. I stalled as long as I could to give Walt Levinson a chance to get there. That's enough. I said that's deep enough. Oh, please, I, I, I'm just started. You're finished. Jason, get into that hole with him. Uh, very well. I, I guess this is it, Diamond. I'm sorry to have dragged you in. Well, that's a horrible way to say it. Don't we get time for a last cigarette? No. Thorne, take this gun. What? Oh, no, I'm not going to kill them. Shut up and take this gun. Oh, don't do it, Thorne. Be a man about it. Here, Thorne. Don't be such a weakling. Two shots and it's over. No, it was your idea. I'm no murderer. Shut up, boy. Stick up for your rights. You shut up. Thorne, do you do the job or do I make you number three in that grave? You wouldn't dare. You, you need me. Shut up, boy, Thorne. Tell her. Go on, Thorne. Take the gun. No, I can't. I just can't. Not my face. You weakling. I'll do it myself. Now, turn around, Diamond. Oh, now, look, baby, this thing's getting out of hand. You shoot me and the law will be all over the place. Not until I've filled that grave in over you. I call them, baby. Oh, you're lying. Am I? Well, just turn around and take a look at that lovely big fat policeman standing over there by that tree. Oh, you really don't expect me to fall for an old stunt like that. Well, if you don't, you'll fall for something. It's your funeral. No, it isn't. It's yours. All right, lady, drop it. What? Why, you... Smarty. I'll kill you anyway. <laughs> Carol. Rick, what the devil's going on here? What are you doing down there? I'm looking at the girl. I, I think you shot her pretty bad. Who are these two guys? Now, the guy with the cast in that knees is Doc Thorne. Better put the cuffs on him as an accessory. But you can't do this. I was the one that re refused to shoot you. Oh, stop licking my hand. You can tell it to the precinct judge. Otis, snap the cuffs on him and take him out the car. Sure. Come on, you. Now, what about this other guy? The girl's stepfather. How do you feel, Mr. Jason? Sick, Mr. Diamond. How about the girl, Rick? Shall I call the ambulance? I don't know. Carol. Carol. Well, Rick? Ah, uh, take your time, Walt. She's not with us. I gave Walt the story, then took Jason to his house. Stayed there long enough to brush the dirt off my clothes, wash my hands, and then I headed for a delayed date. At 975 Park Avenue, I found the big fireplace and the lovely redhead waiting for me. A redhead wearing a dress that was part green silk and part... Well... I'm the library, darling. Come on in. Oh, uh, hello, Helen, baby. You sound like you found oil in the basement. What's with the cheer? Me? Isn't it always? I like you. Hmm, I like the way you say that. Looking up at me with those big green eyes. They're not green. They're hazel. Oh, are they? Hmm... Let me look closer. Uh, not until you sing for me. Sing? Oh, honey, I'm tired. I want to rest. No, you don't. No, over to the piano. No, Rick, not here. But, Helen, all I wanted to do was... I know, Rick. Oh, you've been using that Ouija board again. I don't want to sing. Now, look in my eyes. Close range? Contact. I'll sing. That's better. Like, uh, you must have been a beautiful baby. I love it. You must have been a beautiful baby You must have been a wonderful child When you were only starting to go to kindergarten I bet you drove the little boys wild And when it came to winning blue ribbons must have shown the other kids how I can see the judge's eyes As they handed you the prize I bet you made the cutest bow Oh, you must have been a beautiful baby Cause, baby, look at you now Like that? That was wonderful, Rick. Come here. Mm, about time. Mm. Oh, Rick. Do you think you can do that and sing, too? Honey, when you look at me like that, I could kiss you, sing, and knit a whole sweater at the same time. Rick, could you? Want to try? A sweater will take years. I'll buy that. Come here, we'll start with the neck. Rick. Mm. 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 You know something? Mm, what? I may even knit you a whole suit.
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Averback, Betty Moran, Howard McNear, Edwin Max, and Jay Novello. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (coughs) Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. How much is your life worth? Think about that for a minute. Is it worth a little care? Well, that's all that's needed to protect it on America's streets and highways. Only your careful driving and your acceptance of personal responsibility for your own life can guard you from the dangers of the road. The price that you may pay for carelessness is a high one, and it's a price that thousands upon thousands of accident victims have already paid. Their gamble with death behind the wheel is a stark warning. A warning that an accident can happen to you. Last year alone, some 32,000 persons were killed in traffic accidents, and well over a million others were injured. Smash-ups have averaged more than one a minute, every minute of the day and night. These are the facts of traffic dangers. As for the facts of traffic safety, well, they all boil down to just two facts. Careful driving by automobile owners, careful walking by pedestrians. So drive carefully, walk carefully. The care you take may save a life, and that life may be your own. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned to NBC's star lineup of shows. Each Saturday, make it a point to listen to NBC. You'll hear Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, Grand Old Opry, and Songs by Morton Downey. Now, stay tuned for Lionel Barrymore and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, returning your call. Oh, hi, Pat. How Southern California? My vacation on expense account, I love it. Well, don't overdo it. Just because the Jolly Roger matter interfered with that vacation you'd planned is no Now, wait a minute. You promise. Full expenses. (laughs) Okay. When are you coming back to Hartford? As soon as I clear up the Lamar case. Want okay expenses on it now? Huh? Lamar? Yeah, Pat. This is a case that'll make your hair curl. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Expense account? Ah, oh, forget it. I'm on vacation. As far from Hartford, Connecticut's center of the insurance business as I can get. Yeah, I'm in La Jolla, California. And I'm staying in a big, ritzy motel called El Crescenta. Alone. Oh... There is a girl down here. A lot of them, in fact. But one in particular. Bonnie Lamar, her name is. Sounds like somebody in show business, doesn't it? But she isn't. Tall, five feet eight, brunette, pretty as the devil. And I gave her the line that my so-called business back east consists of nothing more exciting than running a filling station. How can you afford to come all the way out here to California for a vacation? to say nothing of staying at the El Crescenta. Rich uncle, Vonnie. Died and left me a couple of thousand to do with as I see fit. This is the way I see fit. Only a couple of thousand. Mm-hmm. Gee, that's too bad. A couple of hundred thousand, I might really fall for you. Oh, Vonnie, how can you? 
Hmm? Here I thought these last three days and evenings with you were due solely to my overwhelming personal charms. Your charm has nothing to do with it. Kiss me again, anyhow. With money around, who needed a couple of hundred grand? Yeah, the gal was just about all anyone could ask for. And I don't mean for just a quick vacation time romance. I'd spotted her the minute I'd landed here at this hotel. More like a guest ranch by the seashore. Beautiful, modern cottages set around a big green lawn with a swimming pool in the center big enough for the Olympics. Carports beside the cottages loaded with Eldorados, Continentals, and a handful of foreign sports jobs. And a beautiful big dining room and a building set up to look like an old clipper ship. And food and service worthy of Oscar of the Waldorf. And what was I doing here? On expense account, remember? Yeah, I'd spotted Vani the night I arrived from San Diego after clearing up the Jolly Roger matter and set my sights for her immediately. Naturally, I wondered what so attractive a girl was doing alone here. She cleared that up for me at dinner the second night. I still don't understand why Daddy hasn't arrived yet. Oh? He's supposed to join you on this vacation? We always spend our vacations together. At least we have since Mother died a few years ago. You're an only child? Yes. Really, a foster child. Just as we were about to take our plane, some crisis or other arose at the plant. So he made me come along and wait for him. Lamar Metal Products. Lamar Metal... Oh, yeah, yeah. Aircraft components, isn't it? South Bend, Indiana? Yes. You know how crisis can arrive in a business like that. Sure, I imagine so. Government orders, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you'll probably hear from him before. Oh. Here, waiter, would you like to get a... Telephone, senorita. A telegram for the lady. Oh? Excuse me, John. Sure. Here you are, Peter. Gracias, senor. Oh, dear. What's the matter? It's from my father, and I don't like it. Listen. Must delay departure a few more days. Doctor's orders. Oh? Nothing to worry about. Stay there in La Jolla until I join you, love Daddy. That's too bad. But doctor's orders. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. He had a new insurance examination just a month ago. They gave him a clean bill of health. Uh, what company? Oh, Try Mutual something or other, but what difference does it make? There's something wrong about this. I'm sure of it. Well, why don't you phone him? Yes. Yes, I will. My cottage is right next door here. Come on. It was none of my business, but the name of Trimutual rang an old familiar bell. Yeah, I'd handle a lot of cases for them. Anyway, she wasted no time in putting through a call to her father's private number in South Bend. Yes, operator? Thank you. I don't know why I didn't go to my own cottage to make this call. Mm, my pleasure. I guess I'm a bit upset by this wire. I don't blame you. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. There can't be. Well, maybe he just made the mistake of mixing too many oysters with too many martinis. Hello? Hello? Daddy, what's this telegram you sent me? Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, well, you had me scared for a few minutes. Oh, yes, fine. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, if you must know the truth, I have. Johnny Dollar. Uh-oh. Very. Careful, gal. Oh, he says he runs a filling station, but I don't believe him. <laughs> I'll tell you all when you get here. And hurry, darling, please. All right, Daddy. Good night, dear. Oh, thank goodness. You don't know how close your guess was, Johnny. Oh? It was just a slight case of indigestion. Plus the fact he wanted another day at the plant. Well, good. Then let's go back to the dining room and see what kind of indigestion we can accumulate. Well, that started it. Three days and nights of as much fun and relaxation as I've had in years. A wonderful place to stay, a private beach that I'll wager a second to none on the Pacific coast. Swimming, water skiing, skin diving, sailing, everything. Oh, this was it. Or so I thought. Oh, why make any bones about it? I'm a sucker for romance. And believe me, it wasn't hard to be serious with Bonnie. Johnny. Yeah? This is nice, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I... 
I, I don't believe in love at first sight. Do you? Uh, no. No, I, um... But it is nice, isn't it? Hey, whoa, gal. Mm hmm? It'd be much too easy to fall in love with you, Bonnie. And I mean the forever kind. Well, would that be so terrible? Well, you've, you've got one big strike against you, you know. Johnny, what? M-O-N-E-Y, <laughs> money. <laughs> you lose. Huh? I have nothing. Except what my father gives me. You know, allowance and for clothes and things and... <laughs> you know. It's easy, I'm just as poor as you are. Only you aren't. Or you wouldn't be staying at a place like this. Another thing. You know absolutely nothing about me. <laughs> you know you don't make a living by running any old filling station. Johnny Dollar at the sign of the Flying Red Horse. Oh, stop it. Well, for all you know, I'm a... I'm a gangster, a safecracker, a jewel thief. Mm. Or worse still, playboy scion of a wealthy family who never did a lick of work in his life. In other words, a worthless bum. Don't say that, Johnny, even in fun. Had you fill them, huh? Yes, and their mothers. Old dowagers trying to marry them off to another wealthy family. Add the name Lamar to their end of the social register listing. Ensure the fortune with another fortune. I thought you said you were poor. Well, you know what I mean. A bunch of worthless fops, that's all they are. I've seen better men among the servants and chauffeurs, the little Mexican boy who helps one of the gardeners, and the young businessmen there in South Bend and in other cities. Maybe earning just enough to make ends meet, but but men, ambitious, hardworking, willing to get somewhere on their own merit. And... Well, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Why don't you marry one of them, Bonnie? It isn't as easy as that, Johnny. You know it. Maybe I was waiting for someone like you to... Mm. I still don't believe in love at first sight. Mm. Good. Let me snuggle again. Like before we started this horrible discussion. Mm-hmm. The sun's going down, though, honey. And this little niche in the rocks is going to get cold. Yeah, look... Everybody else has left the beach. Come on, snuggle. I like it. <laughs> Kiss me. And I thought I'd have to ask for it. John, Johnny, what do you do? Well, hmm? well, I'll tell you. I live in Hartford, as I told you, and Wait. I'm really. Listen. He's calling you. Yeah, you too. Oh, the spoil sport. Well, maybe it's worried from your dad. Here, up you come. Oh, I hope so. Come on, Johnny. Pedro? Pedro? Over here. Here we are. Here. What's up? Oh, senor, senorita. Telegrams. Telegrams? But the one for the senor was Mark Rush. So I rush. Good boy, Pedro. Here. No, I'll tip you when we get back to the motel. Si, Stop senor. by my cottage. Uh, Johnny, it's... It's... What's wrong, Bonnie? It's from our family doctor. I'm afraid. Here, you read it. Sure, I'll be glad to. Regret having to inform you your father died a few hours ago. Suggest you return to South Bend immediately. Oh, Johnny. <laughs> It was a few minutes before Bonnie could pull herself together enough to walk from the beach up to her cottage where she could pack her things for the trip back to South Bend. I told her I'd make the necessary plane reservations for her. But what I didn't tell her was the contents of the wire I'd received, the one marked Rush. It was from Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. A request to call him at his home in Hartford immediately. I put through the call. Hello, Pat McCracken. Well, Killjoy, what's on your mind? Johnny? That's right. Hey, you got my wire. Why else do you think I'm calling? I tried to get you long distance all day. Your motel didn't seem to know where you were. Well, that was my doing. They might have spoiled a beautiful romance. Well, what's on your mind? Uh, Johnny, you've got to cut your vacation short. Oh, no, you don't. And you've got to come back to Hartford right away. What? Now, listen, I'm just... Yes, but plan to make a long stopover in South Bend, Indiana. South Bend? That's right. Oh, I get it. This is a gag. Or did you know I'd figured maybe on stopping over there anyhow? I don't know what you're talking about, but now listen. 
By a rare stroke of luck, we just got word of the death this morning of one of Trimutual's bigger policyholders. How much? A million and a half. <sighs> man named Thomas Rene Lamar. Lamar? Pat! Now listen, Johnny. The circumstances lead us to think it may be murder. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a set of circumstances arise that are enough to keep a man from trusting even himself. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your party in Hartford, Connecticut now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Just a moment, please. Hello, McCracken, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Hi, Pat. Johnny, are you still in La Jolla? Didn't you get my telegram? Sure did, and I'm getting ready to leave for South Bend right now. In the company of a beautiful, charming, lovely... Now look, son, your vacation is over. Charming, lovely girl named Vonnie Lamont. Okay, okay, now will you... What? That's right. Thomas Renee Lamar's daughter. Does she know her father has died? Telegram for her arrived at the same time I received yours. You didn't show her my wife. No. She doesn't know yet that you think it might be murder. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Mr. Patrick McCracken. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Or was it murder? Expense account item one. I'm calling it item one, Pat, because it's really the first tab on the Lamar case. Previous expenses here in La Jolla were charged against the Jolly Roger case. Expenses for the vacation you promised me and have now so rudely interrupted. Item one, $9.60 for that long-distance call to Pat McCracken in Hartford. Now, what under the sun is Vonnie Lamar doing in La Jolla? Vacation? Same as I was trying to take. Now, tell me something, Pat. Uh Has a claim already been filed on Lamar's million and a half dollar policy? No claim has been filed. Well, then how'd you know about his death so quickly? Luck, pure and simple. The insurance company is Tri-Mutual, big office in Chicago, headed up by Lawrence Comstock. Oh, sure, known him for years, good man. Well, he's written all of Lamar's policies himself. He got to know the old man pretty well. Uh Uh-huh. Personal friends, you know, weekend golf together, same clubs, and both nuts about two-handed pinochle. So? Well, Comstock had been Lamar's house guest the past few days and been with him practically every minute the old man wasn't at his plant. Was he actually there when Lamar died? Yes, yes. He was the one who called the doctor when the old man keeled over. Look, you keep referring to him as the old man. Just how old was he? Oh, not too. Uh, let me see. I've got it. Uh, he was 59. 
The doctor's name on her telegram was Wilson. You know his first name? No, I don't know. That stuff you'll have to get from Comstock there in South Bend. Okay. Well, at any rate, Johnny, he called me the minute the doctor pronounced Lamar dead and specifically asked that you be put on the case. Yeah, well, that's flattering. Okay, it looks like I am, but tell me something. Yeah? What makes Larry think the man was murdered? I'd rather not discuss it now. He'll, he'll give it to you when you see him. Our plane leaves in about an hour. No doubt you can be of some comfort to the daughter. Hmm? Her knowing that you're handling the case. Pat, that's the one thing I don't want her to know. I hung up, leaving Pat to ponder over that last remark. Wired Larry Comstock that I was coming and finished my packing for the trip back east. When I'd finished, I paid my bill at the fancy motel. And all I can say is, thank goodness it was on expense account. And I knocked on the door of the cottage next to mine. Yes, come in. Oh, Johnny. Hi, Bonnie. Any way I can help you? More than you have? You've been wonderful. Arranging the flight back for me. For us. Taking care of the things here. Johnny. That's right, for us. I'm making the trip with you. But you... I thought you said Hartford, Connecticut. And your vacation. Oh, the vacation's all over. Wouldn't be any fun for me to stay around after this. Oh, darling. And South Bend is along the way. I'd feel better if I kind of took you home rather than let you make the long trip alone under the circumstances. And maybe I have some business or something to attend to there. Darling, I, I don't know what... To... Easy. Oh, you made it so wonderful when Daddy couldn't get here these last few days and now that this terrible thing has happened, to stick by me this way. That's the only way I'd have it. You... You're so wonderful. All right. Come on now. Come on, get your things together. I've called for a cab to the airport in San Diego. Come on. Oh, thank you, Johnny. I love you for this. Sure. I can't say I exactly relish thoughts of the flight back east. Much as I hoped I could be of some small comfort to the girl. Much as I genuinely wanted to. Such things can be pretty rough, particularly in this instance. But I am an insurance investigator, and in a matter of this sort, a million and a half dollars at stake, the possibility of murder, well, it's up to me to suspect everyone, whether I like it or not. Yeah, I sometimes think it's a pretty rotten racket to be in. Johnny. Sleep, honey, sleep. You'll need all of it you can get before you have to face things at home. I wasn't sleeping. I was just thinking. And being so thankful that you're here with me. Honey, I wired ahead for a hotel reservation. What? Yep. Yeah, I'm going to stay in South Bend a few days. You wonderful one. No, no, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I also wired a friend of mine. A, well, a fellow with whom I do business now and then. So I... Well, anyhow, I'll be there for, for a few days and maybe more, and as long as I can be of any help to you. It's funny. Hmm? You know, you still haven't told me what you do. Well, don't worry about that now. But I'm curious. Tell me. It'll give us something to talk about. Did you wire anyone at your home about your arrival? Yes, Harrison the butler. Johnny. Well, uh, how, how about the doctor who telegraphed you? Yes, Dr. Wilson, too. Honey. Wilson. Wilson. Edward T. Wilson. Not tell me. No. No, now, you you stop talking and try to get some rest. But all... I'm going back to the lounge in the tail section so that you'll have nothing to do but get some sleep. Then you won't tell me. No. Not tomorrow. I'll see. Thank you, Johnny. No, I... I can, maybe... Very rough. I felt like a traitor to her. Well, we landed in Chicago at 10 a.m. and took a cab from the airport to the Lamar home on the outskirts of South Bend. I'd never before realized that the big industrial city with all its huge, dirty, sprawling factories had such a wealthy residential section. And the Lamar home on Parody Lane was one of the most impressive of all, set far back in what must have been an acre of well-kept lawn. 
In addition to Harrison, the butler, we were met at the door by the housekeeper, cook, upstairs and downstairs, maids, and a couple of other servants. All of them, obviously, in deep sorrow over the passing of the master of the house. And may I most humbly, for all of us, express our deepest sympathy in this hour of this... <laughs> it's all... Thank you, Harrison. Thank you all. I'm going to my room and we'll call you when... Uh, yes, miss? This is Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. He is to be admitted to the house. Any time he... Oh, I'll be here, Vonnie, as soon as possible. And you know where to reach me. Yes, Johnny. Thank you. And now to get to work, whether I liked it or not. I took the cab to the townhouse, dumped my bags, then back to Chicago in the office of Lawrence Comstock, Tri-Mutual's representative. He was waiting for me. Well, Johnny, you sure walked into something this time. Thick one, Larry? You don't know. You don't know the half of it. The million and a half of it. You gave Pat McCracken back in Hartford the idea that Lamar's death might be murder. I think it is. I really think it is, Johnny. Why? Tom Lamar was one of the best friends I ever had. Should have been. Your commission on the insurance he was carrying was enough to set you up for life. Oh, no, Johnny, don't talk like that. Tom was a good friend of mine, quite aside from business. I sold him his very first policy years ago, and he was just a bookkeeper for Atlas Processing Company, earning $70 a week. And when he married Delise... Delise? His wife, who died five years ago. Oh. That policy was only for $2,500, straight life. So? Well, you know how little my commission was on that... But I liked him. I saw that he had a spark about him. That with the proper kind of encouragement, he could go places. And he did. Yeah, so I understand. I understand the Lamar metal products is a really big thing. General metal fabricators just bought them out. Oh? Yes, and Tom was getting all ready to retire. Spend the rest of his days having fun. Golf, fishing, winters in California, and summers in Minnesota, that sort of thing. And taking care of Vani, his adopted daughter. Yeah. Kind of worth taking care of, too. Eh? I know her, Larry. Met her in La Jolla, California. Oh, then you... Brought her back here to face the sad fact of her father's death. Why didn't... Oh, yes, of course. The family doctor, Ed Wilson. I should have realized. He sent a telegram to Vani to the same place you were in La Jolla. She's a wonderful girl, John. You're telling me. But, Larry... Yes? Something you told Pat McCracken back in Hartford has led him to think that possibly Thomas Lamar was murdered. John. Johnny, in the years I've known Tom Lamar... Yeah? I've not only known him, but I've known his family. Well? And much of his affairs, personal as well as business. Well? His wife, Delise. I would have married her long ago if I'd been able. Oh, get to the point, Larry. Oh, yes, of course. And his daughter, Lavon. Vonnie. I wish she'd been my daughter, my child. Come on, Larry, come on, get at it. She's him. a wonderful girl. You said that. Oh, yes, of course. Well, there were things in her past, Vani's past, that even her mother and later her father didn't know about. But I did. For heaven's sake, man, get to the point. You too? Yes, me too. Yeah, me. The confirmed bachelor. Take him or leave him. Have fun. Forget him. Make a big... Come on, Larry. Listen, Johnny. Now, listen carefully. Dr. E.T. Wilson, Ed Wilson, an old friend of mine as well as Tom. Yes? It was Ed who made the last insurance examination four months ago. Thomas Rene Lamar was in better health than you are. After all, he was only 59, and he'd lived a careful life, taking good care of himself. Well, go on. We were sure of his physical condition, sure of it. That's why I let him add to his already large policy. Larry... You've told Pat McCracken, and you've admitted to me that you think Thomas Lamar was murdered. Yes, John. Because of one man. Who? The one man who shared his confidences, business and person. Yeah? Who was closer to him than even Ed Wilson or me. Well, who? One man who alone could be sure of benefiting by Tom Lamar's death. Oh, look, Larry, that bush you're beating around is getting bigger and bigger. It's so simple, John, so discouragingly simple. All right, all right, Larry, all right. Take it any way you like. I'm here for two reasons. Because I'm assigned to this case, and because of Vonnie. Yes, I know. Now, who is it you suspect? The man Vonnie is really in love with. Oh. I'm sorry, John. Now, 
here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, some stuff I didn't want to hear, but I had to. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Vani. Oh, yes? Please, come out here to the house, right away. Is something wrong? Johnny, I... You said you came back here to South Bend to... Well, because you didn't want me to have to be alone to face the death of my father. Yes, dear, I... Johnny, you also said you have business here. Well, yes. Is it... Is it connected with my father's death? Vonnie. Please, dear, don't lie to me. He was insured for over a million dollars. Or do you know that? I... Listen. Was this business of yours connected with Daddy? Was it because you, too, think he was murdered? Johnny? I'll... I'll come out and see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter. The question, was it murder? The beautiful girl, Bonnie Lamar, and the beautiful romance I found during my so-called vacation at La Jolla, California. Well, things really got into a bind when she received news that her foster father, back in South Bend, Indiana, had suddenly died. And I received word that I was assigned to the case... Not only because of the million and a half policy on Lamar's life, but because it looked as though it might be nothing more nor less than murder. From La Jolla, California to South Bend, Indiana, was only a quick flight by plane, and the first person I contacted was Lawrence Comstock of Trimutual, Chicago office, who'd issued the policies on Lamar's life. Yes, Johnny, the only two real friends Thomas Lamar had these past few years since his wife died were Dr. Ed Wilson and myself. And Wilson is the man you called in when Lamar died. Yes. You see, Tom and I used to spend a lot of time together. Weekend golf, belong to the same clubs, that sort of thing. We used to love playing two-handed pinochle together. Uh-huh. Go on. I was with him at his house the night he died. And so unexpectedly, Johnny, as I told you, he'd had a most thorough physical examination only a few months before. Or I'd never have permitted him to increase his insurance to a million and a half. Must have cost him a fancy premium. It did. It did. Prohibitive. But that was the way he wanted it. For his adopted daughter. For Vani. Whom you know. And if you're half a man, having spent a few days with her in La Jolla, you're in love. Oh, shut up and tell me what you know, will you? 
You said murder. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Johnny. It began last weekend. As I often do, I spent the weekend with Tom, Thomas Lamar. Well, Friday night, Dr. Ed Wilson was with us. We played three-handed pinochle. Yes, yes. Tom was in perfect health. I know he was. And our evening was all fun, completely uninterrupted. Except by young Marson. Marson? Tom's confidential secretary. And he's the one. Larry, you are the one who told Pat McCracken back in Hartford that you thought Thomas Lamar was murdered. That's why you wanted me to come on out here to investigate the case. Yes. All right, now tell me the truth. Is it because of your great friendship for Lamar? Because of the million and a half policy through your company? Or because you really think he was murdered? Are you here because of the commission you can earn on a case as big as this? Or because Thomas Lamar happened to be the father of Vonnie Lamar? I was ordered on this case from Hartford. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, maybe I'm a silly old fuddy-duddy. Maybe I'm more worked up over this case than you are, whatever the reason. But let me tell you this thing in my own way. Go on, Larry. Well, we know, Ed Wilson and I, I because of being so close to Tom Lamar so long, Ed because of his medical knowledge. We know that Tom was in perfect health. His 59 years were nothing for a specimen like him. Ed left Friday night. I stayed on. Saturday, we played nine holes of golf... Tom wanted to play 18, but I didn't feel up to it. And that night, we played Pinochle. Just the two of us. And we got to bed early. Well, Sunday, we just sat around and talked until evening when we played cards again. There was no strain, Johnny, even if the man had had a bad heart or something. I understand. Now, what about this Marson you named? We quit shortly before midnight. I was tired. My years, no doubt. And I knew Tom would have a hard day plan on Monday. And so I suggested that we get to bed. He smiled, uh, as only Tom could smile. A warm, tolerant, yet at the same time understanding and friendly, completely friendly smile. Go on, go on. And he said he'd probably have to take one of Ed Wilson's sleeping pills to doze off so early. <laughs> but I knew, Johnny. You knew what? Sugar pills. That's all Ed had ever given him. Sugar pills. I think Tom knew it, too. Well? I went up to my room, Tom to his. I heard the water running in his bathroom. About the same time, I was brushing my teeth. And then the crash. Crash? Yes. I ran out through the hall to his room. He was lying on the floor of the bath. Broken tumbler beside him. He left the bottle of sugar pills still open. He'd taken one of them? Yes. And he was dead. You... You mean you no, think... No, no. I called Ed Wilson. He was there in only minutes. It was he who officially said that Tom was dead. Had died instantaneously. And he was sure it was poison. Peculiar color of the lips or something. What do you mean? It was some terrible stimulant to the heart. A very rare drug that only a few researchers would know about. Even the heart of a young and healthy boy would find the influence of this drug too much, too strong. Dr. Wilson told you this? Yes. What is this? Drug? I don't know. Something very rare. But he is sure that's what did it. Well, what did the police say? You called them in, didn't you? Ed did. They'd never heard of it either, the drug. But they've sent samples of the sugar pills to Chicago and to Washington for analysis. Well? We should hear from them shortly. Where is this Dr. Ed Wilson? Oh, here. I'll, I'll just write you his address. Good, thanks. All right now, Larry. Yes? You told me earlier there was one man you thought might be responsible for this. Who? Walter Marson. Who's Walter Marson? Walter has been Thomas Lamar's personal private secretary for some years. Go on. And Walter has been married to Lavon for over a year. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny, because I, I know how you feel about her. Well. Why should that make him want to murder Vonnie's because father? Because of Thomas's will. Tom made a will, Johnny, that left virtually everything he owned to the corporation of which he was the head. Except for his life insurance. Is that why the amount of his insurance was so big? I suppose so. The sole beneficiary of the policy, as you know, is Vonnie. Oh, well, go on. Go Therefore, on. the only way in which anyone else could share in the estate is by being married to her. All right, all right. You've knocked down a couple of dream castles for me. And I'm not talking about a family fortune. I'm talking about a girl. Yes, John, I understand. If she loved him enough to marry him, let him be happy. If he shares some of that million and a half bucks, oh, let him share it. He deserves to, if she wants him to. 
He married her, she married him, all right. It isn't as easy as that. What do you mean? You've forgotten you wanted to know why I think Walter Marson murdered Thomas Lamar. Yes. Yes, you see, I happen to know Vani did not love Walter. You just said she married him. Unknown to her foster father. What are you getting at? Somewhere, somewhere along the line, Walter Marson, shall we say, got something on Vani. What it was, I don't know. But he had a strange power over her, it seemed. Larry, what are you talking about? I don't know, Johnny. From the time Walter first started working for Thomas Lamar, I, well, I didn't trust him. And yet Tom seemed to have the most implicit faith in him. Walter was a good accountant, yes. Handled many of Tom's personal investments. And handled them very well, too. Thomas paid him very well. Rewarded him, always. When he made unusual profits. Why not? But Walter Marson made it plain from the beginning that he wanted to work his way into Thomas's shoes in the corporation, and this Thomas would not have. And the reason? Because Thomas knew that many of the stock deals Walter had made in his behalf were not completely, shall we say, legitimate, or legally proper, perhaps, but not morally so, that is. Corporation money instead of his own, right? Yeah, that's it. Buying huge blocks in order to inflate the price, and then dumping the stocks at their peak, that sort of thing. I don't know much of the details. That's out of my line. But Thomas knew very well that if Walter Marson were ever put into the corporation, he'd use the same slick methods for purely personal gain. At the expense of the corporation, he'd spent his life building up. How do you know about this? I was Thomas's confidant, his closest friend. All right, Larry, let me do a little summing up. Walter Marson failed to dig into Lamar's money via the corporation, so he married his daughter to be sure of latching on to the family fortune. And that's it. Yes, it's as simple as that. Therefore, you're sure this Marson poisoned Lamar? Yes, and because of the findings of Dr. Ed Wilson. Which haven't yet been verified. Well, no. And even if you do find proof that Lamar was poisoned, you have no proof that Marson was back of it? No. Larry, what if Vani had something to do with it? Oh, no. Oh, yes, yes. That's a real possibility, isn't Good it? Good heavens, Johnny, you can't mean that. You... You say you know the girl. Yeah, sure. And I fell for her like a ton of bricks. Whether it's simply because I'm a sucker for such a charmer or just because she charmed me so well, I don't know. But why did she want me if she's already married? Johnny, what are you getting at? A million dollars at stake. A million and a half. How she could possibly have known I'd be staying at the La Crescenta in La Jolla, California, I don't know. But with a million and a half at stake, you could find out most anything. So she worked on me, got me on her side, even before she needed to. And when her father died, according to plan, she knew there'd be no question of settlement of a claim for the insurance because of the way she'd so successfully drawn me into a cozy little noose. Johnny, you're out of your mind. Am I? What are you talking about, you old... (sighs) Yeah, I... I guess I am. John, I've been a confirmed bachelor all my life, even before I was your age. But I know very well that if I'd ever met Vonnie Lamar, my bachelor days would have suddenly ended. Oh, you're hurt. Now that you've found out she's married, you're hurt and you're angry. You're striking out at anything you can reach, anyone. And I'm sorry. Don't let it take away your judgment. I'm... I'm sorry too, Larry. I I didn't mean to... I really didn't... It's all right, Johnny. But now get hold of yourself. You have a job to do, not only for me, for the company, but for yourself. Okay, Larry, thanks. Good boy. I I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I guess whatever it is, I, I better start doing it. Yes. Good luck, Johnny. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, it doesn't take long to find out what has to be done on this case, because the turning point in the whole thing comes straight to me, and with a vengeance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours 
truly Johnny Dollar starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Edward Wilson, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello, doctor. Mr. Comstock of Tri-Mutual Insurance asked me to call you. Regarding the death of Thomas Rene Lamar. Yes. I've just left the police department. The chief autopsy surgeon... Yes? There's no question about it. Thomas Lamar was poisoned. I... I see... I'd like to talk to you, Doctor. I understand you were one of Mr. Lamar's closest friends. Yes. And one of the beneficiaries of his will. That's quite... Where did you learn that? I didn't. It was a shot in the dark. No, look here, young... Better stick close to your office, Doctor. I'm on my way over to see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Lamar matter, now proven to be murder. As the facts of this case lined up, it appeared that Thomas Rene Lamar, wealthy manufacturer of aircraft components, had only two really good friends. Lawrence Comstock, who had issued him a million and a half worth of life insurance policies, and Dr. Edward T. Wilson, and a wonderful, lovely, charming adopted daughter, Laban whom I'd met during my brief vacation in La Jolla, California, whom I'd accompanied back here to South Bend, Indiana, when she received word of her father's sudden death. What little evidence I'd been able to pick up seemed to point to one Walter Marson, Lamar's personal secretary. Unknown to Lamar, he had married Bonnie, and therefore stood to benefit from his death. Oh, why kid about it? I'd fallen for the girl, heavily. And when I found out that she was already married to a slick, smart promoter... Well, let's keep personalities out of this case. Especially mine. I told Vonnie that I'd come up and see her out at the family mansion. But I thought I'd better contact Dr. Wilson first. Come in. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I've heard a great deal about you from Lawrence Comstock. And please, sit down. Thanks, Doctor. You said something over the phone that's bothered me. I won't mince words. Apparently, you and Larry Comstock were Thomas Lamar's closest friend. I don't think there's any question about it, my boy. And I'm sure Lawrence will verify that. He already has. That's why I took a shot in the dark and suggested that you're a beneficiary of Lamar's will. Not his insurance. How would he know that his daughter, Vonnie, gets that, but his will? Well, does that shock you? I suppose Larry's a beneficiary, too. Yes. Then either one of you might conceivably have had a motive for bringing about his death. What? Now, just a minute, relax, young man. Relax, doctor, relax. I make no bones about it. This is the roughest case I ever tried to handle. Unfortunately, I started out by getting myself emotionally involved with Bonnie Lamar. Uh, go ahead, laugh if you want to. Hardly. She's a very wonderful girl. 
A bit mixed up at times, perhaps, because of... Well, because of what? Are you aware that unknown to her father, Vonnie was married? He is married? Yes, to some Walter Marson. Larry Comstock told me. Marson was Thomas Lamar's personal secretary. Did Lawrence tell you why she married him? I don't think he knows. It was a few short months after Thomas Lamar's wife died. A terrible blow both to Vonnie, who was completely devoted to her foster mother, and to him. By way of quenching his sorrow, Thomas drove himself in his work, 16, 18 hours a day at the plant, all his waking hours, so that he would have time to think of nothing but his work. But Vonnie had no such outlet for her emotions. Her friends, a lot of rich 'er ne'er-do-wells, rich, worthless bums, if you like, got her interested in gambling. She plunged into it with a recklessness and abandon that quickly got her into debt so deeply that there was only one way out. Her father didn't know? No, no, no. But young Marson did, and he took full advantage of it. In return for her agreement to marry him, he promised to quietly obtain the necessary funds from Thomas Lamar's investments, which he, Marson, handled. And he did. And she married him? Yes. But how could she? She didn't love him. And you must realize her emotional state at that time. She was terribly upset over the recent death of her mother, and so was her father, of course. She knew the shock it would be if he ever knew of her gambling and the tremendous debt she'd incurred. She was beside herself, ready to do anything. So she married Marston. I could kill him. Now, let's get one thing straight, Mr. Dollar. Yes? You, too, were a bit upset when you came in here. You spoke as though you might think both Lawrence Comstock and I could have motive for wanting Thomas's death. I'm sorry, Doctor, I... It's true that we are beneficiaries of his will, at least Thomas assured us we were, but only in a very minor way. Thomas was loyal to us as he was to the servants who have been so devoted to him for so long, and whatever little he has left us and them... I'm sorry, Doctor, I... Oh, I I guess I was just feeling hurt and angry and taking it out on anyone I could find. At least that's the way Larry Comstock put it. And he was right. Now I got a job to do... What have the police found out? Only enough to back up my immediate suspicion that Thomas was poisoned by pyridamron. Pyridamron? Yes, it's a little-known drug that produces tremendous but only momentary stimulation to the heart, causes the heart to almost literally burst, and it leaves virtually no traceable residue in the system. But you said the chief autopsy surgeon found out... Oh, no, no. He found only positive indication that pyridamron had been used. I found the first clue to it only minutes after Thomas died. A staining of the tongue that even then was rapidly disappearing. Can you tie this drug in with Walter Marston? No. No, the fact that it was available at all has stumped both the police and myself. The last known source was a small island off the coast of Greece many, many years ago. And all the tiny plants from which it could be obtained as pollen were burned by the Greek government. But somebody, somewhere, must have had some seeds, planted them and obtained this pollen. Yes. How do you suppose Mr. Lamar took the stuff? Well, it could have been mixed with one of the medicines in the cabinet in his bathroom, but we found no traces. Uh Uh-huh. Larry Comstock said you used to give him harmless sugar pills as a kind of sedative. Yes. Thomas knew they were perfectly harmless, but he occasionally took them anyway. (laughs) It was a kind of joke. Could this uh, pirate stuff have been mixed with him? We found no trace in the bottle. But you would have been able to. Yes. It is only an assimilation by the human body that dissipation is so complete as to make it virtually undetectable. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't been of much help to you, Mr. Dollar. I think you have, Doctor. I think you have. It was only a hunch. But in this business, you sometimes have to depend as much on hunches as on common sense. I picked out the library nearest to the Lamar residence to do my research. Pirate Dameron, you're sure that is the word? Yes. Can't you find anything on the subject? Nothing beyond what you found in the Pharmacopoeia Index, the name of the plant from which it is derived. Blepharra peporus calandus. No common name. Yeah, no. Well, thanks. Of course, the main branch of the city library in Chicago might have something. Sure, thanks. Yes, yes, I'm sure I can find what you're looking for. You see, I myself am quite a student of rare drugs and poisons. Oh, what's that? After a long, dull day here at the library, I enjoy nothing more than curling up in a big chair in my little apartment and reading detective fiction. Oh. 
Well, uh, where's the book? I'll show you. Uh, but quietly, please. We must maintain the proper atmosphere for our readers. Oh, sure. Yes, I know the poison pyrodamron very well. It was used in that wonderful story, The Case of the Yellow-Lipped Monster. Oh, excellent book. Thrilling. Oh, you should read it. Yeah, well... Uh... Pyrodamron was new to me, so as usual, I had to find out all about it, and I did find out, too. The plant it's derived from, where it's grown, uh, where it was grown. You see, it's been extinct now for many years. Yeah, I understand. Oh, now... Deadly thing, terribly deadly. But now... Now, here is the book that will tell you all about it. The title is Flora Exotica Mediterranea. That means exotic flowers of the Mediterranean. Uh, hmm, Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter? I don't... Oh, good heavens, it isn't here. Are you sure? But it was. I'm sure it was only yesterday. Oh, dear. Well, here, do you see? It was taken out from right here. Well, who took it out? I don't know. Won't your records show? No, I never permit any books to be taken from this section without my knowledge. Well, never. Afraid somebody'd consult the stuff for ulterior motives? Oh, oh, dear, no. It's just that the only ones who want these books are the rabid whodunit fans like myself. And, uh, well, I like to talk to them. Well, isn't there some other book that might give me the information I want? Oh, not another book in the world. I know. And now, oh, tragedy. It's been stolen. <laughs> Well, this was one time a hunch didn't pay off. Quite the contrary. I'd wasted a lot of time. Expense account item 9, 520. Taxi out to the Lamar mansion. I was almost relieved to learn that Vonnie was not home. I'm very sorry, sir, but she and Mr. Marson left shortly afternoon to make the funeral arrangements. Thank you, Harrison. However, as you know, Miss Vonnie wished you to have full access to the house. And if you care to wait... How is she holding up, Harrison? Most admirably, Mr. Dollar, under the circumstances. Uh, Mr. Lamar's passing has been a terrible thing for her, for all of us. Yes, yeah, sure, of course. What will happen to the house, I don't know. Won't Miss Lamar continue to live in it? This morning she said no, that she'd travel for a while, and then settle down somewhere else far away from the city. Oh? And what about you, the servants? Oh, we shall, of course, have to seek employment elsewhere. Say, tell me, Harrison, didn't Mr. Lamar provide for you in his will? I do not know, sir, and I do not particularly care. His kindness and loyalty to us during his lifetime was far more important than any provision he may have made for us. Well, I guess that takes you off the list. Uh, beg pardon? Nothing. So tell me, has Walter Marson been around much since Mr. Lamar's death? Yes, he's been most attentive to Miss Lamar, which we've all appreciated. He lives here in the house, you know. No, I didn't know. Harrison, I'd like to see his room. Sir? I'm going to lay my cards right on the table. I'm an insurance investigator. Here. My card. Why, I... Oh, I see. Miss Vonnie hadn't so informed me. Because she didn't know. Well, sir, I... Now show me to Marston's room. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. Do you like Walter Marston? Yes, sir, very much. Now. What does that mean? I've never spoken of this to anyone else, Mr. Dollar. For years, Walter Marston was a clever, scheming, conniving young man with overpowering ambition to take over the Lamar Corporation. So I've heard. I'm convinced that at one time he even tried to marry Miss Lamar and solely for the purpose of forcing his way into the business. Just trying to... Well, yes, sir. However, in the past year or two, Mr. Marston has changed completely. What makes you think so? Because of conversations between him and Mr. Lamar that I could not avoid overhearing from time to time. Mr. Lamar knew what Marson was attempting and faced him with his knowledge of it. Uh, here is his room. Go on. Uh, Mr. Lamar could have made it very difficult for him in view of his record. Prison record? Uh, yes, sir, for embezzlement. But instead, he gave the young man another chance. So? Go on. And Mr. Marson made the most of it. He changed completely. I say without reservation, sir, that Mr. Marson is as honorable a young man as I know. Pretty sure of that, aren't you? Yes, sir. A butler living as close to them for both for so long can in very... Pardon me, sir, but does something give you the reason to think I'm mistaken? No, no. Unless perhaps it's this book I just found lying on his desk. Book, sir. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, and a switch that will make your head spin. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Larry Comstock, Johnny, at Tri-Mutual Insurance. You're out at the Lamar home. Yeah, Larry. Police crime lab find out anything more about the stuff from here they took in for examination? Yes. Yes, they certainly did. Well? They found traces of that poison, pyrodameron, on the toothbrush that Thomas Lamar was using just before he on died. The to- Are you kidding? Oh, no. No, indeed, John. Not a bit. There's a murder weapon for you. A toothbrush. Larry, send the cops out here. I think I've just about got this case sewed up. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location South Bend, Indiana. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is my final entry of expenses incurred during investigation of the Lamar murder. And murder it most certainly was. It was in La Jolla, California, during my so-called vacation, that I met, and I must admit, kind of fell for Vonnie Lamar. It was from La Jolla that I flew her back to South Bend, Indiana, when we both received news of her foster father's sudden death. All the clues I'd been able to dig up seemed to point to one Walter Marson, who had been Lamar's personal secretary and who lived at the Lamar mansion. At his room there in the house, I found the one book in the world that described the poison, pyridamarin, that had killed Thomas René Lamar. Poison derived from a pretty little yellow flower, once raised on an island near Greece. A flower with sudden death in its pollen. Huh? You're Johnny Dollar, aren't you? Harrison the butler said you were up here. And you must be Walter Marston. What, uh, what are you doing in my room? Let me ask the questions, Marston. Now, just a minute. Look, mister, you may as well know it. I'm an insurance investigator. So Harrison said, but I don't believe it. Right here, my credentials. Uh, oh, I, I see, but I, I thought... You that... thought I was just a boyfriend that Vonnie Lamar met in La Jolla and who just came back here with her to comfort her over the loss of her father. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, you were wrong, mister. Well, partly so. The main reason I'm here is to find out who murdered Thomas Lamar and why. And I think I found out. You have? Well, well who, Mr. Dollar? Interesting book you've been reading here. Oh. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Stolen from the Central Library over in Chicago, wasn't it? Well, yes. Yes, it was. Found a poison in it, didn't you, Marston? Pirate Dameron. Deadly, quick, and hard to trace. So rare that the chances were pretty good it wouldn't even be recognized. But it was. Where'd you get it, Walter? As you said, at the library. I'm talking about the poison, the pirate Dameron that killed Thomas Lamar. Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're all wrong. Am I? Who besides Vonnie would benefit from the million and a half insurance on Lamar's life? Well, what made you think that... that I know that you I'd would. Be the... Because I know you're married to Vonnie. Oh, no. You I, tried to inveigle your way into Lamar's business, but he wouldn't have it. All your chiseling and conniving and phony stock transactions got you nowhere. So you did the next thing you could think of. You got something on Vonnie and forced her to marry you. So you thought you'd at least be sure of a big hunk of the insurance money over my dead Oh, no, look, Dollar, maybe I was married to Vonnie, but... I found out about her big gambling debts, got her off the hook by some fancy manipulation of her foster father's investments. No doubt threatened to tell him all about it unless she did marry you and thereby guaranteed yourself a prosperous future. 
Oh, and you timed the whole thing beautifully when she was emotionally upset over the death of Mrs. Lamar. No, Dolly, you, you don't know but what you're talking patient. about. Couldn't wait for him to die a natural death. <sighs> Dolly. Mr. Dollar. Sure, go ahead, speak up and make it good. Well, I, uh, I was married to Varney. But I'm not now. Sure. That's right. I did want a place in Lamar Metal Products, and I, I thought I could get it by showing Mr. Lamar how clever I was. <laughs> well, instead of throwing me out, he gave me another chance. I'll be forever grateful to him. It was a turning point in my life. I give you my word, Mr. Dollar, I've done nothing since that time that's been anything but completely honest and above board. Pretty speech. No, no, it, it's true. It's it's true, I swear it. Nevertheless, you married Vani in the hope We're that... We're divorced. You're... You're what? Well, it was the only honorable thing I could do. Would you like to see the final papers? Vani mailed them to me from Reno before she went to La Jolla. You mean she... Yeah, let me see them. Here. Right. Yes. Don't try to pull a gun out of there, Marcy. You still don't believe me, do you? Here they are. Hmm. Then would you like to tell me who did murder Thomas Lamar? I wish to heaven I knew. That's why I got this book, hoping to find some clue as to... Where the pirate Dameron might have come from. But you sneaked this book out of the because library. Because I was afraid of the very kind of suspicion that you've shown. Want to know something? I'm still showing. And I tell you, you're wrong. A a ask Vani. She'll tell you. Oh, where is she? Harrison said you two had gone out together to make arrangements for the funeral. Yes, we did, and we came back together. But when Harrison told her that you were here to see her, she... Well, she, she said she'd be back in a few minutes. Where did she go? Oh, she's still in the house somewhere, I, I think. Marson, just what is your relationship with Vani now? Oh, well, there... Never was any love between us. Our marriage was only on paper. Yeah? The foster daughter of the man to whom I owe so much, it's my duty to do what I can for her. In spite of her... Well, for what? Oh, even to the end, we, we kept from him any knowledge of her dissipations, her drinking and gambling. I thought that was all over. Oh, no, she's more deeply in debt now than she's ever been. I'm I'm thankful Mr. Lamar died without knowing what I'll be. But with the insurance, of course, you'll be able to pay off. Marson, you're a dirty rat, and your accusation isn't very well veiled. Are you trying to say that I'm accusing Vani of the... Murder? Oh. Mr. Dollar. Yeah, go on. This book. According to this, the plant from which Pilot Dameron is derived is now extinct. Unless somebody, somewhere, managed to salvage some seeds that were yes, then planted. Yes, exactly. Ruffer of Purpurus Kellandus, found only on a small Grecian island. I I wonder if Dimitri would know about Dimitri? Him. What's this sudden switch? Who's Dimitri? He's the old gardener. He's, he's here on the estate. Come on, Marson, and bring that book. <laughs> Before going out to the gardener's cottage, I asked Harrison where Vani had gone, and he told us he only knew that she was somewhere in the grounds, that her car was still in the driveway. I phoned Larry Comstock again, but he'd left his office, presumably to come out here. And I called the man I'd talked to earlier at the library. Oh, of course I can. As I told you before, I keep a very close check on the books in that section. Uh, let me see now. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Flora Exotica Mediterranea has only been out four or five times in the past several years. Once to a Mr. Thomas... Yeah? Uh, Thomas Hanley. Oh. Uh, to a Mr. Ralph Cummings, Miss LaVon Lamar, and... Uh... That's enough. Thanks. I tried not to show Marson how I felt as we walked out to the cottage of Dimitri, the old gardener. Could be nothing too nice for Mr. Lamar. So I always try to keep things nice. Yeah, I can see. Uh, Dimitri, Mr. Dollar's here to, to investigate the circumstances of... Mr. Lamar's death. Invest. Oh, yes. I hope you find who do this terrible thing to such a fine... Well, I want you to look at this book. Here. Did you ever see a flower like that? Oh, yes. Yes, where? In old country. In Greece it used to be, but no more. You never saw it in this country? No, yes. Well, which is it? Uh, I should not say, because in old countries... Against the law. I don't know why. Well, I do. Go on, Dimitri. 
But I keep many of my nice seeds anyway. And some of them were for this flower? Yes. You, you don't mind? It is very pretty flower. Did you ever plant any of them? Oh, no, no, not I. Somebody else? She was always so nice to me. Funny. Miss Lamar? <laughs> Look, sir. She even sent me gift on her trip last week. Dimitri. Look, look. You call it toilet case. See? It have soap and toothbrush and comb. Dollar. Dollar, look, look. That, that toothbrush. I am looking. The yellow stain on the bristles, the same color as the flower on this deadly plant. So, so pretty. She said her father one of these two. Oh, Dollar, I'm sick. You sick, poor so man? So crude, so corny, and so obvious it would never be noticed. And she was safely a couple of thousand miles away, beyond any possible suspicion when the... Dimitri, yes. did she plant any of these seeds you gave her? She often planted many kinds. Where? He's... Show us. In the morning, maybe. It's getting pretty dark now. Now, now, now. Come on. Come on, Marcel. Yeah. You, you, you must not tell her, I show you. She always keep her little garden secret. She not even think I know. She very sweet girl. Yeah, very. But now... Hey, no. oh. oh, wait. Huh? She there now, cultivating. Cultivating? With a shovel? Dimitri, go back to your cottage and stay there. Oh, you want... Come on, Marson. She's, she's digging. Digging. And I think I know why. She sees us. Go back. Go away, both of you. Stay here. I want to talk to you, Vani. What are you doing? What I'm doing is... I... I'm burying the little garden that was mine for Daddy. Little personal things, Johnny, that I grew with my own hands for him alone. Now that he's gone, this would be only one more bit of memory. Please, leave me, Johnny, to finish. Wait, Vani. What? Before you turn under that little yellow flower. Here, I'll show you... No, Johnny, don't touch it. Here. Source of a poison called pyridamron. How did you know? Here, look. Oh, oh, no, you don't. I'll kill you, too. I'll kill you. Oh, nobody, no. Oh, Walter. Walter, help me. Help you, help you. Johnny was in love with me, but I turned him down, and he he came out here. Oh, good, Bonnie. I hate you. I hate you both. Everything would have been all right if you hadn't come along. I hate you. I... Listen, Johnny. Million dollars. Million and a half. You and I could... You dirty... No, Johnny, please don't. Please! Believe me, this is one case I wish I'd never seen. Oh, sure, you, the company, are all right. You won't have to pay off a million and a half in insurance. Your gain. But me, I've lost something. Faith. Faith and... Oh, I'm sick over the whole thing. Expense account, I'll add it up later. Right now, I'm going out and get roaring... Get some flowers. Some clean flowers. And just sit and look at them. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week? Tell me, did you ever wake up from a pleasant dream to find a smoking gun in your hand and two bodies at your feet? Well, I have. Join us next week and I'll tell you about it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Eric Snowden, Howard McNair, John Daner, Gene Tatum, Joseph Kearns, Paul Richards, and Jack Boyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
Broadway's my beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. soft fall of June, and Broadway's heart beats fast. The girls press gently against currents of summer wind and wear the glimmer of morning sun on their hair, and their lips scarlet, moist. On their shoulders, golden dance of light, and their perfume is of summer fields, which mixes well with Broadway's own exotic odors. Sear of electricity, wash and cool and scent of air-conditioned air, steam mist drifting from manhole covers, and Broadway follows close on the heels of summer morning, turns a corner, punches the time clock, darkens the day. Time of the transients. Their place of sleep, Duane Hotel for transients. Side street just off Broadway. Rooms dollar and a half up. Weekly rates also. Place of desk gouged with the transients mark. Place of dust on mirrors on which names and numbers have been scrawled place of a room where a man lies wounded, dying across in a door bed, and where Detective Dennison was, and I was. Nothing, Danny. No baggage, suitcase, briefcase, cardboard box, nothing. Not even shaving things or a toothbrush in the bathroom. Uh-huh. A thing, huh, Danny? Well-dressed man. Expensively dressed. Silk shirt. Cheap hotel. Stabbed in the back with a grimy knife. You talked to the clerk, Dennison? Yeah. But he said what? He said this man came in last night around one. He said this man registered as Charlie Brown, a name which conjured up old memories for the clerk and made him request payment in advance, which this man paid. One day's worth, which is what the clerk said. He was alone? Uh Uh-huh. Clerk said he was alone. As to visitors, clerk got drowsy around two. Can't see with his eyes closed. I found this in his wallet. Mm, Let me touch two, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Must be $500 in easy dimensions. Feel real nice, don't they? Dennison, uh... Yeah, yeah. Robbery's out, huh? It looks that way. Found this in his wallet, too. A business card. Lane Incorporated. Gadgets, mechanical funnies. George Lane, owner. George Lane matches his driver's license. A man makes mechanical funnies. Carries five C's, pocket change. Look at it one way. There's no percentage in it. Look at it another way. You call the ambulance, Dennison? Clerk said he'd do it for me. Clerk said it'd be a real pleasure. So I let him. He did. And it happened then, the siren. The trailing in of the one-noted song, the shrill tone that shatters a city's traffic and lets through a self-propelled white enameled box designed to carry newly stabbed people as comfortably as possible. And the man near death becomes suddenly an object of respect. So stand by solemnly while he's lifted up and carried away. Instructions to Dennison, then, and leave. Legwork and the offices of Lanes Incorporated. Show the badge and be nodded to a chair by a young woman who tiptoes. And a few minutes later, be tiptoed into an office in limed oak and photographs of lawn sprinklers that turn themselves off, kittens that turn themselves on, and life-size baby dolls that say mama, and smoke. Be permitted a minute of amazement... The door opens, and your back is slapped. No gadget, but a man. And how are you? My name's Harry Webster. Oh, fine. I'm... Danny uh, Clover. You gave your name to Miss Senker, remember? And Miss Senker gave it to me. How are you, Danny? What's your position here, Mr. Webster? You asked to see the fellow in charge, didn't you? I'm the fellow in charge. Well, that is while George Lane is away, huh? As soon as he comes in, I take off my suit coat, and I'm a foreman. Mr. Lane's had an accident. Accident? Uh, no, no, that's the wrong word. <laughs> He was stabbed. He was found in a cheap hotel with a knife. The Lane that owns this place is George Lane, Mr. Clover. Quite a wealthy man, a man who doesn't stint on anything his heart desires, so you see that. Anyhow, we want you to go to police emergency hospital and make identification for us. You just stick around. Mr. Lane will be in. You boys have got the wrong man. Well, let's just go on the assumption we haven't. If we do that, I don't know what to say. Nothing comes. I'll help you. Who would want to stab him? Stab George? I know who'd admire him, everybody. I know who'd respect him, everybody. And everyone would have a good word for him, but stab him. Stab him? When was the last time you saw him? Last night. Oh? He was uh, to my house for dinner. We gave him a little dinner party. Me, my wife, my kid. Celebration. 
I've been working here 20 years, so I have... How did Mr. Lane act last night? Oh, <laughs> well, that means what? I went under the table about 11. My wife put me to bed. Uh, look, I got an idea. What? I'll call my wife and tell her you're on the way over. You want to know how George was last night? Don't ask me. At 11 o'clock, I heard the clock strike 11 o'clock, and I felt myself sliding Just under. write down your address for me, huh, Mr. Webster? <laughs> Over? Yes. Well, I've been waiting for your step ever since Harry called. Just minutes ago, a man walked through the hall, and I opened the door and asked him if it was you, and he just grinned and winked. I, I was very embarrassed. May we go inside, Mrs. Webster? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, please come inside. Dear, I, I tried to straighten up the place in the short time since Harry called, and myself, too. Harry should have had sense enough to ask you to wait around just a little while, so it I... It doesn't could... matter, Mrs. Webster. Oh, no, I... I don't suppose it does, does it? George hurt and wounded, dying like some lonely animal. Mrs. Webster... Now, don't you play games with me, do you hear? No games. Because Harry told me all about it on the phone, and I'll match what you said to Harry and what you say to me and what Harry said, because he told Mrs. me... Mrs. Webster... And Harry doesn't lie. He never fibs. Now, that's one thing you can say about my husband, Harry. You threw him, Mrs. Webster? Well, I I'm upset. I... I tell you that so you know I'm just terribly, terribly upset. Because of what's happened to Lane? But George is dying, isn't he? We don't know yet. We're doing all we... And all you can do or want to do or dream of doing for George Lane won't be enough. Oh? Yes. Oh, George is an attractive man and strong, a wonderful man, a man with a sense of humor, too. So funny. So very funny. You should have heard the funny things he said when Harry passed out last night at his own party. His own party for his boss, George Lane. Twenty years of faithful, devoted service, and Harry gives the party. And Harry Webster passes out at 11 o'clock. Oh, George did such a funny thing. What did he do, Miss Webster? Oh, well, when Harry just sort of oozed down under the table, George did a magic trick with the tablecloth, just yanked it out from under everything, and draped it over Harry, and planted a stalk of celery in Harry's hand. Oh, isn't that funny? Isn't that very funny? No, not very. Well... I thought it was funny. Even Sylvia finally laughed. Sylvia? Sylvia, my daughter. Even she had to laugh finally, the way your father looked. And the funny dance George did around. And your daughter was at the celebration, too. And what's more, George offered to take her home. And she accepted. And I was very proud, I can tell you. I even tried to wake Harry to tell him his own daughter was being taken home, but... Oh, but Harry, Harry was dead to the world. I had to drag him by. Then your and... daughter has a place of her own. And a job of her own. The 58th Street Record Shop. My daughter's very independent. And... Oh, but... If... If George took her home... And it was last night that George mm -hmm. was... Thank you, Mrs. Webster. <laughs> that briefcase hey, into the listening booth with you and all those records. Thank you. Hey, now, you, sir. Is your name uh, Sylvia Webster? That's right. I'm Miss Webster. Oh, I'm Danny Clover, police. That's all right. I'd like to ask you a few questions, Miss Webster. That's all right, too. Earlier this morning, George Lane was found with a knife in his back. Just a minute. Now, you were saying that George Lane was found stabbed and you want to ask me some questions. Isn't that right? Did you stab him? That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? Stab a man, get yourself in a mess. Just when Mr. Sussman gave me a raise last week? May I ask how old you are, Miss Webster? Twenty. I look older, don't I? I've suffered. All the books I read, girls 20 years old suffer, so like them, it's been a constant battle to keep my face from wrinkling. Why don't you live with your parents? In the books, Mr. Clover, the books, all girls 20 years old rebel. They go off and live by themselves. 
Their mothers weep, daddies fold their arms and look off into space and think, what kind of ingrate have I reared? A 20-year-old girl who wants to live alone. Mr. Lane took you home last night, didn't he? I was flattered. Did you find him attractive, Miss Webster? I can only assume, Mr. Clover, that since you asked the question under these circumstances, you've only seen the old boy when he'd been stabbed. You ought to see him without a knife in him. Was there anything... Mr. Lane took me home, handed me up the stoop, held a lighted match near my purse while I located my key, opened the door for me, and made a wish. And? It didn't come true. I closed the door in back of me and left him to face the bitter night alone. Mind if I ask you a question? Go ahead. Is Mr. Lane dead? No. Would you like to see him? I'd love to. But Mr. Sussman left me in charge for the entire day. Think of it. My first day in charge. What an opportunity for a 20-year-old. Just tell him hello, huh? Thanks. Danny? Uh, Dr. Sinski? How is... I took a moment outside Mr. Lane's room, Danny, to grab a smoke... I didn't wish to... Didn't wish to what, Dr. Sinski? To intrude on the grief of his visitors. (laughs) I did everything I know, Danny, but... Visitors? Who is... A Mr. and Mrs. Harry Webster. They told the desk they were old friends. Mr. Webster said you had wished to... Let's go in, huh? Clover. Yes, Mr. Webster? That's George, all right. That man there in the bed. George Lane. Man I worked for for 20 years. A man... My wife's crying because... Danny? A man we've admired, respected, a man... Just a minute, uh, Mr. Arson. What is it, Dr. Sensky? Mr. Lane is dead, Danny. That was a remarkable man. A truly remarkable man. A man I never was. A man I would have given anything to be... All the things I'm not. (laughs) Don't do that, Harry. Because you're right. You're just so right. A wonderful, wonderful man is dead. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Tomorrow night, where you will be expecting your date with Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective, listen for a special program starring Dick Powell and Amos and Andy. Hear the dramatic feature titled The Iron Mortar, describing four generations of progress in the drug field. This Sunday night on most of these same CBS radio stations. In the sunlight of a new morning in June, Broadway leans against a subway exit before going to work and makes the last memory about the long night past. There was the bottle of beer in the corner bar and the reflection of the girl in mirror and how she accepted the light you offered her and not your friendship and the wilted salad and the siren songs of the disc jockeys and spasms of sleep and fragments of dreams when you were skimming the lagoons of Manakura and later when your brow was being stroked in a South Sea Island way And the best dream of all, the one you had been trying to remember for months, shattered again by the alarm clock, lost again, because it's a new morning again. And for me, the new morning was police headquarters and Sergeant Gino Tartaglio. Danny. Come on in, Gino. Well, what's up? Go ahead. Be bright and sunny. Oh, trouble this morning, Gino? June is the cruelest month. Hmm? You know who said that? Mrs. Tartaglia. She can't sleep on June nights. Gino. So she keeps me awake. She keeps telling me she hears music. Gino, please. And I have always been very proud of my hearing, Danny. I hear no music. She keeps nudging me and says, You hear that? You hear that? Violin. So help me, Gino. Once I think I heard a trumpet blow, but I wasn't sure, so I went back to sleep. But that was last month. Uh, but what am I bothering you with? Let's get down to things at hand, shall we? If you please. <clears throat> Rundown on results of legwork by the good detective Dennison. 
The deceased George Lane was known as a big man with the maidens. Some people who knew Bez described Mr. Lane as dynamic and, you know, let's see, powerful. Also, at one juncture in his life, he was all but snagged. Snagged? He was once engaged to be married to a maidy Carson. The take of Dennison has jotted down her address, which I give you now. Thanks. So, what do you think, Danny? About what? About Mrs. D. About she can't sleep at night in June. Just wait till July, huh? Yes? Miss Carson, Lady Carson? That's right. I'm from the police. I, uh... Oh, you people must be very thorough. I didn't realize. That's right, Miss Carson. And you found a wounded man who then died, and because of that you scraped through files and things, and you discovered I was once to marry that man. Lady Carson and with George Lane. That's right. Well, then do come in. Somewhere in all that mess of magazines and newspapers, there must be a place to sit. Thanks, sir. You know why the mess? Well, Miss Carson... In all those magazines, all of them, there are ads for relief organizations who have children on the market for adoption. Look, I... And I've been shopping, you know, browsing, so to speak, and I discover French children are very polite and still, and little Italian boys are nice, too, as are the Greek children and the Polish. I tell you, I... What? So many to choose from, it's very difficult for a girl to make up her mind. That's how Lane's death hits you, Miss Carson? Oh, no. When it hit me like that was when George Lane would not marry with me. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? You know anything about George? Other than he's dead, of course? A few things. You know he was a powerhouse? A veritable powerhouse. A sweeper of girls off their old patterns. A challenge to men. All things his opponent. Men, women, things. And George always won. And to the losers... The spoils. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a bar where once three years ago a girl sat waiting for her fiancé and George Lane, distinguished, gray, bulky, and harmless, introduced himself. Bought said girl a drink. Invited said girl for a little jaunt in his sports car. Said girl, me. Finish the end. Then he wanted to marry you. I wanted... And I talked it over with my fiancé, and he said how he, could he compete with a man like George? Why, once at Coney, we were all together, the three of us, and... And what? Well, simply that George out-pitched, out-hammered, out-coastered, out-photographed my fiancé. So, fiancé said, go marry the man, and I said, please, George. And George humored me, bought the license, tore it up a week later. And so... Go on. So I went back to my boyfriend and said, Paul, forgive, forgive, forgive. Paul didn't. I can't imagine why. Paul, uh... Paul Tyson. He has a home and everything on 23rd Street. Home and everything. I've been watching. One more question. You killed George Lane? No. Look. You get around. You ever run across a nice orphan in the market for a mom? You tell him about me, hmm? I'm nice. I'm kind. I'm... Uh-huh. That's what I am. Goodbye, Miss Carson. Uh-huh. Bye. <laughs> I've got no regrets, Mr. Clover. Nice wife, nice kids, nice view here from the office window. You notice the view? Yes, I did, Mr. Tyson. Now, uh, if you... Sure, uh... I would have married Mady before George Lane came along, that is. A matter of pride after that. What do you mean? She threw me over for him. Then Lane whirled her around a few times and pointed her back to me. Pride. I told her to go away. You want to tell me about George Lane? A very strong man. A very great hand wrestler. After what he did to me in front of Mady, I went out and married a woman taller than I am, and all my children are small for their age. 
There's a very psychological novel in there someplace. Did you kill George Lane? He scared me to death. That's a motive, isn't it? No, I didn't kill him. And you mean what you said, Mr. Tyson, about no regrets? Why do you ask? Well, maybe just clutching a straw now that you're married, a nostalgia for Mady, and the reason you didn't marry her motive. Nothing like that, Mr. Clover. Nothing's left of what I once felt for Mady. When she came back from George Lane, she wasn't Mady anymore. Oh? She was suddenly a, a sad woman, no more spirit. She even started to wear gray dresses with high linen collars. Tough about her. Didn't matter to me. I've got a wife and all the kids I want, and I'm very happy. I'm too happy to murder anybody, Mr. Clover. Know what I mean? And hit the street again. An early afternoon of summer, riot of summer, and quiet places of summer. Side street of hurdy-gurdy man. And the June dance of a wise little monkey. Red cap, little bells, and a very special routine for lady watchers. And a quarter in the cup, and a pat on the skull from a lady watcher, bare-legged and sandaled. Watch it for a while longer, walk away from it, toward river. And consider a crisscross of lives. George Lane's with Mady Carson. George Lane's with Paul Tyson. George Lane's with Mr. and Mrs. Harry Webster, and with their daughter. George Lane, murdered man who made small dyings for people he touched. The Summer River for a while, then back to it, because there's nowhere else. The job, headquarters... In your office, a woman waiting for you. Hello, Mrs. Webster. You wanted to see me about something? Yes. About my husband. About Harry. What about him? About Harry and George. Well... They'd known each other a long time. Twenty years. Go on. From the time I had my daughter, Sylvia. All the time she was growing well, up. Mrs. Webster... Please. All right. When... When Sylvia was a child... George Lane was a better father to her, actually, than Harry ever was. What are you getting at, Mrs. Weston? Please. George brought her things Harry never dreamed a little girl would love. He read to her, played with her, brought a look to the child's face Harry had never seen and, and could never understand why. You're trying to tell me... And with me, George danced well and laughed well and made up naughty little sayings and, and then... Then what? Sylvia's grown up now. And George noticed it by the way he offered to take her home the other night. And what I've come to tell you, Mr. Clover. What? I think my husband, Harry, killed George Lane. If he did, he should suffer for it. Isn't that right? Doesn't an evil deed deserve... Where's your husband now? With my daughter. Her apartment on West 12th. That's all, Mrs. Webster. Now, you, you won't tell him that I... I don't care. Tell him if you want. Oh. Oh, what do you want? I'd like to talk with you, Miss Webster. Okay. Well, well... Can we go inside? I'm a busy little girl tonight. I've got company. Your father won't mind. Oh. Well, you know he's here, huh? Okay, come on in. Pop? Hi there, Clover. Good evening, Mr. Webster. We went gambling, Mr. Clover. Just a little father-daughter gin game. Loser runs down to the corner and buys a quart of ice cream. Grab a chair. We'll make it three-handed. Mr. Clover says he came here to talk. Oh, that's fine. To me, Pop. Oh, oh like that, huh? It's like what, Mr. Clover? Uh, I'd better go. That's all right, Mr. Webster. Stay. I want to talk to both of you. Hey, now, you see. Your wife thinks you might have killed George Lane. Yeah. Yes, I figured she would. Did you? I told you he was a man I respected more. Oh, cut it out. Well, it's true. Is it? Sure, I told you. But you still haven't told me the answer to the question, Mr. Webster. I didn't kill him. That only leaves your daughter. (laughs) The heat must have got. Then who else would you say it leaves, Miss Webster? Pop. The heat really got to him, didn't it? Why don't you level, Pop? Huh? About George. What you really thought of him. Listen, why don't you tell Mr. Clover how you hated George? I've already found out some things about him. Like what? That he was a dominating man. That he destroyed everything he touched. Did you find that out? How did you feel about him, Miss Webster? Look. Yes. I hated him. 
all my life. He made me feel small, unimportant. He paid my wages, and when he felt like it, he took over my family. You know, he took your daughter home after your party? Look, you didn't let me finish. Don't get crazy. Well, he didn't let me finish, and I want to finish. I went to his hotel, and I killed him. See what's become of my father, Mr. Clover. He, he's become ridiculous. Pop, Pop. It's a truth, Sylvia. You know what kind of a hotel George was killed in? Sylvia. The cheapest joint he could find, not his hotel. Sylvia. Where he wanted me to meet him. Shut up. Where I met him. Where I killed him. You know why? You know why, Mr. Clover. Like everybody else, I fell flat on my face for him. Twenty years he was building me up to being alone with him. Please, Sylvia, you just shut up. Instead of going home, he said he had a place he wanted to show me. I would have gone any place with him. Worshipped him, Pop. He took me to that place. I stretched out my arms to him. And all he did was laugh at me and started to walk out. Destroyed me. And that's all he wanted. Sylvia. I'm sorry. No. Listen to me. I'm glad you did it. Yeah. But I should have done it. You couldn't. You didn't have the strength. He destroyed you long ago. It's the journey to the end of all the other streets in the world, Broadway. You turn a corner and you're there. Walk it slowly. Lean your heart against it. Shop for the kicks, the bargains, the heartbreak, until all explodes in your face. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Totaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Barbara Eider was heard as Sylvia, and Herb Butterfield as Harry. Featured in the cast were Paula Winslow, Irene Tedrow, James McCallion, and Lou Merrill. Bill Anders speaking. <laughs> This coming Monday night, where CBS Radio has been bringing you its production of Suspense, listen for the new mystery series called Crime Classics. This Monday on Crime Classics, you will hear a report on the crime of Bathsheba Spooner, the complete story of the first woman tried for murder in the United States. Crime Classics premiere performance this Monday on most of these same CBS radio stations. And remember, for thrilling dramas of escape, listen Sunday nights to the CBS Radio Network. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. (laughs) 
When it's evening and the summer moon starts its circuit over Broadway, the mob scurries to its favorite cooling places. The bars fling wide their gates to let enter the kindly folk with thirst. And the orange juice stand is oasis in the middle of concrete desert. Also to be noted, vision of Wiener, Bagel, and the waitress with a delicate air. And below all of it, subway islands where winds are blown down the tracks on a voice of steel that screams. And behind it, alley and hand out of warm beer through the tear in the screen. New evening on Broadway. Have it. And at headquarters, last trip to water cooler on your homeward way out the door. The door is open for you. Two men, Dr. Sinsky and the man who protests. What would you bring me in here for? For a chat. Consider it a privilege, Mr. Nelson, that you are in condition to chat. Uh, sit down. No, if look. the doctor wants you to sit, mister, he probably thinks it's a good idea. Okay, okay. Now what? It's a nice job of patching up, wouldn't you say so, Danny? Of course, you can't see most of the damage. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Nelson, Lieutenant Clover. Who worked you over, Mr. Nelson? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, here's the report that goes with him, Danny. Uh, Mr. Nelson was picked up draped over a garbage can in an alley back of Third Avenue. What's this mean, Dr. Sinsky? The handwriting or the terminology? Well, just read it to me, that's all. Everything. Yeah, I know. It all looks like a prescription. Uh, Mr. Nelson, it says here, has suffered a 10-inch gash which nicked the periosteum. Oh, come on. The rib casing. It caused either by a knife or glass or some sharp instrument. Uh, this, Mr. Nelson, here, this gentleman, I would say represents a still living example of attempted murder. Isn't that right, Mr. Nelson? I feel fine. He feels fine. Ever, never better. I can't remember an evening... You missing when... a ring, Mr. Nelson? Huh? On your left hand. Looks like you'd been wearing a ring. Wouldn't you say so, Doctor? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Were you robbed of it? Beaten, Mr. Nelson? Uh, over here on the report, here, it, it says he has his wallet with $63. So yeah, you... I see. Are you going to tell us what happened, Mr. Nelson? Then you can get out of here. Watch the man rise, then slap dust from his clothing and gently from the places of pain and shake the head at blood-spattered shirt, adjust the tie, assume the grin, and watch him leave. And with him, seepage of day into fall of night. And for the policeman, night break between violences. Time of end to day's work. Time of summer night. Time of invitation. You got nothing better, Danny. Pinochle, my house, Mrs. Sinsky will... And say no thanks to first invitation of night. Clear the desk, hit the street, drift with night current till nighttime strands you against a doorway, which is where room is and summer sleep. <laughs> Next morning, chain reaction. Waking, which begets hot coffee to dissolve dreaming, which begets subway, which begets headquarters and office and Detective Mugovan. Morning, Danny. Good morning. Sleep good? Mm-hmm. Ask me how I slept. Yeah, I'll do that. Not good. Mrs. and I tried to park for a while. Couldn't sleep. Mugovan. Back home, still couldn't sleep. Why well, I came in real early today. Why I wandered around sticking my nose You got and... something, Mugovan? Just tell me, huh? I'm too beat to fence with you, Danny. Yeah, yeah, I got something. I think I got something. Because I nosed in on night watch reports. Because you got here real early. What? Well, that man Dr. Sinsky brought to you last night, that beat-up Mark Nelson, the still mouth. What about him? You know what he went and did after he left here? No. I didn't think you did. Uh, Mugovan, it... <laughs> Oh, you want me, Danny. You really did. <sighs> All right, midnight. Mark Nelson shows up 205th Precinct, signs a robbery complaint against the Joan Parker. Go on. Nelson tells the precinct boys that Joan Parker was at a party at his house. When Joan left, the guests noticed there were things missing from their person, money and things. Nelson said he'd take care of it, said he knew where Joni hung out. Tommy's Bar, 18th and 3rd. And you know what? No. I said no, Mark. <laughs> precinct boy picked this Joni up. She was doing mirror sketches at Tony's bar at the time. A precinct boy tucked her drawing finger in his palm, dragged her out of there, brought her back to the precinct where... Well, where what? Where Mark Nelson cried a little, apologized to Joan, who cried a little. Then the complaint was dropped, and the precinct boys pushed them both out the door onto the street. Well, I got Nelson's address from Dr. Sinsky's report. Uh, you got the... Uh, I've been very keen this morning, Danny, yeah. Joan Parker, 1834 West 19. We'll have a nice ride, huh, Danny? Ride now the late morning street, dappled with sun and people. Street slowed down according to the heat and according to who's walking in front of you. 
Broadway and leave it. Ride to the west and the row houses turning ragged. Brownstone becoming tenement. Process hastened by heat, chemistry, chalk, boys, disintegration of plaster and attitudes, girls, rust, and jaunty landlords. Address in middle of the block. Cast of characters in the vestibule. Joan Parker, apartment 1C. Try the door. Hmm. Danny? Yeah. Uh, anyone here? Let's go in, Michael. Hey, somebody really tried to mess this place up. Uh huh. Hey, here, I'll take a look. Mm, blood. Take a look in that room there. Mm. Anything? Somebody left the water running. A lot of blood in the sink. Hey, you say you got Mark Nelson's address, Danny? Let's go talk to him. <laughs> My husband isn't home, and I'm sure I don't understand well, what... Well, it's very I... simple, Mrs. Nelson. That you're of the police is a simple fact, easily understood. But that you're here in my home, in Mark's home, that becomes confusing. Well, just a few answers, Mrs. Nelson. About the party last night, for instance, well, about... How the... ridiculous. What? I said, and very plainly, how ridiculous. What is? Well, there was no party here last night, and no girl who robbed anyone. Mark and I have not had a party for months... Not, that is, where other people have been invited. You see... Go on, Miss Nelson. Well, I, I was afraid it would sound mawkish, but why should I be afraid, I asked myself. Mark and I are two people desperately in love. From the days of courting up until this very moment, 28 years of love and... You get along fine, you and Mark? You, uh, you won't laugh. No? It was written in heaven... About Mark and me. And he's not home. Hasn't been all night. No. Where is he? Well, I, I don't know. He was not at home last night, nor this morning. And I'm weak with grief, I can tell you. This is not like Mark. Never like oh, Mark. Mrs. Nelson. But my Mark will explain. My husband... Mrs. Nelson. Will... Uh, yes? Last night, your husband was beaten, knifed. Mark? That happened to Mark? Why? Why? He wouldn't tell us who had done it or why. Then you know where he is, and he's hurt, and you must tell we me. We don't know where he is. We know this. Around midnight last night, he swore out a complaint against a girl he said had robbed his guests at a party. But so ridiculous. I've already told then you... Then the that... girl was brought in, and your husband apologized to her and dropped the complaint. Who was the girl? Earlier, your husband told me he had not been robbed, but his hand looked as if there'd been a ring on it. Oh, of course. His wedding ring. Like mine, see? Mark and I had a double ring ceremony, and I've never removed mine. And... And what? Oh, so confusing. Mark's came in the mail this morning, addressed to Mark. But we always open each other's mail. No secrets ever. May no... I see it, please? Of course. The, the ring and the envelope it came in... Hmm. No return address. No. Who was the girl, Mark? Had... Uh, Joan Parker. You know her, Mrs. Nelson? Mark will tell me all about her when he gets home. All about her. Everything about her. All right. Uh, thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Nelson. Danny? Oh, what, my gun? Call came in on the car radio. Just coming to get you. Homicide. Lexington in the 50th. Alley about three blocks away. Woman, knifed, dead. The throat of violence, the sound of death discovered and built into a mechanical device, the siren. Cover yourself with it and ride it. And three blocks away, slow the momentum for a right-hand turn into an alley where beginning crowd has sensed death and wants a look, an up-close look, and is annoyed that authority rides the squad car and so crowd must get out of the way. And violence is today a woman. Approximate age, difficult to determine because of facial expression. Approximate height, difficult to determine because of attitude of body. Stabbed 
twice. Both deep enough to cause death. Is oh, that a pocketbook over there? Oh, yeah. Here. Hmm. Anything? Yeah. Wallet. What's the matter? Oh, take a look at her identification card, her name. Joan Parker. The girl Mark Nelson had arrested, huh? The girl who had a wrecked room. Uh huh. Well, now we don't have to wonder why it was wrecked. Make you feel better, Danny? You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Americans, men and women from teenage up, you are urged to enroll for Ground Observer Corps service in your locality. You are needed immediately, and the job to be filled is an important one. Write or telephone your nearest civil defense center, or write to Ground Observer Corps, Air Force, Washington, 25, D.C. That's your own civil defense center, or Ground Observer Corps, Air Force, Washington, 25, D.C. <laughs> Afternoon sun hammers summer deep into Broadway's pavement, and the perfumes of the season lay in from the Catskills, where Mom is, and the kids, and from the island of Coney, where the uke is plucked and the portable radio hangs ripe on umbrella trees, and from the beaches of far Rockaway, where later the night fires will keep the feet warm, and also the heart, and wish you were there. But content now, because a girl just walked by in strapless raiment, and the season dances round her languid walk, and her passing reflected in chrome and steel. And suddenly between you, big crowd and loss. So order the beer, skim off the longing. Summer, too, will finally pass. But Tartaglia, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia, will forever be with you. Through thick and thin. What? I said through thick and thin. I did something, Danny? Well, Gino... I stand here quietly. I observe how you gaze through yon window. And I know the turmoil of your feelings and the dangers you are facing on some forbidden shore. And I say, rely on me, Danny, through thick and thin. Thank you, Gino. How many years together now, Danny? I shouldn't ken your moods. You got something for me, Gino? Your secret adventurings. The clanger could take notes on... The who? The clanger, the two-fisted guitar-strumming adventurer whose books and whose exploits I have lent to you who could well take notes from you on exploits that are exploits. Not true to life, the twanger, huh? As of last night's book, My Colt is Hot, I have grown to hate him. He did something I won't mention. I'm sorry to hear that, Gino. Ah, well, twangers come, twangers go. To work, shall we, Danny? All right. The all-points bulletin you issued on Mark Nelson? Yeah? It is still papering the various precincts and patrol cars and the mats of beat walkers. And Mark Nelson is still footloose. Anything else? From Detective Mugovan on routine legwork. That the marriage of Mark and Helen Nelson was blessed 25 years ago with an offspring. A boy. Now 25. Name Richard Nelson. With a business of his own. And a place of his own. Which addresses I now tend you. Oh, thank you, Jim. I'm not finished. Oh. Well? Well, you said you weren't finished, Gino. Pardon the loss of the thought. It's summer, Danny. From lab and technical, a report on the findings in the apartment of the deceased Joan Parker, which consists in the most part of gentlemen's watch fobs, keychains, fraternity pins, chevrons, both Army, Navy, and Marine, assorted cufflinks, also girls' jewelry of remnant sale type, also... Also what? That Joan Parker was a constant frequenter of Tommy's Bar on 3rd and 18th. You have a word for Mrs. T? Well, tell her you were splendid today, Gino. I shall. And thank you. What's yours, mister? Oh, uh, hold that badge closer, huh? Uh, P-O-L-I-C-E. What's yours, mister? I'm looking for the owner. Me. You know a girl named Joan Parker? Uh, let me think. Uh, let me put it this way. Do you know a girl named Joan Parker? 
Georgia! Georgia, come here a minute. He's a cop, Georgia. He just asked me about a girl named Joan Parker. Just because a girl by that name gets found in an alley, he comes here and asks a question like that. At first, I tried to give him the impression that such a girl was a stranger to us. But now I think you better have a seat with a gentleman and talk to him. You want a beer, Georgia? You, mister? One beer. Joan Parker was a dear friend of mine. We used to date together often. I suppose that's because we had the same likes and dislikes. Thanks, Tommy. I don't like beer. It makes me fat. But I like the big glasses it's served in. To move it over the wet on the bar. All around. It's good for an afternoon mood. Joan was a nice girl. It was easy to be fond of her. She was easy to get along with. She had a habit of collecting things, mister. She collected things. There was a guy here. There was a guy here, mister. He resented the fact that Joni's collecting things. And we don't want any trouble here at all. Uh, I don't know the man's name. Do you know the man's name, Georgia? No. No, I don't. That's about it, mister. That what you wanted to know? Walk out of the place where summer ritual is a woman making beer scrawlings across moist of bar. Woman waiting, woman of prepared speech for any occasion. And the ride downtown now to gray building darkening under veil of twilight. Elevator ascent to 12th floor where office of Richard Nelson is. Richard Nelson, broker on glass pebble of door. And find it locked. And be called back by the elevator man and be scolded if you had bothered to ask could have saved you and him and the whole world a lot of trouble. Richard Nelson had gone home, closed up, gone home. So uptown again and to the apartment of Richard Nelson, broker, son of Mark and Helen Nelson, son of beaten man, of wanted men. What does a man have to believe in to finish a shower? Look, you, you Richard I... Nelson? I better be. For your sake, I wasn't. I could get very, very irritated. Who wants Richard Nelson? Police. You? Mm-hmm. Well, look. Yeah. Uh, you got a badge to keep you warm. Me, you mind I go wrapping a towel, something around the frame? No. Thanks, Evans. In a sec, kid. Oh, what with the blush and all, I don't remember. I asked you in, I thought the etiquette went, you stay. Forget it, I'm in. Yeah, you're in. And I got a very eager date waiting in a bar uptown, and her eager runs out when I'm late, so, uh, like that, huh? You know about your father. I know about my father. He's wanted for murder. It surprised me, too. The hidden power and secrets old dads carry in their bones. You know where he is? I knew, I think I'd tell you. Out of a pure filial emotion. Dads hasn't got the wind to keep running, shakes up his heart. Once he ran after me, it took 12 tears and three cold applications to bring him to Your him. father and mother... Now, what about moms and dads? They love each other very much. They... <laughs> You're finagling around to that dame. He stuck in the pokey, then pulled right out again. The murder. Well, just dad. answer me uh, about your mother and... How they love? Now, don't laugh at me, son, but it was written in heaven about your father and me. <laughs> My mom said that. Like that, huh? They hate each other. Can't stand the sight of each other, and the honey flows out of their mouths like wine. They couldn't take it, so I beat it. Hey, look, my eager date, you used up yeah, of... Goodbye, son. Yes, what is it? Mrs. Nelson out here to see you, Danny. Oh, show her right in, Gino. This way to see Danny Clover. Come right in, Mrs. Nelson. Where is my husband? Oh, please, won't you sit down? Where is he? What's happening here? I'd be glad to help Danny. No, that's all right, you know. All I want to know is where he is. Don't you people have any Gino. feelings? Gino. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Oh, Mrs. Nelson. If something's happened to him, please. We don't know where he is. I want you to help me. Listen to me. All right. I, I'm going to sit down like you asked me. And I'm going to control myself. 
I want you to help me do that. Now, just listen to what I have to say. It's been inside, and I have... What do you want to tell me, Mrs. Nelson? I don't know what Mark has done. We think he... I won't listen to it. Whatever it is, just be gentle with him, so that when all of this is over and he comes back to me, I'll have his place all set, and I won't mention it. You're very fond of him, aren't you? When people ask me that, I always tell them that our marriage is made in heaven. You're very fortunate. And here we are together, Mark and I, at a crossroad. Somehow, Mark has been wicked. I know something. What? Tell me what you think he's done. You've changed your mind? So I'll know how to suffer with him. You mean you can do that by degrees, Mrs. Nelson? You don't have to be... I... I'll stick by him. I want you to know that. Whatever he's done... What is it, Gino? Out here, Lieutenant. It's important. Oh, pardon me, Mrs. Nelson. The most terrible thing you could think of, and I'd stick by him. They found him, Danny. Spotted him in a room near the East River docks. Muggerman's got the address. Waiting in a squad car downstairs. Thanks, Gino. Now you can go in and talk to her. Now I don't know what to say to her. Seth Muggerman? All set up, Danny. Stakeout's complete. Everybody's cleared out of the house except him. Okay, you're here. Hey, careful, Danny. He fired a Dennison through the door. Just take it easy, that's all. Nelson. This building... Don't be a fool! Saving the last bullet for myself. Listen, Nelson, you know me. I don't care who you are. Danny! What do you want, Muggerman? Look what... Please, let me talk to him. Officer Curcio brought her here. She tried to crash a stake out. He's my husband. I have more right to him than you. What about it, Danny? I... I'm very calm. I know now Mark has done something enormously wrong. I want to talk to him. Let her come up. Where is he? Come on. Stand right here. Nelson! What do you want? Mark? Mark? It's Helen, your wife. Mark! Oh, hello, Mark. Put down that gun, Nelson. Do what he tells you, dear. Why did you have to bring her here and let her see me? Dear. The gun, Nelson. No. No. I haven't made up my mind yet what I'm going to do with it. And you can shoot me and kill me if you want. Is that my Mark talking like that? You don't know what's happened, Helen. I want to tell you something, Mark. What? Your wedding ring... Listen, You Helen. must have lost it or something. It came back today in the mail. Some kind person. Helen. Here. Here it is. And tonight we'll put my ring next to yours. Clover. What? Doesn't she know what's happened to me? She knows. She hasn't made up her mind whether to believe it or not. Listen, Helen. You put down that gun, you hear? Helen. Mm -hmm. You remember, sweetie? Sweetie. Get away. Mm -hmm. Helen. Drop the gun, Nels. Drop it. Oh. Just stay where you are. You remember. Helen. I met a girl. She teased me. She wanted to wear my wedding ring. It's all right. I tell you, it's all right. See? I have it. She wanted to wear it, else she said she wouldn't like me. Then she wouldn't give it back to me. I followed her to a bar. I had a fight with a man she was with. I fell and cut myself on a broken bottle. You come right home. And then home. they threw me in an alley. Later, I, I had the girl arrested so I could get close to her, so I could kill her. 
That was foolish. She sent the ring back. Do you know what I'm saying? I gave her my wedding ring. Don't you understand? Mark. What? I have to stop pretending now. Don't I? Really pretending. After 28 years of pretending. Helen. Helen. Helen! Dawn reaches Broadway now, and the remnants of the night are driven back into the earth. You walk the street, and from behind the doorway, you hear the old sound, the sound of weeping. And you know the nighttime will never leave. It's found its hiding place. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Paula Winslow was heard as Helen and Jay Novello as Mark Nelson. Featured in the cast were Charlotte Lawrence, Clayton Post, and High Everback. George Walsh speaking. Later tonight, Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, faces the wrath of a powerful enemy in a city gripped by fear. Also tonight on most of these same stations... Gangbusters brings us The Giveaway, Part 2. It's the story of the slickest jailbreak ever pulled off and what followed when police recovered from their surprise. Tonight on CBS Radio, hear Gangbusters and Tarzan for thrills of fact and of fiction. Sunday night's Dick Powell is rough, tough Richard Diamond, private detective on the CBS Radio Network. Rocky Jordan. It was a hot afternoon in Cairo when she walked into the cafe tambourine. She was beautiful, but there was something else. Something so wrong with the picture that I couldn't take my eyes off her. It wasn't the blonde hair piled on top of her head or the dress that clung to her like a football player covering a fumble nor even the set expression on her face. But when she stopped in front of me, I knew what it was. She was all woman, but not an inch under six feet four. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with a man named Rocky Jordan proprietor of the Café Tambourine in Cairo. 
Cairo, gateway to the ancient East, where modern life unfolds against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Bartered Bridegroom. We've had a pretty fair assortment of customers in the tambourine. Almost anything on feet. But when I looked up into that icy-faced six-feet-four of blonde female, I knew we had our first Amazon. You're ready, Mr. Jordan? Uh, ready? You're wasting time, Jordan. I didn't catch the name. Lily Carroll. You're being rude. The face is familiar. Maybe we met in Istanbul. No, Jordan. Alexandria, maybe? The arrangements are made. You're stalling. Look, uh, suppose we take it from the top of the page, Miss Carroll. Naturally, you're interested in the money. This, too, has been taken care of. Now about the ceremony. Ceremony? The wedding. Be there in an hour. Oh, sure. I'll be there in plenty of time. I'm a great believer in weddings. Oh, by the way, uh, who's getting married? I am, Mr. Jordan. To you. Uh, maybe we'd better go into my office. That will not be necessary. Timmy Rogers has made all the arrangements. Timmy Rogers? Now, I know we'd better go into the office. She sat across the desk from me and lit a king-sized cigarette. The hand that held the match wore a queen-sized diamond. It sent a reflection against the wall. I didn't like the way the reflection quivered. Her face was under control, but her hands gave her away. She was a nervous bride. Timmy should have explained these details. And if I know Timmy Rogers, he doesn't bother with details. That's unfortunate. Nevertheless, in one hour, you and I shall be married. You will receive $5,000. Is that clear? Oh, very. It is not enough money? Oh, uh, it's not entirely it, Miss Karoff. Having never been married before... You are being rude again. I plan to leave Cairo immediately after the ceremony. Really? Tell me, Miss Karoff, uh, where are we going on our honeymoon? Enough, Jordan. I will not be insulted further. You will receive the $5,000 as soon as I have sold my interest in the club Fashad. Fashad? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I remember you and Mike Sloan bought that together recently. Yes, but I am selling my interest. Is a matter of business falling off? No, not business. You see, I'm a white Russian. Certain of my friends have been disappearing lately. I do not wish the same thing to happen to me. I see. But this is not what I came to talk about. Now, the wedding... Look, Lily, I've got news for you. I'm not in the mood for marriage. Your moods do not interest me, Jordan. You are going to marry me. Mm. And I'll admit you're more persuasive with a gun. You will not refuse me. Maybe it didn't occur to you, Lil, but you can't marry a dead man. Ah, come on, put the gun away. There are many other ways to make certain you do not back out. Jordan, be at my club in one hour. It means your life. <laughs> She moved out of the office as silently as an Arab folding his tent. I followed her out in time to see her climb into a black sedan two feet shorter than the Queen Mary. It faded off into the crowded street. I stood there trying to figure out where I could rent a tux cheap when a hand thumped against my back. I turned to see a watered-down version of Tyrone Power, all of five feet five in his elevated shoes. It was none other than the little fixer himself, Timmy Rogers. Rocky, old kid. I just saw her leaving. Congratulations, kid. Uh, this makes my day complete. I'm so happy for you, kid. You'll make a lovely bridegroom. Slow down, kid. You're drooling on my wedding suit. <laughs> what a woman. You're a picker, Jordan, if I ever saw one. Aren't you forgetting one little item? You picked her, not me. A mere formality. Greatest girl this side of Minsk. Well, at least the biggest. But, Rock, kid, for $2,000, how can you miss? It's even less interesting for 2000 Huh? How's that, Rock? Lily offered me five. Well, what do you know? She really must be scared. Okay, suppose you give me the straight story. Well, Rock, uh, well, well, I'll tell You're you. Still I... listening? Well, look, why don't you and I go into the bar for a drink, Rock, and I'll tell you all about it. I followed the little man into the bar. We pulled up on a couple of empty stools by the open front door. Timmy Rogers rubbed his hands, licked his lips, and ordered a double orange blossom. Ah, uh, orange blossom for a wedding day, huh, Rock? Uh, 
Now, where was I? You and Lily Caro, remember? <clears throat> yeah. Well, Sir Rock, it's like this. Lil has a few roulette wheels out in the back room of her joint, as you know. Mm. The other night, I ran into as tough a streak of luck as has been seen in Cairo since Happy Harper was picked up for trying to sell some tourists the Sphinx. How much? Uh, how much? Uh, how much? Uh, well, I, uh... I dropped $5,000, which it just so happens I couldn't cover at the bank. Mm-hmm. So then came Lily. Yeah. Lily made me a proposition. She'll forget the 5000 if I marry her. Sure. But it turns out she's looking for an American. She wants a ticket to the USA. Oh, that pitch, huh? Well, can't say that I blame her, Rock. Things can get pretty rough around Cairo for the wrong... Hey, hey, hold it. Huh? That guy's been staring at me too long. Standing there in the open doorway was a brown suit full of balloon-shaped Egyptian. His eyes didn't leave my face as he hooked his cane over one arm and smoothed his white gloves with his hand. He tipped the brown bowler on his fat head and waddled toward me. You are Mr. Rocky Jordan? Yeah? I am Mahmoud Pasha. My card. Hmm. Well, what's on your mind? I will not waste time. Mr. Jordan, regarding your coming marriage to Miss Lily Karoff. Oh, I suppose you're the bride's father. Indeed, I am not. My affection for Miss Karoff is not paternal. I have come to offer you $10,000 if you do not go through with this wedding. Ten? Huh. It's the best offer I've had all day. In cash, Mr. Jordan. And if it makes you feel any better, Pasha, you can forget... <laughs> I hit the floor fast Over my head, the big mirror behind the bar Shattered in rain glass When the rain stopped, I jumped up and raced for the door Outside, there was a dent in the usual late afternoon traffic And down the street, shot a black sedan It was the same car Lily Karoff had stepped into 15 minutes ago Well... That gave me something to think about as I walked back into my cafe to survey the damage. The man in the brown bowler had vanished. Underneath a table, his broken cocktail glass in his hand was Timmy Rogers. I helped him to his feet. All right, little man, fit that into your patch story. I had nothing to do with it, Rocky, so help me. You'll have to do better than that. Rock, listen, I didn't know Lily would go that far. It wasn't Lily. She may be in a hurry for a wedding, but she doesn't want to marry a corpse. Well, maybe she was only trying to scare you, Rock. Could be, but I don't like her idea of a wedding invitation. Come on, let's go. What are you going to do, Rocky? I'm going to pay my respects to the bride. It started with an Amazon looking for a husband, and then a two-bit gambler with a sense of humor. Then in comes a fat man in a brown bowler who wants to pay for no wedding at all. <laughs> Rocky Jordan, parted bridegroom. I shoved Timmy Rogers into a cab and hopped in behind him. I gave the cabbie the address, Club Fashad. Ten minutes later, we pulled up in front of a big streamlined white building. I paid the driver and we got out. The sign on the door said not open until seven o'clock. Hmm. Sometimes you can't believe in signs. Coming down the corridor was a slim, touched character named Mike Sloan, manager and co-owner of the club for shot. A nasty smile cracked his face. Oh, I'd seen Sloan kicking around Cairo before, and I didn't like him. I like him even less now. Well, Rocky Jordan, congratulations. Listen, Sloan, I didn't come here for... Oh, now, don't bother to explain, Jordan. I understand. You, uh, got our wedding invitation? Oh, sure. The bride wore a thirty-eight. Uh... Lily is sometimes a little impulsive, Jordan. After all, no one was hurt. But you'll get a bill for that mirror. We're ready for the wedding. You're wasting time. It's off, Sloan. Couldn't find the right size wedding cake. Rogers, what about that? I thought Jordan was all lined up. I, I did my best. I'm not wife. backing out of it now, Jordan. Let's go. The bride's waiting. Pack her in ice. She'll keep. I'm out of it. Too easy, Jordan. Not a chance. <laughs> Just watch me. Rocky, listen. You're making a mistake. You sure are, Jordan. Oh, I see. It's going to be one of those uh, shotgun affairs, huh? Well, I wouldn't want to have to kill you. This way, Jordan. 
The gun in Mike Sloan's hand didn't move. It buried itself into the middle of my spine. Jimmy Rogers wrung his hands and trailed along behind us. Sloan walked me down a thick carpeted corridor, and we turned left into the main office of the club for shod. The blinds were drawn. Sloan slammed the door behind us. Coming toward me from the other side of the room was Lily Karoff, with gold earrings swinging like pendants. She was poured into a glaring red dress that revealed an awful lot of the new look. Well, Jordan, I see you couldn't pass up the money. Tell your boy Sloan to get the gun out of my back and I'll show you how fast I can pass it up. Mike, is everything prepared? Ready and waiting, Lily. In fact... Lily, my flower. Lily, what's happening? It was the balloon-shaped Egyptian in the brown bowler. His cane still draped gracefully over one arm. As he paddled toward us, his mouth fell open. Inside was a small fortune in gold fillings. What are they doing to you, my delicate Lily? Ackman, please leave at once. I do not need your help. But, my Lily, I'm here to protect you. These men, they are making a fool of you. Do not believe Get me. Get out of here, Pasha. This is out of your range. Please, Lily, my blossom, I beg you to see reason. These men, they only mean to do you harm. I... The lights. Where are the lights? Help! Pool of black ink. I dive for the spot where Sloan had stood with the gun. I felt hot air on my neck and turned. The carpet came up and made a fuzzy pillow for my cheek. As everything folded into a nightmare of spinning rooms. And somewhere off in the distance, I, I heard the toll of wedding bells. Tonight's story continues in just a moment. We're sure you listeners, many of whom have written letters to CBS, are happy to know that Rocky Jordan is back on the air. Yes, Rocky Jordan joins one of the most outstanding mystery lineups in radio. Over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour, each Sunday evening, will be the time for Rocky Jordan. Now, back to tonight's story, The Bartered Bridegroom. It was still the office of Lily Karoff. I opened my eyes into a stream of water cascading down my nose. It was coming from a big white pitcher. Holding the pitcher was Sam Sabaya, Captain, Cairo Police. Well, well, Jordan. You know, Jordan, on you, this carpet looks very good. I wish I could say the same thing for my head. What happened, Sam? Nothing unusual for you, Jordan. Only murder. Look, beside you. Really? Miss Lily Karoff, quite dead. Like a model for a detective magazine cover. Mm. Only she is not posing, Jordan. Uh, okay, Sam. Am I booked? Not yet, Jordan. Not yet. The dialogue wasn't exactly sparkling on the way to the Cairo jail. Sam confined himself to a few official grunts, and I sat back and watched traffic. In ten minutes, we... Pulled up to a sand-colored building, and Sabaya and I got out. I followed Sam to a small back room. He closed the door and pulled up a couple of chairs. Uh, uh, coffee, Jordan? Oh, I need more than coffee, Sam. Uh, but we serve only coffee here. Sorry. <clears throat> now, please uh, tell me everything. Uh, beginning when? The police received an anonymous phone call to come to the club facade at once. I arrived to find the body of Lily Karoff shot to death. The gun that apparently killed her was in your hand. Oh, you tell it much better, Sam. Go ahead, go ahead. Never mind, Jordan. I'm waiting for your story. All right, I'll make it brief. Lily came by my office this afternoon with the idea of marrying me. She said something about wanting to leave the country. Leave the country? She's a white Russian, Sam. Mm -hmm. Said certain friends of hers had been disappearing lately. Hey, underground stuff, maybe, huh? Uh, yeah. Underground, of course. Very likely. Well, that's what the lady said, Sam. The lady deceived you, Jordan. I will show you. Now, 
Here we are. A complete report on any and all underground activities in Cairo in the past year. Look, not one case of unexplained uh, disappearance, as you call it. Well, uh, Sam, a good job wouldn't leave a case history for the police. Jordan, I'm afraid you have been taken in by this fantastic story. Mm -hmm. Live and learn. Well, anyway, after Lily, my next caller was Timmy Rogers. He's a small-time gambler. He gave Lily the idea about marrying me. Mm -hmm. Go on. Then a short, fat man in a brown bowler shows up. Lily's stage door Johnny. He tries to buy me out of the marriage. Mm. Jordan, I'm trying very hard to believe you. So then Mike Sloan, one of Lily's boys, shot up my place just so I wouldn't forget. It's my wedding day. All right, I went to Lily's to set everybody straight, and that's where you found me. Jordan, what about this man in the brown bowler? His name is... uh, Ahmed Pasha. We got anything on him, Sam? <laughs> Certainly, Jordan. Ahmed Pasha happens to be one of the richest men in Cairo. Yeah, but... And the most respected. He is a business broker of high reputation. He buys and sells business enterprises. Like uh, nightclubs? And why not? Uh, Jordan, you are beginning to waste my time. <clears throat> It is not likely that you killed Dilly and then struck yourself on the head. Therefore, I shall release you with the usual warning. Jordan, do oh, not... Oh, not again, Sam. I've heard that speech before. No, I'm not leaving Cairo. I like it here. I strolled out of Sam's office and onto the busy street. The neon signs were beginning to light up, which reminded me that the night crowd would be moving into the Cafe Tambourine. But there was one little matter that came before business. Murder. I was only a block away from the station when a small character stepped out of a darkened doorway. Well, 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 Rock, old kid, I've been looking all over for you. Why don't you try the other side of town? Listen, Rock, I didn't know it would turn out this way. I just read the extra about Lily. Look, Rock, you got to believe me. I ran out of Lily's place the minute the lights went out. I didn't know about it till later. Sam Sabaya might like to hear that story. Look, Rock, I saw something in that room. You know who turned out those lights? Sloan did it. I saw him. It's not news, little man. But Mike Sloan has some answers, and that's the man I'm going to see. But, Rock, he wouldn't be hanging around the facade. Uh, maybe we ought to go back to your place and uh, uh, get a drink first, huh? Hey, maybe you're right for once in your life. You give me an idea. Timmy Rogers and I headed back to the Cafe Tambourine. At every corner, Timmy looked four ways before crossing the street. It was exactly 7.30 when we walked in the front door. I worked my way through the crowded tables toward my office. Timmy Rogers hung on my coattail like a scared kid at a bargain counter. I opened the door. Just as the books were beginning to balance, I knew I had to throw them all out of the window. Sitting behind my desk was the man I was looking for. Mike Sloan. He was dead. Three holes neatly punctured the starched white shirt front of his tuxedo. Rocky, is he dead? Shut the door. Rock, what's that? It's a calling card. Sloan had it crumpled in his hand. Gee, Rock, let me see it. Not so fast. Here. What? There's nothing on it. Just a dirty orange spot. Try turning it over, Timmy. Makes more sense that way. Rock, it says Ahmed Pasha. You guessed it. It's his calling card. Then then that means Ahmed Pasha left it there? Well, not likely. Maybe Sloan was trying to tell us something. You're right, Rocky. Sure, sure. Ahmed Pasha was in love with Lily and she wouldn't have him. So when he couldn't stop the wedding, he killed her. And Sloan saw him do it. Well, it fits that way. And maybe it does, Rocky. What are you going to do now? Find Ahmed Pasha. Oh, I... I don't know, Rocky. The Pasha didn't strike me as that kind of a guy. Maybe we're jumping to conclusions, Rocky, huh? Maybe not. Well, I don't know. That isn't much proof. Ahmed Pasha just doesn't look like the kind of person who would commit murder. Are you going to call Sabaya? Yeah, later. There's one other call I'm going to make first. Where's that, Rock? The card says, Office Number 17, Kadru Street. Pretty late for calling at Pasha's office, isn't it, Rock? Oh, just a hunch, that's all. Uh, coming with me? Yeah, well, okay, Rocky, I guess so. We 
We ducked out the alley door. Down the street, we hailed a taxi and gave him the posh's address. As we weaved through the night traffic, wheels in my head ticked along with a cab leader. Everything added up like a traveling salesman's expense account. It fit now. I wouldn't be throwing any more books out of the window. There was a light in the office front as the cab pulled over to the curb. Is it, please? I'm looking for Ahmed Pasha. Is he here? It, it, it's rather late. No, no, he's not in. Hey, mind if we step inside? Well, very well. You are also from the police? Rocky, maybe we better no, get out. No, not exactly, sweetheart. Ahmed Pasha left a calling card at my place. I'm returning the call. Then you are not the police? No. When were the, uh, the police here? A while ago. I don't remember. Please. Ahmed Pasha is not here. I cannot help you. I have not seen him all afternoon. Oh, just calm down. We'll make this short. Please don't ask me any more questions. It is time to close the office. I must go home. One thing more. Any idea where we could find him? Perhaps at his hotel. That is all I know. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the partner. No, no. The Hotel Shepherd, room 614. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, that's it. Uh, uh, sorry to bother you. I watched the girl bolt the door behind us and pull the curtains. So Sam Sabaya had paid his respects to the Pasha after all. Didn't look like his luck was any better than mine. Timmy Rogers had something in his mind. It's this way, Rock. The Pasha shows up in your cafe and I get shot at. Then he comes to the wedding and Lily gets killed. You know, Rock, I don't think I'm in a hurry to meet that Pasha again. Uh, see what you mean. Look, Rock, why not let Sabaya handle it? If you go up there to Ahmed Pasha's hotel, you don't know what might happen. Timmy, I think you got something there. Maybe it would be a nice idea to have Sabaya along. Sure thing, Rock. That's playing it smart. Oh, come on, we're wasting time. And not we, Rocky. If Sabaya is checking on Ahmed Pasha, I'm next. I don't want any part of that police station. The last time I dropped in to see Sabaya, I stayed 30 days. <laughs> All right, see you around, Timmy. Yeah, sure, Rock. See you around. I found the nearest phone booth and dial police headquarters. Sabaya was gone for the night. My next stop was the Cafe Tambourine. Nothing had turned up. Mike Sloan was still sitting behind the locked door to my office, and I left him there. That made it complete. There was only one item left on my list. Hotel Shepherd, room 614. The lobby of the Shepherd was teeming with a tourist trade. I strolled over to the main desk and waited for a pith-helmeted Englishman to collect his mail. Then I moved in. Rocky! Rocky Jordan, I say it's good to see you again. Where you been? Oh, usual places, Archie. Ah, what's on your mind, Rocky? Archie, you got a small favor. Oh, Rocky, the last favor you asked of me almost caused me my position here. Yeah? Oh, sorry to hear it. This one's going to be easy. Oh, yes? What is it? I want the key to room 614. Really? Oh, no. Oh, now, Rocky. Well, there you go again. Oh, this is important, Archie. Oh, I, I can't do it, Rocky. Sorry, I... I'd really be discharged doing a trick like that. Besides, that, that that's uh, Akmud Pasha's room. Don't you know that? Well, he's a permanent guest Look, here. Look, Archie, I said it was important. Oh, well, I, I, I'd like to, Rocky, but you know... Thanks, I... Archie. I knew you'd help me out. Archie's a real friend. He made like he didn't even know I'd slipped him the ten spot when he handed me the key. Being in Shepherd's was like old home week. When the little numbers on the door said 614, I stopped. This was the end of the line. I put the key in the lock. I gave the doorknob a quick turn, kicked the door open, and dived for the floor inside. When the shooting stopped, I reached back with my foot and kicked the door closed. In the thick darkness, I started crawling for the spot the shots had come from. I figured he wouldn't move, but I was wrong. I met him halfway. He didn't have time to shoot again. <laughs> Lights came on, and in the doorway stood Ahmed Pasha, all cane and white gloves, the brown bowler resting neatly on his round head. What? What is the meaning of this? Uh, I don't time for the shooting. Maybe you'd like to meet the man who murdered Lily Karoff. Ah, uh, take a look. Why? Why? That's right. The little fixer himself, Timmy Rogers. <laughs> Rocky.
Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Now a note for you listeners. Remember, Rocky Jordan has joined one of the most outstanding mystery lineups in radio. Over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember this same time each Sunday night for Rocky Jordan. Now for the ending of tonight's story. It was after midnight before Sam Sabaya and I could settle down back in my office at a cafe tambourine. They had taken Sloan's body away, and as usual, Sam wanted details. Now, Jordan, about the Pasha's calling card. I found Sloan dead with a card in his hand. It was Ahmed Pasha's, all right, but on the back there was an orange spot. The Pasha's too neat a guy to be passing out soil calling cards. Besides, the color of the spot struck me. Where would you pick up an orange spot? Well, I haven't the slightest idea. Well, that's because you don't drink, Sam. Ever hear of a cocktail called an orange blossom? A real fancy thing made with orange sherbet and gin. What has this orange blossom to do with the calling card? Timmy Rogers was drinking one this afternoon when my bar got shot up. He must have picked up Posh's card off the bar after the shooting. What he didn't notice was that a little of his own drink had spilled on it. Then he deliberately left the card in Mike Sloan's hand after killing him. Sure. Timmy had it all set for Ahmed Pasha. Till I made him think Pasha knew something. That's when he got scared. He waited for Pasha in his hotel room, and when I came in... Well, you know the rest. He fired at a swinging door. So Timmy killed Lily, and then Mike, because Mike had seen him do it. The whole scheme was simple, Sam. It was Timmy's idea to set up the phony white Russian scare. That was to get Lily out of town so he and Mike could take over a money-making nightclub. They were going to buy her out for almost nothing. And at the same time, Timmy could square the 5000 he owed the club. A good scheme it was, too, Jordan. Except that Timmy Rogers lost his head and killed Lily when Ahmud Pasha threatened to expose them. Ahmud Pasha must have loved Lily very much, Jordan. Lily. His uh, little flower, hmm? uh, Do not make fun of his love, Jordan. Love... It's a serious business. I uh, guess I wouldn't know, Sam. <laughs> I guess I wouldn't know. Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Gomer Cool and William Frug, produced and directed by Cliff Howell, with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon, Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb starred as Jeff Regan Investigator, stand by for trouble, suspense, and adventure in tonight's story of the man who liked the mountain. This is the way it started. It was about 6 o'clock last Monday night. I was home cooling myself off when the phone began jumping around on top of the desk. Jeff? Mm Mm-hmm? This is Melody. Mr. Lyon calling. I'm out. You can't find me. That's no attitude. Here he is. Hey, hey, Melody. Regan, I got a job for you to do. You can tell me all about it tomorrow morning. So long. Now, wait a minute. It's got to be taken care of now. Tonight. Look, I worked hard all day. I'm tired. Right, Get somebody else. I told you 15 minutes. Now take this down. Office in Taft building right by your place. He's an attorney. Name of Collins Knight. Collins Knight? What rock did you look under for him? I don't be smart just because the guy serves a little time once. And gets himself disbarred and re-entered and tied up with every piece of gambling from here to Reno. I'm not interested in who they are, what they've done as long as they can pay the bill. And Collins Knight is just the baby who can do it. So hop over there and find out what's what. And call me if you run into any trouble. Uh, 
Collins Knight, attorney at law, half building. Turned out to be a medium-sized man, about 50, in a loud tan sport coat and black and white polka dot tie. The good tailoring on his shoulders didn't cover up that 45-year-old stomach, but it didn't seem to bother him. He smiled when I walked in his office, pulled out a bottle of bonded stuff and a couple of tall glasses. Sit down, Regan. Make yourself comfortable. Say when. When? Mm. I'm a four-finger man, too. Yeah. Here's to you. Cigar? I don't use them. You, you don't mind if I do. Yeah. Now then. I asked you to come here because I want you to find Big Ed Kittredge for me. Been missing three days, according to his wife. From pictures, I've seen a Big Ed. He'd be a hard man to miss. Yeah, I figure the same way, Regan. But he's been gone for three days, and I think someone's either cooled him off or he's lambed. Why do you think somebody cooled him? Oh, a man like Big Ed's bound to have a lot of enemies. For one reason or another. Why do you think he lambed? For one reason or another. Friend or enemy? Neither. I just know the guy. He's one of my people. I handle a couple of things for him. His wife is worried about him. I didn't know people like Big Ed had wives. Well, they do. At least Ed does, and a darn cute little girl she is. Inez. Yes, very pretty little girl. Tell me about him. He's gone. What about his wife? Where'd he meet her? When'd he marry her? I gotta have something. I don't know. Well, I'll have to see her. Okay, see her. You don't much care whether I find Big Ed or not, do you? Nope. Thanks for the drink. Uh, you, uh, don't like me, do you, Regan? No. Well, most people don't. So long, Shamus. Keep in touch. <laughs> The name on the door said Mr. and Mrs. Edward Kittredge. It was a clean door and a clean hall with a nice new carpet on the third floor of an apartment house over on Franklin. I figured a hundred bucks and up for the bachelor. She was pretty. Red hair, the mahogany kind. Green eyes. Twenty-four, maybe. But she could look sixteen, just coming off the beach and wearing those gold sandals. Yes? Miss Kittredge? Hi, my name's Kittredge. My name's Regan. I'm a private detective. Collins Knight hired me. He said your husband's missing. Oh, come in, Mr. Regan. I told him I'd want to talk to you. Okay if I sit down? Oh, of course. Of course. I'm sorry, Mr. Regan. Can you tell me anything about him? His friends? Business? You ever heard of Big Ed Kittredge? Oh, yeah. He's been around. Makes the papers now and then. You know what kind of friends he might have? What about his business? I love Mr. Regan, I... I was hopping cars in Glendale three years ago. The movie contract they brought me out from Iowa to keep was anything more than a lot of talk. And I had to eat. One day, a big man came in. I waited on him. Big Ed. Yeah. After that, he kept coming in. I began going out with him. When he asked me to marry him, I married him. I didn't ask him what he did for a living or how he spent his time. He was good to me. He's always been good to me. Now he's gone. Mm Mm-hmm. He's never been gone more than five hours since we were married. He gave me everything, done everything for me. Then you don't ask questions. And I don't ask questions. But there's one thing. Yeah? Yeah, a partner here, the man named Axman, was here two nights ago. That was the night Ed left. He'd never come back. Axman? Yeah. They was in the kitchen. I was in the bedroom. I thought I heard him quarrel, and when he came out, Axman had his hat in his hand. He was leaving. Ed went with him. Mm-hmm. That it? Well... Yeah, that's it. I ain't seen him since then. Think anything's happened to him? You think he's all right? I think you ought to tell me the truth. What? All the pictures I've seen in the paper of Big Ed Kittredge were of a big man with a pipe in his face. I don't see any pipe racks around here, but I see where they might have been. Why, you... And if I went to that closet, I bet I wouldn't find any Ed's clothes around here either. Now, come on. Tell me about that argument. All right, you win, Peter. The same thing we've been arguing about for three years. He drinks too much. He plays the horses too much. And besides, he socked me. Mm-hmm. Go on. God, finally got fed up. Told him to get out. Only now you want him back. Why? Just long enough to save him some divorce papers and get a property settlement. I thought it'd be something like that. Oh, no, wait a minute, Ring. Wait a minute. But actually, I wasn't lying. He hates Ed, even if they are partners. Something from the old days. Axon walked in when Ed and me was having a knockdown. He saw it all. If he wanted to bump it, he could do it. Somehow he fixed it so it looked like I'd done it. He's a kind. You think he'd make a good witness? 
Axman's a smart guy. Now you <laughs> But the doorman and the clerk downstairs, they heard Ed and me arguing. We get kind of loud. Uh, I might have said something about killing Ed. Sure make me look sick if Ed turned up dead somewhere. Yeah, it would. You gonna help me? I'm already hired, lady. Thanks, Peter, thanks. Sorry, I put on that act. Ah, uh, you're pretty good. Wrong prop, that's all. I'd try that studio again if I were you. Yeah? Uh, that bunch of slobs, they would give no gal a break. Maybe you're right. <laughs> you ain't bad for a peeper. When this is all over, let's you and me have a drink somewhere or something, huh? Yeah, something. I'd like to meet a nice guy. A real nice guy, just one. <laughs> just one. Two minutes later, in front of the apartment house, I was lighting a cigarette and thinking over what Inez Kittles had just told me when a soft hand belonging to the soft arm, body, and face of a little Regan. thug I knew named Louis Regan. Pacheco settled on my arm. Regan. Regan. All right, punk, what is it? I've been waiting for you, Regan. <laughs> been with Big Ed's wife, huh? <laughs> nice dish, huh? I seen it. Uh, I got some business with you, Regan. Yeah? Yeah. You're looking for Big Ed Kitteridge, ain't you? Maybe. Yeah, then I could tell you something that'll help. All right, go on. Tell me. Ah, uh-huh. ah. Now, without you giving me something from the trouble. How much can you tell me? Ah, uh, maybe what Big Ed is. Okay. Five. Ah, uh, uh, tell somebody else. Suit yourself, punk. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Regan. Well? He, he shagged up the mountain town, yeah. Has a place up there called Hideaway. And not many people know about it, not even his wife. Yeah. He went up with a guy named Axman three days ago. He's got some slot machines and stuff like that up around there. That all? Yeah, that's enough for you, gumshoe. Okay. Here. Hey. Uh, keep it. I don't need your lousy sawbuck. Keep it, you chiseling cheapskate. Cheapskate. <laughs> I don't care what kind of people are involved. I told you that before, and I'm telling you again. If they play rough, let them do it, just so we get paid. All right, fatso. Then get yourself somebody else to take over. I quit. No, no, no. Just a minute, Regan. Just a minute. Let's not fly off the handle about this thing. Now, be hasty. There are a bunch of bums, and you know it. Well, now, perhaps I was a bit indiscreet accepting a client like Collins Knight with his reputation and all that. It isn't only him. It's the man I'm supposed to find and his friend Axman and anybody else who knows him. Now, Jeffrey... I'm sure that a man of your talents could locate Ed Kittredge without any trouble. After all, Jeffrey, you've dealt with people like this before and always handled it admirably. Very admirably. I don't like it. Knight hires me to find Big Ed Kittredge. Only he doesn't care whether I find him or not. Big Ed's wife only wants to find him so she can slap a court order on him. And both of them tell me that Big Ed might be dead. Well, now let's not jump at their conclusions, Jeffrey. Well, I have to admit the whole thing looks fishy. Jeffrey, I want you to find Big Ed Kittredge as soon as you can. Look, I just told I you know, that I... know, I know, but the fact of the matter is, I have an agreement with Knight in writing. You have and what? And you know what kind of a man he is. He's very tricky. He could close International if we don't stay on this case. If you don't stay on the case. Okay, you win. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Expenses? Of course, of course. After I drive up to Mountain Town, I might find Big Ed up there. Mm, of course. Be careful, Jeffrey. Be careful and... Oh, uh, don't give me that phony line about calling you. Now, Regan. Yeah? Call me if you run into any trouble. How far to Mountain Town? You're here, Pilgrim. Hmm? This is it. That black place over there is the lake. And that black place over there is the town. Cabins round the lake, no one round the town. Fill her up? Yeah, fill her up. Where can I get some coffee? I've been driving half the night. 30 feet to your right and inside the door. Janey will fix you up. We're open all night. Thanks. No trouble? No trouble at all? You better look at that oil. Glad to. Tires and water. Glad to. You can move it if you want to. I'll be in getting coffee. Don't worry. 
I don't get enough business at one in the morning to stay open. I'm going to talk to the boss about it someday. Hey. Hey. like that for I'm... Co- well, I thought you was Eve. I didn't know it was a customer. Who's Eve? Him. Eve Holton that runs the station. What's yours? What's my what? Name. Well, as long as we're being formal, it's Regan. Jeff Regan. Oh, you're Janie. Well, say, how'd you know that? Eve. He told you. Well, say... How about some coffee, Janie? Huh? Oh, sure, sure. Um, you've been traveling far, Mr. Reed? From Los Angeles. Going far? Right here. This stump. You don't tell me you're going to be here this summer. A little while? Well, say. I'm off in an hour. I got a little cabin on the other side of the lake. Well, that's nice. Too much fishing? Fishing? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I am. No, thanks. I'll take it black. Oh, what you gonna do here? Look for a man. Yeah? Say, what man? You might be able to help me, Janie. A cottage called Hideaway. A man named Kittredge. Big Ed Kittredge, you a friend of his? Car's already. Car's already, Pilgrim. Thanks. Janie, don't you think you ought to go see how the fire's doing? Hmm? What fire? Make one. All right, Eve, all right. Do you think as a girl takes a job swinging hash has to listen to a lot of belongings to make this must be worth the trouble? <laughs> Janie's too friendly. I like friendly people. Keep the car here, will you? Hmm? I'm looking for a hideaway cottage. I don't see any road going around the lake there. I guess I'll have to hoof it. Hideaway? Hmm? East shore of the lake. About half a mile from here. Now, you're right, there's no road. You'll have to walk. Thanks. Don't mention it, Pilgrim. Don't mention it. Well, the cottage turned out to be an all-white, phony log cabin affair. I pounded on the door. Nobody answered. There was a sick kind of oil lamp burning inside, so I pounded on the door some more, and some more people didn't answer. When I put my hand on the latch, the door opened. People or no people, so I went in. Well, you can believe this or not, but somebody was there. Right in front of the fireplace, only he was dead. And one whole side of his head was dark and shiny. It was still warm. Nope, you're wrong. It wasn't Big Ed Kittredge. This was a man I'd never seen before in my life. Return to Jeff Regan, investigator, in just a moment. An easy way to save for future security is by a payroll deduction of savings bonds. If you are not paid on a salary basis, you can purchase savings bonds at your nearest post office, bank, or savings and loan association office. Now is the time to ask your employer to start deducting for savings bonds or to buy a bond on your own. If no other plan is feasible, your bank will deduct enough each month from your savings or checking account to buy a savings bond. For money in the future, buy United States Savings Bonds. You'll be glad you did. And now, back to the story of the man who liked the mountain and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, I stood there and looked at what was left of whoever he was. Wasn't anything in his pockets. Labels, cut off his suit, no laundry marks. Then I began looking around for a poker or a hammer or something. What I found was a heavy piece of kindling wood, and one end of it was stained. Then I heard somebody come in the door. I saw striped overalls, flashlight, and forty-five Colt revolver held by E. Fulton. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He looked at the dead man, looked at me, looked at the piece of wood in my hand. Uh-huh. Dead. Yeah. Friend of yours? Never saw him before in my life. I did. Yeah? Name's Axman. Tom Axman. Friend of Big Ed Kittredge. Friend? Why'd you kill him? I'll just take your gun. Mm-hmm. 
safer this way. You always wrap a gun in a handkerchief? Only when I want to keep fingerprints on it. Evidence. So it's that way. Uh-huh. It's that way. You kill him? Uh-uh. <laughs> you did. There was a big fight. You conked him with that piece of wood, then shot him in the head. I saw it. My gun, my bullets, it's pretty neat. But he was still killed with this. Who's going to be able to tell? A good coroner. We got a lousy coroner up here. He don't know from nothing. That makes me the fall guy. You're it, Pilgrim. Let's go find ourselves a cop. Eve waved his gun at me, and I started ahead of him for the door. Oh, he was good at doing frame-ups, and he was good at running things, but he was only an amateur when it came to pushing a man with a gun. I waited to feel it in my back. By the time I got to the door, it was there, and that was his mistake. I shoved him up against the wall, but he didn't drop the gun. Before he could do anything, I was running for the black place that he told me was the lake. Come back here, Regan! Come back here! I ran till I was out of breath. What? Who is it? Who's there? Take it easy, Jane. It's me. Uh huh? Oh. Oh, Mr. Regan, it's you. <laughs> hey, listen, he's looking everywhere for you. I know, I know. He says you killed a man, Tom Axman, over in Kittridge's cabin. I know. But you didn't kill him. I know that. Yeah? Hey, come on, we can't talk here. Someone will see us. This is my place. Boy, I got some things to tell you, Mr. Regan. I don't like this place, and I don't like Eve Holden. I don't like anything that's been going on. I... You got to get out of here. Get out fast. Come on in. Look, I quit my job tonight. I didn't want to get mixed up in any of this. Any of what? This killing, and gee, I don't know what all. Oh, I better pull the curtain. Someone might see you in here. This is a scary place. You say you know I didn't kill Axman. How? Well, I've been working in Mountain Town a couple of weeks now, and I've seen a lot of screwy things. Like what? Like Eve Holton. He works for Big Ed Kittredge. And Big Ed ain't no saint. Have you seen Big Ed? I mean, he drove up a couple of nights with that Tom Axman. I think Ed killed him. Yeah? Well, he'd, he'd been drinking a lot, and they both talked kind of loud to Eve. And Big Ed and Axman went over to the cabin. I didn't think anything of it till they didn't show up for something to eat the next morning. Ain't nothing to eat in that cabin. That helps, Janie. Go on. Well, Eve's been going up around that mountain taking a look every day for no reason at all. Yeah, sure he has. Only well, he isn't looking at the mountain. Scared. Look, Mr. My Jalopy's out in back from the filling station. Take me with you. I I'll tell everything I heard and seen it, and we can let some cops figure out all that. Eve, what's that? There was a hand firing a gun at her. It figured to be my gun. I hit the oil lamp and went down to the floor. Then I heard somebody outside on the porch. I crawled in the dark till I found a wall and a window. It wouldn't open, so I took half of it with me. Hey, what is this? Come here, you. I look punk. I just drove 85 miles in 100 minutes. 7 o'clock in the morning, and I haven't been to bed all night. I saw one dead man and one woman made dead. Hey, easy on that stuff, Regan. And some of your playmates up at Mountain Town. I'm trying to make sure that I get hooked with it. Now, wait a minute. Oh, start talking, punk. Wait a minute. What, what do you want me to say? I don't know nothing about no stiffs and no Mountain Town. All right. But somebody like you comes sidling up to me and tells me where to find my man and doesn't take five bucks for it. That means he's already got dough. That's Regan. I... And they only give you dough for work. <laughs> Gee whiz, Regan, you know I wouldn't mix up in no killing. I, I can't stand that kind of thing. Punk, who paid you to tell me to go to Mountain Town? Who paid you to send me up there and make a patsy out of me? Let go, let go. I, I, I'll tell you, Regan. I'll tell you. It, it was Knight the lawyer. Yeah, yeah, Collins Knight. He slipped me 50 to pay you and give you the dope. Nice. I might have known. Go on. That's all. Honest, that's all there is to it. I... Pay you over to Big Ed's apartment. You talk to his wife and you know the rest. Can I tell you why? You know, I never asked any questions. I just do what I get paid for. Hmm? Nobody ever let me in on something big. I didn't know it was no frame. Okay, punk. <laughs> Listen, if night ever finds out, I told you. Uh, shut up. What are you going to do? Hi, Regan. Hard night, huh? Uh -uh. Easy, he, he made easy. me tell him. He made me tell him, Mr. Knight. Sure, easy. Well, don't worry about it. I got up early, Regan. Kind of figured you'd be looking up for punk here. He phoned from Mountain Town, said you lambed out on him twice. <laughs> You're a pretty tough boy, aren't you? Here, punk. Huh? 
Buy yourself something and forget you ever saw Regan, okay? Oh, sure, 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 Mr. Knight, sure. Okay, Regan, let's get going. Got a long drive ahead of us. I'll be able to drive it blindfolded someday. Someday. I'm still your patsy. Mm-hmm. I take you back there and we call a cop. Now, come on. He will be getting anxious. <laughs> Well, you can't say I didn't find my man. Even if I did find him sitting in that same cabin with a couple of corpses on the floor. Big Ed Kittredge. He needed a shave. He was sitting there looking at Ackman's body and Janie. I guess Eve had brought her over from her place. Eve was there, too, holding my gun against Big Ed's back. Was still wrapped in that handkerchief. Night, I thought you'd never get here. Come on, let's get this over with. I don't be nervous, Eve. Ed, I want you to meet Jeff Regan. He killed you. Hiya, Bo. You're the fall guy, huh? Tough luck. Where'd you find him? Where well, I said I'd find him, at the punk. Still using my gun to kill people? Not quite finished, Pilgrim. Two down, one to go. Very easy to figure. I'm next, huh? Yeah. Sorry, Ed. It has to be business. Me and April take over where you and Axe will leave off. Hey, Bo, we're going to let him rub me out and pin all this on you? We're going to do something about it. Take it easy, Ed. I think we ought to do something about it. Oh, watch him eat me, too. <laughs> Big Ed was good. He stopped the first two slugs from Eve's gun and the first two out of Knight's. By that time, I got a hold of a poker and I brought it into Knight's face. He looked kind of sick and went down without a sound. When I looked around, Big Ed was twisting the gun from Eve's hand. Blood pouring from four holes in his chest. Uh, we ain't so easy at that, huh? It's the frame won't work now. Where's your phone around here? I'll get you a doc. Uh, well, Sawbone's gonna help me save yourself from trouble. I never knew they burned like this. What's your name, Bo? Regan. I'm a private detective with International. Oh. Yeah. Lions still run that dump. Yeah, he does. Old bomb, ain't he? <laughs> Night high, you'll find me? Yeah. He's real tricky. Well, they ain't making a patsy out of you, anyhow. Look, uh, Regan. Uh, I done you a favor. Fix, fix a deal for me, will you? Sure, Ed, sure. I, I got a wife named Inez. Met her. Pretty, huh? Look, uh, tell her, tell her I wasn't sore. I, I didn't really leave it. I just came up here to let her cool off. I, I kind of like the mountain. That's why I had a place. <laughs> sure, I'll tell her. Oh, this is a bunk, ain't it? Regan. I'm here, Ed. You found me, huh? Yeah, I found you. Yeah, lions, I... Two bucks says lions won't give you no bonus for it. I... Yeah. I guess you're right. I called the sheriff, who had a face like a boiled beet. He listened to the whole thing, and then we kind of pieced it out together. You see, the day I got there, Big Ed killed Axman. I guess they got into some kind of an argument, and Ed picked up a piece of kindling wood. About that time, Eve Holton showed up and saw what had happened, and he figured he had something. So he pulled a gun on Ed and stuck him in a cellar somewhere. Then he phoned Knight down in Los Angeles. It was a good chance for Knight and Eve to take over, so they figured to kill Ed and... Get a fall guy for both murders. That was me. Didn't come out quite that way. Eve had to kill Janie, too. All with my gun. You know the rest. Well, the lion cashed Knight's check. He was happy. Hey, uh, that sheriff up there's going to call you for the coroner's inquest this afternoon. Yeah, I know. Uh, technical charge of manslaughter. 
Yeah, they'll clear you in a couple of hours. Yeah. So Big Ed liked the mountain, did he? Imagine that big crook. Hey, where are you going? Remember, you got to be up in Mountain Town this afternoon. I'll be there. i got to go over and see Big Ed's wife first. He asked me to tell her something. Big Ed's wife? That's right. Forget it, Regan. She's glad he's dead, same as everybody else. I'm going over to see Big Ed's wife. Why do you want to go sticking your nose back into it? Because Ed was dying and he asked me to do it. Lots of guys ask for lots of screwy things when they're dying. They wouldn't bring them up unless they were sure they didn't have to stick around and see what had happened. Make sense? Makes sense. Where are you going? Over to see Big Ed's wife. At no time in our nation's history has it been more important to develop an outstanding Army Medical Department. Without an adequate nurse corps... This can't be accomplished. And nurses are still needed to fill the estimated requirements for 1948. If you are a graduate, registered nurse, over 21 and under 45, you're invited to apply for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. If you are selected, you may choose either active duty or inactive status. Apply to the Adjutant General, Washington 25, D.C. Jack Webb is starred as Jeff Regan, with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS same time next week for hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Also heard on tonight's program was Jeff Chandler, Betty Lou Gerson, Edgar Barrier, William Conrad, Sidney Miller, and Lorette Philbrand. Jeff Regan, Investigator is written by E. Jack Newman, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, with original music by Dick Arant. If you like mystery, here find that clue with mystery master Ken Crossan quizzing the top mystery writers of Hollywood and a special guest this Monday night over most of these same CBS stations. Here find that clue Monday night, 8.30, over most of these stations with Turhan Bay. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name is Jeff Regan. I get ten a day and expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action, mystery, and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Man in the Door. This is the way it started. The lion called about 4 o'clock that afternoon, said he wanted to see me down at the office. I argued a while, finally told him I'd be there. Melody was sitting in front of her typewriter when I came in, putting a new coat of paint on her nails. She handed me a blank contract with no dates filled in, jerked a thumb toward the lion's den. I went in. Regan, I'm glad you got here. What do you know about architects? They draw things. I know that much, but what about bids and all that stuff? Well, they figure out what a building's going to cost, don't they? Go on. If whoever's paying for the building likes what they write down, then they're hired. A couple of architects, maybe three or four, make bids. I suppose so. Low man gets the job. Why? Our client's an architect named Dudley Hayes, an office in the Park Central building. He thinks maybe the bank that's handling his bid might try to put something over on him. Banks don't do things like that. He thinks maybe a guy who works at the bank might be taking dough to shove his bid under the counter. Why didn't you say that in the first place? Because I'm saying it now. Haynes wants us to look into it. All right, who do I see? Haynes first. I only talked to him on the phone. I told him we'd have to have a contract and retainer before we did anything. That figures. So hop over there and find out what's what and make him sign that contract and get a check. Anything else? Make sure it's certified and call me if you run into any trouble. <laughs> Dudley Haynes, architect, Park Central Building, had an office on the ninth floor. 
When I went in, a girl with hair that figured to be blonde right down to the roots pulled off her glasses and put out her cigarette. And she kind of eased out of her chair behind that desk, moved toward me like a panther looking for a meal. Ma, you're tall, aren't you? Well, there's nothing I can do about that. Mr. Lyon said he was sending us one of his best men. He always says that. I think he meant it this time. He's an awful liar, lady. Dorothy. Dorothy Nolan. Fit. The name or the dress? Both. What's yours? Jeff Regan. Oh. Well, now we know each other. That's nice. I came to see Haynes. He wants me to look into something for him. I know. He's expecting me. I know. Well? I hope you had to look into a lot of things. For Haynes? No. This is his office, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But he spends most of his time in 902 into the hall. Makes his blueprints up there. I'll take you. You are a tall. <laughs> Well, we started down the hall. We got about ten feet from the frosted glass door at the end. We both stopped. We were looking at the outline of a big man behind the door. Both of us expected him to open it and walk out. Oh, he came out all right, but he walked right through it. Oh, he's been shot. Oh. You know him? It's my boss, Mr. Haynes. No, it was your boss, lady. He's dead. Lieutenant Salvatore Wendetti, Central Homicide Detail, showed up about eight minutes after I called. He had his whole goon squad with him and a couple of guys in double-breasted suits from the district attorney's office. They roped off the entrance to the building, got hold of the elevator operators and the man who runs the cigar stand and asked them questions. Then when Daddy looked at what was left of Haynes and okay, started yelling okay, into okay, a phone. Okay, Lieutenant Farrakhan, don't move until my fingerprint boys get through. Yeah. Okay, sis, where the guy lives? At the Biltmore Hotel. Where's his wife? We didn't have one. What do we tell? We didn't have any family. So no one's going to cross. Well, that makes it easier. Regan, was he your clan? No, nobody's a clan until he signed a contract, Sally. Well, you would bring him a contract to sign and then you would do something for him. What? Well, I didn't talk to him. Sis? Uh, well, Mr. Haynes had made an estimate on a little office building in Beverly Hills. He thought that a man named Adler at the bank might be taking money from someone to hold his bid out. So he wants an investigator to look into it. Why do you think that? Well, I don't know. You work for him? Well, I don't know everything. Neither do I. Hot, isn't it? Who's Adler? Oh, did I have to name him? Mm. Who else? Who else? Architects. Who else was making a bid? Uh, I don't know that. Now, where are we? Uh, Kelly! Yeah? Guy named Adler at the uh, Grand, uh, National, Grand Bank. National Bank. Pick him up and have him down to my office in half an hour. Yeah? Uh, what do you want to do about reporters, Sally? Tell him to go jump in the lake. Yeah? They always spell my name wrong. How long have you two known each other? An hour. Nice. What do you mean by that? That's nice. Didn't hear any shots? No, we didn't. Tell me more about the bid. Well, what's better tell? Hey, shut up. So the bank handles the money. Who says yes? Who says no? The bank, but... But what? Uh, the contractor usually tells them who to take. Huh? Who's in... Who's that in this case? A uh, contractor in Long Beach. His name is George Cantrell. Hmm. I'll say this to you, Regan. When you get mixed up in anything, you certainly get mixed up with a good-looking people. I'm not mixed up in anything. What do you say, sis? <laughs> I'll keep my mouth shut. Uh-huh. She's a smart girl, Regan. Uh, hello, honey. Won't be home for dinner. Some guy got himself killed and I'm in on it. Not long, no. Hmm. Regan? Hmm. I'll tell her. Wife says hello. Says come out to dinner sometime. Whoop. Uh, sis. Uh, how much that contract worth? Oh, on the building in Beverly Hills, about uh, forty thousand dollars. Profit? No, overall. Break it down. Well, Mr. Haynes would have paid about twelve thousand dollars if he'd gotten. It. I know some guys have killed for a dime. Uh, Sam, when Daddy? I'm still at the Bar Central building. Get out to Long Beach and talk to a contractor named George Control and uh, find out what architects were making business and stuff he was going to put up in Beverly Hills. Yeah, get the names. Okay, that about does it. Let's go. Uh, Miss Nolan? What? I have to take you down. Just can you do that? Uh, you're a material witness. Well, what are you? He's a bystander with a built-in lawyer. Well, I do, Jeff. Go with him. Why do I want to spend the night in jail? I just worked for Mr. Hayes. Uh-uh, no phone call. This is a murder case. Well, get me a lawyer or something, Jeff. You know a lawyer? No. Wait. Yes, I do. His name's Dave Henderson. He lives at 1648 Glamont Place. Will you get for me? Tell him I'm in trouble. Yeah. Check, Sally. She didn't make a phone call. I like it, too. Well, look, he may not be able to do anything for you tonight. It's almost six. But you'll see him as soon as possible? Yeah. Tell him I'm scared, Jeff. I'm scared, Steve. Well, I stayed there and phoned the lion, told him what had happened. 
Oh, he got mad and yelled something about me being a jinx on all our clients, and then he hung up. So I went through the classified telephone directory under attorneys and Henderson. There was a Ben, a George, a Joe, a William, but no Dave Henderson. So I drove out to the address that she'd given me. It was a blue apartment house four blocks west of Vermont over by the Coliseum. Somebody was cooking hamburger somewhere, and somebody was all worked up over a ball game on the radio. I picked the baseball fan. But now, as anybody's guess, but let me tell you that this ball game is a long way from being up. A... Hey, what'd I tell you? What'd I tell you? It's outside the ballpark, and they're coming in like homing pigeons. Bases are loaded, and they're all coming in. Oh, it's going to be eight to five. Come on, come on. The ball game's you. not that good. What's so important, Pilgrim? I'm with the ball game. I'm looking for a man named Dave Henderson, a lawyer. So what? Well, somebody told me he lives in this apartment house. Who told you that? A lady. Huh. Does he live here? You try looking at the mailbox? No name. You cop? Private type. Ha! Does he live here? Sure he lives here. Well, where? End of the hall, 106. Thanks. Oh, he's a lawyer, is he? With his kind of friends? Ha! What does that mean? You're young, ain't you, Curly? I got a driver's license. Let me tell you something. Don't go knocking on no doors and you hear a ball game. Remember that. Yeah, I'll remember that. And you can tell him Tessie Bogart has talked to that one. And the score is 8-5 to five coming into the first half of the ninth, and this has been some ball game. Let me tell you. No stick. Here we are. Come on in. It's unlocked. Your name Dave Henderson? Yeah, who wants to know? My name's Regan. I'm a private investigator with the International Detective Bureau. Wrong steer gum shoe. I don't need one. Look, I'm not looking for work. I'm looking for you. What'd you say it was? The Regan? That's right. R-E-G-A-N. Regan. Regan. Learned that just an hour ago. Cute, huh? I met a friend of yours today. Dave Henderson never had a friend. She said she was a friend of yours. But I didn't say it was a friend of hers. Hey, who are we talking about anyway? Dorothy Nolan. How is Dorothy? Not so good. Thought you were a detective. I am. You sound like a doctor. Look, you sound like a guy with a chip on his shoulder. Sound like a lot of things. You're trying to be tough, Pete. No wonder you aren't in the telephone directory. I'll just skip that. She said you were a lawyer. They say I drink too much. Haven't seen you drinking, have you? She wants you to get in touch with her. The man she was working for was murdered today. She kill him? Well, they're holding her. Material witness or a suspect? Material witness right now. She doesn't want to spend the night in jail. Who does? That's why she isn't feeling so good. Huh? <laughs> he wants me to get her up. Something like that. Who's handling the case downtown? Detective named Wendetti. Yeah, and where do you come in? Well, he didn't give her that one phone call. Yeah. You're sent to me. What if I said no? Well, that's your business. You know why she asked you to see me? Because I'm a guy she knows. And every guy who knows little Dorothy does a little something for her. Ever met him like that, Regan? Sometimes. He's just checking. Checking what? She's pretty good with the works. Eyes just right for the job. Hair just right. Everything just right. She can make you do a lot of things you don't want to do. Wait till you see her in a bathing suit. That's something, brother. Well, they aren't wearing them in the county jail. <laughs> okay, I'll find, phone with Daddy and find out what her bond is. Look, this is a murder case. There's no bond on this. You know that. Well, it depends how you handle it. I'll think of something. Yeah, I'll bet you will. We don't like each other much, do we? Nope. Well, that's the way it goes. Listen, she said to tell you she was scared. Well, some of us are scared part of the time. And somebody gets shot. And everybody gets scared. You scared? No. Nope. Iron Man Rick. Have a good time. Did I say Haynes was shot? No. You didn't say a thing. See you somewhere, people. <laughs> Well, I 
I stopped by Muso Frank's and had the special, and then I went on home. I tried to make a couple of calls, but when Daddy was out and the desk sergeant thought I was a reporter and he wouldn't tell me a thing about Dorothy Nolan. While I was sitting there, the phone began jumping around on the hook. Regan? Yeah? This is me. Where you been? I called your place 20 times, but I've called it once. Well, I've been busy seeing a lawyer. What do you need a lawyer for? You aren't married. Somebody else needs one. Who? Dorothy Nolan, that blonde who worked up in Haynes' office when Daddy's holding her. Good. I want you to go down and see her. What for? We can still make something on this thing if we play it smart. When I talked to Haynes on the phone this afternoon, I told him I wanted a certified check. So what? So that means there's a check for a hundred bucks lying around his office somewhere. And it's made out to International. Look, he's dead, remember? Everybody dies. Don't worry about it. We weren't even hired. We had a verbal contract. We had nothing. That check's no good to anybody but us. We didn't do anything for him. Well, buy him some flowers. Now hop down to the pokey and see that dame and find out where that check is. We can't do that. I talked to Harry Presidio and he'll give us a lead to get in. Hello? Hello? Regan, you're still there. I was still there, Hello? but I wasn't listening to the lion. I was looking at a skinny little man with one leg. Hey, Regan, you're still there. Now don't ask me how he made it inside my door. He was just there. Propped up on a pair of crutches, swaying back and forth, watching me with a couple of sick gray eyes that were so full of water you'd think they were going to float right out of his head. All at once, he went down like a busted sugar sack. He'd been shot twice through the neck with a small caliber gun, a 25, 32, I don't know. I, I found a dozen razor blades in one pocket and two dozen sets of shoelaces to go with him. There wasn't anything that told me his name, but there was a picture inside his shirt pocket. One of those things that you have taken in a penny arcade, you know, in front of phony pasteboard props. Well, a man with one leg was looking out from between a pair of painted angel's wings. And the guy standing next to him, who was smiling up at the halo, was the same man that I'd seen that afternoon. An architect named Haynes. A man who needed the private detective. A man who walked out a glass door and then dropped dead. And the one printed word above that picture stuck out like a wart on an egg that said, Happy Land. <laughs> Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Here is a special and important message to every businessman listening. To every businessman, regardless of the size or the type of his business. Gentlemen, do you realize that the schools of this community help you every day that you're in business? That's right. For one thing, our schools teach the boys and girls of this community to cherish the human right, the free enterprise on which our country and your business are founded. With each new generation graduated from our schools, the Army defending our way of life and your business grows stronger. What's more, good teachers and well-equipped schools do a better job of developing our children's talent. The result? School graduates to become more skilled and more efficient employees. So remember... Any time and taxes that you contribute to improving local schools are an investment in your own business future. Education is good business. Education can maintain our freedom. And freedom is everybody's job. And now, back to the story of the man on the door and Jeff Regan, investigator. I left the little man with the one leg lying there. There wasn't much I could do for him. I wanted to wait before I called homicide. I took the picture I found in his pocket and I drove to Happy Land. It turned out to be an open-air penny arcade on 5th and Main. It smelled like all the hot dogs in the world had been made right there. There were machines all over the place telling you how strong you were, how rich you'd be, and who you'd marry. <laughs> all for a penny. I guess it wasn't much of a bargain. The only customer was a sailor trying his luck at the shooting gallery. Back in the corner, a tired-looking girl in light blue slacks and a dirty gray sweater was sitting on a stool by the hot dog counter staring at nothing. Want some pennies? Not right now, no. Oh, just looking? Go ahead. When you figure out where you're going to spend your money, come back and I'll give you some change. You got a picture gallery here? Oh, well, tell me you're a real big spender and want to have your picture taken. Maybe. You got one? Yeah, we got one. Where is it? In there. 
You really want to get your picture taken, I'll climb off this stool and take you back. I want to tell you now, if you're just trying to be sociable, you can go and fly a kite. You run the picture concession? I run the picture place and the hot dog place, and I sweep out in the morning. Oh, I wish I had better brains than to marry that slob and get myself stuck in a cheap dump like this. All right. Do you remember taking this picture? How would I know I take a lot of pictures? Well, come on, look at it. All right, all right. Yeah, I took it. That what sold you? When? How do you think I am? Can't remember what night it is every time a pair of drunks comes in and wants their pictures taken together. Well, try to remember, will you? <laughs> You're a real wise guy, mister. You don't want no picture. You just want some talk. You're a cop. Friend. I met the little guy in the picture once. Dusty. What was that? I thought you said you met him once. Well, we weren't introduced. I just met him. Who is he? Dusty Rhodes. Works the circuit. What circuit? Fifth and Main, STEM. Business section. What kind of business? Dusty handled the razor blade and shoelace traffic. He hates pencils. What did he do when he wasn't working? What does anybody do? He went out and got loaded. Go on. And you don't know him very well for a friend. I'm not going to know I'm not getting Dusty in trouble talking to you like this. Nobody can get him in trouble anymore, lady. What do you mean? He was shot tonight. Oh, no. Oh, poor little guy. Do you know where he lived? Seashore Hotel. The Seashore Hotel. Oh, gee, Miss Ensick. Oh, I'm real sorry. The seashore caters to many types of people, good and bad, just out of the pokey. Two bits a night for tranchants, 150 a week for solid citizens. And sign and register, it's a law. I'm not looking for a room. Then you're wasting my time, brother. My beer's getting warm. Look, I'm a private investigator. My name's Regan. I liked you before you said them two words, brother, but you have soured me. Private investigator means private eye, and it all means cop. And you are not welcome, not blow. I'm trying to find out something about a man named Dusty Rhodes. We do not ask questions and we do not give answers. Now, blow. I was told he lived here. You'll find me tongueless, brother. Now, blow. Did you know him? During the last five years, I have acquired 85 pounds and a very bad heart. All right, have you in the alley right now. Oh, yeah, sure you do. Here. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln was a very fine man, and he took a very fine picture. I seem to have found my tongue, brother. Will it be? The key to his room for a starter, huh? Uh, disallowable and punishable by fine and imprisonment. Into the hall, turn the bend first door to the right. Thanks. Well, I don't know what I expected to find there. Outside of more razor blades and more shoelaces... It was a little room full of dirty white curtains and a wire bed that sagged in the middle. I was standing there watching a neon sign advertise beer a block down the street when I thought I heard somebody behind me. Whoever it was had been drinking bad whiskey, but he was still pretty good. Ooh. It landed a quarter of an inch above my right ear, and I piled up in a lamp, a chair, and a pitcher full of water. Five berries get you a look, brother, but doesn't get you a room. Besides, it's already taken and the bed's over there. Now, come on. <coughs> oh. Yeah, you didn't go to sleep, brother. You was knocked to sleep. Oh. I apologize. Why the games? Who came in after me? You're the only one. You sure? My name's Sam Preacher. Brother, I'm very sure. Well, maybe he was waiting for me, huh? I don't generally ask him, but the question is this. Why? Oh, I don't know. Unless... What's the matter? Something missing? Just a picture. You can get lots of pictures. You didn't see anybody? That makes the third time, brother, and the answer's still negative. Okay, okay. Then let's blow, buddy, huh? Coroner's office. Lou. 
Luke, this is Regan. The lion's eye. What's with you, baby? When Daddy tells me you walked into one today. Yeah, I did. You got him there? Haynes Dudley? Sure. Want to come down and take a look? He's toe tagged and salted down real pretty. Yeah, I'll bet. Them 32 slugs was just incidental. The guy had four weeks at the outside. All right, give it to me. Haynes Dudley was dying from malnutrition, alcoholism, and a couple other things with long names. Give me one long name. Diabetes. He didn't take good care of himself, funny, huh? A misspent life. <laughs> Somebody's gonna take the gas chamber for nothing. <laughs> when did he know this? Sure, sure. And he was wearing a brand new suit, too. We'll sew up the holes, we'll bury him in it. Well, you aren't finished yet, Luke. Baby! A guy with one leg dropped dead in my place a couple hours ago. It's after 11. I'm sorry, Luke. They connected? Yeah. Murder? Yeah. Ah, well, come down and see us any time, Regan. We're open 24 hours a day. Fell at the homicide office. They told me she'd been released about 10 o'clock. They said a lawyer named Henderson had put up the bail and handled the whole thing. They gave me an address on her when I went out there. It was a bungalow court on Normandy, and it took her a long time to answer the door. Oh, you. Yeah, tell me how tall I am. Oh, I'd love to, but not right now. They told me you'd been out since 10 o'clock. Maybe I should have come sooner. <laughs> Dale gives me the willies. I'm about to take a shower. I was kind of hoping we could have a drink. I did better than I thought with you. I got a hold of a lawyer for you, didn't I? Yes. Well, doesn't that rate me an invitation to have a drink? I said later, I'm really tired. I, uh, I said no. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, if you're that thirsty, all right. That's better. Isn't every day my boss gets killed and I need a private detective? I need a drink. I was slugged tonight. Slug? Yeah, right here, see. Oh, it looks nasty. Why did anyone do that to you? Wanted a picture I had. Whistler's mother? Just a picture of a couple of drunks who are dead now. Maybe whoever did it was a relative. Guess again. I don't like games. But you play them all the time. No, we all. I know a psychiatrist says we can't help ourselves. You can. I liked you when you walked into the office this afternoon, but I'm not so sure I like you now. Maybe you better go. Expecting somebody, huh? What are you doing? You let go of me. Let go of me. Oh, no, baby. You've got real nice eyes. I want to look at him. Let go. He's crazy. Hello, Dave. We didn't hear you knock. Did you bring your piano? What's the idea? He gave me... Why don't you tell him to go away, baby? Anybody can tell we're busy. Let it go, Regan. You want to break us up? Yes, he's so just trying to make you jealous and say things. Come here, honey. No! You don't have to do that! I said let her go. Is that the same 32 you killed a one-legged man with? Over, gum shoe. Don't be a fool! Stay right where you are, baby. You're first. Listen to me, baby! I listen to you too long. He's only guessing. He doesn't have any proof of anything. You can cry if you want to, baby. This is gonna hurt. <laughs> She spun around and fell into a coffee table and then lay very quiet on the rug. Her eyes were open and she didn't say anything. She just lay there looking up at him. I couldn't tell where she'd been hit. He seemed to forget all about me because he walked over to her, knelt down beside her, put the gun right up against her head. This is awful close range, baby, but I can't afford to miss. <laughs> Neither could I. <laughs> Well, when Daddy and I stuck our heads together and it all came out when we looked into a couple of things. You see, Dave Henderson was Dudley Haynes. And he was wanted for attempted murder and embezzling and one thing or another back in Ohio. So he figured it'd be a good idea to bump himself off. Dorothy helped him with the idea. They both went down on Main Street and they picked up an old bum, dressed him up in a new suit and shot him. I was supposed to walk in with Dorothy, and she'd identify the body, and as far as anybody knew, Dudley Haynes would be dead. Dave didn't figure that she'd be taken down. She didn't figure that she'd get scared, and neither of them figured the man with one leg was a pal of the man that they'd shot. Well, it seems that they looked through a lot of files, and they figured that a lot of murders go unsolved. Maybe they do. I don't know. Well, anyway, he sat down on that little bench up there in San Quentin last week. The one with that bucket of acid in the room. Oh, well, he held his breath as long as he could, but everybody has to breathe. He's buried up there with a lot of other guys that figured they could get away with murder. 
Dorothy? Oh, she wasn't hurt too bad. I had her in a wheelchair for the trial. She got 15 years as an accomplice. Some kind of a deal. State's evidence and all that. I don't think I'll wait for her. She wasn't that good. <laughs> Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at 9.30 next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman and produced by Sterling Tracy. Dorothy Nolan was played by Betty Lou Gerson and David Ellis was Dave Henderson. Lorene Tuttle, William Conrad, and Lou Krugman supported. <laughs> Perfectly natural and wholesome for some men who want to leave great wealth behind. There's a druggist in a small town in Pennsylvania who'll do that. The wealth he'll leave behind will make many lives easier and happier and finer down through the years. For he was the principal donor of an outdoor meeting place for religious services in a Boy Scout camp in the Poconos. Working with his neighbors and community activities, he saw the need of this improvement, helped to install it. That's the kind of wealth that you can bequeath to generations coming on as you enjoy the freedom of working with your neighbors for the betterment of your community. Freedom that can be anybody's pleasure is everybody's job. Music for this program is arranged by Dick Arant. Next week at 9.30, Jeff Regan, investigator, brings you another thrill-packed half hour with his story of the house by the sea. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It was Gilbert and Sullivan who said, quote, a policeman's lot is not a happy one, end quote. But tonight, just on the stroke of eight, Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite ferreter of felonies, is seated in his apartment. He looks down on the bay at the masthead lights rising and falling with the swell as Phyllis, his easy-on-the-eyes associate, does things with eggs in the tiny kitchen, a kitchen which hangs like an eyebrow on the forehead of Telegraph Hill. Uh, yes, Angel? How's the shoulder? It's fine. Uh, that is... Uh, oh, it's pretty good. Why? Ah, uh, because I think you're using it as an excuse to get me over here every night to fix your dinner. Well, Angel, some fellows have etchings. I use scrambled eggs. Uh-huh. Well, from tonight on, if I come over to your apartment, it's to be as a guest. You're about to do cooking. Oh, Angel. I mean it. I'm through being a detective by day and a cook at night. All right, come get it. Oh, boy. Uh, hello. Hi, Mike. Oh, hello, Inspector. What are you doing? Well, I was just going to sit down to a plate of scrambled eggs. Why? I got a body. <laughs> you sound like something out of a horror film instead of Inspector of Homicide. What kind of a body? It's been in the water a week or so. It looks like an accident. Autopsy surgeon seems to think it was an accident. Sergeant here says it was an accident, but... Uh... You think it's murder? Could be, Mike. Where are you? You know where Olium is? Right on San Pablo Bay? Yes. I'll have the police boat pick you up at the jetty. Oh, swell. The sergeant will pick you up as fast as he can get there. Well, uh, give me two more seconds. Two more seconds? Yes, Inspector. One second for each egg. There she is. Pull alongside. Are we going aboard that yacht? Yeah. Inspection board. Hmm. It's a 
trim looking craft. Yeah, about 200,000 bucks worth. Hi there. Can you make it up the ladder or do you want a bosun's chair? Oh, half an hour aboard ship and he talks like an admiral. <laughs> we'll use the ladder, Inspector. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter, Angel? Can't cook his own dinner because of a bullet wound in the shoulder, but he can climb a ship's ladder. Well, I... Okay, okay, you go first, Mike. Okay. Well, kids, you made good time. Mm hmm. Sergeant brought us up the bay as if he knew every wave. He does. Born and raised at San Rafael. Well, <laughs> where's the body? On the engine room hatch. Mm hmm. Any uh, wounds? One blow on the head, which could have been made if he had fallen off the rocks. Water in the lungs? Yeah, Phil. Oh, so he was alive when he hit the water? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Dressed in sailor pants, a reefer jacket, scarf. Shoes don't look like a sailor's. Uh, what besides the shoes make you suspect murder, Inspector? A dead man's hands, Mike. No calluses. And the nails have been manicured. Mm. Sailors don't have soft hands and manicured nails. Well, good work, Inspector. Good work. But, uh, how come uh, you're aboard this ship? Is the owner aboard? No, Mike, but we've sent for him. We came aboard because the Bay Patrol found the body near the ship. And because of this. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. The North Star, owner Nelson Carter. And this is the North Star? Yeah, Phil. Autopsy surgeon said the body has been in the water about ten days. Oh, it's pretty hard to identify him now. Any missing persons reported? I don't know. The sergeant checked with the missing persons bureau when he went back to pick you up. Yes, sir. Nobody reported missing, Inspector. Say, uh, who's aboard? I noticed the anchor light is trim and clear. No smudge on the glass. Must have been lighted tonight. That's right, Mike. Captain is aboard, also the quartermaster. Oh, I don't see any cabin light. No, Phil, the portholes are covered with heavy green curtains. Uh, did you uh, question the captain and the quartermaster? Yeah, Mike. Very non-committal gents. Said they didn't know the dead man. Never seen him before. Didn't know anything about him, and then they both retired to their cabins. Well, that's a little suspicious, don't you think? Uh, not particularly. Well, most people are inquisitive, Inspector, especially about anything that smells of murder. Inspector, did you search the ship? Yeah, they're doing quite a bit of repair work. Huh? Placing all the paneling in the stateroom and so on. Oh, uh, Inspector, did you take a look at the uh, ship's log? No. After all, Mike, we really haven't anything definite to go on, not even a legitimate reason to suspect murder. I think we have. Well, so do I. Otherwise, I wouldn't have sent for you. But to try and tie the murder up with the captain or... With the ship, even. But I do tie it up with the ship, in a way. What do you mean, Mike? Point number one. We're agreed that this dead man isn't a sailor because of his hands. Uh -huh. Agreed. Point number two. We think that these sailors' clothes aren't his clothes, all except for shoes. Oh, yes, Mike. But I still don't see how Dead you... men can change clothes, Angel. Oh. So that suggests uh, violence. Now, take a look at the inside of that right trouser leg. Mm -hmm. You see that uh, smear of orangey red? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. So what? Well, that was made by red lead. The stuff they used to keep iron and steel from rusting. Go on, Mike. Now, take a look at these stanchions on the port side. Freshly painted with red lead. I didn't notice that before. Well, neither did I until right now. But you'll notice, Inspector, that there's no trace of red lead on the inside of either of the dead man's shoes. I see what you mean. To get that smear on the pants legs, whoever was wearing those pants would be sure to get some on their shoes. Right, Inspector, if he were wearing them voluntarily. Now, that smear suggests that he was carried. So I give you a suggestion. The murdered man was stripped of his own clothes, then these sailors' clothes were slipped on him and he was dumped into the bay. And these sailors' clothes came from this ship? Yes, Inspector, yes, these clothes are from this ship. And for that reason, I think we should question our four suspects. Four suspects? I... I don't get you, Mike. Four suspects. Yes, yes. The captain, the quartermaster, the owner. Yeah. And the fourth? The fourth is the ship's carpenter. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the news you've all been waiting for. Post-war gasoline is here. Right now, as we speak these words, Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries are shifting to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, you'll be able to buy a new 76 gasoline that will knock your hat off. 
As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are hurrying it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil Minuteman hasn't received his first shipment of this powerful new gasoline yet, he will within the next two weeks. And just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up, and then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are still aboard the yacht North Star. The dead man's body still lies on the engine room hatch as Mike knocks on the captain's cabin door. What do you want? This is the inspector of homicide. I'd like to talk to you again. Well, I won't say glad to see you because I'm not. I won't say sit down because I'm hoping you won't stay long. We've uh, sent for the owner and I thought we could save time by asking you a few questions. Who are you? I'm Mike Shane, private detective. I don't know that I got to answer any of your questions. Oh, you don't, of course, but I'd like to ask one question anyway. Well? Where's your master's certificate? Why, you went... And don't tell us it's in the chart house, because uh, we looked there. Now, Captain, you may not like to answer Mike's questions, but I think you'd better answer mine. Where is that certificate? Here in the drawer. I haven't had time to put it up yet. I only took over this ship yesterday. Oh, only yesterday, huh? Yes, I answered an ad in the paper. man wanted a navigator to be captain of his private yacht. I got the job. What about the crew? Only well, need three. I'll pick them up in San Francisco tomorrow. What about your quartermaster? Is he a new man, too? Yes, I heard him yesterday. Ahoy there, North Star! Throw us a line! Here you are, Sergeant! Who have you got there, Sergeant? A ship's carpenter named Wilkinson. What about the owner, Carter? Couldn't you find him? No, he's down in South America. Been there for three months. What's that? I said the owner of the North Star has been in South America for the past three months. But that's impossible. I spoke to him a couple of days ago when he hired me. Ah. That's what Carter's secretary says, and he ought to know. I brought him along in case you wanted to ask any questions. Mm-hmm. Who else is that in the police launch? Well, the woman is Mrs. Carter. Oh, um. Has she heard from her husband lately? No, not for three weeks. Mike. Yes, Angel. You and I have the same idea. I'm beginning to have the same feeling, kid. Well, let's have the secretary up first and have him look at the body. What's his name? Jackson. Mr. Jackson, will you come up the ladder, please? I wonder... Yeah, Mike? I wonder if the ship's carpenter is one of the old crew or a new man... Did you know he must be one of the old crew. I didn't hire him. You want to meet, Sergeant? Ah, uh, yes. This is Inspector of Homicide. How do you do? Mike Shane. Hello. Miss Knight. How do you do? I wonder if you'd come over this way, Mr. Jackson, to the engine room hatch. Okay, Sergeant. Oh, why, why that's... That's... Mr. Carter? Yes, that's Mr. Carter. Hmm. Inspector. Yes, Mike. I'd like to make a suggestion. Sure. I think we should take the body back to San Francisco. Yes? Then we should take everybody, and I mean everybody, to police headquarters. Sit down, Mr. Ryan. You're carpenter on the North Star. Yes, sir. Tell me, how long since you were aboard? Well, nigh three months, sir. Not since Mr. Carter left. Is that right? That's right, miss. Mm-hmm. Now, take a look at this reefer jacket. Hey. Hey, that's mine, sir. I left it in me bunk. And these pants? Mine, too. But there wasn't no red lead on them when I laid them on the bunk. Mm-hmm. Did Mr. Carter say anything to you about redecorating or repairing the paneling in the staterooms? No, miss, not to me, he didn't. And uh, you think he would? But uh, Mr. Carter was always one to be full of surprises. He could have done it without saying anything to me. You don't know of any reason why anyone should want to kill him? Not me, sir. I didn't know anything about his private life. Only as the owner of the North Star. Did he and his wife use the North Star much? Oh, yes, quite a bit. Sailed a couple of times to a wire with her. Lots of trips to Vancouver, B.C. 
He was in the shipping business, you know. Yeah. Well, Mike, unless you have any more questions... Uh, yes, just one. Where was the North Star anchored the last time you were aboard? She was tied up at her own jetty, three miles northeast of Olium. Oh, so she's been moved in the past three months. Yes, miss, out into the middle of the bay and about uh, three miles south. Uh-huh, I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Wright. The sergeant will show you out. And bring in Mrs. Carter, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Sit down, Mrs. Carter. I know this has been quite an ordeal. You identified your husband? Yes. We suspect murder, Mrs. Carter. Have you any reason to suspect anyone? No, my husband hasn't... Hadn't an enemy in the world that I know of. You thought he was still in South America? Well, yes, although I haven't had a letter for a month. I-, I used to hear from him regularly every week. I suppose you inherit your husband's property, Mrs. Carter? I suppose I do. Half of it is mine anyway. I inherited it from my mother. Did, um, did your husband say anything about repairing or redecorating the paneling in the salons? No, but that reminds me of something. Yes, Mrs. Carter? Well, I heard Mr. Jackson talking to someone on the phone the other day about paneling. I didn't know what he was talking about, but then I paid very little attention to my husband's business. I see. And you can't help us anymore? I'm sorry, but I, I'm afraid not. I, if I think of anything, I'll call you, Inspector. Thank you. The sergeant will show you out. Bring in the captain, sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, we may be out to call on you, Mrs. Carter. It might be necessary to search your husband's papers. Certainly, Mr. Shane. Sit down, Captain. Thanks. I take it that if you only took over command of the ship yesterday, you haven't given any orders? No, I spent yesterday and today checking supplies, looking over the ship's gear. You knew nothing about uh, the replacing of the salon paneling? Oh, yes, yes. The man I thought was the owner told me he was having it replaced and the workman already knew what to do. And this man that you thought was the owner, what did he look like? I don't know. I never saw him. But you said you spoke to him when he hired you. I spoke to him on the phone. Aha. Now we get somewhere. What was his phone number? I don't know. He called me. I wrote him an answer to his advertisement and put my phone number in the letter. Called me on the phone and told me to report aboard yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's all you know? That's all I know. I saw the ad, answered it, and he told me the berth was mine. I came aboard, and that's that. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I guess you'd better get back aboard ship. I'll wait for the quartermaster. I'm sure he doesn't know any more than I do. As you wish, Captain. You're quite certain that the quartermaster doesn't know anything. How oh, can he? I picked him up on the waterfront this afternoon. He's only been aboard a few hours. I see. All right, Sergeant. We'll see Mr. Jackson next. Uh, just a second, Inspector. Yes, Mike. I think maybe we ought to take a trip out to Mr. Carter's home before we talk to Jackson. All right, Mike. Keep Jackson and the quartermaster till we get back, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Get out into the corridor and see if the captain and Jackson or the quartermaster get to talking. Right, Inspector. Atta boy, Inspector. Uh, are you serious about going out to Carter's place? Well, yes, honey, why? Well, I've been following your advice, Mike. Yes, Angel? I've been listening to the tone of these voices. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think the captain is lying. Or at least not telling the whole truth. Why, Phil? Well, he said he hadn't given any orders since he went aboard. That's right. Yeah. He said he'd been checking stores and looking over the ship's gear, but... Well, then who you... painted the stanchions with red lead? The captain? Those stanchions were still damp. Well, it takes red lead quite a time to dry, but Angel... Angel, I think you have something there. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know quite what it is, but you have something. <laughs> Thanks, Mrs. Carter, for waiting up for us. Oh, not at all. Naturally, I'm anxious to do anything I can to help find my husband's murderer. Hmm? I'm afraid I, I hardly realize he's dead. Yes, there isn't much we can say, Mrs. Carter, except that we'll get his murderer if anybody can. This is... this was my husband's office, his home office. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson always worked here when my husband was out of town. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd better check the desk first. Bill, you take the straw, Inspector. I, I don't know any about shipping schedules. Say, Mike. Phil, yeah? Hmm? What is it? Here's the North Star's clearance to leave her jetty on the 
An anchor in the bay. Dated the 26th of last month. Well, it might mean something. We'll, uh, we'll remember that. Hey, what have you got there, Mike? Well, something not quite on the up and up, I think. In the fireplace there? Uh-huh. Yeah. Burned envelopes and letters. Here, Inspector. Yeah. Here, if that isn't part of a Panama stamp, Panama. Then I don't... That's where my husband was when I last heard from him. Well, this was mail the 21st. Airmail. The last I received was the 18th. Mail the 21st, and the North Star changed her moorings on the 26th. Yes, Angel, yes. Just time to receive this letter and change the ship's moorings. Does that mean something? It uh, depends, Mrs. Carter. It depends. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. I think we should pay a visit to the North Star's jetty, three miles northeast of Oleum, as I remember it. We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who may have tuned in late, we are repeating the announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries have been shifted to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, depending on your locality, you'll be able to buy a powerful new 76 gasoline that beats all pre-war performance. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are delivering it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil man hasn't received his first shipment of this sensational new 76 gasoline, he will within the next few weeks. Just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up, and then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new post-war 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are facing one of their most baffling mysteries. A murder with apparently no motive and no clues. We pick them up at the jetty where the North Star is usually tied up. Well, there's not a thing that I can see. Bare jetty. Odds and ends of rope, freshly painted staunch. Yes, everything connected with the North Star seems to lead to staunch. What, what is it, Mike? Look, look, a piece of red glass. Looks like part of a ship's lantern. Port lantern. A natural deduction, Inspector, since we're on a jetty. But look again. Then look at the railing here. Hmm? A long scratch with paint rubbed into it. Yeah. A scratch made by an automobile bumper and rear fender. Yes. When the car was backed up to turn around, whoever was driving scuffed along the rail and broke this tail lamp glass. Sergeant. Uh, yeah, Mike. Check with Mrs. Carter's car, Jackson's car, and uh, the captain's if he has one. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike. But uh, first get hold of Chips. Chips? Uh, the ship's carpenter, Mr. Wright. Oh. Get hold of him and tell him to meet us aboard the North Star as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then? And then? Then bring everybody back out to the ship, but not before you've checked all the automobiles. Yeah, Mike. And what's our move, Mike? Back aboard the North Star and lay a trap for a murderer. Oh, that constant creaking of the ship gets me. I think we're in luck. I don't believe the captain or the quartermaster are back on a board. No, Mike. Captain said he was going to wait for the quartermaster, so they're both back at headquarters. Yeah, you're right. I forgot. What are you looking for, Mike? I don't know. But I'm giving these port stanchions the once over. Say. What? You see that dark stain on the deck? Yeah. Sure. What about it? You know what made that? No. Do you? No, but I'll make a good guess. Fresh water. Fresh water? Yes. Deck should always be washed down with salt water. It leaves them white and sparkling. Fresh water makes them dark. Yeah, but even so, Mike. Shh, shh, shh. I hope this is Chips, our ship's carpenter. Oi, there! Yeah. Here's the line. Tie up and come aboard. All right. All right, mate. Well, what can I do for you? Tell me, what will dissolve red lead? Red lead? Why, oil will if it ain't too old. And you've got to scrape it. Uh, Take a look at the staunching. Oh, what? That off in no time. You've got oil aboard? Sure thing. Okay, let's get going. All right, sir. Now, now for a quick look at the salon. You know... This was a pretty cleverly conceived murder. 
if that body hadn't been found for a week or two, there would have been no trace of this murder at all. There isn't much trace even now, Mike. Uh, not enough for your district attorney or grand jury, but enough for me. And I think we can trap the murderer without too much difficulty. Well, this is the salon in here. Oh, oh what a beautiful place. Yes. Doesn't seem to me that the paneling needs redecorating. Uh-uh. But I tell you what it does look like, Mike. Yeah? Looks as if the paneling had been torn out in the search for something. The ship's safe, perhaps? Mm. Could be, or something hidden behind the paddling. There goes Chips. Uh, Why do you call him Chips? His name is Wright. All ship's carpenters are called Chips. At least in the books I read. Well, here we are. I found these rags in the captain's cabin. Good. Look like they've been used for the same job before. Let me see those. Hmm. Blood? I think so. Here, use this one. All right, sir. This is going to make a mess of the deck, though. Uh, that's all right. All right. Do, do I hear a boat coming? Yeah, I hear it too, Phil. Hurry, Chips, hurry. Get some more of that red lead off. All right, sir. I'm going like the roaring 40s, I am. Ah, that's the stuff. You got it down to the old paint there in spots. He was right off when it's still soft this way. Boy, not star! Tie up and come aboard, Sergeant. Bring everybody aboard with you. I think this ought to do it. Well, now I want you. Let us see. Hey, hey, what's going on there? You'll ruin that deck. I think this deck's already been ruined, Captain. But let that go for a moment. The uh, inspector had you all brought out here to see what we were doing. Yeah, what are you doing? We're taking off the last few layers of red lead that somebody put on this stanchion. Now, would you know who did it? You did it, Captain? You've been aboard two days and this red lead was still soft and wet. Could it have been put on without your knowing about it? Red lead often takes a week to dry. That stanchion hasn't been painted since I came aboard. That stanchion is the clue to this killing. What do you mean? Mr. Carter was killed aboard his own ship. Oh, Mr. Miss- he was probably hit on the head with a marlin spike, but that's beside the point. The main point is that while his killers were changing his clothes, putting the ship's carpenter's clothes on him, he bled quite a bit. Some blood was spattered on the deck. The killers tried to clean that with fresh water. Yeah. Then they were afraid that some of his blood was on the freshly painted stanchion. So after they'd thrown his body overboard, they repainted the stanchion. But not before they got a smear of red lead on the pants leg as they heaved him overboard. Oh, but who would do such a thing? My husband... The captain, for one, Mrs. Carter, and I think the sergeant has the answer to the other. Right, sergeant? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Mike, we found the car. The car? What car? Yes, Captain, the car which was used to take Mr. Carter out to the jetty while the North Star was still tied up there. That car has a broken taillight and a badly scraped fender. And it is where, Sergeant? In Mr. Jackson's garage. Jackson, you fool, I told you... Shut up, you idiot. Cut out the arguing. You'll need all the arguments you can scrape together when you face the jury. Okay, Sergeant, you can handle them. This is going to taste good. Nearly six in the morning and I'm hungry. You know, I was afraid that the inspector wasn't going to get a confession from those two, the captain and Jackson. They were tough monkeys. Oh, not so tough, really. They had just spent so much time plotting and carrying out this murder that they, they couldn't realize they were trapped. Oh, such a senseless murder, too, Mike. All murders are senseless, honey. But I don't think they started out with the idea of murder in mind. As I see it, the secretary of Jackson had uh, made several trips on the North Star. He knew that wherever they went, Mr. Carter always had plenty of ready cash. Mm. He just got the idea in the back of his head that the money was hidden somewhere on board. He didn't know where, but uh, when Carter went to Central and South America, he determined to make a haul. Mm. So when the crew was on vacation, he got together with this man who called himself the captain. They started taking the salon apart, huh? Right, Angel, right. Jackson needed someone who knew something about ships. And then when he saw from the mail that Carter was coming home, he he got panicky and destroyed the letters to Mrs. Carter? Mm Mm-hmm. He met the unsuspecting Carter when he arrived, took him out to the jetty where the North Star was birthed, set out into the middle of the bay and killed him. Ah, dressing him in the carpenter's clothes so if he were found, nobody could identify him. Mm Mm-hmm. I see. Have some more coffee, Mike? Sure thing, Angel. How's the shoulder after the night's excitement? Oh, pretty good, but... I still think you'll have to come over for a few nights and fix dinner for me. I will not. You can eat out if you're too lazy to fix your own dinner. You know, I've been thinking, Mike. Yes, Angel? Wouldn't it be nice to have a yacht like the North Star and go any place, any time you wanted to? Oh, I don't know. Look what happened to Mrs. Carter. She lost her husband on account of the North Star. (laughs) Of course, darling. I don't have a husband. Well, don't give up hope, Angel. Now, if you were to fix my dinners for the next few weeks... Mike, Shane, I believe that's all you think about in a wife, a good cook. Oh, no, Angel, not quite. But, uh, 
being a good cook is a good recommendation. Before we sign off, I'd like to repeat the special announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. As fast as Union Oil Company's trucks can haul it, a powerful new 76 gasoline is being delivered to your Minuteman stations. Watch for the signs to go up at all Union Oil stations announcing the first shipment of the new 76 gasoline. Then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of powerful post-war gasoline soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Written and produced by David Taylor, tonight's story was based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Charles Dan. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company present The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. A detective as well known as Mike Shane is in the limelight pretty much of the time. This evening, Mike is not in the limelight, but behind the footlights. Or rather, he is just about to be. A new review is opening at the Empire Theater, and for reasons still unknown, Mike has been asked to attend the rehearsal. Right now, Mike and his pretty associate, Phyllis Knight, are waiting at the stage door. Yes, what do you want, son? We'd like to see Miss Beverly Pryor, please. I'm sorry, son, rehearsal going on. But she asked us to come. It's business. Oh, business. Well, then, I guess it's okay. Come on in. Miss Pryor's dressing room is number four. Well, thanks. Mike, how long is it since you've seen this Beverly Pryor? Oh, years. <laughs> Ten years. We got to be good friends when I spent a couple of vacations down in New Orleans. Seems to me she could have told you what she wanted over the phone. Well, we'll know in three seconds. This is dressing room four. Come in. Oh, well, Mike. Hello. Oh, darling, let me give you a... <laughs> Bev. Mike, I've been waiting to Beverly. pieces, Mike. It's so wonderful to see you again. I, oh, I'd almost forgotten you were so handsome. Uh, yeah. Oh, I almost forgot, too. Phyllis, I mean, uh, Beverly, I want you to meet my... I mean, uh, I want you to meet well, Miss Phyllis. Oh, Mike, you haven't gone and got yourself married. No, Miss Pryor. Not yet. I'm Phyllis Knight, Mike's associate. Oh, uh, just in a business way. Mm -hmm. How do you do? Beverly, I didn't know you'd gone on the stage. Oh, I was always good at dancing. You remember, Mike. I've got a specialty number in the review. Oh. South American dancers. Rumbas and sambas. Do you like my costume? Oh, sure. It's uh, <clears throat> very colorful. <laughs> Shows off my legs very well, don't you think? Uh-huh. <laughs> you remember what skinny legs I used to uh, have. Miss Pryor, Mike and I don't want to hold up your rehearsal. Oh, no, no, that's right. Beverly, you said on the phone that you were afraid of something serious happening. Somebody connected with your show. Oh, oh yes, I, I was pretty scared yesterday. But some changes are being made tonight, and, well, I think things will all straighten out now. Well, what was wrong? Well, maybe it was my imagination. We've all been so nervous and hot-tempered. Yes? Well, I thought somebody was planning a murder. 
Somebody would... Mm-hmm. What made you think so? Hiya, beautiful. Ready for your spot? Larry says you're going to follow up. Oh, oh come in, boys. I want you to meet an old friend of mine. Mike, this is our comedy team. Sweeney and March. Mike Shane and Miss Knight. Hello. Is the salt sent to the pepper? Shake it. <laughs> How do you do? They're just dandy. Snug as a rug and a bug. <laughs> you get the switch. Snug as a rug. <laughs> All friends of theirs, huh? Uh, well, you believe me, this little gal's going places. You know, this show's just third base for her. Next strike will be home plate for Hollywood. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sweeney thinks he can sell me to Hollywood. If he'd stick to comedy and forget the age of you. Wait, well. you wait, you'll see. I'll have Sammy Goldwyn and Louis V strangling each other for you. Hey, come on, Sweeney. We're late for okay, us. Okay, yeah, we'll be seeing you. Yeah, uh, sure. A <laughs> slap happy pair. Mike, why don't you and Miss Knight go out in the wings and watch their routine? Well, I want to get your story first. Now, who was planning a murder? Oh, it's all straightened out now, Mike. After rehearsal, we can have a little supper, and I'll, and I'll tell you all about it. Now, go on, Scoot. I've got to finish dressing. Well, all right. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Haven't you anything to say? Angel. Your vacations in New Orleans must have been very pleasant. Oh, (laughs) yes, very pleasant. (laughs) (laughs) Did I miss a joke? You missed something. (laughs) Uh, The hotter a woman gets, the more she freezes. Okay, Sweeney, let's take that railroad spot again. All right, fine. You all set? Let's go. Right. It doesn't really matter, Mr. March. Any train will do, but I must have a ticket for Hollywood. Well, I understand that, Mr. Sweeney, but I can't let you have a ticket unless your trip is essential. What sort of business are you in? Oh, well, I'm president of the 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company. 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, we manufacture a sausage that's 12 inches long and contains 12 different kinds of meat. Well, what's the advantage? What's the advantage, Mr. March? Just this. If you're slicing a piece of our sausage and someone comes up to you and says, no matter how thin you slice it, it's still bologna, they're probably wrong. It may be liverwurst. Oh, oh, come now, Mr. Sweeney. After all, how can I give you a train reservation for something like that? Well, if you must know, I've got to get to Hollywood to see my doctor. Oh, oh, you have a serious illness, do you? Yes, I suffer from very bad attacks of bakery face. <laughs> bakery face, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, under uh, my doctor's orders, I wash my face in baking powder and lemon juice. Well, then what happens? I break out in cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sweeney, it seems to me that the thing... Help, 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 Wait a minute. What's, what's, what's going on? Mike, Mike, it's the old man, the doorman. Yes, and he's pointing into that dressing room. Come on. It's Estelle. Estelle. She's murdered. Wait a minute, I see her. Hell, I see her, Mike, happened? in the dressing room. All right, stand back, everybody. Stand back. You're not coming in here. Who says we're not going in there? I do. I'm a detective. Dad, you keep him out. I sure will. Oh, it's not a pretty picture, Mike. Stabbed in the back right at her dressing table. Hmm. Done with a huge knife. A special kind of knife with a gold hilt. Mike. Yes? Look the mirror right above her head. Oh, uh-huh. some letters and lipstick. Yeah, she tried to tell us something. It spells B-E-V-E. Uh, the rest of the letters are just a red scrawl. Oh, I'm afraid we know where they were meant to be. B-E-V-E. R-L-Y, Beverly. Beverly Pryor. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, since we told you last week that post-war gasoline was here, many of you have already tried a tank full of the powerful new 76. But just in case the Minuteman in your locality hasn't been able to supply you with the new 76 gasoline, be patient. As fast as the modern 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company can make and blend it, our tankers and trucks are hurrying post-war 76 gasoline to you. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing its arrival. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tank full of the new 76. Performance of the new 76 gasoline far exceeds pre-war standards. You'll like its lighter, faster, more powerful action. And you'll like the price, too. It sells at regular prices, no increase. 
So to make your old car act like new, put in a tank full of the gasoline of the future, the new 76. Now going on sale wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Your Union Oil Minuteman Station. Mike's backstage visit to the Empire Theater has taken a grim turn. Mike and Phyllis have found a girl stabbed to death. Behind a closed door in the Dead Star's dressing room, Mike and Phyllis tell their story to the inspector. And that's about it, Inspector. The old mm. fellow who watches the stage door discovered the body. We were out in the wings watching a comedy routine when we heard him yell. The murdered girl is Estelle Carroll, Inspector. She was the dance partner of Vic Hunter. Carroll and Hunter, they're listed on the billboard. Yeah, sure, kids. But this gal, Beverly Pryor, you say she called you here tonight because you thought a murder was cooking? How does Beverly know so much? Well, you see, Inspector... I see plenty. I see in that mirror right above Estelle's head the letters B-E-V-E written in lipstick. Estelle tried to write the name of her murderer. I was coming to that. Just give me time. Now, Phyllis checked through Estelle's purse, and according to Estelle's driver's license, she was five feet four inches tall. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm six feet tall, Inspector. Yet these lipstick letters are three or four inches above my head. Now, I've heard you, Inspector, lecture your boys on the squad. That a person will usually ride on the level with his eyes. Sure, it's a safe generality. Well, then, Mike, you think somebody else wrote the letters B-E-V-E, -E, huh? Some tall person to give us a false clue? That's possible, Phil, but we can't prove it. No, no, but I would like to see a woman who has been stabbed in the back rise clear out of her chair, take a lipstick, and scrawl some letters 12 inches above her eyes. All right, while we're on the subject of clues, what else have we got? Well, I searched her dressing table. It's just the usual stuff. Except for one thing, this old-fashioned locket necklace. Hmm, smear of blood on the locket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the murderer's fingers, probably. We found it thrown in the bottom drawer. Yeah, uh -huh. but more important, Inspector, look at the inside of the locket. There, you, you can see a patch of glue and a trace of paper sticking to it. Yeah. Well, there was a photograph pasted inside this. And if we can find out whose photograph it was, I think we may know why Estelle was murdered. Okay, let's start asking questions, beginning with Beverly Pryor. No, if you want, Inspector, I'll go get her for you. Thanks, Phil. Hmm. Mike, has Beverly seen the body and this writing on the mirror? No, no, we kept everybody out of the dressing room. Good, then I think I'll drape this towel over the mirror. Just as well if Miss Pryor doesn't see our own name on the glass. Or any of the others, for that matter. Hmm, this is a peculiar-looking knife. Gold-painted hilt. Must be a theatrical prop. Mm, probably. Whoever the killer was, he or she must have stood behind Estelle as she sat at the dressing table. And while they were talking, plunged the knife in. Assuming the killer was supposed to be her friend. Well, sure, sure. There's no signs of a struggle. And no closet for a murderer to spring out of. And this may be this window here. Seems to open into an alley. Well, we checked it, Inspector. It was locked. Uh, Miss Pryor, this is the Inspector of Homicide. How do you do, Miss Pryor? If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, no, no, of course not. You want to ask me how I knew there was going to be a murder? Yes. Well, I, I didn't know. But I saw something during rehearsal last night. Well, that's why I telephoned for you, Mike. And what did you see, Beverly? Well, uh, I was standing in the wings, waiting to do my number. Estelle was out front rehearsing her solo. She was supposed to do pirouettes clear across the stage into the opposite wing. And, well, just as she reached the curtain, I saw a long, thin sword slide out through the curtain. I, I screamed, and, well, Estelle stopped. That's all that saved her life. You didn't see who held the sword? I, I couldn't. Did anyone else in the cast see who it was? Well, I didn't tell them. I, I said I screamed because I saw a rat. May I ask why the deception, Miss Pryor? I didn't know who it might be. I, I mean, I wasn't sure. Maybe I just imagined I saw a sword. The stage lighting is so uncertain. Yet you took it seriously enough to ask Mike to come here tonight. Beverly, we want you to examine the knife here in Estelle's back. Oh, it's... Ghastly. Yes, but do you recognize the knife? Is it a theatrical prop? Yes. It's it's from Harry's act. Harry? Harry Frizee, the magician. The famous Frizee. Would he have any reason to kill Estelle? I don't know. Okay, let's find out. Let's talk to everybody. Oh, I... I'm hey, I'm hold I... on. Come back here. Yes, yes, sir. Who are you? I'm uh, I'm the doorman, sir. I was just passing... Oh, yes, just... and you're the man who found the body. Yes, sir. I had a telegram to deliver to Miss Carroll and her partner... I thought they were both in the dressing room. When I opened the door, man alive, there she was. You didn't tell me anything about a telegram. Well, uh, I, I forgot. Here, I got it in my pocket. Let me see that. Oh, it's addressed to Vic Hunter and Estelle Carroll. Yeah, two or three telegrams in the last uh, couple of days. Think so? Oh, Sergeant. That's Inspector. Check with the telegraph office. I want the text of all wires received here in the past week. Right away, sir. Inspector, listen to this. Yeah. Carroll and Hunter. 
Have booked you three weeks, Club Belvedere, starting next Sunday. Stop. Top deal. Regards, Sam McGlynn. Yeah, I have that telegram, please. Huh? I'm Vic Hunter. Oh, Estelle's partner. Mr. Hunter, do you know if Estelle had any enemies? No, not real enemies. She, well, she had several bad quarrels the last couple of days with March and with Beverly. I heard that, Vic. You know it wasn't Beverly's fault. Estelle was jealous. She knew Beverly was going to steal the show. Don't be silly. Nobody can steal a show from Estelle. Then why did she tell me she'd fix it so I'd never dance again? Okay, okay, okay. Estelle was jealous. Let it go at that. Now, what about this fight with March? All right, I'll tell you. I suppose everybody knows about it anyway. I was trying to get Estelle to marry me, but she kept turning me down. We began a fight. I and... told you, March, you were wasting your time on her, but oh. no, no, you wouldn't listen to me. You even had to take our paycheck, my paycheck, to buy her an engagement. Well, she ring. gave it back to yeah, me. Yeah, she gave it back. You'll get your money. Don't worry about your money. Quiet, quiet. Your money. quiet. Did any of you notice anything strange in Estelle's action the past few days? Did she seem afraid or worried? No, no, no just a fight no. with Beverly and March. Mr. Hunter. We found a necklace and locket in Estelle's dresser, an old-fashioned gold chain and locket. Yes, she always wore it. She called it her good luck charm. Whose picture did she keep inside the locket? Why, I think it was a man's photograph. I assumed it was some fellow she was or had been in love with. She never told you his name, Mr. Hunter? No, Estelle was very closed-mouthed. Mm-hmm. I want to establish the time element in this case. Estelle and Mr. Hunter finished rehearsal and then went back to their dressing rooms. Now, sometime during the next 15 minutes, the murder occurred. Now, during those 15 minutes, where was everybody? Well, I was in my dressing room. Part of the time, Mike and Miss Knight were visiting with me. And Sweeney and I were just buzzing around. We stopped in and gabbed a minute with Beverly and her pals. Yeah, well, we're in the clear. A comedy guy couldn't carve a hole in a gal's back and then go out front and panic him with gags. Sure. We'd be laying turkey eggs all over the place. I'm not the one to say that you didn't, Mr. Sweeney. Huh? Didn't which? Say, listen, if you mean that... Inspector... Are... We were going to talk to the magician, the famous Frizee. Yeah, it's about time. Anybody know where we can find him? Well, he was in his dressing room a few minutes ago. I'll show you where it is. Never mind if you'll just tell us. Oh, all right. You go right down here. The famous Frizee's dressing room is the last on the left. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. You kids got any ideas yet? I have. Uh Huh? I'd like to know why none of these people voluntarily mentioned the famous Frizee. They know everybody in this theater is under suspicion. Yet nobody refers to the magician, mm. the owner of the knife which stabbed Estelle to death. Right. Well, probably because none of them noticed the knife. Aside from Beverly, I'm not sure the others even know how Estelle was killed. Mm, one of them does, Mike. Huh? He said a comedian couldn't carve a hole in a girl's back and then go out and do a gag routine. Swing. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. This must be the dressing room here. No answer. Well, there's his costume on the chair, but no Mr. Frizee. That's blame funny. We haven't seen him anywhere around the theater. He's just disappeared. Mm, it's not surprising for a magician. <clears throat> hey. Hey, that window curtain. It's blowing. Yeah, and the window's wide open. And an alley right outside. I'll bet he ducked out the window and up the alley. Oh, great. Now I'll have to drag out the old net. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Low gear for a moment, Inspector. Look at that sword rack on the wall there. Sabres, swords, daggers... Yeah, in several blank places in the collection. The rack is minus two daggers, the same type that killed Estelle. And also minus two swords. Swords. Oh. Huh. Oh, what, Angel? I just remembered. When I went out to get Beverly for you boys, I found her in Sweeney and March's dressing yeah, room. Yeah, and... and... I saw one of those swords on top of their trunk. Uh-uh. And last night, Beverly saw a sword come out of the curtains intended for Estelle. Mike! Mike, Inspector! What's Beverly? Matter? Beverly, what's wrong? I just got a phone call. A man told me he knew who killed Estelle. Huh? He asked me to meet him in my hotel room. I didn't know what to do. Well, I said yes. Could you recognize his voice? Oh, I think so. He was trying to disguise his voice, but it sounded like... like Harry Frizee. Frizee, swell. Then we know where to find him. Oh, I'm scared, Mike. Everybody in the troop knows I called you in tonight because I knew something. Maybe he's trying to lure me outside. That's exactly what he's trying to do, Beverly. Now, you're going to stay right here. We'll keep that appointment for you. Give me the key to your room. Uh, here it is. It's 9.05. Frizee is right across the hall, number 906. What time did he say to meet him? At 9.30. And it's 9.10 right now. Okay, Inspector, we've got ourselves a date. <laughs> Floor. Room 905. That would be this way. 
Yeah. Yeah, here we are. That's for Z's room across the hall. And the light shining over the transom. Okay, let's talk to him in his own room. We may get a chance to see something. That's funny. His lights are on. This is another vanishing act. Let's try the door. Unlocked. More than that. Look at the doorknob. And my hand. Blood. Mike, is... is that the famous frisee? I'm afraid the word is was, Inspector. It was the famous frisee. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane in his adventures. How about it, friends? Have you gotten your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline? It's available right now at no increase in price at many Minuteman stations. The new post-war 76 is freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company. That means you're getting the benefit of the latest in war-proven refining methods when you get the new 76. It's lighter, faster action beats all pre-war performance. You'll notice the difference as soon as you come down on the accelerator. So for a real motoring thrill, get a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. If your minute man doesn't have the new 76 today, please be patient. Our tankers and trucks are making deliveries with all possible speed, but some outlying districts of necessity take longer to supply. But whether you're able to buy the new 76 right now, or whether you have to wait a few more days you'll find it the gasoline you've been waiting for. It's the new 76 gasoline, now going on sale at your Union Oil Minute Man stations. For the second time tonight, a murderer's knife has struck. The prize suspect, the famous Frazee, has been killed. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have just completed a search of the dead magician's hotel room. Ransack, turned upside down, pulled apart. I wonder what under the sun the killer was looking for. Well, we haven't the foggiest idea what to look for or what's missing. Mm. But at least this time we know the motive. For Z was killed because he knew the identity of Estelle's murderer, huh? You can't even say that, Phil. Huh? Don't forget For Z's knife was found in Estelle's back. He may have committed the first murder tonight, then somebody else killed him. Oh. I want to take a really good look at that body. Hmm. Still wearing his overcoat, so he had just come in. Wound on the back of the head showed the murderer first tried to put him out quietly. Hey, Inspector. What? His wristwatch, it smashed. Yeah, it stopped at, let's see, 8.57. 8.57? Inspector, when Beverly rushed in and told us about Frazee's phone call, remember I looked at my watch? That's right, you said it was ten minutes past nine. Hey, hey, then Frazee was already dead. He wasn't disguising his voice on that phone call. Somebody was trying to imitate for Z. And I'll bet you that somebody made the phone call from right inside the theater to get us out of the scene for a while. Well, if you're right, Mike, it's a darn good thing I phoned the sergeant to bring these people here to the hotel. Hey, kids. Yes, what? Angel? Y- you notice that for Z's right hand is closed tight, uh, in fact, awfully tight. Yeah. You suppose maybe he's got something in his fist? Well, we shouldn't disturb the body till the coroner gets here. Go ahead. Perhaps if I just pried his fingers open. You're right, honey. Mm, let's see it. A photograph, a tiny round picture of a baby. Yeah. And look at the back of the photo. Dried glue. This is the picture that was torn out of Estelle's locker. Inspector, I've got everybody outside for you. Sweeney, March, Hunter, and Sprayer. Okay, Sergeant. We'll talk to them one at a time. Bring in Sweeney. Yes, sir. Mr. Sweeney. This thing gives me the creeps. When are you guys going to stop finding bodies? Mr. Sweeney, you have one of Frizzy's swords in your dressing room. Mind telling us what for? Oh, that old March and I borrowed a couple of them from Frizzy. We were cooking up a burlesque on his magic act. Mm. We figured we could get some laughs. Yeah, I it. see. And now, uh, will you look at this photograph here? Sure. Do you recognize this baby? No. That's all, sir. Okay, Sergeant, bring in March. March. Mr. March, would you explain why you had one of Frizzy's swords in your dressing room tonight? Sure, we've had him a couple of days. Sweeney, now we're going to do a takeoff on Frizzy's act. Oh, yeah. That checks up. Do you recognize the baby in this photograph? Mm, no, sir. Okay, thank you. That's all. all right. Sergeant, Mr. Hunter. Yes, 
Yes, gentlemen. Oh, Mr. Hunter, we found that photograph which was missing from your partner's locket. You have? Good. Yes, yes. Here, this is it. A baby's picture. And as uh, we recall, Mr. Hunter, you said that there was a man's picture inside. Well, there was the last time I saw it. She must have changed photographs recently. Do you know who this baby might be? Not the slightest idea. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Will you send in Miss Pryor next? Oh, yes, Inspector. Yes, I will. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. One of the boys just came to the telegraph office. Here are the copies of all the telegrams sent to the theater. Swell. Then hold Miss Pryor outside till we've read them. Yes, sir. Let's see. The first wire is four days ago from Chicago. Regret to inform you your father passed away last night. Stop. Will you attend funeral? Sign Norman L. Tyre, gang cop and tire attorneys. Well, this second wire is a duplicate. Two days later. And the last is dated yesterday. No word from you, so funeral tomorrow. Stop. Have been named administrator of your father's estate. Stop. You are again beneficiary because of John Jr. Signed Norman L. Tyre. John Jr. Again beneficiary because of John. Well, maybe I'm crazy, but I say the baby in this picture is John. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Back at the theater, I asked everybody if Estelle acted in any way peculiar the past few days, if she'd been frightened or worried. Yeah, and they all said that she was not upset. Well, then that's our answer. Inspector. Yeah, Mike? Somebody had better go back to the theater and pick up Dad, the old doorman. Now, Dad, now I want you to be very careful. How many telegrams did you receive addressed to Estelle? Why, three to Estelle and one to the team of Carol and Hunter. Uh Uh-huh. Now, um, you all remember that I asked uh, whether or not Estelle had shown any signs of being worried or upset? And you all said no. Yes, Yes, right. Three of these telegrams told of her father's death. Well, she certainly didn't say anything or show any signs of grief. The answer to that is easy, Mr. Hunter. She never saw those telegrams. They were deliberately withheld from her. But but, uh, I delivered them. At least I gave them to Mr. Hunter. You're right. I did withhold them. I didn't want Estelle to go to pieces and ruin our act. How long did you and Estelle work in that act, Mr. Hunter? Over three years. And during that time, your impression was that the locket she wore as a good luck charm contained a photograph of a man? Some fellow she was or had been in love with, I think you said. That's right. You're lying, Mr. Hunter. What do you mean? Does this look like the photo of a man? It's a baby. Estelle's baby. I don't know. I told you. You told us a lot that you didn't mean to, Mr. Hunter, but you didn't tell us that Estelle's baby was your baby, too. That you and Estelle were married. That you that you had to kill her. I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. And you killed Frizee because he knew. Frizee found the baby's photograph. How, I don't know, but that doesn't matter. Frizee put two and two together. You had to kill him. I can only guess at your original motive, but uh, that's something I'm quite sure the inspector will ring from you when he gets you down to police headquarters. <laughs> There it is, Angel. I know, Mike, but I still don't see how Hunter could expect to get away with it. But didn't he know somebody would check up on those telegrams? Well, certainly, honey, but he miscalculated on one thing. Hmm? He didn't know a private detective was going to be backstage right after the killing. He didn't have time to plant the telegrams in Estelle's purse or dresser. Well, I don't understand how that would help. I sure it would. Then he would have played it differently. Hunter would have admitted the marriage. He would have told us Estelle and he were planning to leave the show because Estelle had come into her father's money. As I see it, the reason he had the killer was because she was going to divorce him. Oh, that would cut him off from Estelle's inheritance. Yes. Mike. Yes. Thought you'd like to know we just got a confession. Seems Estelle was planning to divorce Vic and... Ah, just what I finished telling Phil, Inspector. Oh, oh, but there's one thing, one thing. How did Hunter make that phone call imitating Frizee? From the theater, Mike. He called Beverly to give himself an alibi. He wanted us to think Frizee was still alive while Hunter was in the theater. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the one question that worried me. <laughs> okay, Inspector. Thanks a lot. Mm, Michael. Uh, yes? Uh, there's one more question, and it worries me. Hmm? When you were down in New Orleans, just how friendly were you with Beverly? Oh, why, Miss Knight. Well? <laughs> Uh, I may have an eye for figures, but, Angel, you certainly haven't got a head for them. <laughs> How old would you say Beverly is right now? Mm, 22, 23. She's 22. I told you I knew her in New Orleans ten years ago. 
Yes, ma'am, we were the scandal of her grammar school. Mike Shane, you deliberately led me on. You allowed me... Oh, come here, you big lug. Oh, oh, Bev. What? I mean, the angel. Remember, friends, the new 76 gasoline will give you a driving performance that will make you think of jet propulsion. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing the first shipments at your Union Oil Minuteman stations. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tankful of the powerful new 76 gasoline, freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company, now going on sale at your Minuteman stations. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. The characters of Sweeney and March were played by the comedy team of Sweeney and March. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Colgate Palmolive Feet Company, makers of Halo Shampoo to glorify your hair, and Colgate Tooth Powder for a breath that's sweet and teeth that sparkle bring you Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. People like Pam and Jerry North enjoy living in New York because there's always something going on. At any hour of the day or night. But if there's one time when the big city sleeps, or even dozes off for a moment, it's in the wee hour just before dawn, when the streets are deserted, and your car is just broken down on the outskirts of town. Oh, it's no use, dear. This thing wouldn't start if I gave it a dose of Benzedrine. I wish it'd stop turning the motor over. I'm beginning to feel like a malted milk. Mm, must be the distributor or that uh, flow from the carburetor. Oh, no, it's the starter, Jerry. It keeps spinning around and around as if all the ice cream weren't melted. What ice cream? Well, I hadn't thought about the flavor. I, I suppose it's chocolate. In the carburetor? Oh, is that what you call those things? What thing? Those aluminum containers they mix malters in. Darling, I'm talking about starting the car. Well, for goodness sake, what do you think I'm talking about? I don't know, dear. You haven't given me a clue. Jerry, where are you going? Well, we can't just sit here, Pam. I've got to find a garage or a telephone or somebody that'll give us a hitch to one. Everybody around here seems to be asleep. Oh, there must be some sign of life. Other people drive home from late parties, don't they? Not along this road. There doesn't seem to be a single... Ah, a milk wagon. What are you so happy about? We don't want any milk. Hey there. Hold up a second, will you? Oh, oh, Nilly. What's the trouble, mister? Run out of gas? Run out of engine, I think. Uh, do you know where I can find a garage that's open at this time of the night? Well, no, I, I don't know as I can. I, I don't have much use for garages, you know. Not while there's good horses around. <laughs> now, you stop laughing, Nelly. You break down, too, once in a while. What's the matter, Jerry? Won't he help us? Oh, I'll help you, ma'am, as soon as I finish up my milk route. Nellie won't mind taking you to a garage so long as you don't make her go in. The, the smell of gas gives her colic. Uh, I guess she doesn't even like to talk about it. <laughs> she don't mind. Well, how long do you think it'll take you to finish? Oh, it won't be long. 
I haven't got but a few more calls to make. Now, you just sit here in the wagon and wait for me. I'll be back in a minute. Do you think we ought to, Jerry? Wait in the wagon? Why not? Well, I don't know. It just seems kind of funny to be sitting in a milk wagon. I don't know a thing about cows. I don't either, dear, but I just assume get home tonight. Come on. Right. Oh, must be awfully lonely being a milkman, leaving bottles at people's doors, sitting up here in the driver's seat. You never see anybody face to face, not even the horse. Pam, will you please sit down and leave Nellie out of this? The first thing you know, I'll have to... You have to what? Stay where you are. Don't make a sound. Why, Jerry... Shut up, I tell you. Jerry North, how dare you talk to me like that? I'm not talking, Pam. It's this manly-looking gentleman who's just stepped up to the wagon. Oh, what? The one on your left with the scar on his face. And the long-nosed gun in his hand. Oh. How do you do? Keep your trap shut or you'll get hurt. Where's the milk? Uh, Matt Wells. What milk? Come on, come on. Where are the cases that were piled up and back? I don't know. We're strangers here. Oh, push over. Let me look inside. Yes, sir. Oh, is that all the milk there is, just these four bottles? As far as we know, we haven't touched a drop. No, we're coffee drinkers. Shut up. I ain't got time for polite conversation. Hey, what, what? are you doing? That's somebody's milk. Mind your own business. Oh, you, you can't do that. Think of all the trouble the cows went to. Sit down and keep out of the way. Jerry, he's milk mad. He'll break all the bottles and we'll get the blame for it. Well, that's that. There's some cream over here in the corner. Never mind. Where's the milk route? The what? The list of places the milkman delivers to. It ought to be hanging up here somewhere. Oh, is this it? That's what I want. Hey, now, wait a minute. You can't get away with this. No? What are you going to do? Uh, pay for the milk. That's more like it. And just to make sure you don't get in my hair, I'm going to send you two on a little buggy ride. Buggy? Okay, here, don't you dare take those reins. You'll get them back in a minute, lady. Get here, Jerry. Give him a good ride. Hey, don't do that. Don't. don't. Stop him. That bug's running away. Never mind him, Pam. The horse is, too. Had a girl, Nellie. Just take it easy and we'll find your master for you. Maybe it'd be better not to, after running away with his horse. The horse ran away with us, dear. And if she hadn't tired on that long hill, we'd have been in Cleveland by now. Oh, golly, she's starting again. Now, now, don't excite her, Pam. She just sees her master. Where? Waiting right over there on the curb next to our car. Oh. Whoa, Nellie, easy, girl. This is the end of the line. You'd better start talking, Jerry, before the milkman turns sour. Uh, fine thing. A fine thing. If you want to go for a ride, why don't you find a merry-go-round? We can explain everything, driver. Well, you can't explain overheating this horse. She ain't air-cooled, you know. Well... Gosh almighty, you broke my milk, too. Now, Mrs. Snyder won't be able to take her bath. But it wasn't our fault, driver. That horrible man had a scar on his face and a gun in our ribs. Otherwise, the horse wouldn't have run away. Don't you see? I see, all right. But I don't think I'm hearing so good. He broke the bottles, the, the thug. And he took the milk route, too. Now, why would anybody want to break milk bottles? That's just it. We don't know. Unless he sells cardboard containers. It's a lot more serious than that, Pam. That guy was desperate. I don't believe the whole story. Stick him up. Huh? huh? Stick him up, all of you. You'll get shot. Jerry, it's a girl. Now, what kind of a joke... Shut up. Hand over all the milk you got. Come on, lady, pass it down. But there isn't any more. Will cream do? Uh, we have some very thin cream. Don't be funny. Give me the cream. Yes, ma'am. Is that all there is? Just these two? That's all, lady. Mrs. Foley and Mrs. Rosenblum. Oh. Gosh, takes. that's not just cream. That's extra heavy. What happened to all the milk? The man with the scar got it. He got the milk route, too. The man with the scar? That's what they tell me. Get in, driver. How's that? Get in, I said. We're all going for a little ride. Another one? My horse is exhausted. So like I tell you. You're going to take me back over your milk route. <laughs> Why did he do it? Why did it have to happen to me? Every bottle along the route has been broken. Well, stop your whining and keep driving. There's Mrs. Henderson. 
There must be milk insurance. There's Mrs. Flowers, both ports. There's rain insurance. They'll never forgive me. I'll have to move to a new neighborhood. Oh, there's one that isn't broken. Where? I see it. Mrs. Breedham's house. Oh, oh, Nellie. Oh. Take it easy now. No tricks, I'll let you have it. We uh, may get out, may we not? One at a time. Keep in front of me. All of you. Come on, Pam. Watch your step, dear. How can I? With a hot gun breathing down my neck. Go ahead, milkman. Stay with him. I'm staying. Only I wish you would... Keep moving. Oh, yes, ma'am. Not too fast now. Keep in line. Anything you say. Go ahead, Jerry. I just can't understand why all the other milk bottles are broken and this one is still whole. Wait a minute. I think I understand it now, Pam. What is it? A man lying across the steps. A dead man. Oh, no. How do you know he's dead? He's been shot through the head. Jerry, that thug did it. The man with the scar on his face, he killed him. No, Pam. That thug didn't kill this man. Why not? Because this man is the one with the scar on his face. Well, this is one situation where there's more to cry over than spilled milk. Halo, everybody, halo. Halo is the shampoo that glorifies your hair. So, halo, everybody, halo. Use halo shampoo if you want naturally bright and beautiful hair. Remember, even finest soaps and soap shampoos hide the natural luster of your hair with dulling soap film. But halo contains no soap, therefore cannot leave dulling soap film. The first time you use Halo, your hair glistens in all its natural brilliance. The natural color and luster shines through like sunshine through a clean window pane. And remember, even in hardest water, Halo makes oceans of rich, fragrant lather. Halo quickly carries away loose dandruff and grease, needs no lemon or vinegar rinse, because Halo leaves no dulling soap film, nothing to hide your hair's natural beauty. Say hello to Halo and goodbye to dulling soap film. Use Halo on your children's hair, too. Get Halo shampoo at any cosmetic counter. Remember, Halo glorifies your hair. So, Halo, everybody, Halo. Halo shampoo, Halo. Now, back to Mr. and Mrs. North. Just stand there, Jerry. Get the police. I'd be very happy to, dear, but I doubt if this young lady with the gun will let me. I will in a minute, mister. As soon as I search this guy's pocket. Oh, don't do that. It's against the law to move a dead man. Against the law to do a lot of things. I'll bet you've done them all. Shut up. All I wanted from you was milk. Just the same, you're going to get into a lot of trouble if you don't stop throwing suspicion on yourself. You're mixed up in a murder case, young lady. No, I'm not. I'm just looking for a ring. What kind of a ring? Is that what he was looking for? That's my business. It'll be the police's business, too, when they catch up with you. Don't forget you've got three witnesses here who can identify you. Cut it out, will you? I didn't kill this guy. But you do know who he is. He's a skunk, a no-good double-crossing skunk. Oh, I take it you're in love with him. I was until he tried to run out of me, just swiping somebody's ring. A dirty rat, he said the cops would chase him down the street. He had to get rid of it. So he just left it in my milk wagon? That's what he told me. He said he cut through the cap of a milk bottle, dropped it inside so he could pick it up later. Only the wagon had moved by then. I guess so. Well, if he was double-crossing you, why don't you put that gun down and let the police take over? Because I don't want to get blamed for stealing that ring. I want to put it back before she finds out it was stolen. Who is she? The woman I work for. She'll think I took her because I'm a maid. Well, who is the woman you work for? I've told you too much already. Now, turn around, all of you. What's the idea? Turn around, I said. Keep facing the street. If anybody tries to follow me, I'll shoot. Stay that way, all of you. See which way she's going, Jerry. No, and I'm not going to look either. She's too nervous to be tempted with that gun. I'll see. We should have found out who she works for. The woman who owns the ring is the key to the whole case. We don't even know who she is. I know who owns the ring. Who? Mrs. W. W. Stewart. Says so on the inscription. What inscription? What are you talking about? The ring that was in the milk bottle. You mean you've seen that ring? Seen it. I've got it. I found it while you was out gallivanting with my horse. It's right here in my pocket. Homicide, Sergeant Mullins speaking. Mullins, this is Mrs. 
Mrs. North. Oh, so early in the morning, Mrs. North? Don't tell me you're going to start finding corpses at the break of day. Well, we found this one, Mullins. There may be more later. You mean there's one already? A bona fide murder? As far as we're concerned, it is. But we'll leave it to you to make it official. Well, I'd better get right up there. Uh, that's why I'm calling you, Mullins. Jerry and I are going to take the diamond ring over to Miss Stewart's place. But you'll find the body on Hewlett Street, about six feet from Mrs. Breeden's milk bottle. What? Oh, you can't miss it, Mullins. It's homogenized. And the milkman will be waiting there for you with a gray horse. We must have a bad connection. Nothing but gibberish is coming out this end. Well, it's going in clear enough. The corpse is on Hewlett Street, 722. I got you. A milkman is waiting there for you to tell you about the murder. I got you. And Jerry and I have to dash over with a ring because that maid of hers might kill somebody. I lost you. W. Stewart is certainly taking her time about answering the doorbell, Jerry. Well, it's only 8 o'clock, dear. She might still be asleep. Yes? Mrs. Stewart? Mrs. W. W. Stewart? Yes? I believe you own a diamond ring with a large stone in the center and a circle of emeralds around it. Why, who are you? What do you know about the ring? Well, we don't know very much, except that it was stolen last night. Stolen? From this apartment? Oh, don't be alarmed, Mrs. Stewart. Uh, the ring isn't missing anymore, but if you want it back, we'll all have to go to the police. No, and... no, I, I don't want any fuss about that ring. But there is a fuss. There will be if we stand here talking about it. Well, what shall we do? Make signs? No, please, go away, will you? Don't you understand? My husband is a very jealous man. I, I can't stand here any longer. I really... Who is it, dear? Oh, um... Just some people from, uh, from down the hall, Ed. Please, will you go away and come back some other time? Mrs. Stewart, you don't seem to realize there's been a murder. I can't help it. There'll be another one if you get my husband involved in this. But what about your maid? Goodbye. Mrs. Well, that was a cordial little reception. Another minute and she'd have served tea right in our faces. Very strange, Jerry. Didn't seem as if she were at all interested in getting her ring back. Or the murder either. Seeming isn't believing, dear. She didn't even see the scene. Well, before we go off the deep end on this, I think you'd better run down to the drugstore on the corner and phone the police again. I may need Mullen's strong right arm before I'm through here. Well, what are you going to do? Find out a little more about this ring. Alone? I won't be alone long, Pam, if you hurry that call. A squad car can be here in three minutes. Oh, all right, Jerry. I'll be right back. Thank you, dear. And don't keep telling me I can trust you because I can't. You lie like a trooper. I don't. Don't argue with me. I've got to get to work. Oh, uh, oh uh, excuse me. Yeah? Uh, what are you doing here? What do you want? Why, uh, nothing. I was just... Don't uh, hand me that. You were just about to ring the bell. You're one of our friends, aren't you? No. As soon as I tell her I'm going to Chicago, they start coming early in the morning. Now, wait a minute. I was here just a moment ago. I rang the bell. Then she was lying to me. She said it was somebody from down the hall. Hey, hey, let go of my coat. I'll make an example of you, mister. Nope. Come on. Come on, get up. So you can knock me down again? No, thank you. Get up, I said, or I'll grind you into the floor. No, no, well, wait, wait. Now, look, I, I don't even know your wife. I just came here to help her get a ring back. What ring? The big diamond one that was stolen last night. I've got it right here. Don't you lie to me. That ring is at the jeweler's. She told me she left it there to have it fixed. Well, I don't know what she told you, Mr. Stewart, but... Hey, 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 that's my throat you're squeezing. Come on, we're going to find out about that ring right now. now. Wait a second, will you? My wife's downstairs in the phone booth. I don't care where your wife is. You're coming with me. Operator, get me police headquarters right away. Yes, ma'am. Police headquarters. Put that phone down. Huh? Oh, it's you. Oh, dear. It's you. Put that phone down. Uh, of course. Now, hand over the ring. What ring? Don't play dumb. I saw the milkman give it to you. I've been following you ever since. Well, you haven't followed very closely. My husband's got it. Get it back. But uh, I can't. He's upstairs in the apartment on Tilden Street, and you're holding me here on Monroe Street. What are you and, talking about? Well, it ought to be plain enough. You're holding me here on Monroe Street, and my Wait husband... a minute. There goes your husband now, with Mr. Stewart. Where? 
Can't you see through the window? They're crossing the street. Well, uh, don't you want to find out where they're going? You bet I do. Come on. Until I get that ring, I'm not going to let either of you out of my sight. Well, I I wish you'd tell me why you're dragging me to a jewelry store, Mr. Stewart. I've I've got the ring in my pocket. Be quiet. The store's right here. It isn't open yet. Now, wait, wait. There's something awfully fishy about this ring business. And I've got a hunch my wife is behind it. Why? Because she doesn't ever tell the truth until I dig it out of her. Only this time I'm going to dig it out of the jeweler. Hey, say, what was that? Sounded like a shot to me. There's another one. Where are they coming from? I haven't got the faintest idea. Quick, get down. That one was too close for comfort. What the heck is going on here? Don't you know, Mr. Stewart? Somebody's trying to kill us. <laughs> It looks like Jerry is going to be kept very busy for a while. I'd like you to try something tomorrow morning or evening. In return, I promise you a small miracle, and that's not a wild promise. I ask you to brush your teeth with the all-purpose tooth powder, Colgate tooth powder. Just that, and here's the reward I promise you. You'll find that brushing your teeth becomes a really pleasant experience... You actually enjoy the rich, active foam of Colgate tooth powder, and you'll certainly like what it does for you. Not only does it get your teeth sparkling clean, looking their brightest, but at the same moment, it cleans and sweetens your breath, too. Indeed it does. That's proved. Colgate tooth powder with its active foam instantly stops unpleasing breath, originating in the mouth, in seven out of ten cases. Look, you can still get all-purpose Colgate tooth powder tonight and try it in the morning. But at any rate, try it as soon as you can. The sooner the better, for you will learn that Colgate tooth powder sweetens your breath while it cleans your teeth. Those shots are coming from across the street. Get back in the doorway, Mr. Stewart. You're too big a target. If you are the target, it's me, all right. My wife's firing those shots. See her over there? She's coming this way. You better beat it before she gets the range. Where can I go? She's got us cornered in this doorway. Well, I'll stand in front of you, but the way she looks, I think she'd shoot through me. Come on out of there, Ed. Now, wait a minute, honey. You don't want to kill me. Keep talking. This police car coming up. I know we had our little spats, but... Stop shaking, you big bluff. If I hadn't been afraid of you, this would never have happened. But I don't want you Not to... That's a good lead, oh. Officer. Oh. Mullins. That's all right, Mr. North. I've got hold of her now. You got here just in time, Officer. She was going to kill me. Don't be a fool. I was just trying to frighten you away from the store. I didn't want you to speak to the jeweler before I did. Why not? Because I lied to you about that ring, Ed. It wasn't being repaired. I pawned it about a month ago, and I didn't want you to know about it. So I had a duplicate made. And that's the one I've got? The one that was stolen? Yes, Mr. North. The stones aren't real. Well, I don't know what you two are talking about, but you're all coming down to headquarters for questioning. I've got a murder to solve. Well, it's a lucky thing you found us, Mullins. How'd you know we were here? Well, didn't your missus get a message through the headquarters? Oh, she pulled a fast one, Mr. North. They believe she was hanging on the phone and left it open all the time. What? That's how we knew that the other girl was holding her. What other girl? What are you talking about, Mullins? Where's Pam now? I don't know, Mr. North, don't you? No. What's that? Oh, there she is across the street. Quick, Mullins. That other girl will kill her. It's all right, Jerry. I've got the gun now. Pam, what happened? You're not hurt. Now, don't get excited, dear. We just had a little argument over the revolver, and I won. Watch her, Mullins. Here, I got her. I didn't kill him. I, I didn't kill him, I tell you. Oh, but you did. You admitted he was running out on you when you called him a skunk. You had every reason to kill him, and you proved it. By refusing to give yourself up to the police when we told you to. Oh, no, that wasn't it. I was afraid they blame me for stealing the ring. Oh, but you didn't have the ring, so you couldn't have stolen it. You see? The only thing you had to hide from the police was murder. <laughs> Awfully nice of you to take us home, driver. You sure you don't mind? Oh, it's a pleasure, Mrs. North. 
I wish I could take you home every morning without a murder, of course. Oh, aren't you sweet? You, you really mean that? Sure do. Why, if I could make my milk route with you, I'd leave an extra bottle of heavy cream at every doorstep. Oh, I think you're pretty swell, too. Say, what is this? A mutual admiration society? Why, Jerry North, you're not jealous, are you? I think it's fun coming home with a milkman. So do I, as long as the milkman doesn't come home with us. <laughs> Remember, every Tuesday night at the same time, the Colgate Palmolive Pete Company, makers of Halo Shampoo and Colgate Tooth Powder, bring you Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. The characters are based on those originally created by Francis and Richard Lockridge. Original music is composed and conducted by Charles Paul. The program is produced and directed by John Lufton. A soap with a fragrance that's delightful and gay Is one that is known as cashmere bouquet Like magical gardens with blue skies above So enchanting and trancing the fragrance men love It's thrilling to bathe each day with cashmere bouquet no other soap gives your skin this exciting bouquet. Next Tuesday night, Mr. and Mrs. North find a lawyer, namely to wit his follows her in, murdered, and a murdered man asking for their help. Charles Stark speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Colgate Palmolive Pete Company, makers of Halo Shampoo to glorify your hair, and Colgate Tooth Powder to get teeth sparkling and super clean, bring you Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Cross. In all respects, Pam and Jerry North's car is an excellent car with only one defect. It always picks the long way home. That's especially the trouble tonight when Pam and Jerry are coming from a weekend in the country and the car seems to have chosen the longest, darkest, and most deserted road. Pam, I'll have to take ten minutes shut-eye, darling, before we can go on. I'm getting dangerously sleepy. Well, let's do it then, Jerry. This is no place to have a smash-up. Yeah, just lie back in the seat, dear. Right. Oh, oh. I can just feel myself drifting right off to sleep, mm. can't you? Jerry. <laughs> That's right. Go to sleep right while I'm talking. For all you know, I might have had something very interesting to say. I didn't, but I might have. What? Listen. Somebody's playing a musical instrument. And way out in the country. He's good, too. Where is it coming from? I don't see any houses. I wonder if... Look, there, by the side of the road. A man playing a clarinet and coming toward us. He's seen us. Hey, come with me. Come with me huh? this way. Why, what's the matter? Just behind those trees. Come and see. Oh, what's there? A tree got in the way of my car. Oh, an accident. Anybody hurt? A girl. And the tree killed her. She's oh. dead. Please come and help me. Huh? Right away. Where's your car? Over here behind these trees. See? Holy. You really smashed up. The girl's in the seat. Help me, will you? Jerry, you look and see. Right. Say, there's no girl in your car, alive or dead. What? Well, she was here a minute ago. Uh, are you sure? Could you kill a girl and not know it? We better look around for her, haven't we? Jerry, our car's starting off. Hey, stop! Stop! That was the girl who took the car. But you said she was dead. That's right, she was dead. She isn't now. Stop! Come back! That's our car! Which way did she go? Well, that way, didn't you see? 
Jerry, here's a brand new man. What? Oh. Who are you? Where'd you pop from? I've been right here with you all the time. I didn't see you. Oh, but I... I guess it's so dark. Sure. That's why you didn't see him. It's so dark. Lady, you said the girl drove your car toward New York? Well, you were right here, too, you said. You, you must have seen the car go. Only he didn't, lady. It's so dark. Let's not argue about it. If she drove toward New York, I know exactly where she's going. Get in. Get in what? My car. It's right here. Come on. I didn't see any other car here. Of course you didn't. It's so dark. My car's been here right along. What's the matter with you anyway? Now, all of you. Get in and we'll go to town. Here we are. Made it fast, didn't we? If you ask me, we made it in no time. Oh, it's too dark here. I'm going inside where it's dark. What place is this? It's a pretty gloomy-looking house. This is where the girl came. It's where we all live. So long. So long? What about our car? And the girl who was dead, but isn't. What dead girl? What are you talking about? The girl in your car in the wreck. Oh, only she wasn't there, and then then she stole our car. Lady, you're all mixed up. Sure, it's so dark. Well, so long. Me too, so long. Wait. If you're going inside and you think the girl's in there, we're going in too. Oh, no, you're not. Murder goes on in that house, and you're not allowed. But, But the girl's got our car in there. Nothing doing. It's dark in that house, and if you go in, you'll get killed. So long. He's gone. I never saw people move so fast. Jerry, we've got to find out what happened to our car. The only way we can do that is to get into that house. darkest cellar I've ever been in. I don't think it's a cellar, dear. It's a corridor. I can touch both walls at once. Do you hear anything? No. We'll have to get upstairs. Here's the door. Can you open it? I can't find the handle. Oh, here it is. Stick right behind me, Pat. I'm so close behind you. I'm practically in front of you. Here it goes. It's heavy. There. It's a jam session. These many musicians getting together and playing just for themselves. There's the man who drove us in. He's playing the trumpet. And next to him, that clarinet player. There's no air in here. And it's hot. Jerry, there's the girl, and she's singing. Yes, her mouth's open, but the orchestra's so loud I can't hear her. Can you? No. Oh! Jerry, look at the walls. They're closing in on us. The room is getting smaller and smaller. But look behind the musicians. There's no wall at all. Only black space. We've got to get out of here. Oh, no. You can't get out now. Oh, the clarinet player. But uh, how can you be talking to us here? Your, your clarinet's still playing. My clarinet plays by itself. Huh? <laughs> I told you not to come in here, didn't I? Now you're going to die. Jerry. You're going to die by the knife in my hand. Jerry, where are you? Help me. He's gone. <laughs> Now listen to that trumpet. Listen to him climb. Okay, boys? One, two. When he hits high C, the knife goes right into you. Oh, no. Jerry! Jerry, where are you? Listen to the trumpet. G sharp. A. B flat. And look at this knife, and here comes high C. Jerry! <laughs> Pam! Pam, darling, what's the matter? I'm right here, sweetheart. Wake up. Wait, wake up. Oh, I, I was asleep. Sure. Oh, darling, what a horrible dream. It must have been. You were waving your arms oh. and kicking your legs. But you're safe in the car, and we can start driving home again. Oh. <laughs> you know, darling... It all started when I dreamed I heard a clarinet playing. And then I saw... Jerry, am I awake? We both are. And I hear it too. 
somebody's playing a clarinet somewhere near us on the road. Yes, Pam and Jerry are awake now, but it's still pretty dreamlike to hear a clarinet in the country on a dark, dark road. Hello, everybody, hello. Hello is the shampoo that glorifies your hair, so hello, everybody, hello. Use Halo shampoo if you want naturally bright and beautiful hair. Remember, even finest soaps and soap shampoos hide the natural luster of your hair with dulling soap film. But Halo contains no soap, therefore cannot leave dulling soap film. The first time you use Halo, your hair glistens in all its natural brilliance. The natural color and luster shine through like sunshine through a clean window pane. And remember, even in hardest water, Halo makes oceans of rich, fragrant lather. Halo quickly carries away loose dandruff and grease, needs no lemon or vinegar rinse, because Halo leaves no dulling soap film, nothing to hide your hair's natural beauty. Say hello to Halo and goodbye to dulling soap film. Use Halo on your children's hair, too. Get Halo shampoo at any cosmetic counter. Remember, Halo glorifies your hair. So Halo, everybody, Halo. Halo shampoo, Halo. Now, back to Mr. and Mrs. North. We've got to see what it is. I know what it is, Dolly. A clarinet being played on a dark road on a dark night. The point is, why? It's coming from behind those trees. We'll see in a minute. Now it's going away, Jerry. Yeah. Maybe drawing us after it like... Like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. I'm right. Look at that car against the tree. It's pretty badly smashed. Someone may be hurt. Maybe it's a girl. Oh, she isn't there now. What makes you say that? That's the way it was in my dream. Is there? Yes, there's a girl. But she's there? Oh, but she's not dead, is she? She's alive, Pam. Oh, somehow I knew she would be. Loopy, you've got to take me back. You've got to, Loopy, or I'll... Oh, who are you? We found you here in the wrecked car, miss. Are you badly hurt? No, I just hit my head, I guess. Here, let me help you out. Thanks. Where's Lupin? The man who was playing the clarinet. Uh, we heard him, but we haven't seen him. Good. You got a car? Could you take me back into the city with you? We'll be glad to. And you want to see a doctor? How'd the crash happen? Lupin tried to get me to run away with him, and when I caught on, he wouldn't turn back. I crashed the car on purpose. Lupin's the greatest hot clarinet in this world or out of it. Oh. I'm on a Tremont. I guess we ought to know who you are, but... but... I'm a hot singer. They call me the scat girl. I guess you don't get around. Uh, no. But uh, shouldn't we try to find Loopy? I don't want to find him. I only want to get back to the city. Hey, wait a second. Here's another car. Teddy. Teddy, darling. Morning, baby. You okay? Teddy, I'm so glad you got here. Now you can take me back into town. You bet, honey. And I want to get my hands on Loopy. Uh, Loopy doesn't seem to be around here anymore. Excuse me, folks. This is Eddie Rayburn, and a hot trumpet if there ever was one. We're Mr. and Mrs. North. Hi. And as you're in good hands, Mr. Mont, we'll be getting back to our car. Wait a minute. What? Eddie. Huh? Something's been stolen from my handbag. You know what it is? You bet. And so do you. Oh, maybe that was uh, Loopy's doing. That guy must be around here someplace. Jerry, our car's starting. Hey, wait! That's Loopy thing. Got a gun, Mr. No. Look out! How do you like that? Oh, Eddie, you know where he's going, don't you? Yeah. But how do you know I know? I wish I didn't. Won't you take us with you in your car? Okay, hop in. Okay, cats. There's your crate park just ahead. I never expected that. Jerry, we've got the car back. I hope it's all in one piece. Anyway, thanks very much for the lift, Eddie. And Mona, I hope you're okay. Hmm, I will be. So long, folks, and thanks. Oh, just a minute. I want to see that Loopy McGee and give him a piece of my mind for stealing our car. Now, look, Mrs. North, you're not going to see Loopy. I'm giving a private party. 
And you're not coming into that building with us or you'll get hurt. Permanently. Oh. Now take your car and get going. So long. Nice people. We better go, Pam. It's late and there's our car. Jerry, I, I'm remembering that awful dream. And it, it, it's all coming true. That this strange building. This is where Eddie brought us before. Oh, darling, forget it. Dreams never come true. I know, but something tells me we're not going to leave here. No? Just watch us. Get in here. I'll get in the other side. Right. Jerry. Look at this, here on the seat. Never mind, dear. Never mind. Get in. But, Jerry, it's, it's a wanted circular for an escaped convict. Hmm? Wanted Eddie Malden escaped six weeks ago from state penitentiary while serving three-year term for armed robbery. Dangerous. Former occupation, trumpet player. Look at the picture. That's Eddie. Yeah. The man who drove us into town. The man who just took the girl into that building. And this must be the thing Malden missed from a handbag. Loopy stole it from her. And they were both scared because Loopy found out he's a fugitive. That's right, Mr. North. Oh. Now I'll take it from you. Oh. Eddie, well, we, we thought you were inside. Give me that thing. Here you are. Well, so long, Eddie. Hold it. Now that you know who I am, you think I'm going to let you run off and call the police? Not a chance. Come on inside. Oh, dear. What are you going to do with us? Keep you locked up in the cellar while I finish some unfinished business? <laughs> in my dream. I wonder where that door is. Oh, I remember now. We just turned a corner, and there... Wait a minute. Oh! Don't move. Who's that? I don't know. Just a man I bumped into in the dark. Won't be dark long. There's a light right here. There. Oh, there's two of you characters. Just what do you got in mind sneaking around here? Talk fast or you'll get in trouble. Let's begin by finding out who you are. Flash Farrell, Mona Tremont's manager and future husband. And there's a private jam session going on and you haven't been invited. Now you take a course. Jam session? Then there is a jam session. Yeah. What do you want with it? We've got to get in there to prevent... Damn! A... Uh, oh, uh, uh, Mr. Farrell, I-, I want you to hear me sing. You sing, do you? Oh, haven't you heard of me? I'm Pam, uh, Choo Choo North. Choo Choo. That's my style. Okay, Choo Choo. And who's this guy? Look, Mr. Farrell. Uh, I... That's my husband, uh, 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 Hot Lips North. Uh, Do you ever hear him play on the zither? Zither? Who can play hot on a zither? Oh, you've never heard Hot Lips. Has he Hot Lips? Uh, no, he never has. It all sounds fishy to me. Okay, then. Just show us where the jam session is. Okay, Choo Choo. And the first thing we'll do is to hear you sing. And you better be good. Bongo, 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 I don't want to leave the conga, so I think I'll stay where I am. Choo Choo! Okay, Choo Choo, you're not so bad. She's okay, isn't she, boy? Not bad. Not oh, I'm bad. so glad you liked it, Mr. Farrell. Oh, Jerry, the way it was before, Loopy had a knife. See if he has one now. All right, I'll be right back. Hey, North. Yeah? Who let you out, Farrell? No, oh, no. We let ourselves out and met him in the corridor. Now, look, North. Anybody that crosses me up gets it. Including Flash Farrell. I'll kill anybody that gets between me and Mona. Farrell's in love with her, too, isn't he? Look at her, boy. Wouldn't you be? I've got a very charming wife, thank you. Say, hot lips. Hot lips. Oh, oh. Yes, Farrell? Sorry, we haven't got a zipper for you. Oh, that's all right, Farrell. Oh, uh, how did you think I was, uh, hot lips? Just great. Uh, Choo-choo. Eddie, how about giving us the number? Oh, sure, Luby, but I'll have to make it the last for tonight. Okay, Eddie, but come on. Come and Flash. Yeah, sure. I'll see you later, Choo-choo. Come on, Jerry, it's more and more like my dream. You've got to stop Eddie from playing. Okay, I'll try. Hiya, folks. Say, I didn't know you two were happy. Hey, 
to what? To the rhythm. I didn't know you had the power. Now, look, ah. Mona, I've got to get over to the bandstand. No, you don't. There's a gun in this handbag of mine. Make like he's just chatting so nobody gets leery. What's the matter? I saw Eddie talking to you. What'd he tell you? He said he'd kill anybody that came between you and him. That means Loopy, because he knows about Eddie. Does Farrell know about Eddie, too? No, he doesn't. What are you two going to do? We don't know. I'll tell you what to do. Nothing. Just you two keep your trap shut or you'll have bad trouble with me. We can't let him commit murder. No. Hey, folks, shut up, will you? Eddie's going to rip out with a little lip. I'll set Eddie. Take it high. It's oh. going right out the roof. Okay? One, two. Jerry. Yes, darling. The dream, the dream. What? The trumpet was playing and Loopy started to come at me with a knife. The trumpet went higher and higher like he's doing now. Ham, you're imagining things. Nothing can happen now that he's playing. A flat. A. B flat. He's getting closer. Jerry, do something. <laughs> I told you, Jerry. What's the matter with him? Here, let me see. Jerry, is he... Yes. Eddie Malden is dead. It's a bad spot for Pam and Jerry, for they know the murderer is right in that cellar room with them. Last word on cleaning teeth is your dentist. Yes, the last word on cleaning teeth is your dentist. And over 4,000 dentists in a nationwide survey said Colgate tooth powder with the two-minute routine gets teeth sparkling and super clean. Yes, dentists say Colgate tooth powder with the two-minute routine gets teeth sparkling and super clean. So to get your teeth sparkling and super clean, to show their full natural sparkle, start today with Colgate tooth powder and this two-minute routine. One... Brush your teeth night and morning for two minutes with Colgate tooth powder. Two. Be sure to brush all three surfaces of your teeth, the biting edge, the inside, and the outside. Three. And always stroke your brush away from the gums. Remember, dentists nationwide approve Colgate tooth powder with the two-minute routine. Remember, too, Colgate tooth powder also freshens and sweetens your breath. The last word on cleaning teeth is your dentist. And dentists say Colgate tooth powder with the two-minute routine gets teeth sparkling and super clean. Looks like he's been poisoned. Eddie, my Eddie. Okay, which one of you did it? I've got a gun in this bag that's ready for him. Mona, wait. You'll only get yourself in trouble. Listen to what the guy says, Mona. Unless you don't care if you shoot, Mona. I care, all right. I want to get the guy that did it. Mona, you're awful sure it was one of us. That's what I was thinking, Mr. Farrell. Mona, you were certainly anxious before to keep us away from Eddie. You're onto it, Pam. How about it, Mona? If anybody tries to hang Eddie's murder on me, they'll go right along with him. I loved him. Mona, don't point that gimmick at me. Listen to reason, Mona. I'm listening. Somebody talk. Pam, I've got an idea. No tricks now, Mr. North. What is it, Jerry? Eddie told me he was going to kill Loopy because Loopy knew he was a convict. And we all know Loopy was in love with Mona. You mean I kill him? You're off beat, mister. Not much. You killed him to get a free hand with Mona. Okay, Loopy. This looks like the last chorus for you. Jerry, wait. That doesn't make sense. Now you're in the groove, Mrs. North. Oh, but it does make sense. Good sense. Sure, Loopy killed him. He hated Eddie. Don't you move, Farrell. Don't any of you forget this gun. I'm not forgetting it. But you listen, Mona. You yourself told us that Farrell didn't know that Eddie was an escaped convict. That's right. What are you getting at, Pam? Well, Loopy didn't have to murder Eddie to get him out of the way. He knew Eddie was an escaped convict, and so all he had to do was report him to the police. But Flash... You didn't know that. And so to get Mona away from him, you thought you had to kill him. That's a lie. Farrell, you're going after Eddie. Don't shoot, Mona. Grab him, Louis. I got him. Me too. Nice going, Mrs. North. You sure got the power. Oh, just call me Choo Choo. Oh, Jerry, what a night. Mm. Now it's almost dawn. We'll be home in a moment, darling. And then some sleep. I could go to sleep right now. (sighs) 
Jerry, listen. <laughs> it's that clarinet again. Where is it coming from? Am I dreaming? And so once away? again, the Early Risers Club greets you with music to put you in tune for the day. Oh, a disc jockey on the car radio. And we start as usual with our theme, a recording by Loopy McGee and his clarinet. Want to hear it, dear? I do not. Take me home and let me sleep and never dream again. Tuesday night at the same time, the Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, makers of Halo Shampoo and Colgate Tooth Powder, brings you Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. The characters are based on those originally created by Francis and Richard Lockridge. Original music is composed and conducted by Charles Paul. The program is produced and directed by John Lufton. There's a fragrance that men love, so delightful and gay. Caressing the skin you bathe with cashmere bouquet. You're enchanting and trancing with a subtle perfume that whispers of romance in a candlelit room. And it's thrilling to bathe each day with cashmere bouquet. No other soap gives you skin. This exciting bouquet. Be sure you join us again next Tuesday when the North's a pigeon holed by a pigeon, chased by a pair of lovebirds on the wing, and caught by a murderer who has flown the coop. This is Charles Stark speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Portions of the following are transcribed. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Yeah. Down, up, round, and down. Mr. Diamond, I presume? Yes, and maybe no. Down, up, round, and round. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand you. Uh, yes, I'm Diamond, and you're not presuming on me, not if you're a client. Well, no, that's not what I mean. What is that object you're playing with? Uh, this? This is a yo-yo. You make it go down, up, round, and down. See? Uh, yes, yes. But, but I came in on business, Mr. Diamond. I want to hire you. Just drop it like this. Down, up. As a detective. Oh. Well, a hundred a day in expenses, and I throw in the yo-yo lessons free. Give me the Mr. Diamond. Are you in business? Do you have the hundred a day? I do. I am. That's fine. Your name? Oh, I, I can't tell you that. Goodbye. <laughs> Will you kindly put that thing away? I have a terrible head. Oh, I don't know. It's not so bad. Carve it yourself. Why, you insufferable... Now, wait a minute. Until we've had a formal introduction, the word insufferable is your ticket for a new set of dentures. Now, why don't we get formal and save your gums that lonely feeling? I told you my name is not important. That I believe, but let's kick it around anyway. Is that necessary? Look, look, you said you wanted to hire me. So either tell me your name or what you wanted me to do, or let me get back to my practicing. Uh, I, I should find another detective, but you came highly recommended, so... All right. Uh, you can call me, uh, Johns. Other wife? What? Forget it. The initials on your briefcase read J.B. Oh, oh, that, uh, it's one I borrowed. So, now that I've conquered your coyness, what's the Pitch? Pitch? Oh, oh, you mean my assignment. Oh, it's very simple, but first, I must insist that no word of this conversation leaves your office. So far, no one would believe it anyhow. But my ethics are in good order, Mr. Johns. Good, good. This must be kept very secret. Shall I pull down the blinds and stuff the keyhole? Oh, that shan't be necessary, thank you. Your secret is... Uh, murder, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I just knew you were going to say that. Where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse? Oh, that's what I came to you for. I want to have professional advice on every angle before I kill. Now, you've had police experience. Uh, I... unless my hearing aid's on the blink, you're saying you want to commit a murder. Oh, not want. I'm going to. This evening. Oh. What do you want me for? The victim? Oh, I have the victim. 
the opportunity, method, uh, and the man to handle the uh, details. However, I want to be sure that I'm not tripped up by my lack of foresight to police procedures. Uh, sure, 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 yeah. Uh, whom are you calling? The police, but you'll probably get sent to Bellevue. Mr. Diamond, your ethics. Ethics about concealing or helping a murder are free passage to Sing Sing. The phone, put it down quickly. Oh, my. Isn't that shiny, a real gun? Those things are illegal, you know. Must you shake it so much? Uh, oh, sorry, I, I'm a little nervous. Oh, Swell, you're nervous. Hey, quiet, quiet, I'm thinking. This visit has obviously been an error, but perhaps not a fatal one. Let's see. I have it. Into the closet. What? With my bicycle? It'll be too crowded. Your bicycle? Or my exercise bicycle. And that's my, there's my rowing board and oh, my, my weight. Oh, be quiet. Stop walking. Oh, this is ridiculous. Now open that door. Oh, okay. Uh, now that bicycle. It has a seat? Well, yes. Sit on it. So the Diamond Detective Agency sat in the stuffy closet listening to the sound of the desk being pulled over and jammed against the door. Not having anything better to do except call myself names, I rode. On my fifth lap around the world, I gave birth to a brainchild and began applying the art of leverage against the blockaded door using both legs and the flat of my back. Result? A charley horse. On the third lap following, I came up with something more substantial. A heavy barbell. Four smashes and three torn ligaments later, the thin door collapsed over the desk blocking it. I picked my way over the debris, trying to focus my eyes to the light. By instinct, more than sight, I found the phone. But as I reached to pick it up, I suddenly realized I was shaking hands with someone. Back up, Diamond. Oh, this is getting ridiculous. All my clients waving guns at me. I'm no client, Diamond. Mr. Johns wants I should keep your company for a while. Oh, well, you're a small one. This gun makes me a big one, Diamond. Real big. That's why my nickname is Big Man, even though I'm only four feet tall. Oh, well, maybe I could help you. I've got a lot of exercise things. Be funny or shut up. How about a few yo-yo lessons? <laughs> Say, it's very funny. Shut up. Big man, what would happen if I took that gun away from you? You want to try? Uh, I was giving it a thought. But on second thought, uh, no. Yeah, smart Shamus. I can empty this magazine in your stomach before you make two steps. It... Rick, I... Oh, I didn't know you had a client. Take it easy, Diamond. I got a gun in my pocket. Uh, the, uh, H Helen. Helen, baby, come in. Uh, uh, meet big man McCarthy, an old, old pal from PS69. Big man, this is uh, Miss Asher. Oh, yes, delighted, Mr. McCarthy. Hey, same here, chick. Say, pal, you got good taste. Some built. Oh, <laughs> such a flatterer. Rick, what happened to your closet? Uh, the termites broke my non-aggression pact. Uh, what's on your mind, baby? Well, I came to see if you were ready for the benefit tonight. You are, aren't you? Oh, well, am I? Just watch this new yo-yo trick. They call it round the world. Oh, wonderful. Oh, Rick, you know so many things. Where'd you learn that? A PA-69, of course. Where else? Mr. McCarthy. Do it again, Rick. I want to see how you do it. Sure, baby. Just watch. You take it in your hand like this and throw it out like this. <laughs> oh, Rick. Rick, you struck that poor little man. No. Well, that poor little man had a big nasty gun in his pocket and it was pointed right at my breakfast. Why, that horrible little... Why didn't you hit him harder? He might have hurt you. Oh, darling, are you sure you're all right? I'm sure, baby. Well, you send for the police. He should be behind... Now, look, Helen, this is my department. You'll go along with your errands. Rick, he's dangerous. Helen, will you go away? I have a few questions I want to ask this little hood, and you'll be of no help, believe me. Well, all right, but you be careful. Oh, and uh, about tonight. It's not at my apartment, but the park is penthouse up above in the same building. Now, come early and help Francis and me get things ready. Stop pushing. I'll see you tonight, baby. Oh, Rick. Are you sure I can't stay? Go, scat. Now, for you, Mr. Big Man. Come here. Wake up. Wake up. The mule train went that way. Come on, come out of it. Ah, uh, That's uh, you, huh? Yeah, me. Now, what's the real name of your boss? Who's he going to kill? You can stop the questions, Diamond. I'm not going to talk. You want me to wring it out of you like a wet wash? Who is Mr. Johns? You know, there's a big advantage in being little, Diamond. Yeah, you can hide under smaller rocks. <laughs> Who's your boss? There's another advantage, too. A man my size can be awfully hard to catch. What? Hey, come back here. The 
your helmet. <laughs> he never looked so good. Shut up, Otis. He's really been worked over. Wonder what gang did this to him. Rick. Rick, snap out of it. Oh, oh. Rick, what happened? Oh, it just came through the door. Oh, what? Coming through the door couldn't wreck you like that. Oh, without opening it? You mean... Oh, no. You got that shiner by running into the door? <laughs> Shut up, Otis. Okay, Rick, where's the body? Uh, beside you. Now, that's Otis. I mean, where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse isn't a corpse yet. Otis, get my bicarbonate. Hey, Yellowtooth. Go on, Rick. The corpse isn't a corpse. Tell me, what is it? A ghost? Exactly. Otis? He hey, Yellowtooth. Mm. Now, Rick, do me a favor. Please tell me what you're talking about. Oh, you aren't trying, Walt. All I said was that the corpse isn't a corpse yet and that it's a ghost because I don't know who's going to be the corpse. Rick, before I go stark raving mad, will you tell me what you're talking about? Well, a man came into my office this morning, said he was going to commit a murder. Threw a gun on me when I started to call you. Locked me in a closet. I broke out only to find he left this little man, big man, the midget who just ran out of here. Stop, please. So Helen came in. I turned the tables on big man. She left. I asked questions, drew a blank. Big man started to run. Why didn't you nab him? He ran through the door. I ran into it. You're up to date. <laughs> I'm up to date. Get him. I'm up to my ears in confusion. So we've got a man who's going to murder someone. All right, what's his name? He said Johns, but it's a phony. Initials on his briefcase read J.B. Uh, say, Shamus, what do you look like? Uh, Otis, do you have a son? Oh, you know I don't. Well, that's what he looked like. Rick, are you sure this J.B. is planning to kill someone tonight? Well, if he isn't, he sure took a lot of pains for nothing. Let's get down to headquarters. I want to check the files. Well, okay, but we don't keep files on ghosts. Oh, by the way, why did you come up here? Helen called. Said you were holding a pigeon for us. Oh, lovely girl. I'll say... Can I have a dance with her at the benefit tonight? Uh, no, Otis. I think I'd better fix you up with Francis. Swell. Otis, you gravelhead. Francis is a butler. Oh, it's all right, Lieutenant. I like them foreign dames. Well, that's all the pictures, Walt. I've looked them all. Johns doesn't have a record, neither does a big man. Yeah, they wouldn't. The one time we get a chance to stop a murder before it's committed, and we've even got a good description of the potential killer. Well, this, this J.B. was no bum. Not even an ordinary working man. His clothes are expensive, and the briefcase he carried probably cost more than your weekly salary. Now, it's an even bet he belongs to the social upper crust. That or close to it. Well, that would narrow the field a lot, but still... How I... about the newspapers, Walt? They have society reporters who know anyone who is anyone. It's a long shot, but name, name me a better. You can go through the newspaper logs. They might have a picture of Oh, some... no, no, Walt, no pictures. I'm nearly blind from looking at pictures now. Thanks, but I'll try the reporters with a description. You sounds like you're going to search for a needle in a haystack. Oh, Otis, please, your cliché is showing. Ah, uh, that's screwy. You can't kid me. Only dames wear clichés. How could mine be showing? Sergeant, when you die, will your brain to a clinic? Maybe they'll discover a cure for it. Ah, oh, lay off. Besides, I got a good idea for your investigation. I wouldn't miss hearing this for my next two issues of Batman. Yeah, I was thinking you could maybe save a lot of time if you got an artist to draw a picture from your description. They do it in all the movies and catch crooks easy. Otis, how would you like a transfer hey, to Walt. Staten? Wait a minute, wait a minute. He may have an idea. I know where there's an artist who could sketch J.B. from a description. It's crazy, but you may as well try it, Rick. Otis, you can drive him there. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, tell him yes, Walt. I can't stand to see him cry. All right, Otis. You can use the siren. <laughs> It's right at the head of the stairs. Uh, who is this guy? Her uh, name's Vladimir, and be careful. He's temperamental. Oh, that's okay. I've been vaccinated. What, what, what? Open up, Vladimir. Runga go away. My name's Patrick O'Brien. It's Diamond, not the landlord. Comrade, come in. Stalin. No, Vladimir, that's Sergeant Otis. Oh, what a startle he gave me. Uh, Vladimir, can you sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch... Did I not once sketch the whole Russian army and with one pencil? Okay, Vladimir, but can you do it? Comrade, you doubt it? 
I am the greatest artist that's impossible. I can draw... Uh, Comrade, you are paying cash money. Cash money? Oh, for that I can draw you Siberia and never miss a salt mine. I'm such a genius, I can't stand myself. Another man, Vladimir. Can you sketch the man's face? I think so. Okay, but make it fast. I'll give you the general idea and correct you as you go. Corrections you can make. One criticism, I go back to my chef cream signs. Come with me to my hizzle. <laughs> Almost, Vladimir, but the nose still isn't quite right. Make it look a little more like a pickle. Sweet? Dill. Off that side, just a pinch. Oh. Like this? Yeah. Yeah, you've done it. That's him. Ah, how much do I owe you? For you, comrade, hundred dollars. What? Fifty dollars. A buck. S sell my genius for a buck? I die first. A buck and a quarter. Comrade, please, I'm capitalist now. A buck and a half. Last price. I wouldn't get... Last, pr last price, I take it. But I may die. If you do, give me a call. It's a good job, Vladimir. Of course. Was I not the artist to sketch the Tsar himself? Of course, it didn't pay so well, but it was great honor. Looks pretty fuzzy to me. Comrade Diamond, your patronage I appreciate. But if you must bring along this peasant, don't. Even his face makes me sick with the repulse. Uh, Otis, come on. You'll have to pardon him, Vladimir. Whenever his shoelaces come untied, his brain slip out. See you later. Oh, Chichornia, comrade. When we left Vladimir, I sent Otis back to Walt and took off for the newspapers. I showed the sketch to one society reporter after another and watched so many heads shake, my eyes began to cross. It was 6.30 when I finished playing Quizmaster, and there was no use kidding myself. I had struck out. I had to tell Walt, so I started for the 5th Precinct. I was at a point where I'd have hocked my Social Security for 30 seconds with a little big man. Then as I walked down the street, I suddenly felt the nerves in my spine jump down into the pit of my stomach, and goose pimples skidded up my back like scared rice. It was a feeling I'd had before. So without turning, I headed for the steps of a basement apartment. <laughs> Well, I got my meeting with Big Man all right. It came within inches of being a vamp into a Gabriel solo. Big Man apparently thought his shots hit pay dirt. But when I peeked over the top of the stairs, he was in his car and going. I took in the torn knees of my pants, sent a few messages to the spirit world that would have barred me from any seance, and hauled what was left of the Diamond Detective Agency to see Walt Levinson. Well, you can have it, Walt. This is getting ridiculous. Beating my brains out, getting shot at, and for what? Shot at? That's right. I said shot at. You can have the whole stupid mess. I like to get fees for playing post office with slugs. And if a guy gets killed, call me. I'll help with the embalming. But, but... Oh, but nothing. It's 7 o'clock, and I'm not sticking around to split a three-way crying job over a killing that may already have happened. I'm going to Helen's and get a drink. Oh, all right. Go ahead, Rick. There's nothing more you can do anyhow. I'll see you later. All right. And you stop looking like a panda with a bellyache, Otis. No, what did I do? Oh, shut up. Uh, hey, where you going? I'm going out and punch the first little guy I can find right in the nose, just on general principles. I left the precinct and headed for Helen's party. I remembered that the benefit was being held in the penthouse and went on up. I was surprised to find Helen's butler, Francis, opening the door. Good evening, Mr. Depp. Oh, my, did you have an accident? This day has been an accident, Francis. But if you mean my clothes, I was playing spin the bottle with a bulldozer. You do look a little battered, if I may say so, sir. You ought to see the bulldozer. What are you doing opening the door up here? Oh, the parker's butt that was taken ill, sir. As I was helping Miss Asher with the decorations anyway, I remain to take his place for this evening. Is she here? Yeah, yeah, she's in the living room, sir. Thanks, I'll go on in. Here. Hello, baby. What? Hit you a bus? Just a door and a sidewalk. The bus I get later. Oh, Rick. And just look at your suit. It's ruined. Now, uh, what's with the concern over my suit? You lobbying for my tailor? I wanted you to look your very best tonight. Here, let me see those knees. Come on, sit over here. That's it. Now... Oh, well, they're not as bad as I thought. Oh, cheer up. Maybe they'll get infected. That'll help. 
Who did this to you, Rick? Our sweet little friend of this morning, Big Man, or I should say his boss, J.B. He's the one who sent Big Man after me. J.B.? A specter sent to haunt me for my past sins. He hired the little killer. You saw me sock with my yo-yo. Your yo-yo? Oh, you haven't lost your yo-yo, have you? Oh, Helen, baby, your Ricky's nearly been killed. Must you worry about my yo-yo? I'm sorry, but it is all right. In my pocket, here. See? Good as new. Oh, that's fine. Now, what about this J.B. person? Why did he send Big Man to kill you, Rick? Because I know he's going to commit a murder tonight. Maybe doing it right now. Wait a minute. You said Big Man. Did you let him go this morning? Uh, yeah, yeah, I let him go. And I've worn my feet off up to my eyebrows trying to find out who his boss is and who's on the spot to get knocked off. Oh, poor Ricky. I wish I could help you. It's not me that needs help now. I quit. It's the guy J.B. is after. J.B., uh, are those his real initials? Yeah. No, we've had lots of things to go on. Initials, descriptions, even a sketch of him. Here, I've got it in my pocket for all the good it did. No, wait, don't tear it up. Let me look at it. Oh, Rick, silly. This is no murderer. That's a sketch of Johnny Blackwell. It's a... Helen, you know who this man is? Of course. It's Johnny Blackwell from Newport. He and his wife are up here visiting Adam Worcester. Rick, what is it? You're... You're all turning blue. All day long, I... When you were in my office, you could... Oh, if I'd only asked... Helen. Yes, Rick? Get me some cyanide. No water. Oh, but you must be mistaken about the sketch. Johnny Blackwell can't be a murderer. Well, I'm getting out of here. Where can I find him? If you'll just sit still, he'll come to you. Adam Wister's bringing him and his wife to the benefit tonight. Well, that's the way the screwy world works sometimes. One minute you're on your uppers. With a stick of bologna, you're trying to hold off three guys with swords... And Kismet makes a switch and tags your side for a gain and you're living. I called Walt to pass on the good news, and in eight and a half minutes by the clock, he joined me with Sergeant Otis in the kitchen from where we could peek out at the growing crowd. Let me take a look, Rick. Has Blackwell come in yet? Uh, stay back. I'll let you know. Otis, get out of that ice box. Oh, I'm hungry. You heard me. Oh, there's fried chicken, Lieutenant. Fried chicken? Mm, I haven't had... Otis. Oh. Walt, Walt, come take a look. There's Blackwell. Where? Over there, just sitting down. The man with the sandy hair. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Who are those people with him? Well, the woman must be his wife. Oh, but get a load of the little weasel. That's Big Man, the guy who got away from me this morning. Oh, and the other man? Must be Adam Wister. Helen said he was bringing the Blackwells. Well, he did. So now we wait for the play. Well, we waited and watched the Black Bull party settle down to enjoy itself. Big man acted like he hadn't eaten for a week and made hors d'oeuvres vanish in his mouth like marbles down a manhole. After what seemed like weeks, the situation grew, suddenly took shape. On Blackwell's urging, Big Man rose to dance with Mrs. Blackwell. Mrs. Blackwell was a dark-haired honey with curves right out of one of my better dreams. But my mind was on her husband and Worcester. As soon as they had the chance, they got up and headed out of the room. Watch them, Rick. They're headed for the library. Come on, this way. Through this door and down the hall. Well, Adam, it's nice to be visiting you again. So glad to have you, Johnny. We're sorry to hear about your losses in the market last year. The story here was that you were cleaned out. Hey, Diamond, what's he saying? Shut up, old Oh, I still have a little money, Adam. In fact, I'd like to buy back in with you as a partner. You don't have that much, Johnny. And your wife won't give it to you. She may, Adam. She may, and quicker than you think. Walt, come on. We picked no, the wrong victim. Let's find the big man. Hey, it's nice on the terrace, Mrs. Blackwell. Yeah, real nice out here. I don't like it. It's chilly. Oh, it'll warm up, Mrs. Blackwell. No, I'm going back in. Better not. I don't like the way you're acting, big man. Get out of my way. Get back and shut up. How dare you talk to me like that, you little... Now I'm big, Mrs. Blackwell. Real big. <gasps> A gun? What in the world? I'm gonna kill you. Kill me? Yeah. Only it'll look like an accident. 
Why, this is ridiculous. What kind of a joke is this? <laughs> it's no joke, Mrs. Blackwell. Your husband don't think it's no joke. He wanted me to tell you he was real sorry. Now I'm going to kill you. You mean it. You really mean it. Yeah, sure, Mrs. Blackwell. Mr. Blackwell needs your dough. Bad. Back up. He can have it, all of it. Only don't kill me. Don't. Sorry, Mrs. Blackwell, too no. late. Now start back. Please, please. Over to that wall. You're going to play Humpty Dumpty. Oh. That's right. Now get up on the wall. No, no. I'm a guy who's willing to help you. Me, too. Simon, why you? Captain the girl, Walt. Big man's mine. He was going to kill me. All right, Mrs. Blackwell. Take her inside, Otis. Rick, you okay? Yeah, getting my hands on this little rat was better than a year's vacation. Well, we sure heard enough to give both him and Blackwell a long vacation on the state. Keep him on ice. I'll collect the other one. I'll be delighted. Uh, oh, my joy. Oh, waking up? Uh, what a shame. <laughs> what a lovely party. I do love these informal get-togethers, don't you, big man? Uh, oh. <laughs> It was short but very sweet, the wind-up of the no-one-was-murdered case. The score was the kind to make you forget you didn't get a fee. Two killers caught, no victims. When I saw Walt take the little big man, not so big without his gun, and his boss Blackwell off to the Bastille, my worries melted like a snowman in a blast furnace. And speaking of melting, the lovely Mrs. Blackwell showed signs of being upset. So, what could I do but console the pretty little thing? Oh, Mr. Diamond, I think you were so wonderful and brave. Oh, you show a few nice points yourself, Mrs. Blackwell, and call me Rick. You saved my life, Rick. And call me Rita. You can get to the point quick. Why, Rita? Oh, there you are, Mrs. Blackwell. I know you must be terribly upset. Oh, Rick has been a great comfort to me. I bet he has. But I've arranged for Francis to take you home. Uh, now. Now? Oh, well, thank you, Miss Asher. And Rick. Yes? Don't worry about the name calling. Just say, hey, you. I'll know what you mean. I think I know what you mean. By you. Well? So help me, I'm innocent. With lipstick on your collar? That orders. I've warned him to be careful with my shirts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, time for my yo-yo act? Your act. I... Oh, Rick, uh, about that... No, no, no. Look, I've worked my finger to the bone practicing. Don't tell me. Why, well, you specifically asked me to be here tonight. I... I know. And come on with me over to the bandstand. Oh, no. No, you don't. I'm an artist tonight, not a singer. No sing, no yo-yo. You mean if I sing, I can do my yo-yo act? If you make it pretty. Uh, it's blackmail, but I'll do it. Well, you stay right here. I want to talk to the orchestra leader. Okay, I'll practice. <laughs> I give you Richard Diamond, his piano, and his yo-yo. Sing good, Rick. Like a robin with a sponsor. Are the stars out tonight? I don't know if it's cloudy or bright. Cause I only have eyes for you, dear. The moon may be high. But I can't see a thing in the sky Cause I only have eyes For you I don't know if we're in a garden Or on a crowded avenue You are here So am I Maybe millions of people go by But they all disappear from view And I only have eyes for you Present an exhibition of dexterity. Now? Now. Oh, no, Shamus, no. You're doing it all wrong. You gotta use more wrist action. Oh, the start of the act. Oh, come on, let me show you. Here, give it to me. Now, you, you start it down, like this. 
Helen. Yes, Rick, he's better. Uh, let's go home and Nick. Wait till I get my hat. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Hans Conried, Grace Albertson, Sidney Miller, and High Everback. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions of the program were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (laughs) Now this is Tal Avery inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned for NBC's star lineup of shows. There's always a program of interest on NBC. Now stay tuned for Edward G. Robinson and the Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Time now for Rocky Jordan. I'm always suspicious of a man, even in Cairo, who wants to play hide-and-seek. Especially when he's a total stranger. Well, this fellow in a felt hat and tweeds had been shadowing me for too long. So finally, around 10 o'clock, I left the cafe tambourine, figuring that before the night was over, my shadow and I would be properly introduced. But before it was over, I met a lot of people. Living and dead. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the Mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Strangers 3. <laughs> I made a dry run down the boulevard by Kiel, and sure enough, the stranger in felt hat and tweeds was still following me. I headed south, away from the crowds. He was right behind me like the back hump on a camel. I picked a nice dark alley for our meeting and faded into a doorway. I didn't have to wait long. As he came by, I grabbed for him. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, stop it. Who are you? What do you want? Take your hands off me, Mr. Jordan. You've been tailing me all day. Why? Only for an opportunity to talk with you. This is a very personal matter. Uh, from the top of the page, mister. And start with your name. Fader Brahms. I'm delighted. Now just what do you want? After I explain, you will understand why I did not wish to show myself. You see, I knew you were a good friend of Angus Morgan. Angus Morgan? You and he were once partners in Istanbul, I believe. Well, what about it? Mr. Jordan, I've been trailing him for over a month. Well, then stick to him. Why trail me? A short time ago, I lost him. But I have reason to believe he is now in Cairo. At first, I hoped that you would unwittingly lead me to his hiding place. Perhaps even your cafe tambourine. Want to stay with that story or try another one? (laughs) Mr. Jordan, would $500 be a decent sum for Angus Morgan's address? You can have it for free. Angus Morgan's been dead for three months. Now, you take it from there. A thousand dollars, then? Look, I'll play it once more. Angus Morgan is dead. Not dead, my friend, but very much alive. All right, let's say I buy your story for the moment. Why is Angus's address worth all that dough? (laughs) You are very cute, Mr. Jordan. Well? You have the dough with you? Certainly not. It's hardly the place for a financial transaction. Uh, Shall we say your cafe in two hours? Let's say that. I'll have the money there. 
You will carry out your part of the bargain? I didn't make a bargain. I think you will. In two hours, Mr. Jordan, at the tambourine. I watched Brahms fade off up the street and then detoured by way of the Cairo News Gazette. It was true, Angus Morgan and I had once been partners in Istanbul. Only Fader made one mistake. Angus and I were not friends, not even poor ones. Angus had double-crossed me and run out, owing me $15,000. If Angus was alive, only one thing interested me, my 15 grand. It took some fast talk and 20 piastres to get me into the newspaper morgue that time of night. But from then on, the night clerk was cooperative. And what was that name again? Uh, Morgan. Angus Morgan. Oh, uh, yeah. Moody, moon, moon. Yeah, I wouldn't mind this night job if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> you married? No, no. Uh, there was a story in the paper about his death about three months ago. <laughs> Don't ever get married, not if you work nights. Uh, what did you say that name was? Morris? No, Morgan. <laughs> now, take my wife. Always wants to know what happened. What? Oh, wait. Did... That's the one I want right there. Uh, no, no, that's Morgan, Angus Morgan. Give it to me. Okay. What can I say to her? She wouldn't believe me anyhow. Angus Morgan, killed in mysterious explosion, salvaging operation, off the coast of Ross el Hard. Yeah, then she says, why can't an alert, energetic man like me get a day job? Sure looks dead, all right. Yeah, she's just that way. Huh? My wife. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for everything. Here, file this back under Rocky Jordan. Sure. Good night, Mr. Morgan. I decided to make one more call before keeping my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. The authorities seemed sure Angus Morgan was dead. But if he was alive and in Cairo, he was here for one reason. A reason named Sabina. She wasn't too much to look at now, but at one time she was the toast of Istanbul. These days she ran a Turkish bath near the Sharia El Mudafar. It was late, but her office door was open and the sign said, Come in. So I did. I, I can't believe it. When can I see him? He's waiting at the Sharon Sanitarium. Philip, wait. Hello, Sabina. Did I interrupt something? Rocky Jordan. We meet again, Sabina, like old times. Don't tell me you want to lose weight. (laughs) No, no. There's enough hot air over at the cafe tambourine to keep me in shape. Like a word in private with you, Sabina, as soon as you're through here. Uh, Why, I... I am in no hurry, Sabina. So suppose you go ahead and see what Mr. Jordan wants. I will wait for you. Why, that's very kind of you, Mr. Tornay. Yeah, thanks. We'll only be a minute. Yes, Rocky? Who's the overgrown Frenchman? Oh, Mr. Tornay was arranging for me to give someone a massage at the sanitarium. Please, Rocky, what do you want? Sabina, what do you hear from Angus Morgan? Angus? What are you talking about? You know he's... I've got a hunch he's alive. What kind of a cruel joke is this? I get reasons for believing it. Rocky, I know how you hated Angus for double-crossing you. What good can this do you? Can't you let the past sleep? Still do anything for Angus, wouldn't you? Get out of here, Rocky. Sure, Sabina. Get out! I got out. If Sabina was putting on an act, she wasn't doing a good job of it. But I knew my visit with her was a sure way of making Angus show his hand, if he was around. I went back to my cafe tambourine. It wasn't yet time for Fader Brahms to show up. So I sat out in my office to try and decide how I could handle him. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Is this Mr. Jordan? Yeah? Good. I want to speak to you, Mr. Jordan. It is very important. Who is this? Oh, yeah. We have never met. My name is Svensson. Swenson? Jan Svensson. Oh, naturally. Mr. Jordan, I saw you talking to a man named Fader Brahms. Nice of you to tell me. I don't know what he offered to pay for information leading to Angus Morgan. But I can guarantee you, he will double his price. I didn't know a dead man was worth so much. Mr. Jordan, a man does not yoke when he is 40 fathoms on top. Look, uh, drop the salty talk and get to the point, huh? I am staying at the Hotel Mala, room six. Will you come see me right away? How much money did you say? i sure we can strike a bargain. Well, then get ready to bid, Swenson. You got competition. <laughs> I hung up knowing that Fader Brahms wasn't the only one who'd been following me. Add one Jan Swenson. I figured Fader and his appointment could wait. Two heads were better than one, and if my 15 grand was around, I wanted to be sure of it. The Hotel Malau wasn't far, and I was there in five minutes. Room six was on the first floor. There was a light on inside the room, and I knocked on Jan Swenson's door. 
No answer. I tried the door, but it was locked. So I called the hotel manager, and we went in. Oh, oh. what has happened? That bed does not belong in the center of the room and the dresser upside down. It looks like somebody went through here with a bulldozer. Oh, 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 oh. there has been a fight. But Mr. Swenson's clothes are still here. Yeah, a few of them. Yes. Oh, oh. what are these? Oh, heavy rubber gloves, like a deep sea diver's maybe. Nice and new. Oh, this is terrible. Dust all over everything. Yeah, even the phone. We must call the police. Yeah, do that. I left the hotel manager wringing his hands and got outside. I checked my watch. It was time for my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. And this time I really had some questions. As I turned to go, I felt something tugging at my coattail. It was a small native boy. He handed me a white envelope and dodged away into the crowd. I opened the letter and it read, Mr. Jordan, before you see Angus, see me. I will meet your price. Signed, Captain Morey. Address... 62 Fernier Road. Now, it looked like time for me to tally the score. First on base was Fader Brahms. Next, Jan Swenson. Now coming up to bat, Captain Morey. Now, I figured that Fader could wait for me at the tambourine, and I caught a taxi to 62 Fernier Road. It had all the earmarks of a sedate rooming house. The skinniest woman I've ever seen opened the door. I'm Mrs. Phipps. May I help you? Yes, I'm Rocky Jordan. Shh. You'll have to keep your voice down. My guests have been asleep for hours. Oh, sorry. Captain Morey's expecting me. Captain Morey? You don't say so. Well, I can't imagine... Look, I got a letter from him. Shh, please. I've got to see him tonight. I'm so angry I could scream. It couldn't have been ten minutes ago. He skipped out of here bag and package. Out the window, if you please. And not paying me one cent for his board and room. Take his clothes with him? Yes, everything except these awful rubber boots. Here, you can have them. Forgot his sea boots, huh? Better give them to the police. The police will be here. I've already called them. Oh, just one more thing. What did Captain Morey look like? Simply horrible. Grotesque and horrible. Oh, thanks. Shh. I left Mrs. Phipps standing there, a big new sea boot in each hand, and moved out onto the dark street. I got to the nearest payphone and called Chris at the tambourine. He said nobody resembling Fader Brahms had made an appearance there. We were both late for our appointment. Now, there was something else in my mind as I left the phone booth. I wondered if my visit with Sabina was going to pay off. And then it did. The shots were wild and there were holes in the wall all around me. I dropped to the ground, rolled up in a dark corner. The guy with the gun must have thought he got me because he took off down a side street. He was big, but he ran like a scared gazelle. I was up and after him, but when I got to the corner, he was out of sight. I let him go. Anyhow, I had one answer. The seed I had planted with Sabina had finally blossomed. Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On CBS, My Friend Irma is now one of the most popular comedies on the air, and the two characters, Irma and Jane, are familiar to millions. You'll enjoy Irma to her last dumb remark on My Friend Irma, following CBS Radio Theater, Monday night. Now, back to Rocky Jordan with tonight's story, Strangers 3. <laughs> Angus Morgan was supposed to have died three months ago. That's what the record said. But when three men named Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey came to Cairo looking for him and said he was alive, I was interested. Angus owed me $15,000, and I like money. My visit with Angus's old girlfriend, Sabina, paid off on the nose. When shots started flying, I knew Angus was close by. Back in Sabina's office, the fellow named Tournier had mentioned the Sharon Sanitarium. And Sabina hadn't covered it too well. So the next day being Sunday, I invested in one dozen roses and paid the Sharon a visit. On the third floor, I hit pay dirt. I swung a door open, and there, propped up in bed playing chess with Philip Tournier, was Angus Morgan. Rocky! I uh, brought you some flowers, Angus. Shut the door. How did you find me, Rocky? In the telephone book. The same old Rocky. Is he your finger man? Yeah. Uh, Meet Philip Tony, my bodyguard. Well, we've already met. 
Twice. Twice, Mr. Jordan? Once at Sabina's and once outside a phone booth. You're a bum shot, Tony, eh? I'm afraid you are mistaken. Uh, skip it. Listen, Angus. Rocky, how did you know I was still living? Three men told me. Three? Well, count them. Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey. No. They, they, Maybe you're having a relapse, Angus. Maybe I better call a nurse. Stop it, Rocky. They say they're alive. Breathing, too. Right down your thick neck. They know where I am. Uh, not yet, Angus. But they're each offering me a few thousand for that information. I've... I'm beginning to see what you mean. Seems there was a debt. I'll refresh your memory. Fifteen thousand dollars. Rocky, I'll pay you every cent of your promise to leave immediately and forget you've been here. As far as I'm concerned, Angus, you're resting where you so justly deserve. Got it with you? Yes. Philip, this is just between Rocky and me. So if you leave the room... But, Angus, you are sure... I can trust Rocky. You can get me some cigars while you're out. Go on. Very well. I will be back shortly. Well, Rocky, it's been a long time. The money, Angus, remember? Very well. Will you hand me that valise on the lower shelf of the cart there? Oh, sure. Well, feels loaded. <laughs> I'll have a little left. Mm. Yeah. Here you are. Fifteen thousand dollars. Cut it if you like. Well, don't worry, I'll be back if it's not all here. Angus, I'm overwhelmed. You're paid. Just keep your promise and get out. Sure, I know when I'm not wanted. Just one more thing. Yes? Tell Tournier to stop using me for a clay pigeon or I'll have your three friends up here next. I'm going to show you, Rocky. You'll never hear from me again. Angus put his valise back where it was and I got out. I walked slowly down the stairs trying to decide what I was going to tell fate of Brahms. He still hadn't kept his date with me. Well, I had my dough. I promised Angus to keep my mouth shut and that's the way it was going to be. I just about reached the main floor when Bedlam broke loose. It was coming from the third floor. I raced back up the steps two at a time. Down the hall, a crowd was gathering in front of Angus Morgan's room. I saw Philip Tournier come out of the elevator when we reached the room together. We pushed through the crowd of Sunday visitors and into the room. And there was Sabina. Sabina, what is it? Pull yourself together, Sabina. What happened? I, I walked into the room and, and there... There he was. There's no doubt about it this time. Oh, Angus is dead. Stabbed to death. From there on, things moved fast. Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, took over. A very thorough man, he rounded up everyone connected with the case. Down at headquarters, I was kept cooling my heels while Sam talked to Sabina and Tournier. He called me in last. Well, Jordan, I am afraid you have a great deal to explain. Well, by this time, Sam, I thought you'd have the murder solved. Jordan, this time, let's get to the point. I suppose Sabina told you I had it in for Angus Morgan. That is correct. And Tournier happened to mention that I threatened Angus. Just one more thing. In Angus Morgan's room at the sanitarium was a valise containing $300,000. 300000 He is missing. I believe 15000 of it is in your pocket. Tournier did talk, didn't he? May I see it? Sure. Thank you. Hey, what are you doing, Sam? That's my door. We shall see. Right now, it is Exhibit A. Where is the rest of the money, Jordan? How should I know? Well, now, wait, Sam. You don't think Would I... you like to tell me everything now, Jordan? Of course. I was as sure as anybody else that Angus Morgan was dead. Then people came to me looking for him, said he was alive and in Cairo. What people? Well, first, a guy in a felt hat and tweeds named Fader Brahms. Yeah. Then Jan Swenson and Captain Morey. They both skipped out, but I'll give you their former addresses. You better look him up, Sam. Getting back to Angus Morgan, how did you find him? Philip Tournier let his whereabouts out of the bag when I went to see Sabina. Oh, by the way, an hour later, somebody tried to kill me. I think it was Tournier. But um, about that 15 grand, Angus owed it to me. I will do my best to find this three thumb you speak of. But, Jordan, the facts remain incriminating. I was halfway out of the building when the murder took place. Save that part of your story for the inquest tomorrow. We will notify you of the time. Okay, Sam, we'll play it your way. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Sam. Oh, and by the way, when you give me back my money, I'm going to buy you a present. Oh? What, Jordan? A can of oil. Your chair squeaks. I went out into the street, and when the air hit me, I knew I was sweating. If we were all released, that meant Sam was playing cat and mouse with us. And everything pointed in my direction, much too conveniently. I had to act quickly while I still had a few hours of freedom. I had a hunch the police were following me, but I didn't care. I had nothing to hide. 
Sabina was first on my list. She took my paid once before, and she might again. When I reached Sabina's Turkish bath, she was already there. Rocky, what are you doing here? Who let you in? I've got to talk to you. Haven't you caused enough trouble? Leave me alone. Who's Fader Brahms? Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Why don't you ask Philip Dornay? Well, I will. Where is he? He's staying at an apartment over the open air market on Farron Street. Oh, thanks. I got a good hunch who killed your boyfriend, Sabina. Maybe you have too. Who did it, Rocky? That's what I got to find out, Sabina. Or I may be next. I went to the open air market on Farron Street. Philip Tournier's room was on the second floor. I knocked. When he finally opened it, he was either out of breath or awfully scared. It's all done. I'm coming in, Tonya. Yes, yes, of course. I, I thought you were in jail. Well, weren't we all? Here, uh, there is a policeman watching my apartment. Two of them now. One for each of us. I'd right, start leveling with me, Tonya. You tried to kill me last night, didn't you? I could have, Rocky. But I shot wild, purposely. I was Angus Morgan's bodyguard, not his finger man. When did Sabina arrive at the sanitarium Sunday? I do not know. You ever hear of Fader Brahms? Why, uh, I have never seen him. Well, try these for size. Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Uh, Angus Fader and Swenson hired uh, Captain Morey's boat. Uh, they salvaged an army payroll from an American freighter that had been sunk during the war. Uh, where? Uh, off the coast of Russell Hud. The four of them were supposed to split the money between them. Knowing Angus, he changed his mind, wanted all of it. Uh, that is right. After they had hauled up $300,000 of the money, Angus sneaked off the boat, leaving a time bomb behind. Everyone was reported missing at sea, including Angus. Well, they're not missing now. They're in Cairo. Uh, they will kill me. Sure, if you took the 300000 But I did not. What can I do? Just sit tight and don't talk to anybody. Especially not to Sabina. <laughs> Tournier was halfway to his phone before I got out the door, but I didn't mind. At least now I had something to work with, if I could believe anything he said. I went out onto the street wondering if I'd ever see Fate of Brahms again, or Svensson or Captain Morey. Why would anyone kill Angus, take the money, and stay around Cairo for the police to get at? I stood there trying to figure my next move, and then it was figured for me. The door of a car waiting at the curb swung open. Get in, Jordan. Fate of Brahms. Sure I'm not intruding. Get in, I said. Okay. But take that shiny cannon out of my face. It hurts my eyes. I may have to use it. I want that $300,000, Jordan. Oh, you haven't got it? No. And I want every cent of it. Tell me something, Fader. How did it happen Angus Morgan didn't kill you like he planned? Perhaps I knew him too well. We were on the salvage boat, all four of us, lying two miles offshore. One night I heard the sound went up on deck. And I heard oars fading into the fog. Zangus Morgan taking all the money we'd salvaged. Before I could do anything, there was a blast. I came to on a small vessel sailing for East Africa. It took me two months to get back. And I've been looking for Angus ever since. I see. Now you see why I want that money, Jordan. Why don't you look up Jan Swenson or Captain Morey? Why pin it on me? I think you have it. Jordan, I swear I'll kill you right here. Oh, maybe not after you take a look out the back window. Go ahead. Black car? Keep watching it. The police, Fader. They've been tailing me all day. Perhaps you are not flying. Now listen to some sense. You want the money. I want to get the guy who killed Angus Morgan to clear myself. We can get them together. You you know who killed Morgan? Yeah. Captain Morey. I'm sure I saw him at the sanitarium. Captain Morey? Of course. What's your plan? Well, first we split up. Shake the police off our trails. Meet me at the corner of Sika and El Modar, right by the old tower. Why there? I think I know his hideout. You'll be there in 30 minutes. Very well, Jordan. I will be there. I waited till Fader Brahms drove off around the corner, and I got to a phone called Sam Sabaya. It wasn't long till Sam's sleepy voice came on. Sabaya speaking. Listen, Sam, I think I got your man. Uh, you got... Uh, what, 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 what is this? Captain Morey, if you'll be at Seeker and Elmo Dar in half an hour, I'll produce them. Uh, Jordan, go home and go to bed. Sam, listen to me. But I am glad you called, though. The inquest will be tomorrow at 11. Will you be there, or um, should 
I send an escort. Sam, I told you where to be. Now, don't let me down. Good night, George. Listen, Sam. Sam! Okay, I'll go it alone. Sam was in no cooperative mood. But it was too late to change my plan now. My watch said 11 o'clock. That meant I had just 12 hours to dig up somebody to take my place at the inquest. I walked the whole way to our rendezvous spot through the twisting narrow streets that led to the old tower, a familiar dismal landmark in the lower quarter of Carroll. I finally stopped at the tower. No one was there, but I was a couple of minutes early. Laughter sounded from an upper window across the way. It stopped, a light went out, and all was darkness and quiet. I leaned against the wall and waited. Once I thought I saw a figure in the shadows. I glanced back and it was gone. You know, shadows play tricks sometimes. Then I heard it. A quick rustling motion that resolved into a figure as I turned. I felt it coming, but I was too late. Pain stabbed my right shoulder. I tried to move, but the knife had me pinned to the wall. Through a blinding fight to keep my senses, I heard a confusion of sound. Pistol blazed almost in my face. And everything mixed into a whirlpool of shouts and footsteps and went spinning off into nothing. With Rocky Jordan right in the middle. Rocky Jordan will be back in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a Mike memo from CBS for Monday Night Listening. The Foxes of Harrow comes to you Monday night on CBS Radio Theater with lovely Maureen O'Hara and John Hodiak. Don't miss The Foxes of Harrow, CBS Radio Theater, Monday night at 7 in California and 6 elsewhere in the West. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. <laughs> When I opened my eyes, the darkness of the night under the old tower had changed to all white. White walls, white sheets, white bedshirt. The sun was coming in the west window and seated beside my bed, looking me over like a hound looks over a fresh bone, was Sam Zabaya. Well, Jordan, you missed the inquest. Oh, you're breaking my heart, Sam. Where am I? In the Sharon Sanitarium. Oh, the Sharon again. Why here? We, we, we thought you might feel right at home. Well, I'm not. Ooh. What happened? Only a knife wound. Your shoulder will heal. You were more fortunate than Angus Morgan. Yeah. Then all that shooting was the police. Sam, I thought you weren't coming to the party last night. Oh, Jordan, you wrong me. Feather Brahms is now in the Cairo jail. A little worse for the wear. Okay. Now, Sam, when do I get my 15 grand back? Remember? Exhibit A? Uh, Jordan, you promised to lead me to Captain Morey. Where is he? In jail. Captain Morey, Jan Swenson, and Fader Brahms. They're all the same man. The... Oh. It's no wonder we couldn't find the other two. When did you know this? Uh, I should have known from the beginning. Fader was too elaborate with his plans. I figured he invented the other two to keep me on my toes, make sure I didn't lose interest. Mm -hmm. And if a murder rap came up, the police would be out looking for Swenson and Morey. Dead men. But, Jordan, that is hardly proof. No. I wasn't sure until Fader Brahms came to me and demanded the money. I told him to ask Swenson and Captain Morey, but Fader didn't bat an eye. Why? Because he knew they didn't exist. No doubt they were actually killed in the salvage boat. Sure. So when I told Fader I'd produce Captain Morey, he knew I was lying. He decided it was time to get rid of me. Just one thing I don't understand. Uh, Sam, about my 15000 uh, What don't you understand? Well, if Fader Brahms killed Angus Morgan and took his money, why didn't he get out of Cairo? Now, very good question, Jordan. Brahms has confessed to the murder, but he did not get the money. What? Sabina came into Angus Morgan's room too quickly after the murder. In his haste to escape, Fader left the very thing he was after. Then he really did think I had it. Oh, but where is the money? But that is a very strange thing, Jordan. After we brought you back here last night, the money was found in the third floor laboratory. How it got there, I don't know. Sam, of course. Angus set the money satchel on the lower shelf of that, uh, that little cart the nurses wheel around. It was still there when she wheeled it out. Ah, uh -huh, I see. Perhaps during the confusion after the murder. Well, that about settles everything. Oh, no, Sam. What about my 15 grand? 
My dough. Well, you see, George, and there will probably be an estate. You will have to put in a claim for it. Well, of all the... Hey, nurse! Nurse! Uh, Jordan, can I get something for you? Yes, Sam, a first-class lawyer. <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. You will get your money. You always do. <laughs> Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Bernard Girard and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Jordan. You can't always be right, but with the practice I've had, it doesn't take long to spot a phony. She had on low tan Oxford shoes, service weight hose that disappeared under the hem of a very new lookish tweed suit. Her hair was plastered down in a severe updo that left her ears sticking out as perfect resting places for the brown tortoise shell arms of her glasses. She was carrying a brown leather briefcase, and the end of her nose was tilted just a little as if something smelled. I thought so, too. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter in sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine. Crowded, forgotten men of the waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Up in Flames. Yeah, from her hairdo to her round-toed Oxford shoes, she looked 100% businesswoman. I mentally turned up my sales resistance to medium and sat back. She learned her lines for the role by heart. Mr. Jordan, I am Miss Bates. I represent the International Fire Insurance Company with head office in New York. I am certain that you already carry fire insurance, but with the rising costs of building materials and good labor, is it adequate to replace your establishment if it were to burn to the ground? Oh, Miss Bates, I... I... am certain it is not, Mr. Jordan. Uh... My company, sensing the trend of the upward spiral in replacement costs, has decided to extend for this fiscal period an added inducement policy covering the differential in costs that has developed. Now, look, Miss Bates, no doubt what you say is true, but I'm not interested in any more fire insurance. Mr. Jordan, your attitude is typical. But under the current circumstances, don't you think it would be wise to reconsider? What circumstances, Miss Bates? Surely, Mr. Jordan, you must be aware of the unusual number of major fires in Cairo in the last three months. All right, sister, drop the act. What's the pitch? Mr. Jordan, you do me a great injustice. In all oh, excuse cases... me. Hello, Cafe Tambourine. Hello, Rocky Jordan. Speaking. Oh, Rocky, this is Lefty Miller. I met you in the back room of Gus Gimlick's Snooker Parlor, remember? Oh, yeah. How's the broken nose and cauliflower ear business? Same as always, Rocky. I'm in a semifinal bout tonight at the American Club. You coming to the fight? Oh, I thought I'd drop in. Why? Um, I'd like to have you come down to my dressing room before my fight. I got a little favor to ask. Why not ask me now? I can't, Rocky. It's something personal. It takes too long to explain over the phone. What do you say, Rock, huh? Oh, okay, Lefty. I'll stop by. That's uh, well, Rocky. I'll leave a ringside ticket for your information test. Oh, thanks. Don't mention it. See you tonight, Rock. Goodbye. Now, Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Oh, uh, you still here, Miss Bates? Here's my business card. Both day and night telephone numbers are on it in case you wish to reconsider. One never knows when a conflagration might cause irreplaceable loss. Oh, I'm certain one doesn't, Miss Bates. Well, if I change my mind, I'll let you know. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Agrazian, who owned the frozen food lockers at 937 Kamal Street, Mr. Tanut, who owned the hotel at 3014 Shariel Modafar, and Mr. Shoup, who owned the drugstore at the corner of Bakil and Canal, felt exactly as you do. 
Now, since their establishments have been completely destroyed by fire, they are very glad they reconsidered and took out adequate protection with my company. You might check with them, Mr. Jordan. They might help you to change your mind. With that clincher, she closed the door and left. I decided to check up on her little game, so I ignored her card, looked up the telephone number of the International Fire Insurance Company in the phone book, dialed the number, and asked for the manager. This is Mr. Temple speaking. Who's calling, please? Oh, I want some information about fire insurance. I already have some, but I, I need more. Will your company issue additional insurance? Oh, indeed we will, sir. In fact, at this very time, our company, sensing the trend of the upward spiral in replacement costs, has decided to extend for this fiscal period an added inducement policy covering the differential in costs that has developed. Uh, that's fine. Now, if I wanted a salesman to call, uh, who might I expect? I will arrange to have our star salesperson contact you in the morning. Her name is Miss Bates. Uh, who is this calling, please? <laughs> That was what I figured was wrong with the deal. It was too pat. Everything fitted together too well. No flaws. And maybe Sam could spot one. So I called him. Cairo Police, Captain Sabaya. Jordan, Sam. Well, what is it now, Jordan? How many bodies and where are they? <laughs> no bodies, Sam. Just me. Uh, is this a pleasure call? Oh, it could be. How's about taking the night off and going to the fights at the American Club with me? Oh, I would be delighted, Jordan. Only Commissioner Baromi takes a rather dim view of his men relaxing in such a manner while on duty. Oh, it's too bad, Sam. Some other time then, huh? Uh, oh, uh, Sam. Ah, uh, now it comes out. All right, Jordan, let's have it from the beginning. <laughs> You're in a rut. All I want is some information. I'm waiting. You got any leads on who's been setting all the fires we've been having lately? Jordan, if you know something we... Calm don't... down. I haven't got a thing. And what about all those fires? Well, every one of them, causes unknown, owners away at the time, no evidence of arson. Luckily, most of them were adequately insured. Uh, with the uh, International Fire Insurance Company, Sam? How did you know that, Jordan? Were the claims paid? Every one of them, Jordan. What are you running into? A blank wall, Sam. See you later. I decided to forget about Miss Bates and her fire insurance. I had about two and a half hours to kill, so I did a very strange thing. Went out into my cafe, sat down, and had a steak on the house. It wasn't bad. Maybe I should do it more often. I picked up my ringside seat ticket at the information desk of the American Club. And the attendant told me Lefty Miller's dressing room was number seven in the basement under the gymnasium. The first preliminary was already underway upstairs. Lefty's door was open. He was sitting on his rubdown table faded purple dressing gown over his shoulders. His manager and his sparring partner in second were just finishing tying up his shoelaces. Rocky, come on in. Hey, look, Mac, you and Benny step outside for a while. Will you? I want to talk to Jordan along. What's the idea, Lefty? You'll be on for so. Never mind. You and Benny wait out in the hall. This won't take long. Okay, if that's the way you want it. Uh, Rocky, uh, Gus Gimlick says you're a right guy that you don't mind doing a favor now and then. Well, I'll return the compliment when I see him. All right, what is it? I came down to see the fights, remember? This won't take but a minute. I uh, rock my wallet's in my coat pocket there in the locker. Get it out for me, will you? Sure. Huh? Huh. This it? Yeah. There's 250 bucks in it. Take the door, will you? Okay. Now what? Quick, stick the door in your pocket. They might come back in. Now, here's the favor. When you go back upstairs, I want you to bet it on tonight's... Oh, get the phone for me, will you, Rock? I got my gloves on. Hello? Hello, Jordan. Yes, sir. How'd you find me? I called the information desk to have you page on the loudspeaker. They said you were in Lefty Miller's dressing room. That's how. Uh, I'll buy that. What do you want, Sam? Jordan, if any of my men stop you as you are hurrying back to the tambourine, tell them you are going to a fire. What's that? I'm trying to tell you. It just came over the teletype machine. The tambourine, your cafe, is on fire. Thanks, Sam. I'm on my way. Hey, Jordan, where are you going? I ain't back. Never no time to explain, Lefty. <laughs> I didn't get to use Sam's advice. Nobody stopped me. I pulled up in front of the tambourine. Business was going on as usual, so I wheeled around to the back. There'd been a fire, all right. Seemed the trash barrel had caught on fire and smoked up the back wall of my cafe a little. Uh, if this was a practical hint to buy more fire insurance, I didn't like it. I went inside. Miss Bates' card was still on my desk. I called the night number. A man answered, but I didn't hang up. Hello, this is Mr. Temple speaking. Oh, uh, I called earlier today for some information. Oh, you're the gentleman who called. We must have been cut off or disconnected. Uh, yes, yes. 
Uh, would you please give me the phone number or the address of your star salesperson, your Miss Bates? Uh, who is this, please? And may I ask why you want that information tonight? Well, never mind, Temple. Just give me your phone number or her address. Who is this speaking, please? My name is Jordan. I run the Cafe Tambourine. I want to talk to you, Miss Bates, about a little fire. Mr. Jordan, can't the discussion take place tomorrow? Miss Bates is asleep now. What, at this hour? Wake her up and get her to the phone. Mr. Jordan, I am seldom abrupt with the prospective client, but I am afraid you're overstepping your bounds. This apartment is my home. Miss Bates is my wife, and she's worked very hard today. If I do not choose to awaken her, that is my prerogative. Good night, sir. Well, that was that. It was too late to go back to the fight, so I tore up my ringside ticket and went out into the cafe. About 45 minutes later, Lefty Miller's fight manager, Mac, walked in, spotted me, and came over. Jordan, I want to talk to you. All right, go ahead. Let's go in your office. Oh, real private, huh? Okay, come on. Hey, Jordan, why did you come to Lefty's dressing room tonight? Well, I'm an admirer of muscles. I'm a smart guy. What went on in there? Look, if it's just 250 bucks you want here. He said he wanted me to bet him on the fight, but I left the club before I could make the bet. Well, what's sticking in your craw? You wouldn't be known that Lefty took a dive in the third round and didn't even make it look good. What? Look, Jordan, I don't appreciate guys getting to my boy. When I find out for sure it was you who did it, I'm coming back. Time's up. End of bout. Beat it, Mac. Take Lefty's dough with you. Mac took the 250, gave me a dirty look for a receipt, and slammed the door behind him. Now, things had been jumping all evening. I hoped they'd quiet down, but they didn't. They started happening two at a time. Hey, come in. Hello? Uh, hello, Mr. Jordan. Jordan, this is Savio. Oh, hello, Sam. His name isn't Sam, Mr. Jordan. It's Timothy. Keep quiet, will you? What's that, Jordan? Oh, not you, Sam. No, go, go ahead. Go oh, wait, dear Mr. Jordan. Perhaps you did phone. not know, but since I talked to you last, there has been another fire. Why tell me? Well, you seem so interested earlier tonight. Is this a pleasure call, Sam? Indeed, it is not. The American club gymnasium had burned down, and your prize fighter friend, Lefty Miller, is lying dead. Lefty's dead? Burned to death in dressing room seven. I am calling from the main building of the club. I want you to come down immediately. Okay, Sam. I'll, I'll be right over. Now, you there. What are you... Good evening, Mr. Jordan. When my husband, Timothy, here, told me how agitated you sounded on the telephone earlier this evening, I realized you must have reconsidered. So we got dressed and hurried right over. Now, Mr. Jordan, just how much additional fire insurance do you think you will need? <laughs> Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On New Year's Day, CBS will devote every facility to accurately bring you the happenings in Pasadena. All the beauty and color of the parade and the thrilling play-by-play -play description of the Rose Bowl game. Now back to Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Up in Flames. <laughs> It all started when Miss Bates, tweed suit, horn-rimmed glasses, and briefcase had tried to sell me some extra fire insurance. I didn't like the deal. I couldn't put my finger on the spot where it left the straight and narrow, so it still bothered me. Item one, the prize fighter named Lefty Miller, who took a dive in the third round of his fight, and his manager blamed me. Item two, a fire in back of my cafe tambourine. Item three, and this is where things started happening two at a time, Sam Sabaya called me on the phone... And at the same time, at 11 o'clock at night, who should walk into my office but that certain Miss Bates and her husband, Mr. Temple? Subject, fire insurance. I said, Mr. Jordan, how much additional fire insurance do you think you will need? Well, look, something has just come up that's going to delay my decision. But, Mr. Jordan, you see... The that... American Club gym has burned down. What? Oh, good Lord, another one. And a prize fighter was burned to death in his dressing room. Oh, how oh, awful. Oh. Captain Sam Sabaya wants me to come right over, so if you'll both pardon me... We'll do more than pardon you, Mr. Jordan. We'll drive you down there. Come on. It came out during the ride that the American club was insured with International. I had a feeling it would be. There was still some equipment and a lot of people around when we arrived. Mr. and Mrs. Temple went looking for Bert Johnson, the manager of the club... I went looking for Sabaya. I found him with some of his men in the basement of the gym. He turned his flashlight on me as I came up. So, Jordan, you finally got here. Yes, Sam, now that I'm here, why were you so anxious for me to come down? I thought perhaps the atmosphere here might induce you to tell me what is going on. Sam, believe me, I would if I could, but, but I, I can't. can't. You mean you will not? 
Very well, George, and look around you. Sam began pointing things out with his flashlight. They weren't pretty, especially the body lying beside the burned rubdown table. Sam played his flashlight on the lockers, then over to the wall in the back. He held it steady for a moment on the electric light fuse box. A little metal door was hanging open. Is that what caused it, Sam? No. If there had been a short circuit, the fuse would have burned out. I checked them. None of them had burned out. Any ideas? Perhaps you would like to explain what you were doing here earlier this evening. Well, Lefty Miller phoned this afternoon and said he wanted me to come to his dressing room before the fight. He wanted to ask me a favor. Yes, go on. It turned out he wanted me to bet 250 bucks of his money on the fight. You called before he could do it. That's all, Sam. Thank you, Jordan. I might have known you would not tell me the truth at this time. Sam's like that. This was once I didn't blame him. I didn't make much sense to me either. I knew I should get to Lefty's manager, Mac, before Sam did. I wanted to clear up a few things, so I took off. On the way downtown in the taxi, I figured Gus Gimlick would know where I might find Mac. I checked my watch. If things were running normal in the back room of Gus Gimlick's snooker parlor... They'd be getting the results of yesterday's races short way from the States. Now, we finally pulled up in front of Gus's place. I told the driver to wait, walked on in, and through to the back room. Things were running normal. They were waiting for the results of the fifth, the Tanforan. It wasn't hard to spot Gus, even in the crowd. He was all Greek and a yard wide. He weighed a little over 300 pounds. He looked up from a form chart as I walked over. Hello, Rocky. You'll have to hurry if you want to get the bed down. The fifth is about to start. Horses are entering the start. Oh, thanks. Just same, Gus. I'll sit this one out. Suit yourself, Rocky. You got something on your mind? Yeah. You know Lefty Miller's fight manager, Gus? His name is Mac. Yeah, they're all in the start. Yes, again. I know Mac. He's not very smart, but he's honest. Why? Well, I want to get in touch with him. You know where I might find him? And there they go. Yeah, the fifth race is started. Blue Flash is going to the front. Ernie Keltner is second. Maximilian is third. Days end is fourth. Flying Knight is fifth. And up in play. Where can I find him, Gus? Later, Rocky. Okay. After the race. Blue Flash in front by a nose. Ernie Keltner is second by one length. Days end is pulling up between horses. It is now third. Maximilian is fourth. Flying Knight and up in flame. Who's the favorite, Gus? Days end. But most of these Here's guys the that bets on the long side, up in flames. Up in flames. Ernie Keltner is third, flying night is fourth. Maximilian is fifth, and up in flames. <laughs> up in flames. They said it was a hot tip, Rocky. Ah. Days and is second by half a length. Flying night is third. Ernie Keltner is fourth, up in flames is fifth, and Maximilian. And there goes up in flames. He found a hole in the rail and is moving up between horses. Yeah, guys, your bankroll's going up in flames. It's Blue Flash, Days End, and Up in Flames. Now it's Days End and Blue Flash, and Up in Flames. They're in a drive and coming down to the line of finish. It's Days End, and Up in Flames. And Up in Flames gets up to win it by a nose. Days End is second, and Ernie Keltner is third in front of Blue Flash. Not too bad, Gus. You can't win all the time. Don't worry, Rocky. I'll get it back. There are still two races to go. Now they'll all bet on the long shots. I hope they do, Gus. But to get back to where I can find Mac. Oh, yes. I don't know where he lives, but he hangs around Lefty's apartment all the time. It's 847 St. George Street. 847 St. George Street turned out to be a medium-sized apartment house in a middle-class neighborhood. I paid the driver and walked up the six stone steps to the entranceway. The entrance light was burned out, so I scratched a match. The name Lefty Miller was on the mailbox, numbered 311. I started to flick out the match and stopped. Just under it on the mailbox, number 211, was the name Mr. and Mrs. Timothy Temple. It was a mild shock, but I'd been waiting for something like this all evening. Things had to tie together, and maybe this was it. I went upstairs and knocked on the door just under where it said 311. I hoped the door would open. It did. And I got another shock. This one gave me the full treatment. Oh, Rocky Jordan, come in, come in. It was Lefty Miller, and very much alive. Come in, Rocky, come on in. I went in. Lefty seemed glad to see me. While I stood there trying to believe my eyes, I noticed on a long table about five or six radios with their parts scattered all around them. I'm uh, glad you dropped by, Rocky. Did you get that bet down on me to lose? This may come as sort of a mild surprise, Lefty, but not more than an hour ago... I left your dead body lying in three inches of sooty water in what was left of dressing room seven after the fire. My dead body? 
Fire? What fire? You don't know that the American club gym burned down? Well, no, Rocky, but what do you mean? There was a body in your dressing room that everyone figured was you. Good Lord, Benny. Benny? Yeah, my sparring partner in second. Rocky, this is awful. They'll say I killed him. Well, did you? No. I'll admit we had a quarrel. I, I knocked him out, but I didn't kill him. Wait a minute. You said just now, did I get the bet down on you to lose? That's what Benny and I had to fight about. I didn't tell him I was going to take that dive in the third round. And it was a phony dive. Sure, I admit it. Benny bet on me to win. He was sore about it. He swung on me after Mac left. I let him have one on the chin, left him lying on the rubdown table. I turned out the lights, closed the door, and left. That's all. Hey, you didn't bet my money on me to win, did you? I didn't bet your money at all. I gave it to Mac when he came over to my cafe later. I said that's where he went. Maybe he figured you got me to take the dive. Why did you? That was Gus Gimlick's idea. I owed him some money. Some horses, I bet, I decided not to come in. He said if I take the dive in the third round, he'd cancel it that. That's a quick way to end your fight career. As far as I'm concerned, it's over right now. I wasn't making any dough in a fight game. None of bouts. I've been making my rent money repairing radios. It's quite a hobby for a prize fighter. I picked it up during the war. Essential industry kept me out of the army. Oh. Hey, let me show you the combination screwdriver and solder iron I invented. Uh, some other time. Hey, uh, what did you come here for, Rocky? I was looking for Mac to convince him I didn't get you to take the dive. I guess it won't be necessary now. No, I guess not, Rocky. Going already? Yeah, but you'd better stick around. I think you're going to have another visitor. An official one. Lefty shrugged his shoulders, picked up his combination screwdriver and soldering iron, and turned towards the table with the dismantled radios. I closed the door and walked down three flights to the front entrance. The timing was perfect. Sam's limousine pulled up at the curb just as I was going down the six stone steps. Jordan! Jordan, what were you doing in there? Talking to a very much alive dead man, Sam. You'll find his story very interesting. No doubt, Jordan. The body is not that of Lefty Miller, but of his sparring partner and second, Benny Myers. Miller was seen leaving the club quite some time before the fire. Yeah. Hmm. Jordan, a penny for your thoughts. You just rang a bell, Sam. See you later. Jordan, come back here. I guess Sam figured he knew where he could find me later because he didn't follow me. I grabbed a taxi at the corner and headed for dressing room seven of the American Club gym. I didn't ask for permission and nobody tried to stop me. Just as the fourth match was burning my finger, I found what I was looking for. Fourteen minutes later, I pulled up at 937 Kemal Street at the charred remains of Mr. Egrazian's frozen food lockers. The next stop was 3014 Shariel Motifar and what used to be Mr. Tanut's small hotel. From there, we wheeled around and went to what used to be Mr. Shoup's drugstore at the corner of Bakil and Canal. Then I gave the driver the address of 847 St. George Street and settled back to count my evening's loot. Adding them up carefully, they would just come to the price of the new American airmail postcard. I told the driver to wait, ran up the six stone steps and went inside. This time I knocked on the door right under where it said 211. I figured when the door opened, it'd be Timothy Temple. It was, and he was in a bathrobe. Mr. Jordan. Uh, what do you do? What? Uh, thanks for asking me in, Temple. What do you mean by forcing your way in like this? What do you want, Jordan? I'm on to your game, Temple. Did you ever see these before? What? You're asking me to identify four American pennies, Mr. Jordan? They're yours, aren't they? How would I know? Look, would you please go? Mrs. Temple and I were about to go to sleep. Who is it, dear? What is going on? Oh, Mr. Jordan. Well, you look quite different without your uh, glasses, Miss Bates. Uh, Mrs. Temple. Mr. Jordan, I don't know why you forced your way in here like this, but will you please go? We would like to go to sleep. Now, with that radio on in the bedroom? Sounds more like you were dancing. Mr. Jordan, that radio is not in our bedroom. It is in the apartment upstairs. That awful man plays his radio day and night. And what is more, he is a prize fighter, and when Timothy reprimanded him, he offered to knock my husband's block off. We're going to move just as soon as we can find another apartment. Uh, it's just possible I could be wrong about you two. What are you getting at, Jordan? Why did you want me to identify those four coins? Let me ask one, friend. Who besides you and your wife would know to whom you had sold extra fire insurance? It is odd you ask, Mr. Jordan. My husband and I have tried to keep that information a secret between us, discussing it only here at home. 
The number of our clients having fires is alarmingly high. The head office is quite disturbed. Well, what would happen if you could prove those fires were deliberately set just to collect the insurance? Why, we could force them to return the money and put the guilty persons in prison. Uh, but what makes you think the fires were not accidental? There's no proof. I've got the proof, Temple. Wait a minute. You stay right here. I've got an idea. I left Mr. and Mrs. T looking at each other without saying a word. I didn't count the steps between 211 and 311, but there weren't many. I tried the door of 311. It wasn't locked, so I opened it. And here they are. Lefty was gone. The music was coming from one of the radios. I walked over and turned it off. Mr. and Mrs. Temple's voices were coming out of a pair of headphones lying on Lefty's work table. It all fit now. I had my answers. I walked over to the phone and called Sam. Cairo police. Captain Zabaya. Uh, Jordan, Sam. Any of you boys around this time of night? Certainly. Why? If they want to know where you're taking them, tell them you're going to a fire. Jordan, what are you talking about? No time for details, Sam. Meet me at my cafe as soon as you can. Maybe we can catch the guy red-handed. I think somebody's getting ready to set fire to the tambourine. Hurry, Sam. <laughs> When we pulled up in front of the tambourine, there was no sign of Sabaya. I tossed the driver a five-pound note and reached for my keys as I crossed the sidewalk. Except for the little service light in the back of the bar, the cafe was dark. I opened the front door, started for my office. I figured I'd find him there. I was just about even with the foot of the stairs going up to my room over the office when the upstairs door opened and he was framed in the light. I started up the stairs after him. He met me halfway and proved the theory that what goes up must come down. We untangled at the foot of the stairs and I swung on him. I should have known better. He was a trained fighter. He caught me right on the button and I went backwards against one of the service tables full of glasses and silverware. I got up and shot it for him again. His back was to the front door. Just then, Sam, with full siren, pulled up out front. My opponent turned. His chin was silhouetted against the glare and the headlights. And I let him have it. And for the second time in one night, Lefty Miller took a dive. Only this time, it wasn't fate. <laughs> Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. On New Year's Day, the Rose Bowl kickoff will be at 2 instead of 3 p.m. due to the return of California to standard time. Remember to enjoy both the Tournament of Roses and the Rose Bowl game on your local CBS station, New Year's Day. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. I'll say this for Sam. When you really need him, he's right there. If there were more like him, the world would be much better off. But as usual, he wanted all the details. And from the beginning. All right, George. And how did you know we would find Lefty Miller here in your cafe? Well, Sam, I just figured. When I heard Mr. and Mrs. Temple's voices on the earphones in Lefty's room, I knew he'd been listening in on them. Hmm. Maybe first as a gag, but... He was the only one besides the Temples who could have known who they'd sold fire insurance to. So he was the one who had gotten the owners to agree to let him fix up the accidental fires. Exactly. He convinced them that he could do the job, and when they collected the insurance money, all he wanted was a percentage of the profits. Hmm. Jordan, how did you figure out he did it? Well, first of all, Lefty was an electrician. Fixed radios. He also had invented a combination screwdriver and solder. Jordan, wire. keep it simple. Oh, I will, Sam. He went to those places and did a little work on a light switch. A couple of drops of solder in the right place. Then he put a penny behind the fuse to keep it from burning out when the short developed. All the owner had to do was to turn out the lights, lock up the joint, go someplace where he'd have a perfect alibi. Mm -hmm. After a while, the short would develop and the penny behind the fuse kept it from burning out. And there you have it. Fire. Cause unknown. Mm. Well, you still haven't told me why you knew he would be here at the tambourine. Oh, it's the pattern, Sam. Lefty's sparring partner, Benny, must have caught on to him. So after Lefty knocked Benny out, he fixed the light switch in the dressing room, put the penny behind the fuse, turned off the lights, closed the door, and left. Perfect alibi. But the tambourine, George. Well, that follows, Sam. He fixed the light switch in my bedroom. I'd come in and figure I'd forgotten to turn the light off. Finally, I'd turn it off and go to bed. Then when I was asleep, the short would develop. No tambourine, no Jordan. Up in flames. Up in flames? Hmm. You don't miss a bet, do you, Jordan? 
I wondered what you were doing in Gos Gimnick's back room tonight. <laughs> Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was produced, written, and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Whistler's strange story. Murder at Twin Pines. From the porch of the old gray house on the hill, Victoria Crane peered through the low morning haze that hovered over the lake, watched the boats move slowly back and forth across the water. Then her eyes swept past the tiny village of Twin Pines, nestled on the lakefront, came to rest on the figure of a man standing on the boat dock. For several minutes, she watched Sheriff Tilson, saw him as he tapped the ashes from his pipe and returned it to his mouth. Then, thrusting his hands into his pockets, he started up the path toward her. Somewhat nervously, Victoria's gaze shifted to the lake again, then back to the approaching figure. Presently, she heard the door behind her close, and her sister Meg came out onto the porch. Good morning, Dick. Oh, Meg. Sleep well? Mm Mm-hmm. Like an infant. Oh, goodness, looks like we're going to have another nice day. Mm, yes, it does. Vic? Mm-hmm? What's going on at the lake? What are all those boats doing out there? They're dragging the lake, dear. Dragging the lake? What for? They think they'll find a body. What? A woman. Cher thinks she may have been murdered. Oh, how horrible. But what makes him think that? Well, night before last, several people heard shots from somewhere out on the lake. Then yesterday, a rowboat was found drifting along the North Shore. Is that all they have to go on? No. This morning, some boys found a woman's scarf in the reeds near the boat dock. Vic, do they have any idea who the woman is? No. You had your breakfast, dear? Uh, Yeah. Yes, I've had breakfast. Meg, you know, I've been thinking about that dress material we saw yesterday. I do believe we could get much better if we went up to San Francisco this week and... Meg? Uh, what? Aren't you listening to me, Meg? Oh, I'm sorry, Vic. I was... Hello there. Oh, good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, Victoria. Meg? Good morning. Find the body yet, Sheriff? What? Well, you might know the news is all over the village. I heard about it two hours ago. Find out who the scarf belonged to? The scarf? Oh, it belonged to a young woman who was staying at the lodge. You don't mean Margot Reed, do you? Uh-huh. Know her? I know of her. You know how people talk. We don't often have strangers here in Twin Pines, and when a glamour girl like Margot Reed shows up, well... I don't suppose you know why she came here, do you? No. No, I don't. Meg. Uh, yes? Any idea where your fiancé is? Oh, no, not exactly. But what are you off with, Ben? Ben Driscoll's newspaper office was closed when I went down there this morning. Oh, well, I, I think he drove up to San Francisco last night on business. I see. Why do you ask? Oh, figured he might be able to give me a line on things. The Reed girl stayed pretty much to herself all the time she was here, except... Except what, Sheriff? Well, I understand she dropped around to see Ben at the newspaper office several times. Ben? She... She went to see Ben? Uh Uh-huh. That's what I want to talk to him about. Maybe he has some idea what she wanted here in Twin Pines. I see. Well, I guess I better get back to the lake. Uh, Mind if I go along with you, Sheriff? No, no, don't mind at all. I won't be long, Dick. What? Oh... Oh, all right, Meg. See you later, Victoria. Margot went to see Ben. 
she went to... Oh, if I'd known. If I'd only known. It's something you hadn't counted on, isn't it, Victoria? A threat. It could ruin everything. That is, if you allowed it to. But you've faced worse situations before. Bluffed them through with your cleverness. But even now, in spite of what's happened, you're confident that somehow you'll find a way out. You sit there staring out over the lake and wonder how much Margot told Ben Driscoll. And if your sister's fiancé now knows the secret you once shared with Margot Reed. The secret you thought would be yours alone after her death. There's nothing you can do now but wait. Wait for Ben to return. And then finally, late that afternoon, you hear a car pull into the driveway. You hurry outside, see Ben get out of his car. He stands there for a moment, looking down at the lake, a puzzled frown on his face. Hello, Ben. Hmm? Oh, hello, Vic. So what's going on down there? They're dragging the lake. What? You mean they're looking for a... Yes, there's been a murder. So the sheriff says. Well, how do you like that? First time I leave Twin Pines in over a year and a murder takes place. Say, I better get down Ben, wait. Hmm? They think it's Margot Reed. Margot? Margot Reed? The sheriff wants to talk to you, Ben. He thinks you might be able to tell him what she was doing here in Twin Pines. No one else seems to know. But, Vic, I... What's the matter, Ben? Nothing. I... I think I'd better go. Ben, wait. Do you know what Margot Reed was doing here? Did she tell you? Ben, Ben. Oh, hey, hello, darling. Did you just get back? Yeah. You heard what's happened? Yeah, Vic was just telling me about it. <laughs> I was saying, fine newspaper man I am. Biggest story we've had around here in years, and I have to be out of town. You haven't seen the sheriff yet? No, no. I'm on my way now. Will you be back? Yeah, later. I have a number of things to do at the office. I'll call you, darling. Bye. Hello? Hello. Vic. Yes, Ben. Did Meg there? No, she went out right after supper. I don't expect her back for another hour or so. Can I come over right away? Well, of course. Did you talk to the sheriff? Yes, I... I'd like to see you about that, Vic. I'd like to talk to you. Alone. It's turned out just as you feared it would, hasn't it, Victoria? You're certain Ben knows something. Perhaps that you're the reason why Margot Reed came to Twin Pines. Yes, somehow you can't believe she's told him everything, can you? That doesn't sound like Margot. You're sure that she wouldn't admit blackmail to a perfect stranger. And so you wait anxiously for Ben to arrive and stare out the window. Watch the small boats as they move back and forth across the water... Searching for the missing Margot Reed. A quarter of an hour later, you're sitting in the library facing Ben. I... I hardly know where to begin, Vic. You know why Margot Reed came here, don't you? Yeah, of course. But I I didn't tell the sheriff. Perhaps I should have. I don't know. They'll, They'll find out sooner or later. Will they? I'm telling you this, Vic, because I know I can trust you. You've got to talk to somebody about it. You see... Margot and I were married once. What? Yeah. We called it quits five years ago, divorce. Shortly after that, I came here to Twin Pines, bought the paper. I lost track of her completely until a month ago. I got a letter from Margot. Oh, Vic, don't look at me like that. I know I should have told Meg, but... So Margot Reed came here to see you. Yeah, she said the divorce was a mistake. She wanted us to... Well, of course, I told her it was no use, but she stayed around the village anyway. And then... The day before yesterday, she came into the office. 
She was excited about something. Oh? Said she'd accidentally run into someone here. An old friend. Did she... Did she tell you who it was? No. No, I think she was about to, but Eddie walked into the office then. Eddie? Yeah, Eddie Farrell, my assistant at the paper. And that's something else, Vic. Eddie overheard Margot say she'd see me that night. I'm sure he did. Did you see her? No. No, I waited for her at my cottage, but she didn't show up. That must have been the night she... Oh, Vic, I pulled a stupid stunt. I should have told the sheriff the whole truth. Well, it's too late now, Ben. It, it would only make matters worse. If I were you, I'd leave things just as they are. There's a chance they'll never find out. Yeah, but suppose Eddie tells him I had a date to see Margot that night, and suppose the sheriff starts to investigate Margot's past. Then, uh, then listen to me. I don't know why everyone's getting so excited. What proof is there that the girl's actually dead? She could have suddenly decided to run up to the city for some reason or other. Well... Then I think it's best not to think about it anymore. Try to put it out of your mind. I, for one, will believe Margot Reed is dead when I see them drag her up from the lake. And I don't think they ever will, Ben. I don't think they ever will. That you, Meg? Yes. Did Ben call while I was out? He stopped in for a moment. Had to dash back to the paper. Said he'd call you in the morning. Oh, I see. Oh, by the way, Meg, I think I'll drive up to San Francisco in the morning. Want to come along? No, no, thanks. I'd rather not. Uh, you going to see about the dress material? Mm, yes. There's something else I have to take care of, too. <laughs> And it's an important matter, isn't it, Victoria? The idea occurred to you while Ben was talking about his marriage to Margot Reed. You don't want to do this to Ben, your own sister's fiancé, do you? But you're sure Meg will eventually get over it. And it's the only way to protect yourself. The perfect opportunity to produce a suspect for Sheriff Tilson. Prevent him from digging too deeply into Margot's past, her connection with you. The following morning, you drive up to San Francisco... Your first step is to inform one of the city's newspapers of a new development in the Twin Pines murder, that a prominent citizen of Twin Pines is withholding information from the sheriff. City editor. I have some information for you about the murder of Twin Pines. Who is this? My name isn't important. Now listen. A girl named Margot Reed has been murdered. I know about that. Well, here's something you don't know. Neither does the sheriff of Twin Pines. Margot Reed was once married to Ben Driscoll. He's the editor of the local paper. That's so? Look, where Check you... it yourself. It should be a big story. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You step out of the phone booth, a smile on your lips. It's done, isn't it, Victoria? You've made the first move, and now it's up to the newspaper, to some bright, eager reporter to follow through. Early that same evening, you return to Twin Pines to the house on the lake. As you step inside the door, Meg rushes out of the library into your arms. Oh, Meg. Oh, now, here, here. Well, now, what's all this? Oh, it's Ben. The sheriff's holding him for questioning. He's in jail. What? They, they came for him this afternoon while I was with Ben at the paper. There was an, a man with the sheriff, a, a reporter from a San Francisco newspaper... I don't know how he found out, but... Oh, Vic, Margot was Ben's wife. Ben admitted it. He said he was glad the truth was out. Do... Do they think he killed her? Oh, the sheriff didn't say, but I'm sure that's what he thinks. That's what they all think. But he couldn't have killed her. You don't think he did, do you, Vic? Of course not. I'm sure he didn't kill her. You're pleased with the way things have turned out, aren't you, Victoria? Yes. And you'll find it difficult to hold back a smile, even as you try to comfort your sister, Meg. Your trip to the San Francisco newspaper paid off as you knew it would, and you congratulate yourself. But scarcely half an hour later, your joy turns to bitter disappointment and sudden fear. The doorbell rings, and as you answer it... Ben! Hello, Vic. Why, Ben, I... I, I heard about what happened. It's all right, Vic. The sheriff, let me go. Well, 
That's fine. I told him the whole story. I guess it sounded all right to him, so here I am. Where's Meg? In the library. Come on in, Ben. Yeah, I'd like to see her. I have a lot of explaining to do. You lead Ben into the library to Meg. Sit there as Ben tells her the whole story. His marriage to Margot, the divorce, everything. And then suddenly something he says causes you to stiffen in your chair. Meg looks up quickly. Ben, did you say Margot worked for a Dr. Kingston in Seattle? Yeah, that's right, darling. She was working as a nurse in Seattle at the time we broke up. Dr. Kingston? Vic, that was Uncle Frank's doctor. Was it? Of course. Uh, Uncle Frank? Our father's brother. He'd been an invalid for a long time. Died five years ago in Seattle. He's the one who left us our money. Oh, oh, I see. Uncle Frank had a private nurse, didn't he, Vic? And if Margot worked for Dr. Kingston... Vic, you were at Uncle Frank's when the accident occurred. You wouldn't know if... Why, why, yes, but... The accident? Uncle Frank was killed accidentally, Ben. He he fell down a flight of stairs. Vic, about his nurse... You're mistaken, Meg. I remember the nurse Dr. Kingston had for Uncle Frank. It was not Margot Reed. Are you certain? Quite certain. It's a terrifying moment, isn't it, Victoria? And more than ever, you're aware that there must not be a big involved investigation. They must never find out that Margot Reed was at your uncle's house the night he was killed uh, accidentally. That's when it all began, didn't it? The moment Margot suspected the truth. That you would push the old man down the stairs. Murdered him for the money he would leave to you and your sister Meg. No. There must not be an investigation. Though your first attempt to involve Ben has failed, you're not through yet, are you? Quickly, your mind turns to Eddie, Ben's assistant at the newspaper. And the possibility of using him to frame Ben. On your way down to the village the following day, a plan forms in your mind. Then in front of the coroner's office... What the sheriff is telling the crowd gives you a further advantage. That's right, that's right. The body's been found. Uh, What was it, Sheriff? Drowning? You'll read about it in the papers, Jed. Then it wasn't a drowning. You see, Emily, I... There were several bullet wounds. Margot Reed was murdered. Murdered? Did you find the gun? No, no, we haven't found the gun. Excuse me, Jed, Victoria. I've got to get along now. Now they know, don't they, Victoria? It's murder. And now you can get the gun and plant it in Ben's cottage when the right moment comes along. Yes, the gun must be there when you've finally given the sheriff enough clues to direct him to a murderer. But first, Victoria, you must begin to build a solid case against Ben through his assistant, Eddie Farrell. Morning, Miss Victoria. Hello, Eddie. You hear the news? A couple of the sheriff's boys just dropped in. Oh, so... goodness, did they question you two? Huh? Me? Oh, gosh, no. They only... Co- oh, yes. Yes, they told you she'd been shot. And... Yeah, yeah. I heard, too. I was down there. Oh, that poor girl. Well, I guess they know the kind of person to suspect. Uh, how do you mean? Well, you know. The sort of man who runs around a good deal... Unmarried. Always an eye out for a pretty girl. <laughs> sure, I guess there's a few in this town. But oh, I... oh, Eddie. <laughs> Goodness, you're taking what I have to say to heart. You don't think I'm talking about you. Oh, no. No, I didn't think that. Well, with all the dates you have, it's an advantage. Not something to put you under suspicion. What lucky girl were you out with on that particular night, Eddie? Why, uh... <laughs> Had two dates, probably. Wait. I, I don't think I had any dates. I... What did you say, Eddie? Nothing. Uh, what was it you came in for, Miss Victoria? Let me see. What did I come in for? Oh, yes. Yes, I wondered if you had a copy of last week's paper, Eddie. There was a dress pattern in it I wanted. That all you wanted? Yes. Yes, that's all. Oh, I'm dreadfully sorry, Sheriff. I know how busy you are. If it's something to do with the case, Victoria, it doesn't interrupt. Well, 
It's about Eddie Farrell, Ben's assistant down at the paper. Oh, Sheriff, I really hate to suggest it, but... Go on, go on. It's just between the two of us. Well, he might have been with Margot that night, you know. Might is quite a word. I might have been with her myself. It was his attitude, Sheriff, when we were talking. The way he closed up. <laughs> oh, you're right. Probably nothing. Still, Eddie does have quite a reputation with the girls and... Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, I, I know. I'll have a little talk with Eddie. Nothing can be lost by asking a few questions, huh? <laughs> He's right, isn't he, Victoria? Nothing can be lost by asking a few questions. In fact, you have a lot to gain. Yes. And you've used Eddie Farrow well to point the finger of suspicion at Ben. The proof of that comes late that afternoon, when you overhear yes. Meg on the Please telephone. Listen to me. Don't come back now. You've got to stay where you are. Eddie Farrow has mixed you up in this. Uh, yes, he, he told the sheriff that you had a date with Margot... Oh, I, I know, I know. What? No, please, darling, no. No, no, you mustn't come back here. Not right now. Yeah, all right. But please promise me you'll stay there. Yes. Yeah, yeah I'll call again. Goodbye, darling. Meg. Oh, oh, Vic. Was that Ben you were talking to? Yes, he's up in San Francisco. Oh, Vic, I'm worried. I'm worried sick. What's happened? The sheriff is looking for him again. More questions. What brought this on? Eddie Farrow. The sheriff dropped around to see Eddie this afternoon and... <laughs> oh, what can I do? Oh, no, no, dear. <laughs> Meg. Yes? Meg, you love him very much, don't you? Yes. Very, very much. You must be absolutely sure of yourself. What are you... T You're worried about what you'll have to say if they ever put you on the stand. Well, I couldn't lie. But I couldn't testify against Ben. I couldn't. Well, you wouldn't have to if you were his wife. His wife? The law doesn't expect a wife to testify against her husband. Oh, Vic. Aren't you sure, Meg? Of course I'm sure. But then go to him. You love him, Meg. Go to Reno. Marry him at once. Vic. There's a bus leaving at eight tonight. I'll start packing your things. You better call Ben. Tell him you're coming. Hello? Sheriff Tilson speaking. Sheriff, this is Victoria. Yes? Yeah? Sheriff, I hate to tell you this because it involves my sister. But she must never know. What is it? Ben's hiding out somewhere in San Francisco. She's going to him. Left the house a few minutes ago. She's headed for the village, carrying an overnight bag. They're running off together? Oh, something like that. You'll have to follow her. She'll take you to him. All right, Victoria, and thanks. As you hurry from the house... You tell yourself it's perfect, isn't it, Victoria? Meg is gone now on her way to Ben. She'll talk him into running away, and that's all you need. You know Sheriff Tilson won't let them get very far. All that's necessary now is to take the gun from where you've hidden it and plant it in Ben's cottage. You're certain the murder weapon can't be traced back to you. That when it's found at the cottage, it will definitely implicate him in the murder of Margot Reed. You hurry along the lake shore, keeping well in the shadows, using the darkness to advantage. You have no trouble getting into Ben's cottage. And in the half-darkness of moonlight, you cross the living room, open a closet, and locate one of Ben's old hunting jackets. You're about to place the gun in the pocket when you hear footsteps in the next room. Suddenly, a door opens and the lights go on. Meg! Victoria! You shouldn't have come here, Meg. Why, well, I had to. When I called Ben, he asked me to bring some of his things. I, I've been packing them. But, Meg, you... Vic! What are you doing with that gun? Well, I, I found it here in, in Ben's jacket. Wait a minute, Victoria. You couldn't have. I had searched this place completely just two hours ago. Sheriff Chilson, what are you doing here? Just what you asked me to, following your sister. She asked you to? 
Dick, what does this mean? I think it means Victoria outsmarted herself, Meg, trying to frame Ben. No, that's not true. We'll know more about that when we check this gun with the bullets that killed Margot Reed. I think it'll answer a lot of questions I've had on my mind all day. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. At this time last week, CBS was broadcasting reports of the Kathy Fiscus tragedy direct from San Marino. Because of improvised emergency conditions, communications between our master control room and the CBS newsmen at the scene were severed at 8.30, and we were unable to immediately continue broadcasting from the scene. Because of these conditions, we decided to return to our normal broadcast schedule with the understanding that if an official announcement should be made during the ensuing program, it would be interrupted for the release of the announcement. We regret that we were unable to continue the San Marino broadcast at that moment. This was a decision of the Columbia Broadcasting System and not that of any sponsor. The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. Is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, the Whistler? I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too, tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Sleep, my pretty one. A few months before, Jean would have dismissed the whole idea of having her fortune told as ridiculous. But with marriage to a handsome young doctor just around the corner, things like tea room fortune tellers suddenly seemed important and exciting. So she gave in without argument when her friend Betty suggested they leave their table and visit Madame Zorga in her alcove behind the fringed red curtains in the corner. And as the old woman gazed into her crystal and rambled on, Jean found somehow she was taking it all seriously. A little too seriously. To see. You will be quiet, please. You will concentrate on the crystal with me. Max would be terribly shocked if he knew I was doing this. Shh, Jean. Please, Signorina. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, it is coming. They part now. The clouds part. I I see a number. The number 13. And now, the number 3. It is a date. The 13th day of the third month. March 13th. 
I gaze deeper. Again the crystal clears. And I see the letter J. And now the letter V. Oh, your initials, Jean. J. V. Well, how can you she see? Possibly... I told you. Go on, Madame Zorga. I cannot go on. Oh, but there must be something. I that... have told you. The image fades. The clouds close in. The reading is finished. Is is something wrong? <laughs> Of course there is. Serves me right for falling for this hocus-pocus. It is not hocus-pocus, signorina. If you must know, I will tell you. There is no future for J.V. after the 13th day of March. Why, that's this week. Never mind, Betty. Here you are, Madame Zorga. I better get back to the laboratory. It's late. And, um, don't mention this to Max, will you, dear? If he ever caught me going to fortune tellers, he'd get himself a new lab assistant and a new fiancé. I'm sorry I'm late, darling. I had lunch with Betty. She insisted on a tea room across town. You know how that is. Mm. There. <laughs> miss me, doctor? Yeah, that's a silly question. Of course I miss you, dear. Um, hand me that beaker, will you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been up to my ears around here. Yeah. Uh... Mm. Excuse me. Who's yeah, that? Where'd you pick up the coal? Well, I don't know. I have to do something for it. May I see you a minute, Mitchell? Uh, oh, uh, yes, Dr. Olson. Uh, be with you in a minute, dear. All right. Mitchell, Dr. Davies tells me you want to try your new drug, E37, on one of his encephalitic patients. Yeah, that's right. The man's been in a coma for three weeks. I, I think E-37 can cure him. You think? As head of this institute, I'm afraid I'll have to refuse you my permission. The fact that you injected a bunch of rats with a virus of sleeping sickness... But you don't understand, that... Doctor. Those rats had sleeping sickness with all the symptoms. Double vision, sleepiness, fever. My drug E-37 cured every last one. That doesn't mean it's safe for a human being. I'd hoped you'd remember the last hopeless patient it was tried on. How long did he last, Mitchell? Was it ten seconds or twenty? But I told you I found what was wrong. I've eliminated the toxic factor. Oh, you've eliminated the toxic factor. This institute will not experiment with human lives. I absolutely forbid you giving Davies this drug, and that's final. couldn't help hearing it, Max. The transom was... Yeah. It seems, my love, that my work for the past year has been dedicated to a batch of white rats. There ought to be some way that you... There is. Just one. The drug has got to be proven on a human patient. Olson knows that. For thousands of years, this disease has been killing human beings like dogs. And Olson says we can't afford to take a chance. Well, darling, he's thinking of the Institute. Well, I'm thinking of humanity. There's always a risk. That's how we learn. That's how we progress. That's science. Jean. Yes? Jean, will you help me? Why, of course, darling. I'm going to test my formula. I'm going to make the test and Olsen need never know about it. What kind of a test? On a human subject. But, but who can you... Darling, listen to me. You love me. Yes, Max. You, you trust me. Trust you? You've got to have faith in me, darling. It means everything now. Of course I have faith in you, Max. I have an aunt living outside Spokane. We can drive up there tonight. Well, I don't understand, Max. How can you make a test on a human subject? Who can you Leave that to me, darling. To... I'm going to inject a subject with a virus. Then follow it at the peak of the attack with E-37. It's the only way I can show Olsen. But you haven't told me who you... You said you trusted me, Jean. Did you mean it? Yes, Max. Good. Come on now, let's start packing the equipment. <laughs> Careful with that vial, Jean. It'll take us days to reproduce that drug. Mm, I'm wrapping it in cotton. Excuse me. Uh, uh, there you are, Max. Well, that ought to do it. And you can close up the bag. Now, hold still a moment, dear. Why? What are you... Oh! Just hold still. Ma Max, what, what is this? I'm giving you a shot for that cold of yours. Well... Can't have you sick at a time like this. Oh, uh... I feel a little faint. Yeah, I know. 
It always affects you this way. Eh. That's why I didn't warn you. I don't like injections, Max. Why did you... I told you, dear, it's for your cold. <laughs> You'd better have faith in the doctor, darling. Uh, yes, Max, of course. Good. Feel better now? Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Well, let's go, then. It's a five- or six-hour drive, and I... Well, Max, aren't you going to leave word where we're going? Of course not. I don't want anyone to know where we are or what we're doing until... until it's over. With the prologue of Sleep, My Pretty One, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. I don't have to tell you how automobiles have changed or how driving conditions have changed in recent years. But tonight I want to tell you about an amazing new change in gasoline. A gasoline scientifically engineered to help your car take fullest advantage of today's driving conditions. It's new Signal Ethyl the new motor fuel that's so vastly improved, so superior in every way, you can actually feel the difference. Because today's traffic is heavier, new signal ethyl is engineered to let you inch along smoothly at a snail's pace without bucking. Because stop signs are everywhere today, new signal ethyl is engineered to give you eager, flashing pickup when you get the go signal. Because today's highways are broader, smoother, swifter... New Signal Ethel has wonderful new power that makes the miles fairly fly by. And because many of today's motors have higher compression, New Signal Ethel has higher anti-knock to make hill climbing a pleasure. To actually feel this difference in your own car, just try a tank full of New Signal Ethel. See if you don't agree with the delighted drivers who are saying New Signal Ethel is tops. The decision is made, isn't it, Jean? And you're on your way now to the little farmhouse near Spokane, where it will be decided, rules or no rules, whether the contents of the cotton-wrapped vial in Max's valise are a life-saving drug or a deadly poison. You want to help Max now when he needs you most. But as you guide the car north through the chill March night, you can't help feeling uneasy as if something is terribly wrong. And in spite of your belief in Max, you wonder how far he'd go to prove his cure. And you find yourself thinking about the shot for your cold that Max gave you. You glance sidewise at him at the solid set of his jaw. Wonder who the human subject is he's so vague about. His almost fanatic zeal for his work. His determination that science must come before all else. What's the matter, dear? You're... You're sure you're quite right in this? Huh? Well, I mean, if Dr. Olson were to find out, you'd lose your position. If I succeed, Olson won't matter much. I'll have offers from every institute in the country. And if you fail? You'll matter less. Oh, Look Max, out! Max, Good I... Lord, Jean, watch the road. I don't know, Max. I... Well, what's the matter? But that car for a moment, I... I thought I saw two of them. Careful now, the road's pretty narrow. I can see, thank you. Oh, there's a house up ahead. I'm glad the snow held off. We're in for a late blizzard. Well, there we are. There's the old pump house. The apple tree. Oh, oh watch it. There's an old stump on the right. Uh, if you don't mind, Max, I've just driven over 200 miles of slippery road safely. I think I can handle a country lane without advice. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Max. I... I don't know what's the matter with me. I just don't feel like myself. Well, well, this must be Jean. How do you do? Come in, come in. I declare, Max, you got mighty good taste. Well, thank you. Now, don't bother. She can't hear you, Jean. What? She's stone deaf. Best just let her go on her way. She will anyway. Oh, I see. Come on to the kitchen. Got to get this stuff on ice. 
glad we're warm and together. I said, Josie. No. You're just tired, dear. I guess so. Oh, here we are. Same old icebox. Yeah, have to clear a place here at the back for the vials. You got a match? Right here. Max, uh, I don't like to keep asking this, but... Yeah? What is it? Where do you expect to find anyone with sleeping sickness around here? I don't. What? Very simple. If there are no cases of encephalitis at my disposal, there's only one answer. To create one. Max. To inject the subject with the virus. Then after a good case is developed, use E37. But we're, we're completely isolated here. Where can you find... I've already found the subject, Jean. Max! Jean, look what you've done. Oh, it slipped. I'm sorry. I... Why did it have to be this one? E37. Jean, the cure, my cure. Every bit of it was in that vial. Max, listen to me. Maybe it's better this way. Maybe, maybe you better forget about E37 and, and treat the patient in the ordinary way. There must be a hospital somewhere, Max. Don't be ridiculous. My E37 is our only chance. I injected 20,000 units of sleeping sickness virus... Fatal dose. Yes, a fatal dose. We've got to start working on another batch of E-37 right now. Come on. You follow Max down the dim old hallway in a daze like a figure in a nightmare. The kind where you run slowly as if through water trying to escape while nameless shapes come closer and closer. And though you still refuse to believe to recognize it, one of the shapes is fear. Yes, the fear that Max might be using you as the subject in this dangerous experiment. What? Here we are. Why, it's a laboratory. It used to be Aunt Agnes's pantry. It turned into a lab for me when I was a boy. But, Max, this, this is nothing like your laboratory in town. How can you expect to synthesize? Sure, it's crude, but it's all we've got. Between what I brought and what's here, we can duplicate E-37. With a little luck. How tired are you, Jean? I'm all right. Once we start the process, we can't let up for a second. Come on. Let's get to work. And so it begins, Jean. It's midnight when the two of you have straightened out the dusty laboratory, cleaned the glassware, the retorts, and Bunsen burners. Three in the morning when the first solution is ready to run. Once more, you're sure your fears are groundless. Max loves you. He wouldn't think of using you, risking your life for this experiment. Make a note of the time, will you, darling? Right. March 10th. 5.20 a.m. First solution completed. 100 feet. Feet. Max. What's the matter? <laughs> My eyes. I can't seem to focus. I'm seeing double. Sit down. Rest a moment. You'll be all right. March 11th. 10.15 a.m. Fourth distillate, just coming off. It's March 12th, dear. You've lost a day somewhere. Of course. I don't seem to be conscious of time anymore. <laughs> if I ever get through this, I'm going to build a monument to black coffee. Hasn't any effect on me anymore. And what time is it now? 4 p.m.? Yeah, 26 hours since we ran that solution. Ought to be right by now. Got the beaker ready? Yes. Here, Max, it's sterilized. Steady. Hmm? Oh, your hand's shaking like a leaf. <laughs> Can't see the control. Yes, I guess I'm pretty tense, too. Yeah, equipment's obsolete. It's a gamble any way you look at it. But we've got a good chance. You've never been afraid of taking chances, have you, Max? Why do you say that? Even if it meant gambling with our happiness, your work would come first. Science comes before everything, doesn't it, Max? Well, that's not a fair question. I think it's appropriate right now. 
What do you mean? Max, I love you. I'll always love you no matter what happens. I want you to know that. Jean, this is no time. There's still time to drop this crazy business. There's still time to give the patient one of the standard treatments. What are you I... talking about? Max, let me call Dr. Olsen, please. Oh. I see. You're giving up. Huh? It's not that, Max. Well, I'm no, not giving I... up. We're going through with this. My experiment successful. I want to know my cure alone is responsible. And if not... Go on, Max. What if it isn't? And I'll just have to face the music. I see. Where are you going? To get some more coffee. You're glad the telephone's at the other end of the house. That you'll have a chance to get the call through to Dr. Olson before Max has a chance to stop you. You wait for the operator to answer, trying to fit the words together in a way that will tell Olson the story without going too hard on Max. There's no other explanation, is there, Jean? The dull pain in the back of your head, the nervous disturbance, the deadly fatigue, the double vision can only mean one thing. There's little doubt in your mind now. Max's Aunt Agnes is obviously all right. So you're almost certain Max has used you as a human guinea pig. His belief in the effectiveness of his drug has won over his love for you. Jean, good morning. You're not trying to make a phone call, are you? The line's been down for hours. Count of the storm. Oh, no. oh, you look all worn out, child. No wonder the way you two are working. Listen to me, Alex. You better get to the rest, me, child. I've never seen such dark circles under anybody's eyes. Oh, Miss I... Listen. What's the matter, child? Why are you shaking me like that? I'll write a note to paper and pencil by the telephone. Now watch. And Agnes, watch. Well, what you writing? Huh? Oh. Max trying dangerous experiment. Stop him. It's life and death. Stop My him. life My and death. Land. Do you now, understand it's life that? life and death. I wouldn't dream of such a thing. Ain't ever interfered with his doings, not even after time he and I blew off the side of the Please, barn. Please, it means a life. Rest My life and Agnes. Rest him for one thing or another, but not me. That's science, you know. Max says that's the way we learn. Jean, Wait. Now that you feel sure Max is experimenting with you, you run blindly out of the house, down the snow-covered path to the shed where you left the car. There's only one way now, Jean. You've got to get to a hospital, a doctor. You've got to get away from Max once and for all. And as you fumble for the car keys, the nightmare you've lived through for the past few days comes back in a rush. I'll inject the subject with the virus. And after a good case is developed, use E-37. How long did the patient last, Mitchell? Was it ten seconds or twenty? Oh, Sylvia, I'm giving you a shot for that cold of yours. That car, I saw two of them. Double vision, sleepiness, fever. There is no future for J.B. after the 13th day of March. No future, no future. <laughs> Why don't you stop? Please. Jean. Look. What on earth are you doing out here? Where do you think you're going? I thought if I could reach Dr. Olson, I wanted to get someone, some help. There's no help outside. Only here. Where's the oxalate? Uh, on the top shelf of the cupboard. Yeah, I looked there. You'd better come and show me. All right, Max. I'll come. What time is it, Jean? About nine. Is the hypodermic in the sterilizer? No. Well, put it in. Put it in. We're almost ready. Injected Monday, March 10th. Disease approaches critical state. Yeah, pretty close. Better make the final entry, Jean. Or next to final. While I finish here. All right. Ready now? 
Yes, Max. Preparing to administer anti-encephalitic bulk drug E37 to subject. Work commenced on drug at 1 a.m. March 10th. Completed at 9 p.m. March 12th. Your hand trembles as you write. As you watch Max rise, walk slowly to the sterilizer, lift the lid and remove the hypodermic. There is no future for J.V. after the 13th day of March. You fight it out of your mind. Struggle against the fear that grips you as Max turns, hypodermic in hand. Everything begins to waver before your eyes. You drop the journal. It'll be over in a minute, Jean. You see, I... I simply put the needle in the solution. Release the plunger. No! No, Max. Please. Jean! The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. In spring, most folks think of house cleaning. But because one can't see the inside of his automobile engine, few drivers realize that they get dirty, too, and may need cleaning. In fact, that's one of the reasons Signal brought out Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil, the improved type lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with scientific compounds. While you drive, one of the compounds in Signal Premium actually cleanses the inside of your motor of harmful carbon, gum, and varnish. Meantime, another compound in Signal Premium is on guard against destructive corrosion. And still other compounds are busy doing jobs which regular oil alone cannot do. That's why we call Signal Premium the motor oil that does so much more than just lubricate. And it's why drivers who want to keep their motors young are switching to Signal service stations. Switching to Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. It wasn't too much, was it, Gene? The sight of Max standing there before you, the hypodermic in his hand, ready to administer the anti-encephalitic drug to his subject. And as you collapse, as darkness closed in around you, you realize that what you'd suspected all along was true, that you were the subject in his experiment that Max was gambling with your life. Gradually, as you regain consciousness, you become aware of the room you're in, a pretty bright room with organdy curtains. The sun is pouring in now, and suddenly you realize it's afternoon sun. I think she's coming around. Did you say something, Max? Uh, never mind uh, that, Agnes. It... Uh, well, it's about time, young lady. Max! You slept the clock around, darling. It's after three. Max, it's all over. Yes, it's all over. You're all right. Oh, there's the doorbell, Aunt Agnes. What's that? Doorbell. Doorbell. Oh, doorbell. I expect it's the judge. I'll sit him down in the parlor. Good. I uh, told the judge to drop by on his way home from town, dear. Thought we might make an appointment. That is, if you don't mind changing your name on an unlucky day like the 13th. Change my name? My initials on... Unless you'd rather... No, it's... Max, you haven't told me what happened. What did you do? Well, if you hadn't fainted when you did, you'd have seen. Within an hour after I took that injection, I was feeling better. And eight hours later, there wasn't a trace of sleeping sickness in my blood. Max, darling. Uh, darling. Well, that's science, darling. You risk a little to gain a lot. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own.
Featured in tonight's story were Betty Lou Gerson and Willard Waterman. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with story by Ruth Bourne, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. John, this is Harry Branson of Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Well, hi, Harry. What is it this time? Fraud, murder, arson? No, no, none of them. Then what kind of a case has you in a dither this morning? As a matter of fact, John, there is no case. Oh, now, don't tell me you're spending company money on just a social call. Why, Harry? Of course not. John, I wish you to take a motor trip with one of our very important clients. Well, now, that depends. Perhaps you've heard of her. Betty Charlene Winters. Uh, no, but she sounds interesting. She is. She's one of the most charming people. Very wealthy, too. John, you'll love her. Oh, tell me more. I want you to accompany her to her summer place on Lake Wawayande in northern New Jersey. Sounds better all the time. On expense account, of course, plus a fee of $1,000 for the week or any fraction thereof. How can I lose? Harry, I'll grab the first train. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wayward widow matter. Expense account item 12150, fare and incidentals, Hartford to Philadelphia. At his office on Walnut Street, Harry Branson looked as though he'd been just sitting there waiting for me ever since his phone call. I'll get straight to the point, John. Well, good, good. You uh, don't mind if I sit down first, though, do you? Oh, no, no, of course not. Ah. As I told you on the telephone, Mrs. Winters is one of our... Mrs.? Mostly... You didn't tell me that. Her husband died just a short time ago. Oh, oh. And you, the old friend of the family, have been consoling the lovely widow, eh? John. Yeah, when you pick him, you really pick him, Harry. Hey, do you remember that little brunette you went for in the last case I handled with you? John, that has nothing whatsoever to do with the matter at hand. Yeah, okay, maybe not. Oh, but you sly dog. I'm betting right now you wish you could make this trip to the lake instead of me. Of course I do. The beautiful forests and mountains up there at this time of the year. Oh, sure. Just for the scenery. All right, now tell me all. Well, the Winters were very wealthy. Betty Charlene Winters still is. Thanks, among other things, to the half million dollars she received on her late husband's double indemnity policy. Half a million? You make this sound more attractive every minute. John, will you... You don't suppose the gorgeous babe helped him have an accident in order to collect that? John, you are being absurd. Am I? Tell me this. Was he older than she? Yes, he was. Uh Uh-huh. And two and two make four. And you are making no sense at all. Hey, you have got a case on her, haven't you? Will you please stop this nonsense and listen to me? Now, as I started to say, their lovely home is out between Ardmore and Bryn Mawr. All right, go on. Their home, which Mr. Winters inherited from his father and his grandfather before him, is a veritable art gallery. I see. But she is going to dispose of most of it to the better-known museums and galleries. She plans to sell the family mansion, too, just as soon as the estate is settled. Doesn't go for the old stuff, huh? You're quite right. Her taste is uh, more for the modern. Uh, That's the way I like them. Uh, I beg your pardon? Mm, Nothing. Go on, Harry. Uh, Yes, some of the things, however, she is taking up to the summer home on Lake Wawayanda. Oh, well, now, wait a minute, Harry. Am I taking Betty Charlene up Mrs. there? Mrs. Winters, John, please. Okay, I'll stay out of your territory for the time being. But am I being hired to take her up to the lake or just some of this junk you've been talking about? Both. Ah. Oh. 
You see, there's one thing in particular, some statue or other, that she wants help with. Statue? So you and she and the statue will make the trip. Now, that's the kind of chaperone I like. When do we start? I must confess it's quite a relief to get out of that office for a while. Oh, don't try to kid me, Harry. The only reason you wouldn't let me find my own way out to this winter babe's home. Babe? Honestly, John, you sometimes carry this levity much too far. By the way, how long ago did her husband die? About, um, four months ago. Oh, brother, you don't even wait for the ashes to get cold, do you? John, I tell you that... What did he die of? Well, that, uh, it was an accident. Yeah? In the car during a little trip that they were making south of here. He'd taken over the wheel from the chauffeur. They struck the abutment of a bridge over a tidal creek leading out to Delaware Bay. Oh. He was thrown out, and his body was carried into the bay. It was never recovered. And so our tasty little dish was left with a quarter million life insurance, a huge estate... John, I simply will not listen to any more of this sort of nonsense. Besides, this is the driveway up to the house. Ah, lovely place, isn't it? It was lovely. There must have been over an acre of perfectly tended lawns and gardens. And in the middle, atop a slight rise, was the main house, built of solid white stone of some sort. Old, too, but in beautiful condition. This was wealth, all right, and plenty of it. Harry's year-old car looked almost tawdry in this setting. We stopped, went up the broad front steps and across a wide porch and rang the doorbell. Yes? Oh, Mr. Branson. That's right. Uh, Mrs. Winters is waiting for you in the sunroom. Thank you. Come, John. The butler led us through a large reception room, a huge living room. Both of them hung with beautiful prints and paintings. Through the walnut panel library with its high ceiling and hundreds of leather-bound books. Finally, after passing through a long corridor lined with statues and magnificent vases, we entered the spacious sunroom. There, standing in front of a chair at the window, was a chauffeur. And in the chair sat Betty Charlene Winters. Mrs. Winters, may I present special investigator John Dollar. <laughs> Well, she was a cute little thing, that I will say. But instead of a young, blonde, and beautiful, well, let's face it, she was 70 if she was a day. All my dreams of a high old time during a week at a mountain lake suddenly vanished into thin air. How nice of you to come, Mr. Dollar. Investigator, did you say, Mr. Branson? Yes. I see. Well, don't you stand there, sit down, and be comfortable, both of you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's... Something wrong, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, no, uh, not at all. Oh, Haskins, here's my chauffeur and general handyman. Hi, Haskins. Mr. Dollar? I've just asked him to get the statue ready for our little trip. Oh, you may go now, Haskins. Oh, thank you, madame. Uh, no, wait, please. I, uh, I wonder if I might see this thing we're taking up to the lake, Mrs. Winters. Well, of course, it's right there in the corner behind you, Mr. Dollar. The cherub. Cherub, huh? Oh, I... This... Isn't it beautiful? Well, it was a cherub, all right, uh, about four feet high with a couple of doves fluttering around its feet. At least that's what I gathered from the garish paint on it. Believe me, it looked like something a third grader had slapped together as a joke on his modeling class. Now, I'm no artist, but so help me, I could have done better myself with a handful of mud and with my eyes closed. No family peak, Mr. Dollar. And peak. I started to say what I was thinking, but then Haskins lifted the atrocity off its pedestal and left with it. Haskins has made a special box for it. He'll place it in the car so we can leave with it tomorrow. You are ready to leave on such short notice, aren't you, Mr. Dollar? Well, uh, now look, Mrs. Winters, yes, I... Uh... Yes, his luggage is right outside in my car, Mrs. Winters. Then, Eric, you may fetch it and put it in one of the guest rooms. Uh, very good, madam. By the way, I hope you know how to drive a Pierce Arrow, Mr. Dollar. Pierce? Or did you think perhaps Haskins would drive us up to the lake? Well, I, I don't know. No. Haskins is leaving today on his vacation. And I wonder if he will come back. Why do you say that, Mrs. Winters? Oh, I've been having some trouble with him. Oh? I thought you were always eminently satisfied with Haskins. Until recently. Until the death of my husband. He's been... Well, if he doesn't come back, I shall have to replace him. But now, Mr. Branson... Yes? You're a bit of a rascal. You didn't tell me you were bringing a detective to go along with me. 
investigator, Mrs. Winters. Insurance investigator. Since the company wouldn't permit me to issue any special insurance on that... that thing... But I thought you were going to bring me just some straw. Well, bodyguard. I have known John for many years, Mrs. Winters, and I assure you... Oh, now, don't apologize. I think this is fine. I just hadn't expected so much. Such a nice, good-looking young... But now come, Mr. Dollar, and I'll show you the rest of the house. We spent the next hour or so on a tour of the place. And Mrs. Winters pointed out the various works of art destined for specific museums and galleries all over the country after she moved out, after the estate was settled. Then Eric caught up with us and announced that Haskins had created the statue and placed it in the car. You know, I was curious about that car, so we went out to the garage and inspected it. It was a Pierce Arrow, all right. Vintage of 1928, complete with headlights on top of the fenders and as bright and shiny as the day was made. When I tried the starter, it purred like a contented kitten. Uh, with a bass voice, that is. Along about five o'clock, Mrs. Winters, with a sparkle in her eye, announced it was cocktail time. Harry, being a teetotaler, decided to leave, but not before I buttonholed him for a quick conference. What doesn't make sense, John? Oh, that silly statue, Harry. All the fuss over that piece of junk. After all, John, with all the big policies she carries with us on the legitimate artwork, well, we just can't afford to displease her. But if it had any real value... Perhaps it does to her. How can it? Unless she has a lot of jewelry hidden away in the base of it or something. Hmm. What, John? A cocktail, she said. And I'm sure ready for him. Go on back to Philly, Harry, and wait for my final report. Well, I must admit that Betty Charlene Winters turned out to be a charming hostess, a very interesting conversationalist. Even long after dinner, over brandy and cigarettes, we chattered away like a couple of magpies. I didn't question her about the statue because I wanted to find out more about it on my own hook. Finally, about midnight, we decided to retire, had a nightcap, and went to our respective room. But instead of going to bed, I sat around and read for a few minutes, turned off the light, waited a few minutes more. Then, quietly, I slipped out of my room. That was a mistake. For as I reached the end of the long hall to the stairway, a door behind me suddenly opened. Huh? Who's there? I said, who's... Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. With the bigger, more impressive kaleidoscopic change of events on the world scene today, we sometimes forget the smaller kaleidoscope, the child's toy, with its ever-changing designs and color. The kaleidoscope is a fantastic experience for any child. That is, any child who can see. But one of those children who cannot experience the ecstatic pleasures of form and color in the ever-changing world about them... This problem has bothered many, and many such people have tried to solve it. One-time soldier in the United States Army, Robert Neiman, is one of them. Captain Kenneth Moyer, also of the Army, is another. Both men, while stationed in Japan recently, set about the task of raising funds for the purpose of providing eye examinations and operations for sightless Japanese children. In return for this gesture, Japanese eye surgeons did not charge for their services. For those children who could not be cured, Braille typewriters were purchased and donated for training purposes in the hope of giving a few more people useful lives. Both Neiman and Moyer worked independently of each other. Neither knew of the other's interest in such a gratifying project. Both have continued the work with enthusiasm. The results of their efforts, when a blind child sees again or perhaps for the first time, that is their reward. For a child... As for an adult, new sight leads to understanding. And understanding is a building block of freedom. The right of all men, everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Wayward Widow Matter. When I came to, it was morning. And I found myself in my pajamas lying comfortably in my bed in the guest room. But there was nothing comfortable about the lump on the back of my head. Whoever had slugged me out there in the hall had meant business. I got up painfully, went down the hall, and made a quick check of the room from which the attacker had surprised me. It was just another guest room. 
I showered, dressed, and went downstairs, where I found Mrs. Winters at the breakfast table. She was very much distressed over what had happened and suggested we go out and look in the trunk of the car immediately. There now. Do you see, Mr. Dollar, the box with the statue in it hasn't been touched. I don't understand it. Where is your chauffeur, Mrs. Winters? Why, Haskins left on his vacation last evening. I thought I told you. But surely you don't think Haskins... Well, you said you were having trouble with him. Maybe we'd better open that box to make sure oh, that... but it hasn't been touched. And I'm the only one who has a key to that little lock on it. Yeah, I see. But now it's pretty logical to assume that whoever slugged me last night was interested in... Hey, Mrs. Winters, how long has Eric, your butler, been with you? Why, Eric, the dear boy, has been with me for nearly 30 years. But good heavens, you surely don't suspect him of anything like this. He's a very fine person, Mr. Dollar, and a perfect gentleman. Oh, certainly more of a gentleman than my late husband ever was, in spite of his money. Oh? I must confess that although his death was a terrible shock, I... Well, life has been a great deal easier for me since he passed away. Just how do you mean that, Mrs. Winters? No, well, why talk about it? Something that... Oh. No, oh, why not talk about it? I married Charles for his money, Mr. Dollar. I'd never got any further than the front line of the chorus until he came along. Would you believe that I was a chorus girl? Well, as a matter of... And the wealth and the luxury that he could give me was very attractive. was very satisfying for a long, long time. But for the past 10 or 15 years, maybe more, he insisted that we just stay penned up in this musty old museum he called a home. And what happened? Well, all our friends were traveling around the world, seeing new places and new people. We just sat here looking at four walls and at each other. Except for a couple of blessed months up at the lake. You love the place up there, Mr. Dollar. It's new and fresh and modern. I had it built over his protest. People, young people came to see us, and it was such a relief from a... Oh, well, I'm sorry. This must be so boring for you to hear. Not at all. Now, look. Why don't we call the police in about this thing that has happened to you? Come, we'll go right back into the house and... Wait a minute, call... wait a minute. No, let's not. A bunch of policemen prowling around would scare him off, whoever he is. But suppose you're attacked again. Well, at least I'm ready for it now. I just don't like your taking this chance. Of course, we could leave. Go up to the lake. Run away from him? Well, yes. Oh. Of course, it might prove whether he's interested in the statue. If he follows us, I mean. Oh, dear. Why don't you let me call the police? Only if you think they ought to be around here to protect the house while we're gone. No, no, that isn't necessary. We have a very efficient burglar alarm system. Well, it doesn't look as though it was working very well last night, does it? Unless it was someone in the house who attacked me. Who else is there besides you and Eric? No one, except the cook. Male or female? Oh, no, no, Mr. Dollar, not Martha. Why, the poor dear is nearly as old as I am. And a real companion for me. Sounds strange, I know. But we're real nice friends. All right, let's go back in, have our breakfast, pack our things, and go on up to the lake. Eric, who served the breakfast and whom I hadn't seen since dinner last evening, kept giving me a rather strange look. And as soon as breakfast was over, I quickly stuffed my things into my handbag and headed down to the garage. Eric was waiting for me there. He insisted that he put my things into the trunk of the car, which killed any chance I might have had to pry open the box with a statue. I started to question him about the night before. But as it turned out, my questions were quite unnecessary. Uh, yes, Mr. Dollar, it was I who carried you back to your room and put you to bed. Oh? You see, I was making a final inspection of the house, as I always do after everyone else has retired. I'm always concerned about the many valuable things we have. I don't blame you. Well, I was on my way up the main staircase when I heard you fall. I was slugged. Uh, forgive me, sir, but uh, when I found you there at the head of the stairs, I thought your condition was due to... Uh, you must pardon me, sir, but it was due perhaps to having imbibed too much brandy after dinner? Not a bit of it. Somebody barged out of that guest room and struck me from behind. But I saw no sign of anyone else about. You're sure? Most certain, sir. Was this fancy burglar alarm system you have turned on? Yes, sir. 
Well, then, whoever did it either stayed in the house until this morning or knew the place well enough to get out without setting off the alarm. But I don't see how that would be... Have you called the police, sir? No, and we're not going to. Mrs. Winters and I are leaving for the lake just as quickly as possible. Uh, but don't you think this is sufficiently serious to warrant... Don't forget one thing, Eric. It was pretty dark in that hall. The attack might have been intended for you. Good heavens. But why, sir? I don't know. Oh, dear. Oh, there you are. Eric, you may fetch my bags from my room. On Mr. Dollar and I planned the trip. Uh, very well, madam. Oh, you don't know how glad I'll be to get there. It's such a relief from this place. And all the things associated with it... I'll be so glad when Charles' estate is settled and I can sell this old house and just Martha and I can stay at the lake. Oh, I know all the paintings and things are all very fine and valuable. But I'm so tired of looking at them. Well, then why do you take this so-called... I beg your pardon, this statue up to the lake? Well, this is different. Oh, yeah, I'll grant you it is a bit different from the other things. It... Oh, well, let's talk about it along the way. But we didn't, simply because I didn't bring up the subject again. Why not? Because a couple of pretty wild ideas had begun to peck away at the back of my brain. Ideas just crazy enough to have some basis in fact. The 1928 Pierce Arrow ran like a dream in spite of its advanced age. And Mrs. Winters, in spite of her advanced age, kept the conversation going in a merry clip. There was a sparkling, almost buoyancy about her. And the hunch that had hit me began to grow. We crossed the Delaware River at New Hope on Route 202, and in Lambertville, we stopped at the sign of the Flying Red Horse to gas up the car. That's item 2470. While the attendant was busy with that and checking the tires and battery and so forth, I made some excuse or other and stepped around to the telephone booth at the back. Harry Branson here. Harry, I want you to drive out to the winter's home at Bryn Mawr again. Oh, what for? Just do it, right away. Then call me up at the lake. Whatever you say, John, but I wish you'd tell me... Gotta go now. Goodbye. The rest of the trip through the pretty North Jersey countryside was uneventful. And finally, north and east of the little town of Andover, we came to Lake Wawayanda. We drove along a private road to the far end of it, and there, perched on a little cliff above a deep basin, was a real smart, modern brick-and-glass home. Straight up the little hill and park in front of the garage. Little hill? I just hope we can make it. Right here. I hope the brakes will hold. Or this thing could roll right on back into the lake. Oh, and the lake is so deep right there. Nearly a hundred feet. An old mine or something before the water came up. Oh, this is a pretty dangerous driveway. Here now, let me help you. Thank you. One of the first things I'm going to do is have this driveway built up and leveled off and a big stone wall built around it. Yeah, you'd better. Careful now. This is pretty steep. Oh, listen. Yeah? The telephone is ringing inside the house. Oh, well, let me have the key and I'll go in and answer it for you. I'll answer it. You can unpack the car while I do. I suspected the call was from me, but didn't want to say as much. So I opened the car trunk and proceeded to take out the luggage and the big clumsy box for the statue. The box was heavy, very heavy. And I wondered how Haskins, the chauffeur, had been able to pick up and carry the statue so easily back in Bryn Mawr. I finally got the box perched on the edge of the car trunk when Mrs. Winters called to me. It's for you, Mr. Dollar. It's Mr. Branson. Oh, okay, I'll take it. Leaving the box there on his precarious perch, I went on up to the house. Here in the front hall, Mr. Dollar. Oh, all right, thanks. I'll go on out to the car and get my coat and purse. Yeah. Johnny Dollar. John, this is awful. Terrible. As I just told Mrs. Winters, this is... Well, I, I couldn't believe it. When I, how, how did you know? How did I know what? Eric, the butler. Yeah? Dead. He's dead. And John, I... Dead from what? How did he die? He apparently fell down the main staircase. The poor cook, Martha, is the only other person in the house. She's beside herself. Yeah, I'll bet she is. But whatever made you suspect something was wrong out here? Call the police, Harry. Make sure they look for a possible blow on the head that might have been delivered before he fell. Mr. What? Mr. Dollar's going to fall. Uh, so long, Harry. Oh, dear. Oh, Mr. 
a dollar. Oh, dear. Ah. Fell off the back of the car, huh? Yes. The big box. I must have bumped it when I reached into the trunk for my weekend case. Bounced right down into the lake, huh? Yes. My beautiful little statue is at the bottom of the lake. Oh, well, don't worry, Mrs. Winters. We'll get it back. I'll have a diver come up here. No. No. It's all right. We'll leave it there. Huh? No, no, you were right. It'd only be another memory of the musty old house in Renoir. It really has no place here where everything is so fresh and new and clean. We'll get it back. But it really had no actual value. You were right, Mr. Dollar. It's better to just... Yes, we'll leave it there. Sorry, Mrs. Winters, but that's where you're wrong. Why, Mr. Dollar... We'll get it back, all right. And whatever's in it. Oh, dear... I suppose I might have known. Expense account item three, $290 even for the diver who came over from New York and retrieved the box from the deep hole in the lake. Two boxes, as a matter of fact. One with Haskins' body in it, and the other with the body of Charles Winters. The body that was supposed to have been washed out to sea after a car accident. The story? Well, of course. After Haskins got rid of Charles for me, I had to do something about him. Or rather, we did. Martha, you know. He's such a wonderful friend. Was Haskins the one who slugged me? Yes, yes. So foolish of him, wasn't it? But he'd heard Mr. Branson say you were an investigator and it frightened him. Worried me a little, too. Well, he might have killed you, too, if Eric hadn't stopped him. And, of course, Eric knew that Haskins had unwittingly made this second box for his own body. So now Eric's gone. Martha, huh? Yes, she did it. But she had to put him away. Oh, yeah. You see, he was the one who took care of Haskins for us. And we couldn't have him around knowing everything. Oh, dear. Martha and I had planned so many wonderful things together. But now... Oh, dear. Expense account total, including incidentals and transportation back to Hartford, $365.50. Remarks? Well, I'd rather not say how I feel about a case like this, Harry. A whole crime wave by a couple of apparently sweet old ladies. The legal procedures, and there'll be plenty of them, are up to you and the company as well as recovery of the insurance paid on poor old Charles Winters. Hey, next time, give me a case that doesn't turn my stomach, will you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, A Taste of the Old West... And a taste of lead from a 38 Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Eric Snowden, and Frank Gerstle. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Joe Walters speaking. is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Portions of the following program are transcribed. Here is Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Are you, Mr. Diamond? Creditor or client? I'm a client. I'm a diamond. I'm glad. It's a little informal, but hello, glad. Call me Rick. Oh, oh no, 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 no. My name is, is Julia Bates. Mrs.? Yes, but you don't have to call me Mrs. Bates. I'm a widow, you see. Oh. In fact, it, it may help our relationship if you call me Julia. Oh, well, here we go again. All right, Julia, you can call me Rick. The fee's a hundred a day in expenses. I want you to stay at my house tonight. Uh, I said a hundred a day in expenses. Oh, the, the fee is all right, Mr. Uh, Rick. Money means nothing. Yeah. Well, you think your way and I'll think mine. I'll make out a check right now. No hurry. Any time in the next ten seconds. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Now, about this assignment. Well, it, it may sound silly, but I'm afraid of the house I live in. Oh, dandy. I said it might sound silly, mm-hmm. but it's deadly serious, I assure you. No, I'm sure it is. You see, my husband, Warner Bates, died three months ago. Mm-hmm. He was a very strange man and believed devoutly in many forms of mysticism. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he built this house as a monument to his beliefs and, and filled it with secret passages and rooms and steps that lead nowhere. Why not move out? Well, I'll be perfectly honest. It's because of the money. Oh, oh. In his will, Warner stipulated I was to live in the house for a period of three months following his death. Three months is up tomorrow. And it doesn't help that Warner is buried in the basement vault. What's he doing? Watching Benny's money? Well, he he had a crypt built in the cellar, and a a key, the only key to it, was placed in his coffin. Mm. What's supposed to happen tonight? Well, let let, let me tell you the whole story. A a month ago, I began to hear the strangest things in the house at night, and I found food half-eaten on the kitchen table. Ever try setting traps? Well, the worst shot came when I went to the cellar a few days ago. I found footprints in the dust, naked footprints, leading to and from the crypt. Maybe you had to take a shower. Oh, please, please let me finish. On his deathbed, Warner swore he'd visit me at the end of the third month, and if he could, take me with him back to the spirit world. Oh, and tonight is the night. Yes. Mm. Oh, at first, I, I didn't think it would get me, but... Oh, I'm scared. Really scared. Yeah, well, uh, now look, baby. Let's get off this mystic kick. Who inherits if you don't live up to your requirements? Well, that's just it. No one. That is, no person. The money goes to charities and schools. Mm -hmm. Mr. Anderson, the executor of the estate, says the will is foolproof, legal, and binding. Either I live in the house until noon tomorrow or forfeit the inheritance. So what you want me to do is hang around tonight and see that hubby doesn't go death walking. Yes, that's right. Uh, You don't have to be there till dark, but, oh... Don't be any later than that. Say, six o'clock? Uh, excuse me. Diamond Detective Agency, freewheeling corpses. Ask the man who kills one. Uh, Rick, when are you going to stop those awful slogans? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Got to call you back, got a client. Oh, all right. Is she pretty? I don't know. I'm parked behind a curve. What? Oh, forget it. I'll call you back. Bye. Now, uh, uh, Julia, uh, you better go on home. Where's your broom? Broom? Do you think I look like a witch? You don't look like one. More like the good fairy after she'd heard about men. Now, you fly on home, sweetheart, and I'll see you at six. Uh, Don't be late. I'll be there with bones on. I tried to uncurl my toes and get my mind on business. Thinking of my spook client didn't seem to help, but it was, uh, business. It was getting pretty late in the afternoon, so I put the office to bed for the night, picked up a bite to eat, and went over to the 5th Precinct to keep a coffee date with Lieutenant Levinson. When I walked into the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis with his nose in a book. Oh, hello, Otis. What's with the book? Don't tell me you're learning to read. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, hello, Shamus. Uh, how's tricks? The book, Sergeant. What's the book? Uh, bu- oh, what book? Oh, uh, uh, Lieutenant inside. He said for you to go right in when you came. Otis, uh, tell Uncle Richard about the book. Oh, uh, it's just a book. Here, yeah, I was trying to prove myself. Well, don't feel ashamed, Otis. You've got reason to do that. Yeah, very funny. I see. Hmm. The Art of Graceful Dancing. 
Otis. Well, what's wrong with me dancing, Shamus? I, I don't want to be no social outcast. Dancing? Well, maybe. But graceful? Otis, you couldn't be graceful even if your feet did match. Tell you what, though, I'll give you a hand. Now, just open your arms and pretend you have a dame. Go on, I'll start you on a waltz. Well, okay. Da, da, dee, dee, dum. Tweet, 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 tweet. Da, da. Oh, no, 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 Otis. You look like an elephant with sprained yeah. ankles. Now, try again and close your eyes. Ya, da, dum, dee, 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 dee. Otis, wait a minute. Otis, put me down. What? Oh, oh. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I, I thought you was a dame. You what? Oh. I, I mean, I had my eyes closed. I, I, I was dancing... Oh, Lieutenant, the, the shamans talked me into it. Rick, would you mind telling me what you were doing? Saving Arthur Murray ulcers. Yeah, well, come on in and get some coffee. And Otis. Yeah? Shut up. Shall I pour? Uh, please do. You know how I like mine, Walt. Yeah, no cream, 12 lumps. Uh, better change that. I would think so. Okay, how many? Make it 14. Your coffee's stronger than mine. It's not so strong, Rick. Here. Mm, thanks. You better bite that spot off the desk. The varnish is beginning to smoke. Your jokes aren't any better. Gonna stick around for the heart game tonight? I uh, can't, Walt. I've got a client with a house full of spirits. What? The dead kind. With you on the job, there'll be corpses jumping out of every window. Uh, yeah. Well, if they start, I'll give you a call. I know, I know. Why don't you give up give being a detective, Rick? Play postman or something. Walt, you just don't seem to appreciate my favors. Uh... Uh-oh, I'm getting late. It's nearly six. It's a peaceful night, Rick. See if you can't keep it that way. Oh, sure, Walt, sure. This is one night you can take it easy. Uh, give me two more lumps, please. Leaving Walt and heading to the Bates house, I was feeling as happy as a bird in a hat full of worms. I had a hundred bucks to stall off the landlord... A lovely red-headed girlfriend with curves and a spook client with uh, trouble. Everything great. Then the storm began to blow up. It had started to rain when I saw the Bates house on Temple Street. A big, ugly house straight out of a horror story with gables and shuttered windows. And as if that wasn't enough, I was met at the door by a butler who was a tiny thing, about seven feet tall and 300 pounds, with a face like the devil with a hangover. Come in. Oh, uh, yeah, I wanted to see uh, Mrs. Bates, of course. You are Mr. Diamond. She left word with you? I need no word. I am the seventh son. Of a what? The seventh son. Of a... Oh, no, this could go on forever. Okay, lead on. The name is Kane. Yeah? How's your brother? Well, forget it. Where's your, uh, Mrs. Bates? In the drawing room. This way, sir. Cozy little mausoleum. What time do the ghosts come out? Usually right after the vampires, sir. Oh, dandy. I hope they have an early show. Oh, it will be soon enough, sir. The dead are restless tonight. Maybe if I rocked them to sleep, I... Got a rock? Mrs. Bates... Mr. Diamond. Oh, thank you, Kate. Uh, hello, Rick. How, how do you like my house? Oh, it's, uh, it's lovely. What do you use for doorknobs? Heads? And what's with the big zombie? You didn't mention him. Kate? Oh, he's a fixture around here, but mm. I get frightened more when he's around than when he's gone. Oh, well, now you take it easy, baby. Come on over and sit down and let me chase those fears away. Oh, that is an idea. Name me a better. Uh, can I fix you a drink? Oh, uh, I think I'll take a glass of milk, sir. Here you are. Oh, now, hey, look, Crusher, put a bell around your neck or something. One more surprise like that, and you'll be best man at a funeral. My apologies. Your milk, sir. Yeah, thanks, sir. Come on, Julia, let's get back to where we were. And you, Kane, you... Hey, where'd he go? Rick. Rick, there it is. Huh? Yeah. But that's the way it starts. Listen. It's the stairs to the cellar. Someone's climbing them. What? Oh, it's probably Kane. Right? You wanted me, sir. Kane? Then who... You wait in here, Julia. I'll go out and get our nosy friend. Uh, the, the cellar door is at the end of the hall. I left 
Julia, looking as nervous as a one-legged man walking a tightrope, and took off down the long hall. There was only one door, the one to the cellar, so I opened it and flipped on the switch. I was moving my ankles down the creaking steps when I heard trouble. <laughs> what the devil? Julia! Julia! Are you hurt? What is it? Rick! Rick, over there in the closet, a, a dead man! A dead... Oh, no. There's no dead man in here. Not there. But I saw him, Rick. I swear there, there was a man in there. He was all bloody and there was a big knife in his chest. Oh, but you must have been mistaken. About a corpse, Rick. He was there. Oh, I don't see... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, You're on the floor. Blood stains. You see, there was a man in there. Hmm, this is blood, all right. But where'd the body go? He couldn't have been moved that fast. Unless... Where's Kane? Right here, Mr. Diamond. But I did not move the dead one. No? Where were you just now when Julia screamed? Having tea with a vampire? No, I was in the kitchen, sir. Do not be mystified, Mr. Diamond. Accept the fact that you are in a house controlled by the other world. There's been a murder, Kane, and that brings it into this world. Who are you calling? A real-life cop who likes to know about dead bodies kicking around. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick. Oh, no. I know that tone. Where's the body? I wish I knew. Come on over to 209 East Temple Street. Wait. What do you mean, you wish you knew? Is there a body there? Well, it's here someplace. Now, don't argue. Get over here. Wait, wait. And hurry. Now, Kane, you can go back to the kitchen, but stay there. Don't roam around. As you wish, sir. And now, Julia, baby, we're going to do some investigating. Uh, investigating? That's right. I got a big yen to see what's in that vault downstairs. And this time, I'm taking you with me. But, Rick, it's locked. I hope so, but I'm not making book. You, you mean you think it may actually have been Warner come back from the dead? And, and kill that man, I mean? Right now, I don't know what to think. I wouldn't be surprised to run into Dracula sitting on top of the wolf man. Here's the basement. Hey, who turned out the light? I know I turned it on before. Yeah, that's better. Come on. Down here. Oh, hurry, Rick. I'm getting scared. No, I don't like to feel it myself, but I want to check this vault. See? See the footprints there in the dust? I see them, but I don't believe them. Not yet. Yeah, I'll try the door of the vault. <gasps> Why, it's unlocked. Yeah, and look what's inside. The coffin is empty. It's empty, all right, and it's open. Well, are you going inside? Uh, no, no, I... I think I'll stay out here. Oh, the light. Rick, who put out the light? It wasn't Edison, baby. We got company. Julia, I told you I'd come back for you. Really? Hey, what is this? I am dead. Oh. You know who I am, don't you, Julia? Yes. Hmm? Yes, I, I know it's you, Warner. I'm coming for you tonight, Julia. I will appear at nine o'clock. I'd better set my watch. Be prepared to meet me, Julia, at nine o'clock. No, 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 no. Take it no. easy, baby. Rick, you down there? Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, well, turn on the lights. Sure. There, they're on. Rick, what are you doing? To... Oh, a block. I should have known. Well, do come upstairs and join us. We're coming off. <laughs> Wait. Uh, in a minute, Walt. Otis, mm -hmm. help Mrs. Bates into the living room. She's pretty shaken up. Sure, Shamus. Come on, lady. Thank you. Now, what is this, all this about, Rick? Now, come on back downstairs with me, Walt, and get your gun out. Somewhere in this cellar is a dead man with a lousy sense of humor. searched the long cellar but good while I briefed Walt on the events of the evening. Neither was much of a success. Walt didn't believe me, and our ghost remained a ghost. As we went back up into the living room, I was at a point where I didn't believe the things myself. They couldn't have happened, but they had. Hey, uh, Otis, where did Mrs. Bates go? She went upstairs to pack Shama, said she was going to leave. Leave? And give up her dough? Oh, for Pete's sake, she can't... Not just because of this ghost house. Ghost house? Oh, this is the wackiest yet. Rick, if I didn't know you were so... Walt, do I look like I'm happy about these things? I'm at a point where I'm believing in spooks and spirit worlds and dead men who talk from out of nowhere. Yeah, so the shamus is afraid of spooks. 
this, I'm loving it. Otis. Yeah, I know, Lieutenant. Shut up. Did I say that, Otis? Well, no, Lieutenant. What do you want me to do? Shut up. Oh, oh. Gee, I wish I had a glass of water. A glass of water, Sergeant. <laughs> oh, come out from behind that chair, Otis. It's only came. Who's he? Well, didn't he let you in? No, we found the door open. When we rang and no one answered, we came in. Oh, did you? Hey, Kane, where were you? Didn't you hear the doorbell? I knew the door was open, Mr. Diamond. And I was busy. Like maybe playing ghost? No, sir. Baking a cake. Cake? Oh, swell. All packed. Will you take me to a hotel? Now, but Julia, look, you can't leave. Think of the money. Money or no money, I'm getting out of here, Rick. That was Warner's voice, and I, I, I just don't have the nerve to stay. Oh, but look, baby, you know there aren't any such things as ghosts. Do I? You were in the cellar with me. You heard him. And did you find anybody down there afterwards? Well, no, but... but just a minute, Mrs. Bates. You saw a murdered man earlier this evening, didn't you? You know I did, in that closet. Yeah, well, until I find out who he is and who killed him, you don't leave this house. But, 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 Warner... I'm sorry, Julia. We'll protect you, but you can't leave. Otis, take Mrs. Bates into the library and make her comfortable. Hey, Yellowton, come on, Mrs. Bates. Well, oh. Now, Rick, enough is enough. How could there have been a body in that closet one minute and not the next? Where did it go and why? Well, how the devil should I know? She saw it, screamed, I ran back, opened the closet, and it was gone. Oh, great. Now, come on. I want a better look at that closet. Well, it looks all right. Wonder how it sounds. Use your gun butt on the walls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, but where's the latch? There must be some way to open this section. Try those hooks. Yeah. No, no, not them. Mm. Maybe this rack. Right. Secret room, just like in the movies. Oh, oh, there he is. Yeah, we found the corpse, Walt. And how he disappeared so fast. Oh, some mess. Blood all over him. Walt, hey, this is no corpse. What? Oh, now, don't start that. No? Well, look at it closer, Walt. It's a dummy. Well, I'll... It is. A wax dummy with blood smeared on it. No wonder I wasn't meant to see it. Oh, this is it. I'm getting out of this crazy house. Corpses that talk, corpses that aren't corpses. I've had enough. This is just plain ridiculous. Now, wait, Walt. Someone planted this dummy, and someone is trying to scare Mrs. Bates out of this house. That same someone is in this house right now, and if he isn't stopped, it may mean her murder. How are you feeling, Julia? I'm exhausted, Rick, but I... We I... found the body, Julia. It was a dummy. A dummy? Well, then... Then there wasn't any murdered man? No. This whole thing is a bluff. Even that voice in the cellar. Oh, no, that couldn't be. That was Warner's voice, Rick. I know it was. And he's not in his coffin. I know, baby. And I think that's all phony, too. Now, tell me, who knew that only key in the coffin business? Well, just myself. And, and Mr. Anderson. Anderson? Oh, that's right. You remember. He was Warner's lawyer. Oh, yeah. Now, how about Kane? Did he know of the key? Well, I don't know, Rick. He may have Warner confided in him a great deal. Oh, Rick, this isn't getting us any place. Come with me. Otis, you stay with Mrs. Bates. Yelta. All right, Walt. What are we going to do? Grill the dummy? Go ahead. Be funny. But I want to search this whole house. Oh, Walt, this place is a nut house full of secret rooms and hocus pocus. It'll take two maps and a Ouija board to get around in it. Well, I'm going to get around in it. And up these stairs is as good a place as any to start. Hello, Walt. Oh, stairs that lead to a blank wall. Rick, that's too much. Now, would you stop playing games? Playing games, he says. Oh, where is my bicarbonate? Here you are, Lieutenant. Ah. Sorry to be late. Where's the thunder, Kane? You're Mr. Q. Will there be anything else, sir? I don't see how, sir. Not unless Frankenstein drops in for a game of jacks. I doubt if he will. Tonight it's at his house, so... I'll be on hand if you need anything. We won't. Go on back to your embalming. Come on, Walt. You feeling okay? Oh, I'll never feel okay again. Rick, I've stood for your getting me mixed up in some crazy cases, but this night I'll never forget. Oh, don't quit on me now, Walt. We still have to find that spook and keep Julia from being killed. How? Please, tell me how. Look, he said he was going to appear at 9 o'clock tonight to take her to the spirit world with him. Yeah, well, I'll get a squad down here to see that he doesn't. No, no, Walt, wait. He'll never show up if we're all hanging around, right? Well, yeah. Uh, the only way we can catch the ghost is for him to show up, right? Yeah, go on. So what do we do? So we pretend to leave, make a big fuss about giving the whole thing up. Then we sneak back in and hide. We wait and see if he shows up, and when he said he would, and if he does, we nab him. 
Case closed. Well, it sounds screwy, but to wind this case up, I'll buy anything. Where do we hide? We'll get Julia to wait in the living room. We'll sneak back and hide in that secret room behind the closet. If the ghost shows, we can grab him as soon as he gives himself away. And I think he'll show. After getting Julia to agree to the idea, Walt Otis and I made a big thing about leaving the house. Then we sneaked back in and hid in the secret room back of the living room closet. The closet door was open enough so we could see Julia pretending to read on the couch. And for the next few centuries, we waited. Waited for a dead man to keep a date. What time is it, Rick? It's two minutes to nine. If he's going to show, it won't be long. Hey, you think a dead man really can come back to life? If you don't shut up, Otis, I'll give you a personal chance to try. I wish you'd hurry. Yeah. Well, it's just time now. I hope Julia plays her part okay. She looks pretty nervous. No, why would she be nervous? She's only waiting for a dead man. A phony dead man, Walt, I hope. Now, don't you start believing in ghosts. You know there aren't any such things. Rick, the lights went out. Shh, listen. I told you I would come for you, Julia. It is nine o'clock. Oh, Walter, please, please don't take me out. I don't want to die. Rick, that's him. Shh, wait a minute, Walt. I am the dead, Julia. I am your husband. Yes, yes, I know you, Walter. You must leave this house, Julia. No. Come on, Walt. Right. And Otis, be quiet. Oh, be oh I will. I know enough not to make any noise. What was that? Rick! Rick, hurry! Come on, let's grab him. We all took off after the ghost. It led us on the screwiest chase yet, in and out of the secret passages, upstairs, and then back downstairs again. Trying to lay hands on him was like trying to swat a fly with a piece of string. He finally made a break for the outside door. Then, not to be outdone, I made like a big athlete. Hey, that was a pretty nifty tackle, Diamond. Rick, think you okay? Yeah, as soon as I get this hood off, I'm going to have a few words with this spook. There. He's out cold. Oh, just bring Mrs. Bates in here. Oh, okay. Come on, you. Wake oh. up. Who is he? I don't know. Come on, wake up. Oh. Before I make a real ghost out of you. Okay. Okay, don't hit me anymore, please. Yes, yeah. she is, Lieutenant. Mrs. Bates, do you know who this man is? What? Why, it, it's Warner's lawyer, Mr. Anderson, the executor of the estate. Sure, baby, had to be. All right, Buster, what's the story? Oh, all right, all right. It was the money. If I could get Julia to break the will, I I had a dummy charity set up so I could get the estate. He's all yours, Walt. Wrap him up. It'll be a pleasure. Otis, put the cuffs on him. Take him out of here. Yeah, Lieutenant. Come on, Spooky. Well, that takes care of that. Hey, what about Kane? He must have known about all this. Of course I knew, Lieutenant. But I did not wish to intrude. Those who interfere with the dead... Pay their own penalty. Lose their haunting license? <laughs> Nothing. Oh, sir, my cake is done. Would you like some? It's devil's food. No, thanks. I'll skip it. With nuts? Uh, Julia, walk me to the door. Well, of course, Rick. I'll leave you with Kane, Wall. Tell him a ghost story. Feeling all right, baby? Oh, yes, much better. I'm fine now that I know there's nothing to be afraid of. Tomorrow I'll be moving into an apartment. Uh, will you come and see me? We have things to talk over. Like what, honey? Like sharing a mood. You know, just the two of us. With that, she reached up and showed me what she meant with a big smoochie. Oh, I'd have probably stuck around, but I was afraid the house would be too disturbing. I wouldn't have minded having to get up to chase the bats out of the room, but with Kane showing up every time I wanted something, well, that could have led to complications. So I left Walt and Otis to clean things up, bid a not too fond farewell to Kane, and went from the house of horror to the one that was full of redhead and a piano. The redhead was wearing a red dress with a new... Uh, uh, you know what I mean. Well, didn't think you were going to make it. Uh, I had a tough case tonight, honey. 
Thought I might not get away at all. Mm-hmm. I'll bet you did. Why, Helen, baby, all of a sudden you sound suspicious. Without any effort, darling. Especially when it comes to blondes. Uh, blondes? You mean girls? Girls. Blonde girls with hair like this on your lapel. Oh. And the lipstick on your cheek and the look in your eyes. Oh, you know how it is, honey? Brilliant detective saves clients' life and fortune. She had to be grateful. <laughs> Brilliant detective. You keep on making me so jealous of you, and one of these days the world is going to lose a brilliant detective. No. Someone going to rub out Sam State? Oh, what's the use? Oh, now, baby, don't be mad. Come on, let's next. No. I'm upset and I'm unhappy. If I sing, will you be happy again? I don't know. Well, I'll try. I'll sing my real old head off. I need your love so badly. I love you oh so madly, but I don't stand a ghost of a chance with you. I thought at last I'd found you, but other love surround you, and I don't stand a ghost of a chance. With you. Are you listening? If you'll surrender just for a tender kiss or two, you might discover that I'm the lover meant for you, and I'd be true. But what's the good of scheming? I know I must be dreaming, but I don't stand a ghost of a chance with you. Happy? You sang nice. Do we neck? No. No, it's still early enough to catch a late show. Well, if I take you to the show? Uh, yes. Okay, what's the show you want to see? Oh, it's a wonderful horror picture full of spooks. The ghost talk. Oh, no, no, no. have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Paul Fries, and Robert Clark. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Portions were transcribed. Tonight's story was written by Herb Burdum and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Tal Avery, inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC tomorrow? There's great comedy in store for you on the Phil Harris, Alice Faye show when Phil and Frankie go shopping for Alice's Christmas present. And there's excellent drama on Theater Guild on the air. Tomorrow, Richard Conti, Diana Lynn, and Shirley Booth will be starred in the Pulitzer Prize-winning play, Street Scene, on Theater Guild on the air. W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, tonight you're going to meet some charming people. And you're going to run into a little bit of very fancy murder. The name of the story is 
little drops of rain. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Did you know that there are over 50 million men in the United States who shave? Yes, that's a lot of men. It was in the interest of these 50 million shavers that Fitch Company chemists and technicians went to work in their laboratories and came up with Fitch's No Brush, a shaving cream especially designed to give a solid comfort shave. You see, Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream contains not one, but three important shaving ingredients that work together to give you a smoother, faster shave. It also contains a special skin conditioner ingredient. Men appreciate this ingredient because it has a soothing effect on the skin the instant it's applied, and it keeps the skin feeling smooth and refreshed long after the shave is finished. Men also like the just-right consistency of Fitch's No Brush. It's neither too thick nor too thin. It's not greasy and won't clog the razor. If you're among those who prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives a rich, dense lather that wilts whiskers completely soft for a clean, fast shave. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in big 25 and 50 cent sizes. Try a jar. You'll find it easier on your razor and easier on you. Thank you, Jim. And now, I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. still confined to my little cranked up downy couch in the hospital, but not as still as I was last week. I am now allowed to get up and totter around a little, and I use the word totter advisedly. My legs act like strangers who have different political beliefs, and my knees have suddenly developed sideway hinges. But my nurses, ah, my nurses, yes, they're beautiful and tender, and resistant. And speaking of nurses, nurses are girls, and girls are my favorite pastime. And that brings me up to the girl who has done the most to confuse my life. Liza. The girl I was so sincerely in love with a couple of months ago. Liza was in to see me. She just left, and we were talking about the time when I showed up at her apartment for a date. It was raining out, and... I was sitting at the piano, doodling around a little bit. I don't want to go to a nightclub tonight, Richard. I'm too tired. Let's just go to a show, shall we? Anything you say, baby. That's the kind of guy I am. I want to see two girls and a sailor. It's playing at the Rialto. June Allison's in that, isn't she? Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, that's for me then. You think so? Definitely. You think she's prettier than I am? Well, you're, you're not in pictures, Angel. Do you think she's prettier than I am? Well, well you're, a, you're a different type. Are you going to answer me? Oh, 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 oh if you're jealous. <laughs> How can you be jealous of a girl I don't even know? Give me a kiss. No. No, oh, but baby, I love you. I love you like anything. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Pop then. I don't care. Mm, June is busting out all over, all over the meadow and the hill. Busts are busting out of bushes, and the robin river pushes every little wheel that wheels beside a mill. June is busting out all over. The feeling is getting so intense that the young Virginia creepers have been hugging the bejeepers out of all the morning glories on the fence because it's June. June, June, June. You're insufferable, Richard Rogue. Oh, now, quit potting. Come on over here, on the bench by me. 
Are we going to a show or not? Sure. Get your lipstick on again and we'll see what... Oh. I'll get it. No, I'll answer. It's probably George. Oh, George. Well, I'll tell him, that homewrecker. Hello. Is Mr. Rogue there? Mm, speaking. Uh, this is your call service, Mr. Rogue. We got a call for you. Oh, uh, oh. Who is it? Uh, uh, Mrs. Harvey Burgess says it's very important. Okay, put her on. Right. Oh, put her on. Who is it? Shh. Hello? Uh, Richard Rogue speaking. This is Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Yes? I must see you at once, Mr. Rogue. Oh, well, any time tomorrow, Mrs. I must Burgess. I'll see you tonight, immediately. It is most important. Well, can't you tell me about it over the phone? Oh, no. Could you come to my house at once? Uh, what's the address? 485 Hillcrest. You'll be well paid for your time. Please hurry. I'll be right out, Mrs. Burgess. Wait for me. I'll be right back, honey. Go on. Go on out to see Mrs. Burgess. Don't mind me, Dick Tracy. Well, what can I do? Mrs. Harvey Burgess was the wife of a tycoon with a dollar for every Democrat in Georgia. I tried to explain to Liza, but I was talking to myself and I left for the Burgess residence. <laughs> I left Liza burning like Mrs. O'Leary's barn. The Burgess Mansion was a huge colonial affair. George Washington could have slept there every night. He was at Valley Forge and never seen the same room twice. A butler who talked like he was choking to death on an olive pit conducted me into the library and uh, into the presence of Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Oh, my. What a presence. She was sitting in front of the open fire, filling out a hostess gown that didn't straighten out any of the curves she featured. I pulled my eyes back into my head and tried not to look too interested. Sit down, Mr. Rogue. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I'm in a bit of a hurry tonight, Mrs. Burgess. As a matter of fact, I... Mr. I... Rogue, my husband is making a fool of himself. Yes? He's lost his mind completely over a secretary in his office. His secretary... A girl by the name of Helen Stark. You you mean that... Yes, I mean he prefers her company to mine. Well, that doesn't sound reasonable, if you'll pardon me for saying so. What do you want me to do? Somebody has to bring Harvey back to his senses, Mr. Rogue. Well, I'm afraid you've called on the wrong man. I'm not very good at long fatherly talks. Oh, and Mr. I... Rogue, please, I'm so alone. Hey, hey, now, wait a minute. Good grief. You mean to tell me that Harvey is neglecting you... What you need to straighten Harvey out is a psychiatrist, not a detective. Harvey is definitely off his trolley. Please help me, Mr. Rowe. No, 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 Mrs. Burgess. I, I... He's with her right this minute. How do you know? When he left the house tonight, I followed him. He went to the home of his best friend, Clarence Roman. I parked across the street. I was going in and faced them, but I saw Mr. Roman leave, and I lost my nerve. That's when I called you. Oh, Mr. Rogue, I want you to go out there and talk to Harvey. Tell him I know all about him and that Stark girl. And I'm suing him for divorce. Well, that's not my kind of work, Mrs. Burgess. I I'm Please. sorry, but that... I don't want a divorce, Harvey. But I do want him back. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that if you will do as I say, he'll come back. You must do it for me, Mr. Rogue. Here, uh... oh, where is it? I have $500 here in an envelope. You did? Oh, wait a minute here. Let me see. Uh, oh, oh. Is this it? Yes. That's your fee. Hmm. For going out there with me, Mr. Rogan. Trying to bring Harvey back to his senses. You'll do it for me, won't you, Mr. Rogue? Well, I, uh... You'll do it for me, won't you, Mr. Rogue? Okay. Come along. <laughs> All right. Well, it seems there's nobody home. There's my husband's convertible out in front, right where he left it tonight when I followed him out here. How did the girl arrive? In her car. Oh. Her car isn't here. It was right behind Harvey's. Looks like we got here too late, doesn't it? Try the door. I know Harvey's still here. All right. You're an old friend of Roman's, I suppose. Yes. Why? Uh, I just want to know before I try to open the door. 
You see, there are laws against that sort of thing. Hmm. Door's unlocked. Do we go in? Yes. Okay. After you. You know the house better than I do. Go ahead. All right. The living room is over here. Ah, oh, nobody home. Look, Mrs. Burgess, we better get out of here. No. I know Harvey's in this house someplace, and I'm going to find him. I can't... What are you sniffing for? Wait a minute. That smell in the air. You get it? What? Oh. I don't smell anything. You don't? I smell chloroform. Chloroform? Yeah. You take a look upstairs. I'm going to shake down the first floor. That smell of chloroform can mean trouble, you know. Mr. Rogue, what do you mean? You're frightening me. Mrs. Burgess was very fetching when she was frightened. But I calmed her down a little bit. Now, this may sound fantastic, but I've got a little bell in my head that rings an alarm every time I really get around serious trouble. And it was playing a tune that sounded too much like a death march right that minute. I had to get her out of the way. She finally went upstairs and I went to work. I took the living room first and looked behind all the couches and in all the dark corners. I was bending over, looking under a huge Italian carved table when I thought I heard a stealthy footstep behind me. Ah, Don't move. Oh! My ears were still full of that ringing scream Mrs. Burgess had let out as I caught that sock behind the ear and drifted gently through space toward cloud number eight and my alter ego, Hugo. I was hoping he wouldn't be there, but he was. Sitting there with that silly smirk on his face with his little short legs pulled up under his chin and his funny little arms around him and his long white beard waving the cosmic breeze. Oh, shut up. <laughs> That's a fine attitude. You go prowling around a strange house and get caught at it and knocked out. Then you come up here and take it out on me. <laughs> get out of here, you ingrate. Oh, stop acting like a landlord, Hugo. What happened to me? <laughs> Are you kidding? Tell me, why did Mrs. Burgess scream? Answer me, Hugo. Do you know why she screamed? You going to tell me? <laughs> no. Find out for yourself. <laughs> You're a detective. Oh, someday I'm going to get rid of you, you little pest. <laughs> Why don't you get back to work? You got a date with Liza, you know. She's still waiting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, here goes. Come on, Rogue. Please, come on. You didn't have to hit him so hard, Clarence. <coughs> oh, who hit me? I'm Clarence Roman, Rogue. I came home. I found the front door unlocked. I walked in. I saw a strange man prowling around my parlor. A woman screamed, and I hit you with my cane. Oh, well, what do you carry for a cane? A ball bat? Why did you scream, Mrs. Burgess? I found my husband. Upstairs. He's dead. Murdered. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But now I'd like to say something to the ladies. Do you ever feel like hanging your head in shame because your hair isn't, well, looking as nice as it should? Perhaps you get discouraged because every time you shampoo your hair, it seems dry and difficult to set. Then for your next shampoo, why not try Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo? This clear golden liquid shampoo is made from mild coconut and vegetable oil. These pure natural oils keep your hair from becoming dry and brittle. When you use Fitch's Saponified Shampoo, you can have a shampoo as often as you like, and after each one, your hair will be soft and lustrous, easy to set into your favorite hairstyle. You'll love the glorious quantities of fragrant lather this shampoo makes. It cleanses thoroughly and then rinses out completely without a special after-rinse. You see, Fitch's Saponified Shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. 
All you do is rinse with plain water, and the rinsing agent contained in the shampoo ensures the removal of all particles from your hair, making it sparkle with cleanliness. Ask for Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Richard Rogue is telling our story. Well, I had accepted a case for Mrs. Harvey Burgess, a suspicious wife. Yes, that's the Mrs. Harvey Burgess of the Burgess Millions. She suspected her husband of having a rendezvous with Helen Stark, his secretary, at the home of Clarence Roman, Burgess's best friend, and we went out there together. Nobody answered the door, so we went in. My suspicions were aroused when I smelled the unmistakable odor of chloroform. Mrs. Burgess was looking around upstairs while I searched the downstairs. Suddenly, I heard Mrs. Burgess scream. Ah! My husband! Upstairs, he's dead! Murdered! Well, that snapped me out of it. I got to my feet and ran up the stairs. Mrs. Burgess and Roma were right behind me, and she directed me into the library, which was just off the main hall. And there he was, as dead as last summer's romance, with a neat little blue hole right below the part in his hair. He was a nice-looking old guy, about 50, which made him a good 25 years older than his wife. And his widow was really taking his death big, which was natural. A woman doesn't have a husband murdered every day. Poor Harvey, this is horrible. Has anything in this room been moved or touched? Well, I just arrived home, when I, I wouldn't... I looked in here and saw Harvey, I knew he was dead. I screamed. Yes, yes, I heard you. Then you ran right downstairs, Yes, huh? uh, I saw Mr. Roman hit you, and I ran down to tell him who you were. And... That's a little late. Okay. Just don't touch anything. Stay right there in the door, both of you. Just who are you to be giving us orders? You'll find out. Ever see this gun before? Yes. Where? It was Harvey's. He kept it in his desk at the office. Oh, you recognized it mighty quickly. How? It has his initials on it. I can see them from here, inset in the butt of the gun. Oh. His gun, huh? Yeah. Well, it wasn't suicide. Not with the gun clear over here on the opposite side of the room. This is murder. <laughs> hey. What's the matter? Now, this ought to do it. What is it? What's your handkerchief? A very nice linen handkerchief with initials in the corner. And blood on it. What initials? H.S. Helen Stark. That's her handkerchief. She killed Harvey. She killed my Harvey. Is there a phone upstairs here? Yes. You'll find an extension in the hall. Thanks. Come on out of this room. I don't want anything touched or moved. Now, now. Dear, please. You two wait for me downstairs. I'll be down just a minute. As soon as I call the police. Homicide, Urban speaking. Hello, Urban. Richard Rogue. Yeah, who's dead? Harvey Burgess, wise guy. Hmm? You mean it? You mixed up in another murder, Rogie? Sure. You'd never find a body if it wasn't for me. Where are you? At the residence of Clarence Roman on Cypress Avenue, 2120. Better get the boys and get out here. Be right there. Got any leads on the killer? Uh, a couple of vague ideas. Stay there until I get there, Rogue. Hello? Oh, uh, hello, Liza, darling. This is Rogie. Oh. You know what time it is. Oh, sure, honey, I'll but give you I... ten minutes to get back here and take me to that show. What? Oh. Uh, look, Roman. Roman, the cops will be here in a minute. Tell Urban, that's Lieutenant Urban, he'll be in charge for the police, that I'll be right back, will you? Tell him I went out to get a murderess for him. Of course. And I hope you manage to catch a rogue. Uh, 
Yes? Good evening. Is uh, Helen Stark at home? I, I, I beg your pardon. I'm, I'm a bit deaf. I, I, I couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, I said, is Helen Stark at home? Oh, oh, Helen? Uh, no, no, she isn't home this evening. Has she been home? I say, has she been home in the last hour? Uh, no, no, she hasn't. I, I don't know what time to expect her either. But I imagine she'll be home soon, though. You know where she is? Uh, well, she didn't come home from the office tonight. She's she's working late. Oh. She called you and told you she wouldn't be home? Uh, yes, yes. She said she was going to work with Mr. Burgess. That's her boss, you know, the, the millionaire. Yes, sir. Uh... Well, thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I tell her who called? No, no, no. That, uh, that won't be necessary. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Thanks very much, Mr. Stark. I, uh, oh, uh, you and Helen live here all alone? Uh, yes, yes. Since her mother died several years ago. Uh, are you an old friend of Helen's? No. A very recent acquaintance. Oh. I'm sorry I bothered you, Mr. Stark. Good night. Good evening. Nice out after the rain, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. Good night. Good night. Oh, that nice little old guy. It was going to be tough for him to realize that his daughter was a killer. I hated the world as I walked down the steps from that porch and started for my car. I, uh... Oh... I don't like murder. It upsets so many people who aren't involved in the act, or the reasons for it. Yeah, I guess I'm a chicken-hearted Patsy. But if I am, I'm glad. Anyway, I was walking down the walk when that little bell rang in my massive intellect again. I noticed something, something peculiar. There were tire tracks running into the stock garage. It had only stopped raining about 45 minutes before, and if that car had been driven into the garage while it was still raining, there would be no tracks. They would have been washed away. Now, very peculiar. I ran up the driveway and opened the overhead garage door. Then I jumped back. The garage was full of carbon monoxide. I wet my handkerchief in a puddle of rainwater, held it over my nose, and ran into the garage. I wrestled the door of the small coupe open and saw a young girl, unconscious, slumped over the steering wheel. I pulled her out of there. She was dead weight and carried her into the house. Oh, Helen. Helen. I'm afraid it's a little late for that, Mr. Stark. Where's your telephone? In the hall. Right in the hall. Thanks. I'll get a pole motor squad out here right away. Get a pull motor squad to 640 Inglewood Drive. Attempted suicide. Bad shape. Rush it. Right. Uh, uh, uh. Raymond, Ramsey, Redding, Roman. Roman, Clarence. Hello? Hello. Lieutenant Urban, please. This is Richard Rogan. It's important. Speaking, Rogue. I thought I told you to stay here. Look, never mind the arguments. Get out here to 640 Inglewood Drive. I've got Helen Stark for you. You have? Nice work. I want to talk to that young lady. Well, you missed the boat. I think she's dead. Suicide. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Step on it. Okay, Rogie. I'll be there in ten minutes. Don't go away. <laughs> I gave Helen Stark my own interpretation of artificial respiration until the pull motor squad got there. Urban arrived on the heels of the fire department, and we went out and looked around in the garage. Made some fascinating discoveries, too. The car had run out of gas and stopped turning over, for one thing. And one thing led to another, to coin a phrase. Anyway, Urban and I made a little deal. I went back to the Roman residence, and while he and his boys were being scientific, I sat in the parlor and talked with Mrs. Burgess and Clarence Roman. Mrs. Burgess had recovered her poise to some extent. 
They were both very anxious to know all about my daring capture of the Stark girl. I'm glad she's dead. I couldn't stand a trial. I'm glad she committed suicide. Yes, I, I guess it seemed like the only way out. She wasn't very smart about murder, leaving clues all over the place the way she did. <laughs> Even the cops would have had her in 24 hours. How well did you know the Stark girl, Roman? Rather well. I'd see her on the office a great deal. Harvey was, well, not very discreet about the fact that he was fond of her. Please, Clarence. Harvey's dead. We should forget those things. He was a good husband. I, I don't know what life is going to be like without him. I just have an idea that it's going to be pretty simple, Mrs. Burgess. And possibly rather short. What do you mean? I mean that the police suspect that you and Mr. Roman murdered your husband and Miss Stark. That's a serious accusation, Rude. Your husband was suing you for divorce, wasn't he, Mrs. Burgess? He knew you were going to be there with Mr. Roman, his best friend tonight. So he came and surprised you with Helen Stark for a witness, didn't he? And you, Mr. Roman, you killed him and then you had to kill Helen Stark to shut her up. This is preposterous. Ah, uh, sit down, Roman. You were right, Rogie. We found Roman's fingerprints on the steering wheel of Helen Stark's car. One of the boys just got back with a report that the Roman shoe is a perfect fit in that shoe print outside Stark's garage. I had nothing to do with it. Clarence killed Harvey, and then he chloroformed that Stark girl, and then... You're in this as far as I am. Shut up! I've got more news for you, Roman. Helen Stark isn't dead. The car ran out of gas just in time. She'll be there to appear against you when you're tried for murder. <laughs> Liza, honey. I'm... I don't want to talk to you, Richard Rogue. I'm busy. Oh, now, honey. The lady says she's busy. Yeah? Who are you? The name is George. Good night, chump. <laughs> ah, little drops of rain. The stuff we're getting so much of out here in California right now saved Helen Stark's life. Because if I hadn't noticed those tire tracks, she would have stayed in the garage until it was too late for the pole motor squad to save her. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Little drops of rain put the curse on what was almost a perfect double murder. With the help of my massive intellect, there's only one thing I can't understand. How come a guy as smart as I am gets hit on the head so often? Answer me that, will you? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. How did you like our little story tonight? Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Oh, uh, don't forget to tune in next Thursday night. We're going to present a strange story of a house where everybody was scared. We call it the House of Fear. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, Barber, or Beauty Shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Folks, when we see a wounded veteran, we can thank him with our eyes and with a smile. We can also thank him in more material ways, like helping make sure he gets all the benefits of the G.I. Bill of Rights. That takes money. The money we lend when we buy victory bonds. Buy victory bonds. Receptionist isn't here, Jerry. That's strange. You know she... Jerry! That was from the inner office, Pam. Come on. Mr. and Mrs. North. Starring Barbara Britton and Richard Denning. 
Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Run Away from Murder. The office of the president of the Gordon Electrical Appliance Company is a large and cheerful room. But the man who sits behind the desk in that office has little in common with his surroundings. He is neither large nor cheerful. He's a small man. Small, tired, worried, and frightened. Yes, Miss Nichols? Mr. Schaefer of the Seaboard National Bank calling Mr. Gordon. Oh, oh yes. Uh, put him on. And would you come in, Miss Nichols? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, Greg. Uh, what's the news? Only 30 days. But I asked for a three-month extension. I, I know, but... Yes. Yes, I understand, Greg. I see. Well, thanks for calling. Is something wrong, Mr. Gordon? The bank is giving me only 30 days more on my loan instead of 90. You don't have $100,000 you could lend me, do you, Miss Nichols? I wish I did, Mr. Gordon. You could have it. Thank you, Marjorie. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll raise it somehow. Has that uh, production curtailment order gone out? Yes, I distributed it first thing this morning. Uh, you look terribly tired, Mr. Gordon. I am, a little. You should try to get away for a few days. That's impossible right now. I was hoping I could run up to Syracuse for my class reunion. I haven't attended one in ten, twelve years. Would you believe it, Miss Nichols? When I was in college, the one thing in the world I wanted to do was write. Why didn't you? Uh, don't get me started on that, or I'll be telling you my life story. You're much too easy to talk to, Miss Nichols. Maybe that's because I like to listen to you talk. Thank you. Mind if I quote you to my wife and children? Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Gordon, Mrs. Gordon called while you were out. Asked me to remind you to send a check for 500 to Howard's for the coat she bought for your daughter. 500. All right, Miss Nichols, that'll be all. Yes, sir. Oh. Good afternoon, Miss Nichols. Oh, Mr. Harris, I, I uh, didn't see you. My uncle, then. Why, yes. Thank but you. I don't think he wants to be disturbed. Well, hello, Ray. Hello, Uncle Rice. I just got back in the office and I found this on my desk. The curtailment order? Yes. What does it mean? Just what it says, Hillary. I can't afford to throw any more money into heavy appliance production. Am I being transferred to another department? No, you're going to be laid off, just like the rest of the people in your department. I'm sorry. Does but... Aunt Frieda know this? I didn't discuss it with her, if that's what you mean. And I doubt if she'd be particularly interested. She's rather involved in planning the autumn festival at the country club. Ah. Well... If you ask me, this is a pretty rotten thing to do. Now, look, Hillary. I realize that the prospect of having to go to work for the first time in your life comes as quite a shock to you. But that's it, and I don't want to discuss it. I'm tired, and I have a lot on my mind. And right at the moment, I'm fed to the teeth with greedy, grasping, selfish relatives, including you. Now get out! <laughs> Do you think Mr. Gordon really wants to get rid of all of them? No, I don't think he wants to get rid of any of them, Pam. But from what he tells me, he has no choice. His business has been going badly, and, well, he needs every cent he can get. But all these beautiful additions. It must have taken years to collect them. And when I think how hard I worked to raise those chrysanthemums. What chrysanthemums? In back of the house. Hmm? What on earth are you talking about? Chrysanthemums. Oh, Oh, stupid of me, isn't it? I, I thought we were talking about rare books. We are. Good. Oh, for a minute there, I, I was afraid I was getting confused. All that work for nothing, and you don't even remember. Remember what? The chrysanthemums in back of the house. What house? See what I mean? In Connecticut. Hmm? Don't you remember that summer we rented a house in Connecticut and I spent months babying those mums and then we moved back to the city before they bloomed. I never got to see them bloom. Mm -hmm. It nearly broke my heart. That's how Mr. Gordon must feel. Why? Has, has something happened to his chrysanthemums? No, Jerry. These books. Oh. He oh. spent years collecting them. Now he has to give them up. Yeah. Before they ever even bloomed. Oh, Jerry, you know what I mean. <laughs> you think I'm being silly. Yeah. And I could kiss you for it. But now let's uh, let's look over the rest of these chrysanthemum books. I promised to tell Gordon what I think he can get for them, so I'd better get to it. Come in. 
the North's gone. Yes. What did Mr. North say about the books? He says I can get 25000 for them. Twenty five. But you've paid a lot more for them than that. Jerry knows the rare book market, Frida. And on a forced sale, that's all I can hope to get. Then where's the rest of the 100000 coming from? From the liquidation of the heavy appliance division, sale of the machinery, inventory. I've already made a deal with American Electric. This is almost like starting all over, isn't it? We'll pull through it. Have you talked to Hillary? He telephoned. But I made it clear to him that I wouldn't try to influence your decision. Well... Thank you, Frida. I'm sorry you can't make a place for him in the company, but if you can't, well, we have to look out for ourselves. Frida. Yes? What you said a moment ago about starting over, it will be, in a way, in the work I'll have to do. And I... What, Russell? I don't think I can do it. But you just said we'd pull through. And we can, if we want to. But I don't. I'm tired, Frida. I want to quit... Quit? Let the bank foreclose. Let it have the company. I hate it. I've always hated it, really. But what would you do? I wouldn't do anything if I didn't feel like it. We could get by. We'd have six, seven thousand a year. Six or seven thousand a year. We couldn't live on that. Not the way we're living now, no. But we could sell this house and a place in Southampton, get rid of the servants and one of the cars and buy a little place. Have you gone Uh, completely out of your mind? Is it such a crazy idea? It's insane. Why? This is our life. And what kind of a life is it? A good one. Good. Yes, Russell, a very good life. I like it, and so do the children. I'm sorry if you've decided you don't, but it can't be helped. Frida. And after 25 years of asking me to expect one thing, you can't suddenly change your mind and ask me to take something else. But... You've you've grown almost to hate me, Russell. Yes, and the children, too, because you think we're selfish. Well, what do you call this preposterous idea of yours? You're 50 years old, Russell. You're not a child. And our life isn't a toy you can toss aside because you're bored and tired. All right, Frida. Forget it. Where are you going, Russell? Nowhere, Frida. Nowhere at all. Except to bed. Miss Nichols in, Miss Rogers? She's in your office, Mr. Gordon. Good morning, Mr. Gordon. Good morning, Miss Nichols. I was looking through your desk for the copy of the contract with American Electric. It's in the lower right hand. I found it. And I found this. Give me that. What were you going to do with it? Give me that gun. No. Not until I know what it was doing in your desk. That is none of your business. I'm making it my business. All right, Miss Nichols. I bought it with the idea of using it. On myself. You're a fool. Perhaps. But now that you know why the gun was in my desk, may I have it, please? Take it. Thank you. You won't use it. Won't I? No, Mr. Gordon. You're not the type. You haven't the nerve. All you like to do is think about killing yourself. It excites you. It excuses your mistakes. It it convinces you that that you're all alone and misunderstood. I hired you as a secretary, Miss Nichols. Not as a... But you're not alone. Or misunderstood. No? No. Russell, not if you don't want to be. I think perhaps you'd better go, Miss Nichols. All right. But let me tell you something, Russell. I don't... Just one thing. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you will use this gun. But if you're that desperate, why don't you live instead of die? What do you mean? You have $50,000 from the sale of machinery to American Electric. Yes, but... And you'll get twenty-five more from the sale of your library... Seventy-five thousand dollars. Why, you suggest? I'm suggesting we take that money and go away. We? We, Russell, yes. You and I. Uh, but, uh, about Frida? Oh, don't think about Frida. Think of yourself. Think of me, Russell. Look at me and think about me. I can give you life, Russell, life. Marjorie. And what can Frida give you? Oh, she'd love it if you'd use this gun. She'd have your insurance and you, you wouldn't be around to annoy her. Use it and she'll dance on your grave. But come with me and but I'll... But money, it, 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 it isn't mine, really. Well, nothing is yours unless you take it. Oh, where, where would we go? Oh, anywhere. Everywhere. It's a big world, Russell. It's a wonderful world. Archery. 
Oh, Russell, you will never regret it, I promise you. Hello? Hello, darling. Oh, hello, Jerry. Oh, I'm glad I caught you before you left. I want to change our date. Oh, Jerry, you you can't make it? (laughs) No, darling, we'll still have lunch, but instead of coming to my office, can you meet me at Russell Gordon's office? He's in the Harwood building. I guess so, Jerry. Good. I I have a certified check for him for the books, and he asked me to bring it over and have lunch with him. He wants to talk to me. What about? Well, he didn't say. Why? Well, I just wondered if I'd be in the way. Why, darling, how can you think that? I don't, but I was just wondering. Yes, Miss Rogers? Hey, Mr. and Mrs. North to see you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. and Mrs. North? Oh, yes. Uh, tell them I'll be right out. Well, what are they doing here? I'm having lunch with them. But it's nearly 12.30. It's all right. I'm all packed. I have the bags and briefcase right here. I'll take the North down to the cafe in the building. Did you have to make an appointment for today? Yes. Jerry found a buyer for my books. Oh. He got a certified check and he was going to mail it. The only way I could get it today was to suggest lunch. All right, Russell. I'll meet you at the airport. The plane leaves at two. I'll be there. For your sake, I hope so. Hello, Miss Rogers. Is my husband in? Oh, hello, Mrs. Gordon. No, I don't think he's back from lunch, but I'll... Oh, excuse me a minute. Gordon Appliances, good afternoon. Mr. Gordon, who's calling, please? Consolidated Airlines? Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Gordon isn't in. Can I take a message? Airline? Uh, here, let me take that. One moment, please. All right, Mrs. Gordon, you can use the phone on the desk. I'll connect you. Hello, this is Mrs. Gordon speaking. What is it? What? What reservations? Today? Uh, I see. Well, uh, Mr. Gordon isn't here. He's the only one who can confirm it. I'll tell him when he comes in. Goodbye. They wanted to confirm two reservations for the two o'clock plane today. What do you know about this, Miss Rogers? Nothing. Mr. Gordon didn't say anything about going away. Could it be a mistake? It certainly could. But I don't think it's the airline who made it. Gordon. I haven't seen her since... Uh, Mr. Gordon? What? Oh, uh, oh, did you say something, Mrs. North? Well, I just asked about Mrs. Gordon. Oh, uh, uh, Frida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's fine. Uh, well, I've got to be going. But uh, I thought you wanted to talk to me. Uh, oh, it'll keep, Jerry. Thanks again for helping with the books. Oh, I was glad to do it. <laughs> now, I, I really must get back to the office. But you folks finish your lunch. Don't let me interrupt. Uh, don't get up, Jerry. Um, Thanks again. I, uh, I'll i be in touch. Jerry, what on earth's the matter with him? Uh, business worries, I guess. Oh, Jerry, look. Hmm? What? He forgot his glasses, left them on the table. Oh, yeah. Well, his office is in the building. Let's, uh, let's finish our lunch, and then we can take them up to him. All right. You know, Jerry, it's strange. What is, darling? Well, a man who makes as much as Mr. Gordon does having to worry about money. Well, it doesn't matter how much you make if if more goes out than comes in. But why should it? Look at you. You don't make nearly as much as Mr. Gordon, and and still you can eat your lunch in peace. Well, maybe that's just because we spend everything I make, not more. We'll just leave the glasses. No use going in to see Gordon since he's so on edge. All right, Jerry. Hmm. Maybe we won't after all. There doesn't seem to be anybody here. Well, that's funny. Yeah. I think you'd think there'd be somebody at the reception desk. Well, maybe she just wanted to get a drink of water. Well, I... <gasps> Golly! That was from the inner office. Oh, look, somebody's coming from Mr. Gordon's office. Holy... What's the matter with her? She's fainted. Oh, Jerry, we better go in and see what happened. Yeah. Jerry, it's Mrs. Gordon. Yeah. She, she, she's all bloody. Is, is there anything we can do for her? Let's see. I'm afraid not, Pam. She's dead. Oh, here comes somebody. Wait, it's Mr. Harris, Mrs. Gordon's nephew. Mr. 
Dr. and Mrs. North. What are you... Aunt Frida. Don't touch her, Hillary. She's dead. She's been murdered. Good Lord. Jerry, you... You'd better call Bill Weigand. And uh, as you came into the building, you saw your uncle getting into a cab. Yes, Lieutenant. He was carrying a suitcase. Have any idea where he was going? No. No, none. Bill, Miss Rogers is feeling better now. Oh, the receptionist? Oh, that's good. Uh, come along, Mr. Harris. Yes, sir. Miss Rogers, this is Lieutenant Wigand. How do you do? Just a few questions, Miss Rogers. What was so awful, so horrible. I went into Mr. Gordon's office because the light on the switchboard wouldn't go out. And there she was. Yeah, she fell against the phone and knocked it off the hook. That's why the light flashed. Now, uh, Miss Rogers, Mr. Harris tells me he saw Mr. Gordon leave the building and get into a taxi carrying a suitcase. Do you know where he was going? No, but Margie, Miss Nichols might. She isn't here. Not here. That's strange. What makes you think Miss Nichols might know? Well, she may have made the reservations. Reservations? What reservations? With Consolidated Airlines. They call earlier to confirm two reservations. Two reservations? Bill, do you suppose that could explain where the secretary is? Could she be with him? Uh, could be, Jerry. Uh, Miss Rogers, are you sure the airline didn't say what plane the reservations were for? I don't know where it was going. Mrs. Gordon took the message. Oh? But she did say what time the plane left. 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Let's see, it's two now. Uh, Pam. Yes, Bill? Get to the switchboard. Get Consolidated Airlines on the phone right away. What are they waiting for? Why don't they take off? For heaven's sakes, Russell, relax. We've been sitting here for ten minutes. Where's the stewardess? I, I want to ask you. Oh, we're starting. Time. Everything will be all right. I hope so. Wait a minute. We're not taking off. We're turning around. Maybe they're going to use a different runway. Well, let's see. No. We're taxiing back to the loading gate. What is this? Darling, don't worry. Do you think... Or do you suppose it has anything to do with us? Well, how could it? Who'd be checking with the airline so soon? You never know. I'd call Frida Guy. Maybe it started something. Why did she have to come to the office today anyway? What? Uh, oh, uh, nothing. Oh, we're stopping. But well, now, just sit tight. It might have nothing to do with us. But they're rolling out the steps. <laughs> Look there. Where? There's a police patrol car out there. And here come two policemen up the steps. Russell, maybe we can... Give it up, Marjorie. They're coming for us. We're, we're too late, that's all. Twenty-five years. Too late. <laughs> Since the police phoned that they took Mr. Gordon and his secretary off the plane, Jerry, I wonder when they're going to get here. Well, it takes at least half an hour to get in from the airport, even in a police car, Pam. But it's been a half hour. Uh, Jerry, you say you know Gordon. Did you know of anything between him and his secretary? No, I'm afraid not, Bill, but maybe... Oh, here they are at last. Hello, Russ. Oh, hello, Jerry. And Hillary. What are you doing here? I uh, just came to pick up my things. Russ, uh, this is Lieutenant Wigand of the police. Hey, look, Lieutenant, you have no right to hold me. The money from the books belongs to me. As for the rest of it, there's no proof I wasn't going to repay the bank. Frieda's just trying to make trouble. What? Oh, of course I realize how things look. Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What would you say about your wife trying to make trouble? Well, isn't she? Isn't that why you're here? Because of her? Yeah, that's why we're here. But uh, what's this money you're talking about? Well, didn't she tell you? She didn't tell us anything. I don't understand. Well, I'm not so sure I do either. Now, suppose you answer my question. What's this money you're talking about? Company money. What'd you do with it? Well, it's right here. In my briefcase. I was taking it with me. Here. It's all in... What's the matter? Well, it... it's not here. What? The money. It's, it's not here. Russell. Look. The briefcase is just stuffed with old papers. Yes. Yes, yes. Russell! <laughs> Mr. Gordon. <laughs> All right, Jim, that's enough. Now stop it. Where's, where's Frida? I want to find out what she did with the money. She must be the one who took it. When? While I was at lunch. When I came back, she was in my office. I thought she acted strangely. 
When I told her I was going away on an overnight business trip, she didn't even ask why I hadn't told her about it. She knew I was lying. She knew I was running out, but she didn't care. She was happy to get rid of me, I suppose. So you saw your wife after lunch? Yes. And when you left, was she still alive? Of course she was still alive. She's been murdered. Murdered? Russell, you didn't know. Miss Nichols, when did you leave the office today? 12.30. And you didn't come back again? No. Oh, Bill. Yes? Uh, would you come over here a minute? I'd like to tell you something. Sure. What is it? Mrs. North, you... You both must know that I didn't... That I wouldn't... No. How could anyone know? We'll do what we can for you, Mr. Gordon. I'm sorry, Mr. Gordon. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you and Miss Nichols to go down to headquarters with me. Jerry, what did you tell him? Never mind that. Let's go. Can't I even call my lawyer? From headquarters. All right. Let's get it over with. Come on. Do uh, you want me to go too, Lieutenant? No, Mr. Harris. You can stay here. But I expect you to be available if I want to talk to you again. Of course, Lieutenant. Let's get going. All right, Gordon, Miss Nichols, wait right here till I come back. And then I advise you not to try to leave. Now, uh, Jerry, you and Pam come with me and we'll see if you're right. Okay, Bill. Where are we going? Around to the side corridor. Jerry has an idea the murderer will give himself away. After all, he didn't have much time to hide the money. What? Here, we can hide here and see around the corner if we hear the door open. Right. You see, Pam, Mr. Harris told us that when he was coming in the building, he saw his uncle getting in a taxi. That's right. Well, that was quarter to two, but Mr. Gordon was on the two o'clock plane, and it takes at least half an hour to reach the airport from here. You said so yourself. Uh Uh-huh. Well, so he couldn't have been here to quarter off. That's it, Pam. So Mr. Harris was lying. I guess what happened was that Mrs. Gordon took the money out of her husband's briefcase while he was at lunch, and then the nephew killed her to get it from her. And you think he hid it in the building? Yes, Then he came right back to the office and pretended to be just arriving so that if anyone had noticed him enter the building, he'd be able to say he arrived after the murder. He wanted to clear himself and wanted the chance to accuse his uncle. He... Oh, there's a door opening. Stay back. Is it Harris, Bill? Yeah. He's going down the hall, stopping by a door. I think it's a storage closet. He's looking for something in there. You know, this could be it. I better go and see. Come on, Jerry. Find anything, Harris? Lieutenant... He's trying to get away. Stop, Harris. Stop or I'll shoot. Don't shoot again. I'll stop. I'll stop. All right, Harris. Just stay where you are and stop whimpering. Just a warning shot. It didn't come anywhere near you. I'll take that bundle. I have an idea. It's going to be a lot more damaging to you than the bullet I just fired. All right, let's go. Hey, Pam. Come here. See what I brought you. A present, Jerry? What is it? Well, remember when we were looking over Russ's collection? Remember what you said? About how much I like the books? Oh, Jerry, did you buy one of them? Which one? (laughs) Ah, no, Pam. I didn't buy any of them. But, Jerry, I thought you said... Oh, Jerry, how lovely. Right? Oh, you're a darling. Oh, how sweet. A bunch of chrysanthemums. (laughs) That puts the finishing touch on another Mr. and Mrs. North mystery. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.